while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. This is your Rexall family druggist with a welcome from the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names. We've done that because we recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Bismarex, for example. This famous Rexall antacid often neutralizes excess acidity within one minute. What's more, the ingredients in Bismarex vary in the time it takes them to dissolve in the stomach. And that way, relief from acid indigestion is quick continuous and prolonged. Quality like that of Bismarck's is what we family druggists are talking about when we tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you another exciting half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, are you, Mr. Diamond? Oh, my goodness, yes. Come right in. My name is Wolf. Well, unofficially, so is mine. Sit down. Thank you. Oh, no, no, my pleasure. You must get a dividend from the nylon companies. Be terrible if there was a shortage. I'm well stocked. Now, what can I do for you? Start by calling me Edna. Well, then what? I'd like you to follow my husband. As a detective or a replacement? I think he's been seeing another woman. Why? Have you been running around the house in a diving suit and swim fence? I've always tried to keep myself attractive for my husband, Mr. Diamond. Well, then if your husband is seeing another woman, Mrs. Wolfe, it's got to be an optometrist assistant. Well, thank you. I think you and I are going to get along just fine. Well, now that we're all agreed, tell me some more about your husband. What makes you think there's another woman? Usual things. The way he's been acting. Business appointments every evening. Nothing else? He received a call late this afternoon. I listened in on the extension. It was a woman. She called the house? George was very unhappy about it. Warned her never to do it again. She gave a name? She said, this is Nancy. I must see you here tonight at 8 o'clock. Hmm. She didn't say where here was, did she? No, George seemed to understand. Probably her apartment. Probably. If he's seeing another woman, I want a divorce, Mr. Diamond. And you need grounds. Yes. A hundred a day in expenses, Mrs. Wolfe. Edna. It's still a hundred a day in expenses. Here's two hundred. I hope that's enough of a retainer. Oh, that'll keep me interested for quite a while. Now, uh, tell me, what does your husband do? Oh, I I, I mean his business. He's in steel. How much in? Oh, very much. He's vice president of his company. What does he look like? Here's a picture of him. Hmm. Well, I'll start right away and see what I can find out for you, Mrs. Edna. Yeah. Well, look, after I found out just how unfair your husband's treating you, I might lend you my shoulder to cry on. And I'd just about have to call you Edna then, wouldn't I? By 7 o'clock, I was standing across the street from her house waiting for her wandering husband. By 7.30, a man stepped out on the sidewalk and hailed cab. I recognized him from the photograph as George Wolfe, and I started the tale, following him east across town to an apartment house on 47th Street. By the time I got in the lobby, it was deserted. A list of names on the mailboxes showed the only girl named Nancy in the building was a Nancy Fowler, so I headed for her apartment. Her door was at the far end of the hall, and I was halfway to it when George Wolfe bounded out and ran right into me. Let me go. Take your hands off of me. You forgot to close the door. Get out of my way. What's the matter, friend? You look like you ran into a yard full of snakes. Will you get out of my way or must I use force? Well, use all you like, but I think you better go back and close the door. No, no. Yes, yes. Stop it. You can't do this to me. Well, I hope you aren't always this wrong. No, no. Please. Now get in the room. <laughs> oh, swell. No wonder you took off like that. I didn't kill her. I swear I didn't kill her. Nancy Fowler? Uh, yes, I guess so. You guess so? Well, this is Miss Fowler's apartment, but... 
I've never seen Nancy Fowler before in my life. There was the 38 revolver lying next to the dead girl, so I took out my own gun and covered Wolf while I called Lieutenant Levinson of Homicide to get right over. Wolf yelled, screamed, and pleaded, and even offered me a nice fat bribe. But we waited for Fatty Levinson and his squad of New York's finest. He finally arrived, but New York's finest was poorly represented. Hello, Shamus. In trouble again, huh? Walt, did you have to bring Otis? I promised he hasn't used the siren in four days. Who's this guy? George Wolf. Caught him running out of the door. Well, Mr. Wolf, what about it? I have nothing to do with it, but I'm not saying any more until I see my lawyer. He was crying all over the place before you got here, Walt. Claimed he got a call from a Nancy Fowler who asked him to come up here. That's the truth, Lieutenant. She said she had something important to tell me. Says he never even heard of Nancy Fowler before the call. That also is the truth. When I came to the apartment, I found her lying just as you see her. How'd you get in the door? She told me she'd leave it open for me to walk right in. Well, it came out the back just below the shoulder blades, Lieutenant. You on the gun, Mr. Wolf? I refuse to answer any more questions. Okay, take him down to the car, Otis. Come on, you. Rick, just how did you happen to be in this building at this particular time? Well, I was hired by that guy's wife to tail him. He was supposed to be playing illegal footsies with a female named Nancy. The dead girl? Well, the wife just knew the first name was Nancy. The girl who's supposed to live here is named Nancy. Nancy Fowler. I've never seen her before. Maybe the dead girl is one and the same. Well, I'll get an identification and have the gun checked by ballistics. In the meantime, I'm going to give this apartment a good going over. Mind if I help? Now, what kind of an answer do you expect to that? You will anyway. He was so right. We started going over the apartment room by room. Closets, drawers, everything. In ten minutes, the coroner and the boys from the lab arrived. And in the bedroom, Walt found something. Take a look at this. Ah, a jewelry box. Hey. Pretty expensive. Regal Jewelers. Very classy establishment. Has a card in the box. For my darling love, George. <laughs> and the guy said he never saw her before. If this is his handwriting, he's as good as strapped in the chair. Well, it looked as if my client, Mrs. Wolf, had a killer for a husband. But a couple of small items still worried me. So I left Walt and went downstairs to find the switchboard operator. Oh, are you with the police? I just left them, uh... Tell me, dear, do you keep a list of the calls that are made through the switchboard? Sure, it costs the tenants ten cents a call. May I see the list? Yeah, I guess so. Here, handsome. Gee, nobody's called me that since I had long blonde curls and a gold yo-yo. I looked over the list of telephone calls and found the ones made by Nancy Fowler during the past three or four days. The last call listed from her apartment had been made at 7.45 that evening to a familiar telephone number. The same number Mrs. Wolfe had given me when she left my office earlier. I left for the home of Mrs. Edna Wolfe. Yes? Oh, Mr. Diamond, you shouldn't come here. What if my husband... Your husband's spending the night out. What? In a cell, all alone. Oh, you'd better come in. Now, what in the world are you talking about? Well, it looks as if your husband killed a girl this evening. Oh, no. That's the way it looks. Oh, please, sit down, Mr. Diamond. Thanks. I uh, caught him running out of the girl's apartment, forced him back, and found the girl shot to death on the floor. Nancy Fowler? Yes, I think so. It was her apartment. The police are making identification now. Oh, it's just terrible. I wonder why he did it. Were you here in the house at 7.30 this evening? What? No, I was with a friend until about 8.30. Well, a call was made to your house from Nancy Fowler's apartment. She was charged for it, so the call was completed. Well, she probably talked to George. Your husband swears he didn't know the girl. Claims he got a phone call and she asked him to come right over. That she had something to tell him. He knew her all right. You remember, I told you I ever heard them talking. Your uh, husband own a gun? Well, yes, I believe so. Hmm. You know what caliber? No. I don't know anything about guns. Uh, a bracelet was found in the dead girl's apartment. The card with it was signed, Love, George. Oh, it looks pretty bad, doesn't it? If it's his handwriting, it does. Well, I guess he deserves it, but... I'll call our lawyer and see what can be done. I'll uh, keep in touch, Mrs. Wolf. I hope you will. Just because the case is finished. Well, there are still a few things that bother me, so I'll just kind of keep looking around until I'm satisfied. You mean you think maybe my husband didn't kill the girl? There's an awful lot of evidence that he did, but uh, there's still a motive to be found. You've got the grounds you wanted, so from here on in, anything I do for you or your husband will be on my own time. Anything you do for my husband, I'll be glad to pay for Oh, well, now, that's, uh, that's real nice. <clears throat> well, I'll take a run down at the precinct and let you know what the lieutenant's found out. Good night, Mrs. Wolf. Still can't get used to Edna? It'll take a while. The 
thought you'd be in bed by now, Rick. My landlord short-sheeted me. What did you find out, Walt? The dead girl was Nancy Fowler. Mm, figured. And George Wolf did do the killing. His gun? Yeah, we checked the registration. His gun, his fingerprints on it, his handwriting on the note in the jewelry case. What does he say about the bracelet and the note? He bought it all right. We checked. Regal Jewelers. Says it was for his wife. You expect him to say something different? No. What's the motive? We'll find it. Probably another man. Here's the report on the dead girl, Lieutenant. Well, isn't it a little late for you, Otis? Why aren't you out flying around some belfry? He's picking on me again, Lieutenant. Maybe you'd like me to tell him about the time I caught you sleeping in the attic hanging by your toes. Oh, not you too, Lieutenant. Otis, I hear you've been picking up some extra money posing for Charles Adams. I don't have to take this. I know my rights, and I ain't no bad. There's something on the dead girl. She works at the Gilded Cage, a nightclub owned by Eddie Young. Eddie Young. Well, there's a nice little fella. He'd set fire to his grandmother if he thought it was too cold in the room. We'll have a talk with him tomorrow. Well, I guess I, I better be going. Sure. See you later. Yeah, I could sure use some sleep. Yeah. And, uh, Rick, when you get over to Eddie Young's club, give him my best. Smarty. <laughs> The gilded cage where Eddie Young ruled as proprietor and keeper for his flock of hard gorillas was only about six blocks away, so I decided to walk it. But like always, I start in one direction and end up getting sidetracked. Keep walking, Diamond. Don't turn around. Uh, you caught me when I'm right in the mood. You turn around, I shoot you. What's the matter? Don't you want me to spot your Tony? Over to that car. Okay. Quit poking. Your muzzle's cold. You drive... I'll get in the back. Oh, I, uh, I forgot my glasses. Can't see three feet without them. Get in. But I have a restricted driver's license. You want it right here? I can wait. Where to? Just start driving and don't turn around. We headed east across town with a gun pointed at my neck. I tried to get a look at the guy in the rear vision mirror, but he was sitting too far to one side. I didn't know where we were headed, but I had a pretty good hunch why we were going there. Turn right. And take it a little slower. I don't want to have to shoot a cop. Well, if we're headed for the river, I've seen it. From the bottom? Don't you think we'd better stop at a bathhouse or something? I know a spot where you can go in clothes and all. Okay. But if there's anything I hate, it's getting my money wet. Turn right again. We were headed for a cross street. I could only turn right or left. A big warehouse was dead ahead. I eased down on the gas and we picked up speed as we neared the intersection. As I started to make the turn, I stamped down on the gas hard and at the same time threw myself toward the floorboard. His gun went off so close to my ear, I felt like my head had split wide open. Then we hit the building. <laughs> You're listening to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, brought to you by the makers of Rexall drug products and your Rexall family druggist. And here he is. Last week, a customer said to me... I wish I knew some way to be sure I'm getting enough vitamins. Some way that's easy. Yes, and inexpensive, too. Well, ma'am, millions of people have found the easy way to do that. They take Rexall plenamins. Plenamins? Rexall's popular multivitamin capsules. Just two plenamins a day give you more than your minimum daily requirement of every vitamin for which such requirements have been established. Well, you can't expect much more than that. Yet plenamins do give you more than that, for they also contain valuable liver concentrate and iron, plus other factors of the vitamin B pl complex. Say, they sound expensive. On the contrary, Rexall plenamins cost you only a few pennies per day. Ask for plenamins at Rexall drugstores everywhere, and remember... You can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. We had hit the building and pushed our way halfway through the brick wall. I was still on the floor, and the motor had been shoved through the firewall and was jammed into the front seat where I'd been sitting a minute before. 
My friend with a gun was stretched out over the top of the seat, his legs resting on the horn and his shoulders through the windshield. I sat up, rolled him off the horn. He was very dead. Before a crowd could collect, I climbed out and got to a phone, called Walt. Are you sure you're all right, Rick? Yeah, I can hear things better now. I just said the other guy's dead. Very, yeah. I, uh, I recognized him, too. Uh, Gus Winkler. Holy cow. You know who he's working for now? No. Eddie Young. Oh, that's it. Well, don't pick Young up, Walt. I, I know a few things I haven't told you about, and this almost puts a cinch on it. I, I, I want to talk to Young, and then I'll be down to see you. But if Young tried to have you killed... Oh, if he did, you can't prove it. Not yet, anyway, so sit tight and... When I get there, I'll show you how to catch a killer. Uh, you uh, going someplace, chum? Yeah, right through that door, chum. Uh, that's Mr. Young's office. Maybe he don't want to see you. Uh, maybe he don't. But he's going to be disappointed. Uh, uh, you, you ain't going in there, chum. I see. Everybody gets disappointed sooner or later, chum. Yeah, what... Aren't you in the wrong room? That's what your boy outside thought. I changed his mind. Are you sure you ain't looking for Bellevue, Shamus? You're kind of a mess. One of your boys, Gus Winkler, tried to give me swimming lessons. He can claim his body at the morgue. I don't know what you're talking about. Somebody else who works for you got killed tonight, too. Yeah, who? Nancy Fowler. What? Oh, come on, Eddie. I couldn't stand it if you started crying. Who killed her? The police are holding a man named George Wolfe. Know him? No, I don't know him, but Nancy's talked about him a couple of times. Hey, boss, that guy just... Forget it, Lou. Well, the boss, he... Forget have... it, will you? Go, go on, beat it. Okay. You know, she almost lose a pretty big boy for you to go pushing around. He's liable to stay mad. So Nancy said she knew this George Wolfe. That's right. Rich old guy, from the way she talked, she was taking him. Good. Where were you between 7 and 8 this evening? Right here in this office. I got witnesses. Oh, I'll bet you have. Okay, Eddie, I'll see you around. I left the office knowing how close I was to the whole answer and called Walt at the precinct. I told him to meet me up the block from the gilded cage, and 10 minutes later, he pulled the squad car up the curb, and I climbed in. You find out anything? Yeah, but I have to know one thing first. What time was Nancy Fowler killed? Garner's report puts it at 7.30. Well, that ties it. Now, would you mind telling me what it's all about? I'll do better than that, Walt. I'll show you. But we've got to wait until Eddie Young leaves the cafe and goes home. It was around 12.30 and we settled back to wait. And with an impatient cop sitting next to me, it wasn't easy. Around 1 in the morning, a boy brought Eddie Young's convertible up in front. We watched Eddie climb in. Okay, Walt, tell him. We stayed close, following Eddie Young across town until he pulled up in front of his apartment and turned into the basement garage. Give me five minutes, Walt. And then come on up to Young's apartment. But why can't I go now? Because what I'm about to do isn't quite legal. And I couldn't stand seeing you blush. Uh, hey, what's going on? One yell and I'll kill you. Uh, look, look, Devin. Come on, put away that gun, will you? What do you want? Let's go up to your apartment. But please believe me, Eddie. I'll do something bad if you get out of line. We rode the elevator up to Eddie's eighth floor apartment. I shoved him in the door ahead of me and then made sure there was no one else around to give me any trouble. All right, all right. What do you want? Pick up that phone. Okay, we'll take it easy with you. Well, who do you want me to call? This number and hurry. I'll tell you what to say. Okay, Honor. I don't get this. Evergreen Street. What's the matter? Don't you like that number, Eddie? I don't even know the number. Come and dial it quick. Okay. And when you get an answer, just say, this is Eddie. Get right over here. I got to see you. And I'll look Shamus. You look, Eddie. I'm going to hold this barrel right between your eyes so you can see it coming if you make a mistake. I won't make a mistake. Hello? This is Eddie. Yeah, get right over here. I got to see you. I, I can't talk. Goodbye. 
Okay, now, will you take that gun away? You look a little worried. What have I got to be worried about? I, I don't know who I was talking to. Oh. That should be the law, Eddie. What is this, Diamond? I'm sorry I can't show you right now. Good night, Eddie. Wait a minute. You... Come on in, Walt. You said five minutes. Holy smoke, what happened to him? I just put him to sleep. We'll stay that way for a while. Now, Rick, you've got to tell me what's going on. I told you I'd show you. Now, go on in the kitchen and see if you can find some ketchup. Ketchup? Yeah, then bring it out here and pour it all over Young. Have you lost your mind? Walt, I want him to make, it, I want him to make him look like he's bleeding. Now, go find the ketchup or I'll just have to cut his throat. Walt found the ketchup and under protest poured it over the unconscious Eddie Young. Then I made sure the door was unlocked and we went out in the hall to wait. Please, Rick, what is this? It's the same way Nancy Fowler killing was framed, only she was really killed. Right, elevator. Okay. I'll play along with it. Let's go, Walt. Help! All right, hold it, Miss Wolf. Oh, oh, Mr. Diamond, he's dead, he's dead. His head is all covered with blood. Why did you kill him? Kill him. I didn't kill him. I just got here. Who let you in? He told me the door would be open. I didn't know you knew Eddie Young. Well, I, well, yes, I know him. He's an old friend. Why? This is Lieutenant Levinson, Mrs. Wolf. He's the man who arrested your husband for the murder of Nancy Fowler. <sighs> Lieutenant, I swear I didn't kill Eddie. Looks bad, Mrs. Wolf. But I didn't. Why would I want to kill Eddie? Well, why would your husband want to kill Nancy Fowler? I don't know. What has that got to do with this? You told me you didn't know Nancy Fowler. I didn't. You know Eddie. Nancy worked for Eddie. Well, I didn't know it. I didn't know Eddie that well. You said a girl called your husband and said her name was Nancy. Yes, that's right. You told me you didn't know her last name, and yet when I came over and told you your husband had just killed a girl, you asked me if it was Nancy Fowler. That's a lie. You said that Nancy phoned your husband that afternoon. She did, she did, I swear she did. And yet Nancy Fowler's hotel switchboard has no record of a call being made to your phone any time in the afternoon. They made a mistake. But at 7.45, a call was made from Nancy's apartment to your phone number. Then she must have called my husband again. According to the coroner's report, Nancy Fowler was dead at 7.30. Oh, Mrs. Wolf, I can swear your husband didn't go into that building until 8 o'clock. I was following him. I guess it doesn't make any difference what Eddie did. Did Eddie kill the girl? Yes. I called my husband. I wanted to get a divorce. And his money at the same time. Eddie knew Nancy, so we decided she'd be the one. She let Eddie in. He made her call my husband. Then he shot her. And the gun and the bracelet. You just took them out of your husband's dresser drawer and planted them in Nancy's apartment? Yes. I found the bracelet in the drawer with a gun. I guess my husband was going to surprise me. Uh, Eddie. Eddie is moving. Oh, Eddie. Uh, Eddie, darling. Hey, what happened? You're what? hurt. You're bleeding. Please. Stay still until we can call it. Wait a minute, will you? Hey, what is this stuff? It, this isn't blood. I'm covered with ketchup. Ketchup? Ketchup? Why, you dirty, no good. Uh, uh, uh. Eddie. We have been framed. Framed? They're all yours, Walt. Why? Good night, Mrs. Oh, I guess now is as good a time as any. Good night, Edna. Yes? Helen? It's Rick, honey. Oh, isn't that sweet? I was just dreaming. Rick, it's four in the morning. Where are you? Oh, I'm helping Walt close up the gilded cage. Helping Walt close up the what? The gilded cage. Nightclub. I hear music. Hmm. But on his accordion will love you. Are you drinking? Honey, I'm with the police force. <laughs> what was that? Well, that was Walt. He said, Rick... You stood me up this evening. Well, I'm going to make up for it, honey. Listen. Okay, eh? One, two. You made me love you. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. You made me want you. 
and all the time you knew it. I guess you always knew it. You made me happy sometime. You made me glad. But there were times, dear, you made me feel so bad. You made me sigh for I didn't want to tell you. I didn't want to tell you. I want some love that's true. Give me, give me, give me, give me what I cry for. You know you got the kind of kisses that I die for. You know you made me love you. That's enough, Abe. How was that, honey? Honey? Honey. Oh, well. She like it? Well, of course she did. She'll be dreaming about it for the rest of the night. Come on, Walt. Let's dance. <laughs> Once more, here's your Rexall family druggist. No faster acting aspirin made. That's Rexall aspirin. When taken with water, the five full grains of pure aspirin contained in every Rexall tablet are ready to go to work for you even before they reach your stomach. Next time you need aspirin, remember Rexall aspirin. There's no faster acting aspirin made. Ask for it at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember... You can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, High Aberback, Stacey Harris, and Victor Perrin. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hiya, beautiful. Get lost, bristle puss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids. Like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll go stag. That's it. Join the stag line now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Yes, to make girls care. Go stag. Sarah Burner will delight you tomorrow with Sarah's Private Caper on NBC. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective.
Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names. We've done that because we recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Plenamins, for example. Rexall's famous multivitamin capsules. Two Plenamins a day give you more than your daily minimum requirement of every vitamin for which such requirements have been established. Plus valuable liver concentrate and iron. What's more, Plenamins cost you only pennies per day. Ask for Plenamins at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. I'm a detective agency. We trail them, we nail them. If they're guilty, we jail them. No charge for poetry. Oh, no. Edgar Guest with a shoulder holster. Hello, Helen, baby. Rick, guess what's in town? Unless I win something, I give up. The carnival. Well, is the balloon concession tied up yet? Oh, Rick, I'm serious. I haven't been to a carnival since I was little. Let's go tonight. You mean peanuts, popcorn, Cracker Jacks, and all that? Yes. Sounds awful. Oh, now, Rick. Please. Uh, okay, honey, I'll be around at eight. Shall I wear my knickers? Rick. Bye. That night, I picked up Helen, and we went to the carnival. There were more people on the midway than Rexall has stores, and we got pushed so much, I felt like the tax bill in Congress. Helen decided she wanted a Cupid doll, so we stopped at the shooting gallery. That's pretty good shooting. Think nothing of it. Just three more bullseyes and you win a dial. Well, here's your dial. Where'd you ever learn to shoot like that? At the skeet club. Would you like to try a shot, Rick? Uh, no thanks. Come on. Oh, Rick, isn't this doll cute? I... And now, oh, your amazement and proof of my statement, I'll ask him to step out here. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Samson, the strong man. Step right up, folks. He'll thrill you with his amazing feats of strength. Now, crowd right in. Don't be shocked. There is no... Standing trickery. on the platform with the biggest collection of muscles I'd ever seen. Samson looked like an overgrown orangutan. And at least three tigers had contributed their all to the loincloth he wore around his middle. Samson, the great. And now, our sensational offer. $100 to any man who will step up here and defy the mighty Samson to put him to sleep by squeezing his chest. Now it is harmless, my friends. And if any one of you daring gentlemen think the mighty one cannot put you to sleep with a mere squeeze, then step right up. If Samson fails, then one hundred dollars is yours. Well, Rick. Now I tell you, friends. Well, Rick, what? Don't you want to show off? Not my insides. Rick, you mean you're afraid just to let him squeeze you? you Honey, I'm afraid to let him breathe on me. One hundred dollars. Come on, let's go see that fortune teller. I steered Helen toward the next booth before she could talk me into anything my bones would regret tomorrow. The sign outside the tent read, Madam Tanya, your past, your present, your future. And inside, we found Madam T staring intently into a crystal ball. She wore gypsy clothes and a heavy makeup that covered what might have been very lovely features. Welcome to the inner sanctum. Hmm. Haven't I heard you on the radio? She didn't crack a smile, and I didn't exactly blame her. She motioned us into chairs around the crystal. The room was decorated in about the same motif as the tattooed lady and would have impressed a man with a bad case of DTs. Madame Tanya went back to staring at the crystal, so I followed suit. I couldn't see a thing in the glass ball, but then maybe she picked up television on clear night. The crystal grows dim. Ah... I can see that you are both very much in love. Well, go on. It is good. This man adores you. He worships you. He idolizes you. Wake me up when I propose. You are an unbeliever? Oh, let's be modern. I'm a cynic. The crystal does not lie. But to make certain, I will consult the cards. She picked up a deck that was too big for poker and too small for canasta. I should pay to watch a girl play solitaire. 
I nudged Helen. We were about to leave when a tall, thin young man pushed back the canvas flap and walked in. Hey, Tony, I just... Oh, I didn't know you were busy. Excuse me. The boy pushed back the flap to go out and then made a sharp, gurgling noise in his throat. He doubled with pain and fell to the floor. Even from where I was sitting, I could see the big, ugly bullet hole in his chest. <laughs> don't scream. We'll have the whole crowd in here. Stand back, Helen. Is he hurt bad? You don't need a crystal ball for this, honey. He's dead. Even under the heavy makeup, I could see her face turn pale. I sent Helen to call the police, and then I looked around outside. The killer had either used a silencer or else the shot was not heard in the confusion. Twenty minutes later, Lieutenant Max Talbert arrived, followed by Sergeant Otis wearing his Hopalong Cassidy badge. Hi, Rick. Well, hello, Max. Where's Walt Levinson? He's on vacation, Rick. I've taken over his cases. Also his problems, I see. Hello, Otis. Hi, Shamus. So there's been another murder, huh? And you just happened to be here. Sounds suspicious to me. Otis, why don't you stick your head through a piece of canvas and let people throw baseballs at it? And get my brains knocked out? Oh, no. Why not? You got nothing to lose. Rick, uh, Miss Asher told me over the phone what happened. It sounds like we'll be looking for a needle in a haystack. You want to work on the case with us? Not particularly. I just happen to be here, that's all. Yeah. I still think that's awful funny. Otis, I'll send you my confession in the morning. So long, Max. It's not that I wasn't interested in the case. I was. But in my business, you can't poke your head into murder on a gratis basis. So I took Helen home. The next morning, I went to my office as usual. And then around 10 o'clock, I had a visitor. Mr. Diamond, I need your help. Well, thank my lucky stars. Sit down. Thank you. She looked like a well-dressed Lady Godiva, minus horse. I stifled a drool as she sat down, and then I realized that I'd seen her before. This was Madame Tanya, minus the heavy makeup, gypsy garb, and the phony accent. It's about last night's murder. You see, it's not the first. Four men have been killed within a year. And all because of me. Go on. My real name is Tony Lawrence. About a year ago, a boy I knew asked me for a date, and we went out. Next day, he was killed. There were two more after that who showed an interest in me. They both died, too. It's getting so every time a man looks at me twice, he's murdered. Well, it's a pleasant way to die. But uh, what about this kid last night? Well, he, he'd asked me for a date at a small party we had after the show one night. He worked in the show, but I hardly even knew him. I see. Did you tell Lieutenant Talbert all this? Oh, yes. He says he'll have to make a systematic check on everyone on the show. But that could take months. Yes, it could. Talbert's a good cop, though. Why'd you come to me? I want you to go back to the lot with me. I'll arrange to get you a job there. Honey, I got a job. I'm a private detective. Oh, I know. I'll pay you what you ask. Oh, well, in that uh, understanding, it will just continue. Well, maybe working undercover, you'll be able to find out who's behind all this. Well, I, uh... Oh, I'm sure it'll work. I'll get you a job as Barker for the girl show. Mm. You know, I've always wanted to run away with the girl show. We drove back to the carnival, and I became Rick Diamond, boy Spieler. The kid who was murdered last night had asked Tony for a date at a small party. There were only three other people at that party, and it seemed logical that one of them was the killer. First on the party list was Chuckles, the clown. Tony took me over to his trailer. Here we are. I think you'll like Chuckles. He's got a great sense of humor. Well, Tony, come on in. Can't stay long, Chuckles. I want you to meet Rick Diamond. He's the new Barker on the girls' show, and the boss wants me to introduce him to everyone. Well, any friend of Tony's is a friend of mine. Glad to know you, Rick. Yeah. How are you, Chuckles? Yeah, oh, just fine. <laughs> so you got the job at the Shakers, huh? You ever bark before? Only at pet shows. Oh, well, you'll do a good business over there. All the old fogies go to see Karen. She's the head shaker. Is that all she shakes? <laughs> hey, hey, that's pretty good. Put some gags in your pitch. The crowd eats it up. We'd better go, Rick. You start to work soon. Yeah, well, drop around any time, huh? <laughs> Number two on the suspect list was Samson, the strong man. I remembered him from last night and took a last look at my fingers as we shook hands. Glad to meet you. Do you wrestle? No, but I'm a demon with jacks. Oh, I can't find no one around here to play with. Oh, you poor kid. Have you tried the lion cage? Rick's going to pitch the girl show, Samson. Oh, boy, that's no fun. 
Hey, look, kid, you work out with me, and someday you can be a strong man, too. Well, that's a tempting offer, but I'm afraid I'm just a natural-born sissy. Well, if you change your mind, come around and... And uh, you'll change my posture, I know. Glad to have met you, Samson. So long. Playful little character. He's really very nice. Hey, let's stop here for a hot dog. Good. My favorite meal. Give the man a cooked one, Maisie. You think, Tony? Uh, loaded with onions, honey. No date tonight. Aren't you hungry, Tony? Uh-uh. I've got to change for my act soon. Tell me, uh, how did a pretty girl like you get tied down to a crystal ball? Oh, I don't know. I grew up on shows. Mom and Dad were wire walkers. Well, I don't like high places, so I decided to be an actress. Mm-hmm. Well, after a few feeble stage attempts, I came back here. Now you do your acting in a tent. That's right. But these murders aren't solved soon. I'll be on the move again. Those, uh, those two characters we just met, do you think one of them might be the killer? Gee, I don't know. They've always been friendly with me, but... Well, they did overhear that boy ask me for the date. Karen was there, too. Oh, yes, uh, the shaker, as Chuckles put it. You'll probably meet her later on. She's always quick to discover a new man. Well, I can hardly wait. Say, I'd better get back. I'll see you after the show tonight. Here you are, mister. It's got enough onions to keep you out of circulation for a week. Tony walked away, stopped, turned, and gave me a smile that made me feel warmer than the hot dog I began munching. She was a very pretty girl. Pretty enough for someone to kill any man she got interested in. And that someone was either a clown, a strong man, or a hula dancer. Yeah, it was quite a mess, and here I was in the middle of it. But as P.T. Barnum always said, as a sucker born every minute. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. Whenever you develop a simple headache, what's the first thing you think of for fast relief? Why, aspirin, of course. Right. But it's also smart to think one step further and choose Rexall aspirin. <laughs> Give me three good reasons why. Okay. First, every Rexall aspirin tablet contains five full grains of pure aspirin. Second... There is no faster-acting aspirin made. What do you mean by that? I mean that when taken with water, a Rexall aspirin tablet is ready to go to work for you, even before it reaches your stomach. Sounds swell so far. What's the third reason? Just this. In the economy size 200-tablet bottle, Rexall aspirin costs you little more than three-tenths of a cent per tablet. That I'll remember. And remember this also. You can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Step right up and see Karen and her friends. Come on, boys, don't be bashful. Put your wives on the Ferris wheel drawn in. Get away from me, son. You bother me. Only one-tenth of a dollar plus 15 cents in your old set. You'll see care of the blonde bombshell. That night, I yelled my head off. The crowd was heavy, and the men poured into the tent until there was panting room only. I looked at my watch and saw that I had four more hours to go. So I warned my tonsils and kept right at it. My mistake, Mr. Go on in. Four hours later, I felt like a politician and had a voice like Andy Devine. Tony met me after the crowds had left, and we had a Coke. Tired? Tired? Me? No, oh, no. 37 hours sleep, and I'll be as good as new. <laughs> You'll get used to it. Oh, do I have to? I thought the girls' show would be great, but they're inside. I'm outside. Well, you'll meet Karen soon. Uh, that's some consolation. No, I'm saying, while I think of it, maybe we'd better not be seen together so much. I got a great affection for life. Yeah, I've thought of that. You'd better go on from here alone. But, Ricky, be careful. I gave her my for you I will look, and then she left. I had been assigned a bunk in one of the trailers and was about to head toward it when something grabbed my arm. At first, I thought one of the snakes had left the charmer's neck. But this one had long blonde hair. Hi. My name's Karen. You got a match? 
I'd heard the match line in a movie, but what this gal carried around could never pass the censor board. I'd been singing her praises all evening, and now I could see that I'd been guilty of understatement. Thanks. Oh, that's all right. I'm loaded with them. <laughs> hey, you're cute. The last guy had a lousy voice, but you're cute. What's your name? Diamond. You can call me Rick. You want to buy me a Coke? Sure. Well, never mind. I just wanted to see if you wanted to. Well, any more party games up your sleeve? Oh, sure. Lots more. Uh, I've seen you with Tony. You like her? Well, shouldn't I? I don't know. Only the way things have been happening, it ain't so healthy. Yeah, so I heard. You like her? She's all right. Burns me, though. She makes more dough than I do, and she's strictly no talent. She just makes up them stories. Now, me, I give the boys the money's worth. Well, uh, I bet you do. You know, I bet we get along real swell, you and me. Well, I, I hope we do. You know, there's nothing but jerks around here. You look sort of like a gentleman. Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm just tired. Oh, I like it. You uh, want to take me into town and go dancing? Well, I'm all worn out tonight. Oh, but... I don't really want to go. Just want to know if you'd like to take me. Oh, we're back at that. Yes, I would like to take you. Good. Oh, gee, it's a nice night for a walk. Oh, would you like uh, to... Uh, let's not go around again. <laughs> Say, you're awful cute. Good night. That night, I went to bed with a lot on my mind and an ice pack around my neck. I was after a murderer who left no clues. The only apparent motive was to keep men away from Tony. Chuckles or Samson? Maybe they were in love with Tony. On the other hand, Karen might be jealous enough of Tony to commit murder. I didn't count sheep that night, just characters... Next morning, while I was roaming around the carnival grounds, I found Chuckles sitting on the steps of his trailer, sewing a bright-colored costume. Well. Hi there. Sit down. Uh, thanks. Hey, you're pretty handy with that needle. Oh, you gotta be. How did it go last night? Well, I'm a little better, but I'm in no condition for a cigarette test. <laughs> I'm glad I don't have to yell my lungs out every night. I just stand around and let people laugh at me. I have a friend named Otis who does the very same thing. Say, you should have been around yesterday if you like excitement. Guy was murdered. Oh? What happened? Somebody shot him. Seems like the only reason was because he liked Tony. You mean the girl who showed me around yesterday? Yeah, that's her. Oh, I guess not many guys give her the eye. No. <laughs> yeah, there's one fellow that kind of likes her, though. A guy by the name of Leonardi. Oh? Yeah, he don't work here no more. He's on another show. Tony and him write a lot, though. I'm always mailing letters for him. Well, maybe they're just friends. Yeah, that's what she says. He worked on this show before I came over here. I don't really know him, but I bet there's something between those two. Maybe he's the one behind all this. Could be. Well, it's not good to poke your nose into other people's business. You're telling me. Well, I guess I'll look over the show. Yeah, well, drop around any time. <laughs> I left Chuckles and wandered on up the midway. About half past the merry-go-round, I ran into Karen, the curve cram kid. Hi, handsome. Hi, yourself. You know, I dreamed about you last night. You do wonders for my ego. Mm, you do wonders for my dreams. Uh, care if I walk along with you? Not at all. Uh, Karen, do you know a guy named Leonardi? Oh, sure. Used to work here. Why, why do you ask? Well, I've heard he might be interested in Tony. That's risky business, you know. Tony and Leonardi? No, now somebody's pulling your leg. Oh, Why Rick, I've been looking Oh, I didn't know you had company. Hello, Karen. Hi. I I just thought I'd see if you were getting along all right, Rick. He's in good hands. That's all a matter of opinion, dear. Uh, look, why don't you girls amuse yourselves while I make a phone call? Karen, you do the shimmy while Tony tells your fortune. I'll be right back. Both girls were exchanging icy stares as I pulled up my coat collar and walked away. So far, I'd accomplished nothing, and the case was still as mixed up as a chef's salad. I called Max to see if he'd uncovered anything on the latest murder. Homicide, Lieutenant Talbot speaking. Max, this is Rick. How are you coming on that circus murder? Oh, Rick, what a headache. Get screwier every minute. Yeah, I know. The fortune teller hired me. Oh, 
Well, man, you know almost as much as I do. And there's one new development, though. Well, don't be greedy, Grandpa. Shoot. That's what someone else did last night. And a guy by the name of Leonardi. Leonardi. The guy Chuckles told me about. The one who liked Tony. Max filled in with the details. The killer had written a letter to Leonardi and told him to come to a hotel room in the city because Tony was sick and had been asking for him. Then the killer rigged up a gun trap so that when Leonardi opened the door, the gun would go off and kill him. Only Leonardi was still alive. The killer had made one mistake. I thanked Max and went back to Tony's tent, certain I could use that mistake to my advantage. Hello, Ray. Hey, where did little Miss Wigglehips go? I don't think she liked your leaving her. She went back to her trailer. Mm, good. Now, Tony, you told me that only three people were present at the party when Bruce asked you for the date. Are you certain of that? Why, yes. Just Samson, Chuckles, and Karen. They dropped in after the show, and we had coffee. Mm-hmm. Well, I want you to invite our three friends over again after the show tonight. Will you do that? Well, yes, but I don't understand. I went back to the girls' show and began my afternoon pitch. That evening, I went through it again, and then around midnight, I went to the party in Tony's tent. They were all three there when I entered. Sit over here, honey. Thanks, Karen. Hi, a weakling. Oh, please, Samson. I'm sensitive. <laughs> Say, you should have seen the matinee today. We did a bang-up routine, and the crowd ate it up. We did the old one, where we all pile into a car... You know, you... They were all relaxed, and yeah. I decided it was time to try my long shot. The Chuckles was just finishing his story as I took a deep breath and crossed my fingers. Back, and then we all pile out of this little car. Oldest trick in the book, but they loved it. Uh, Chuckles, remember that guy you told me about the other day? I think his name was Leonardi. Sure, what about him? Well, nothing. I was just curious. Did you know him, Samson? Know him? Why, Leo and I used to room together when we worked here. Him and me is the best of buddies. And you, Karen, you said earlier that you knew him, right? Yeah, but I didn't think he was so great. He was nothing but a pest. Hey, you can't talk that way about my buddy. Oh, Samson, please. This is a party. Yeah, take it easy, Muscles. Now, let's see. You both knew Leonardi. That lets you out and leaves only Chuckles. You said earlier that you joined the show after Leonardi left, didn't you, Chuckles? Yeah. <laughs> Say, why all these questions about Leonardi? Because you tried to kill him last night. What? You thought there was something between Tony and him. What's this? <laughs> it's a joke, that's all. Yes, clown, but the joke's on you. You're the only one who didn't know Leonardi. The only one who would rig up a gun trap the way you did. What are you... What are you getting at? When Leonardi opened the door, the bullet went over his head. <laughs> over his head? That's right. You rigged the trap to shoot a normal-sized man. You're the only one here who didn't know Leonardi, didn't know he was a midget. Well, you, you're kidding. <laughs> he, he's a midget? That's right. Still feel like laughing? Well, I, I, well, it, it, it's on me. <laughs> the joke's on me. <laughs> you tried to kill my little pal. And, and there wasn't anything between Tony and him, huh? <laughs> Just friends, like she said. <laughs> Oh, what a laugh, a midget. <laughs> Why, you dirty... Take it easy, Samson. Little Leo's my pal. I'll kill this bum when he wakes up. Never mind, friend. That's the job for the state. And so, dear Helen, my life with the carnival ended and I have come back to you. Beaten, perhaps, but ready to continue my valiant fight against the forces of evil. Justice must prevail. Truth must march ahead to... Oh, Rick. Quiet, I'm auditioning for Portia Face's life. Rick. Hmm. Was that Karen person pretty? Mm Mm-hmm. What kind of a dance did she do? Well, she started by, uh... And then she... Well... Oh. One of those. Mm Mm-hmm. Only more so. Well, I hope you enjoyed yourself. Helen, you're so thoughtful. Rick. Yes, baby? I wonder how I'd be doing that. Doing what? Helen, please. This is more your type. Sweet and lovely. Sweeter than the roses in May. Sweet and lovely, heaven must have sent her my way. 
skies above me Never were as blue as her eyes And she loves me Who would want a sweetest prize When she nestles in my arms so tenderly There's a thrill that words cannot express In my heart a song of love is taunting me Melody haunting me Sweet and lovely Sweeter than the roses in May And she loves me There is nothing more I can say So that's my type, is it? Come here. Mm. Wow. Well. Oh, I guess a man's entitled to change his tune. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Tonight, I'd like to say a special word to users of mineral oil. I know that what you search for is one with an extra heavy body. Well, Rexall mineral oil is refined by a special process to obtain just that. And because it's so exceptionally pure and bland, Rexall mineral oil is non-irritating and non-habit forming. What's more, it's tasteless, odorless, colorless. Next time, try Rexall mineral oil. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Richard Carr, with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Bill Johnstone, Wilms Herbert, Lucille Meredith, Parley Bear, Joe Duval, and Joe Gilbert. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hi, you beautiful. Get lost, Bristlepuss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids. Like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll go stag. That's it. Join the stag line now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Yes, to make girls care. Go stag. Wednesdays this fall, hear Groucho, Gildy, and the Halls of Ivy on NBC. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. This is your Rexall family druggist, speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names, and who recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Rexall MI-31, for example. 
Rexall's popular and versatile mouthwash, gargle, and breath deodorant. Full strength MI-31 kills contacted germs almost instantly, yet will not harm delicate membranes of the mouth and throat. Yes, for a dependable, refreshing mouthwash, remember Rexall MI-31. And remember also, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, we never say die. Mr. Diamond? That's right. How would you like to make $1,200? Do I have to name the mystery melody? This is not a quiz show, Mr. Diamond. I have a proposition for you, a business arrangement by which you may profit to the tune of $1,200. Oh, well, that's my favorite tune. My name is Evans, Dr. William Evans. I have an office in the Grant Professional Building, Suite 409. Grant Professional Building, Suite 409. Yes, I, uh, I'd appreciate it if you would come right over. Well, it's after six now. I I'll don't... stay in my office until you get here. And so as to save time with explanations... On your way over, pick up a late afternoon times and read the article on page three, column two. A story about a man called Farmer. I locked the office, went downstairs and out on the street where I purchased the late afternoon times. And in the cab, headed for Dr. Evans' office, I read the article on page three, column two. George Farmer burns to death. And a picture of the deceased. According to the article, Farmer had been on a vacation in the North Woods. He'd gone to sleep smoking a cigarette, and that was that. Mattress caught fire. Before anyone noticed, the whole cabin was burning. My cab led me out in front of Dr. Evans' building, and one look at the large crowd, plus the very familiar black sedan and the passenger loading zone, tied my stomach in a knot. All right, now, get back, you. You! You! Evening, Sergeant Otis. Lieutenant, what are you yelling about, Mellonhead? Oh. Evening, Lieutenant Levinson. Oh, no. I hope you were just passing by, Mr. Diamond. I saw the crowd, Lieutenant Levinson, and came over to find out if you and Otis were playing hopscotch or possibly kick the can. This is a swell time to make with the jokes. Some guy took a dive out of the fourth floor window. Fourth floor? Dead? Very. Name was Evans. Had offices in the building. Dr. William Evans. <laughs> Guy named Evans. Offices on the fourth floor. Doctor. Some guy. Just 20 minutes before, he'd called me with a $1,200 proposition. And now it looked like the only thing I was going to get out of the deal was a late afternoon paper and a story about a guy named Farmer. Farmer? Burned to death and bad? Oh, yeah. We got a report on the case. Well, this Dr. Evans was hooked up with it in some way. He offered you $1,200? He asked me if I was interested. Silly boy. There's the doctor's office. And uh, there's the window he went out of. Who saw him jump? Bill Mitchell, cop on the beat. Saw the body come out of the window feet first. Said at least it looked like he jumped. No sign of a struggle? I'll have the boys give the room a good going over. Well, we're pretty sure of two things, Walt. First, there's a strong possibility that Dr. Evans didn't commit suicide. Also, that he knew something about George Farmer, the guy who got burned to death. Might have been Farmer's doctor. Well, there's one way to find out. This uh, Times article says that Farmer left a widow. While you're checking things here, I think I'll go see what Mrs. Farmer's views are on dead husbands and dead doctors. Yes? Mrs. Farmer? Yes, what is it? I'd like to talk to you about your late husband. Are you from the police again? Well, I just left them, but this is my own idea. My name's Diamond. I'm a private detective. Oh? You working for the insurance company? No. Well, then just what do you want? I'm tired of questions about my husband's death. I've told the police and insurance company everything I know. Well, I know it's been difficult, but I won't take long, and there are a few things I'd really like to find out. Well, what are they? Do you know a Dr. Evans? Dr. Evans? No. No, I don't know any Dr. Evans. Your husband never mentioned him, said he knew him? No, he didn't. Besides, what has this doctor to do with my husband? Oh, I don't know yet. You mentioned an insurance company. Was your husband insured, Mrs. Farmer? 
Yes, with the National Mutual. But if you're not working for the insurance company or the police, who are you working for? Me. You? Look, would you mind telling me what possible interest you could have in the death of my husband? Tell you the truth, I really don't know. But there are $1,200 mixed up in it somewhere, and that's enough to keep me well interested until I find some answers. Thank you, Mrs. Farmer. Hello, Walt. Hello, Rick. You see the wife? Yeah, lovely girl. Hype you'd like to bring home to Mom. You'll find out anything? Nothing in the room to indicate the doctor was pushed out of the window. Mrs. Farmer didn't know the doctor. Said her late husband didn't either. But uh, she thought at first I was from an insurance company. Well, what company? Oh, a national mutual. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Got the names of the officials in National Mutual? Yeah. Bring them in. Right. Why all the action? We checked with the dead doctor's nurse. She said aside from his regular practice, he worked for two or three big insurance firms. National Mutual was one of them. I didn't think of a connection then, but I made the check just in case. Well, George Farmer was burned to death. Dr. Evans knew something about Farmer. Farmer was insured with the National Mutual, and the doctor worked for National Mutual. Might be a tie-up. The vice president of National Mutual is Arthur Peterson. It's not too late. Let's take a run over to his house and see if he knows anything about it. Well, gentlemen, in answer to your questions, yes, we did insure the late George Farmer, and Dr. Evans does work for us. As to whether or not he was the doctor who examined Farmer, I really couldn't say. I'd like to check the files. Lieutenant, aren't you satisfied? You think there's something wrong? We don't know. Dr. Evans jumped or was pushed out of his office window this evening. Good Lord. He called Mr. Diamond here and indicated he knew something about Farmer's death. Have you settled the claim with Mrs. Farmer yet? No, but it's to be settled within the week. $25,000 policy. Hmm. If someone could show your company that Farmer's death was no accident, there'd be a reward, wouldn't there? Yes. Ten percent of the policy. In this case, twenty-five hundred. Oh, half of that'd be about twelve hundred. You uh, think we could look at your records tonight, Mr. Peterson? It's uh, very important. I, of course. I'll just get a coat and we'll go right down to the office. We left with Mr. Peterson and headed for the offices of the National Mutual. A quick look through the file showed us what we wanted. A full report on the state of George Farmer's health. Okayed for insurance by the examining physician, Dr. William Evans. It's too bad the first claim on an action policy has to be a death. Well, that ties that up. Now what have we got? Enough to keep on looking. I think I'll go have a long talk with Farmer's wife. Our company detectives checked that. She was right here in the city when her husband died. Well, a little talk won't hurt. Who sold Farmer the policy, Mr. Peterson? Um, well, um, according to the files, the insurance man was Martin Ames. You have his address here? Yes. Here you are. Good man. One of our leading salesmen. While you're talking with Mrs. Farmer, Walt, I think I'll run over and see this man Ames. Maybe he can do us some good. If the late Dr. Evans hadn't offered me $1,200, I would have okayed his four-floor dive as an act of suicide. But the way things were shaping up, he was going to split an insurance reward. And knowing doctors to be pretty practical people, I just couldn't imagine him giving up that kind of money for a fast trip to the sidewalk. The home of Martin Ames was an apartment on the Lower East Side. His wife answered the door. No, my husband isn't here. I was just leaving. Uh, you know where I can find your husband, Mrs. Ames? It's rather important. I don't know what you want, but if you want to see my husband, that's where I'm going now. I just got a call. He's had an automobile accident. Miss? Yes, I'm Mrs. Ames. I was told my husband. Oh, yes, Miss Ames. If you'll just have a seat, I'll call Dr. Tully. He's in charge of your husband's case. But I want to see my husband. Can I see him? You'll have to see Dr. Tully first. But I want to know how serious it is. I should be with my husband if, if it's you... serious. Just be patient for a moment, Miss Ames. I'll get Dr. Tully. Come on, Mrs. Ames. Let's sit down over here. 
Now, uh, just sit down right over here and try and relax. Dr. Turley, third floor right. reception room, please. Uh, uh, hello, Walt. Dr. Turley, third floor reception room, No, this is a police officer, Miss Ames. Police officer? He's a friend of mine, Miss Ames. Nothing about my husband. Dr. Tully's the man you want to see. Uh, can I talk with you, Rick? Oh, sure. Will you excuse me, Miss Ames? Oh, yes, of course. You'll be all right? I'll, I'll be all right. Okay, Walt. Well, this far north. About her husband? Yeah, I was questioning Mrs. Farmer when I got the call over the hot shot. I remembered, so I figured you'd wind up here. Have you heard how he is? Died five minutes ago. Oh, no. Accident? Hit and run. Before he died, he told us a car ran him off the road. Went down a 20-foot embankment and right into a cement retaining wall. The wall stopped him from going any further but broke his neck. Any lead on the other car? No, a lonely stretch of road. No one else saw it. It happened too fast for Ames. Now, wait a minute. That must be Dr. Tully going over to Mrs. Ames now. Yeah, Mrs. Ames, Tully. I'm afraid that... He I'm did everything he could. I don't envy him. Your Ms. husband is dead. Oh, no. Mrs. Ames. Oh, dear Mrs. God, Ames, please no. control yourself, Mrs. Ames. Come on, Walt. This is turning into a rotten case. <laughs> Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. I often think that perhaps the most common under-the-weather complaint in the average family is either acid stomach or plain old sluggishness. Well, you certainly hit the nail on the head as far as my family is concerned. And I'm also sure that's why there are literally millions of bottles of Rexall milk of magnesia on hand right now in family medicine cabinets. Why, that sounds almost unbelievable. No, ma'am. Not when you know that Rexall milk of magnesia is both a quick-acting antacid and a thoroughly effective yet gentle laxative. What's more, Rexall milk of magnesia has none of that unpleasant, earthy, gritty taste. Say, my family would really appreciate that. Then why not let them see for themselves just how creamy smooth and actually pleasant-tasting Rexall milk of magnesia really is? Ask for it at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. A little after six, I got a phone call, and by 6.30, the man who called was lying on a sidewalk, broken in two from a four-story drop. Two hours later, an insurance salesman named Ames was run off the road and ended up with a broken neck. Coincidence? Not a bit. Walt found the location of the place where George Farmer had burned to death. Then we climbed in the squad car and started the long drive for the Catskills. Around 7 in the morning, we turned off the main highway and onto a dirt road. A sign reading, Sportsman's Retreat, two miles, pointed the way. And 20 minutes later, we were pulling up in front of the lodge. Morning. Morning. Welcome to Sportsman's Retreat. Morning. Oh, Police car, ain't it? I'm Lieutenant Levinson, 5th Bracing, New York Police. This is Mr. Diamond. Oh, howdy, howdy. Oh, yeah. Are you up here about Mr. Farmer's death? Unofficially. You run the place? Yeah, yeah, I'm the foreman. My name's Pop, Pop Sloan, but everybody just called me Pop. We thought we'd stay a while, Pop. Can you put us up? Well, sure, sure. How long you figured on being around? Oh, not long. We only brought one change of clothes. Well, come on in. Breakfast was an hour ago, but if you're hungry, I can have the cook rustle up some bacon and eggs. Oh, sounds good. Many people staying here, Pop? Oh, about 14. Yeah, 14. Same crowd comes up every year. Sort of a club, you might call it. Uh, uh, how many years did George Farmer come up? Oh, Mr. Farmer come up about, uh, oh, for the last 10 years. Hey, who owns the place? Mr. Phillips. He ain't here now, but he phoned and says he'll be in sometime this afternoon. Say, how come you fellas are interested in Mr. Farmer's death? We had the police and the insurance up here for three days. You're a little late, ain't you? Well, uh, there are a few things we haven't cleared up. Sure appreciate some help, Pop. Yeah, just sure. I'll give you all the help I can. I'll go get some breakfast for you, and then we can gab a little while. Hmm? Pop went back to the kitchen, and we relaxed in a couple of big leather chairs in front of a large window that looked out on a row of cabins. That last cabin must have been Farmer's. Yeah, nothing much left of it. <sighs> it's beautiful up here. 
Look at those trees with the sun shining through them. Your soul is showing, Walt. Oh. It was a beautiful place, all right. The cabin stood in the clearing, fronted by well-kept paths and backed by tall trees. Pop came in a little later with enough bacon and eggs to feed a platoon of tapeworms, and we talked. Where is everybody, Pop? Out fishing. Get up about 4.30 around here. Many of the men bring their wives? Oh, some of them. Mr. Farmer used to bring his one up every year. Fine-looking woman, Mrs. Farmer. Didn't come up this year, though. It's too bad, too. Why? Well, might have saved him. Used to smoke in bed all the time. Maybe if she'd been around here, she might have caught him at it. Uh, who discovered the fire? Oh, we all saw it, but it was too late. By the time we got there, the whole place was burning. By the time we got the hose going, there wasn't much left. You say you all saw it. Where were you? Oh, we was up to Willow Peak cooking out. That's about three miles from camp. You can see it from there. See? See that tall peak there to the left of them trees? Yeah. How come Farmer didn't go along? Oh, he never went on many hikes. Had trouble with his legs, you know. Anyone stay here in camp besides Farmer? No, no, no. no. Everybody was up at Willow Peak. Mm. Who examined the body? Doc Combs from Evanston come up and looked at the body. Where's Evanston? Mm, about 50 miles east. But if you want to talk to the doc, you'll have to wait till everybody comes in from fishing. Oh, God. Is he up here now? Yeah, yeah. Come up last night. Gonna stay a week for the fishing. Oh, Pop. Oh, oh well, good uh, morning, morning, Mr. Phillips. Good morning. <laughs> I didn't expect you till this afternoon. This, uh, this is Mr. Phillips, the owner. Oh, I have some bags out in the car. Uh, will you get them, please? Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Right, uh, good morning. Yeah, there's some more police fellas, Mr. Phillips. Oh, uh, about Mr. Farmer's death? Yeah, I've got to clear up a few things. Uh, would you please get those bags for me, Pop? Bags? <laughs> oh, oh yes, bags. Sure, <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, we bags. just wanted to ask a couple of questions, Mr. Phillips. I'm Lieutenant Levinson. and this is Mr. Dunn. <laughs> well, how do you do? How, how do you do? Uh, do you mind if I sit down? Well, not at all. Uh, I, uh... I thought the authorities were satisfied. No, I guess they are. Uh, where were you when the accident occurred, Mr. Phillips? Oh, uh, I was on my way here from the city. I arrived about an hour later. You live in the city, Mr. Phillips? Well, yes, I have a house there. I divide my time between there and the lodge. Tell me something about Farmer, Mr. Phillips. What kind of a man was he? Well, You uh, fellas want any more breakfast? Uh, no, uh, no, thanks, sir. Oh, uh, uh, Go ahead, Mr. Phillips. <laughs> Good old Bob. Uh, well, there really isn't much to tell. Farmer was a nice sort of a guy, rather quiet. As you know, he had a very bad habit of smoking in bed. You have any trouble with him smoking in bed before? Oh, yes, several times. Nearly started a fire two years ago. Well, uh, wouldn't that make you watch him a little more closely? Well, uh, you see, his wife came up with him every year, but this one, she was usually near enough to prevent any trouble. How long did he usually stay here? A whole week, ten days, however long his vacation lasted. Mm-hmm. What was his business? I, I think he was in advertising. Make much money? <laughs> I have no idea. He certainly never spent much. He was tight as the devil. He was known for it, in fact. Coming up here was the only luxury he allowed himself. He'd tell everyone he'd save all year just to come up here and relax for a week or so. Hey, hey, Lieutenant, here comes Doc Combs. He must have got his limit. Oh, you gentlemen interested in talking to the doctor? Yeah, Pop tells us he was the one who examined the body. Well, what'd you get, Doc? Hi, Pop, I got my limit. Oh, good for you, good for you. Come on over here. A couple of fellas want to talk to you. Well, how are you, Phil? Hello, Doc. Uh, Pop said you weren't due until this afternoon. Uh-huh. Oh, uh, this is Lieutenant Levinson and Mr. Diamond. Uh, no. How are you? Uh, police? Yeah, yeah, they want to ask you a few questions. We got to clear up a few things about George Farmer getting burned uh, to death. Oh, Pop, uh, that's hmm? enough, Pop. I was only trying to help. <laughs> well, certainly, gentlemen. Uh, here, will you take these fish, please, Pop? Fish? Hey, hold the fish. Yes, yeah, sure. I'll be right back. Well, I don't think I could tell you much more than I've already told the police. Did you know George Farmer prior to his death? Oh, yes, over a period of ten years. Did you identify the body? Well, not at first. It was too badly burned. Not at first? You mean you did identify it later? Well, when they told me that George had a broken wrist, I found the broken section of bone and identified it. Broken wrist? Oh, yes, Mr. Diamond. Uh, you see, when George arrived, his lower arm was in a cast. He told us that he'd broken his wrist the week before. What day did he arrive? Uh, Tuesday of last week. Well, put in a call to Otis and have him find out where George Farmer had his broken wrist treated. And most of all, when the accident occurred. Well, what are you getting at, Rick? Then have him find out the date the insurance policy went into effect. Doctor, uh, which wrist was broken? Uh, the right one. And it was in a cast, huh? Mm-hmm. Would you say he could move his fingers well enough to write? Well, depends on how recent the accident. Step on it, Walt. Okay, but I don't get it. <laughs> I talked to Otis. He'll get the information. Call us back. 
Now, would you mind telling me what the devil this is all about? George Farmer had to sign the insurance policy, didn't he? Yeah, but he could have done that with his left hand. An accident policy would cover a broken wrist, wouldn't it? Sure and what? Mr. Phillips, you said Farmer was known to be careful with his money. Yes, that's right. Well, I can vouch for that. I treated him for a cigarette burn three years ago and had a devil of a time collecting. Thanks, Doctor. Well, so what? So what? So if Otis gives us the answers I want, I think I can show you George Farmer was murdered. Murdered? Yeah. And I think I can explain why an insurance salesman and a doctor were killed. <laughs> So we all sat around and waited for my hunch to grow muscles. I kept turning the whole thing over in my mind, and the more I thought, the more the whole thing tied together. Around noon, a call came in from Otis, and Walt gave him the information I needed. There it is. George Farmer broke his wrist on the 26th of last month. He was treated at the Olive Hospital. About three weeks ago. He stayed one night at the hospital and went home. What day did he arrive here, Mr. Phillips? Mm, about the 4th. Uh, two weeks after the accident. He died on the 11th, according to papers. Yes, that's right. He'd been here about a week. When did the insurance policy go into effect, Wall? The 22nd of last month. It went into effect. It wasn't taken out. I said, went into effect. Now, it would cost him a few bucks to have a broken wrist taken care of and spend the night in the hospital, wouldn't it, Doctor? Yes, it would. Remember what the vice president of National Mutual said, Walt? Too bad the first claim on an accident policy had to be death? Yeah. Well, if Farmer had an accident policy, why didn't he put in a claim for his broken wrist? Come on, Walt. We're going back to town and talk to Mrs. Farmer. You got your men spotted around the building? Whole block surrounded. Peterson and Evers are covering the front. Cars at every corner. Is Otis going to play? Well, there's been some complaints about noisy cats in the neighborhood, so I stuck Otis and back in the alley. He'll drive every cat right into the river. You might have made a mistake. One yell out of Otis, and he'll end up with all the shoes in the block. Yeah, here it is. Yes? Yeah. Oh. Uh, mind if we come in, Mrs. Farmer? No, I guess not. Well, what is it this time, Lieutenant? We think your husband was murdered. Well, that's ridiculous. I mean, no, you didn't do it, but you were in on it. You know who did. Are you serious? Very. We just had the lab make a check on the insurance policy. The signature and the fingerprints were from the right hand. Well, of course they were. So your husband didn't have a broken wrist at the time? Well, no, he, he did that sometime later. And you'll swear that it's his signature on the policy? Certainly. I went to the doctor with him. I thought you said you didn't know a Dr. Evans. Well, I don't. He was the insurance doctor. Well, I'd, I'd never seen him before or since. How could you expect me Your to remember... Your husband the... didn't turn a claim for his broken wrist. He didn't? Well, that was his business, wasn't it? Don't you think it's rather strange to take out an accident policy and not turn in a claim on your first accident? I don't know. I didn't bother with my husband's affairs. Is this your husband's driver's license? Where did you get that? Motor vehicle department. Is it your husband's license? Yes, I guess so. The signature on his license is not the same as the one on the insurance policy. What do you mean? He means that the signature on the insurance policy is a very clever forgery. Who forged it, Mrs. Farmer? I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. Who went to that doctor's office representing your husband? No one. Why in the world would I do that? Why would I have someone represent my husband? Probably because you wanted your husband out of the way. That's horrible. Get out of here. That's not true. Who was in on it with you? Who killed your husband up at his cabin at the lodge? Get out. Get out. It had to be someone at the lodge who knew what cabin he was in. No, 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 no. Did you get the papers your husband's picture? Yes. You're lying. The newspapers told us you claim not to have a picture. Well, I, I, I don't remember. I don't remember. Oh, sure you do. You didn't want to give the papers a picture of your husband because you knew the insurance salesman and the doctor would identify it as not being the man who took out the accident oh, policy. no. You I... knew your husband was going to take his trip, so you planned his death and stayed home for an alibi. The picture came out, and the insurance man and the doctor had to be killed. A man killed them, Mrs. Farmer. Someone strong enough to run a car off the road and lift an unconscious man out of a window feet first. Who killed them, Mrs. Farmer? Hey, you, stop! Stop! Lieutenant! Otis has got something. Well, let's get out of the fire escape. Stop or I'll shoot. There's a new line. Somebody halfway up the fire escape. Look out, Otis! Move over, Walt. Otis could hit a herd of elephants in the broom closet. I got him, Lieutenant. He got him. No, make him happy, Walt. Climb out there and see what we got. Okay. 
Now, just take it easy, honey. Rick! Yeah? <laughs> that guy Phillips, the one who owned the lodge, and he's dead. <laughs> well, Mrs. Farmer, that's it. Want to tell me about it? Oh, yes, it doesn't make any difference now. Phillips killed your husband and the other two men? Yes. We fell in love three summers ago. But he planted the whole thing was his idea. Oh, sure, sure, I know. But the state is pretty narrow-minded about those things, honey. <laughs> guy like that gets ideas and gets dead for it. You like his ideas, and you just got to get in some kind of trouble along the way. Go on, Melonhead. Climb in. You're not hurt that bad. I am told. You get shot, Otis? No. But I'd like to ask you something, Shamus. Did you throw a shoe at me? Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Whenever you're suffering the pain of a headache, remember, there's no faster-acting aspirin made than Rexall aspirin. When swallowed with water, the five full grains of pure aspirin in every Rexall tablet are ready to go to work for you even before they reach your stomach. Ask for Rexall aspirin at Rexall drugstores everywhere. There's no faster-acting aspirin made. And remember... You can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, Wally Mayer, Joan Banks, and Bill Boucher. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime de Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hi, you beautiful. Get lost, Bristlepuss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids. Like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll go stag. That's it. Join the stag line now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Yes, to make girls care. Go stag. Wednesdays this fall, hear Groucho, Gildy, and the Halls of Ivy on NBC. Makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. This is your Rexall family druggist with a welcome from the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names. We've done that because we recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Rexall mineral oil, for example. This is the mineral oil specially refined for extra heavy body. What's more, Rexall mineral oil is tasteless, odorless, colorless, non-irritating, and non-habit-forming. 
Quality like that is what we family druggists are talking about when we tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Uh, just a moment. Diamond. Diamond, pick up the receiver and speak to me or I'll, 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 I'll... Walt, Walt, is that your blood pressure I hear bubbling or are you calling from Niagara Falls? What's the big idea keeping me waiting like that? Well, the big idea is that it's a beautiful day and I'm happy. When I'm happy, I whistle. And when I'm happy and whistling, I don't like to be interrupted. I'll remember that the next time you're unhappy and you ask a favor from me. You can whistle then, too. Oh, the great, big, important police lieutenant wants a favor from poor little old Richard Diamond. I want you to go to a funeral. Yours? No, it's mine. <laughs> Say, I'll live to dance the Charleston on your grave, wise guy. Oh, well, they're burying Bigfoot Grafton this afternoon. How do you know? How do I know? How do I know what? That it's Bigfoot Grafton they're tucking in. The way it read my paper, the Harbor Patrol fished out a guy presumed to be Bigfoot Grafton, boy racketeer. We're satisfied with the identification. Huh? Fingerprints? Fingerprints. Look, the body was in the Hudson River for nearly a week. Oh. Then tell me, what makes you so sure the guy they're putting in the ground today is Grafton? Look, Diamond, you're beginning to exasperate me. Will you or won't you go with us to Bigfoot Grafton's funeral this afternoon? Why me? Maybe you can show the boys how to dig the grave. Oh, Walt, Walt, that's silly. I don't know, a grave from a hole in the ground. So why me? Because you once told me about a little business matter you had with some of Grafton's gang out west. And because some of those same hoods may attend the funeral. And because if any of them do, you'll recognize them. And I can point them out to you. Say, you are a detective. Otis and I'll pick you up in about an hour. Goodbye, Diamond. Goodbye, Bright Eyes. Come on, come on, Billy. How many times have I got to tell you this is the only thing left to do? It's all wrong, Marge. I tell you, there's no need to call in a private eye. Well, hello, girl. Who are you? The name's on the door. Your diamond? Ah. Uh, you see something you don't like? Yeah, you. Oh, you'll never be lovely, be engaged, or get to use puns with an attitude like that. It's a waste of time, Marge, a waste of time. Lay off it, Billy. I know what's right. We came a long way to see you, Diamond. All the way from West Frampton we came. We're ducklings. Well, first impressions are so deceiving. I almost thought you were girls. Now, look, there's a psychiatrist just down the hall who... Get this, Billy. The guy thinks we're nuts. Well, maybe you are a couple of ducks, and I'm the one who's crazy. Not ducks. Ducklings. Oh. Well, then if you have that kind of a problem, go to the Audubon Society. You never heard of the Long Island Ducklings? All we done was win the pennant last year. Pennant? Oh, baseball? Now it's coming. We're a girls' softball team. We got our own park out in West Frampton. I play third base. Who's on first? Me. Come on, let's get out here, Marge. We'll stay. We gotta find Lottie, and he's gotta help us. Lottie? Lottie Wyrachek, our second baseman. She's been missing almost a week now. We can't win without our second baseman. Oh, yes. I can see where it must leave quite a gap between first base and shortstop. We ain't gonna win the pennant again unless we get Lottie back, Diamond. We gotta have her. You're elected. Elected? I'm not even sure I accept the nomination. See, let's go, Marge. You don't want the job, Diamond? Well, I've never looked for a missing second baseman before. I wouldn't know where to begin. A fine detective. Here, you, you begin by looking at her snapshot. Oh, no, no, girls. Really, I'm terribly busy right now. I've got to go to a funeral and help the police department look with it. Look at her picture. But I tell you, I... 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 Don't tell me this is... Lottie Wirechick. You mean a girl who looks like this wastes her nights playing second base? Yeah. Wastes, he says. Diamond, stop drooling. You take the job? Well, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted, yes. I'm, I'm very tempted. <clears throat> now, let's, uh, let's get some answers first. I ask Billy. She's her roommate. All right. Now, think back, Billy, to a day or so before she disappeared. Uh, she seemed worried about anything? Nervous? Upset? No. Why, she even hit two home runs the very last night she played. She did, huh? Well... I wonder if... Oh, no, no, that isn't possible. The Dodgers do a lot of things, but they wouldn't kidnap people. You say she's been with the team two years? Yeah. Diamond, what sort of questions are these? Please, Lefty. It's my turn at bat. Now, Billy, 
What did she do before she became a second baseman? Who knows? You'll find her for us? For you? <laughs> oh, no. For me. They gave me a pass for the game that night with the Amagants at Amazon's, informed me how to get out to West Frampton the quickest way of the E-train flies, then exploded themselves out, leaving me with a snapshot of a second baseman who looked like Jane Russell, only more so. I wasn't able to dream too long because soon the door opened and I looked up to find the most beautiful gabardine suit I'd ever seen walking toward my desk on the frame of the ugliest hoodlum I'd ever seen. Hey, you Diamond? To some people. To others, I'm Mr. Diamond. Oh, Diamond. Mr. Diamond. The late Mr. Diamond. Yeah, that's the one I like the best. All right, parrot puss. Who's been eating your crackers? All right, comic. I'm just a boy with a message. Spill it. You had visitors, huh? Yeah? Yeah. A couple of overgrown tomatoes. A couple of tomatoes that look more like they belong to the Russian infantry than to the human race. Well, you're not very much to look at yourself, ugly. Get on with the message. The message is lay off. Don't go looking for no missing girl. You don't wake up with no bullet holes where your eyes ought to be. Huh? That's the message. The whole message. No signature? You don't need no signature, friend. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. Uh, just a minute, Repulsive. Yeah? I want to tell you about the last side of the mouth punk who brought me a message like this without a signature. Go on. Frighten me. Go on. Hey, just stand back there, Diamond. Don't come no closer. I'll let you... Don't reach into that pocket, punk. Oh, my arm! Now, let me get it for you. Ah, a luger. And almost as ugly as you are. We won't be needing it for this game. My arm! My arm! Oh, there's your arm. Now, put it up with the other one and I'll knock your head off. A few seconds later, when I picked myself up off the floor, I looked around for my spar mate, but he'd taken his arms and gone home, leaving me with an eye which for weeks to come would have me lying to people about walking into a door. Yeah, a door wearing gabardine. Uh, How'd you get that shiner, Diamond? I walked into a door, Walt. A door with a fist at the end of it. Where is this cemetery, South Carolina? We'll be there soon. Bigfoot Grafton won't mind waiting a little longer. Assuming, Sergeant Otis, that it is Bigfoot Grafton they're planting. Oh, no, you're not going to start that again. I told you on the phone. We're satisfied with the identification. What identification? Laundry marks and Grafton shirt. Cleaning marks and Grafton suit. Go on. What do you mean, go on? Look, Walt, suppose you're wanted for murder. Two murder raps. You don't have a chance of beating and suppose that next to the mailman with the income tax refunds, you're the most looked-for guy in the country. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're going to say, Diamond. You think maybe Grafton finds a sucker with his same general build, shoots him in the spine, changes clothes with him, and then dumps him in the big bathtub. That's right, Walt. Well, us silly, confused, homicide cops figured that way, too. Until we checked up on what gave Grafton his nickname. His nickname? Bigfoot. Yeah. yeah. Fourteen and a half. We found his shoemaker. He verified the signs. So? So it's possible that Grafton can find a guy that fits his general physique. It's even possible that the guy he finds not only is built the same way body-wise, but wears exactly size 14 and a half Brogans, too. Yeah, it's possible. But highly improbable. Yeah, maybe you're right at that. Well, on behalf of myself and all the other simple-minded fellows known as cops, thank you, Diamond, for saying what you just did. Thank you. There's the cemetery. It was just a simple little funeral. Except that the coffin cost maybe $10,000 more than mine will ever cost. And excluding the fact that there were enough flowers to make a couple of dozen floats for the turnip of roses parade. Yes, it was just a simple little funeral with maybe a thousand simple little mourners. Good conservative people... Like safe blowers, burglars, con men, petty thieves, and some not so petty. Big wheels, little wheels, chiselers, grifters, grafters, jip artists. Well, Diamond, you see anyone who used to run with Grafton's mom? No, not yet. Hey, now look. Now, what's he doing here? Oh. The parrot nose in the stylish gabardine suit. I've been admiring that suit. Gabardine, huh? Too bad a poor little gabardine had to go give up its life just so a mug like that could have a suit. Where are you going, Diamond? Who is that guy? He's a messenger boy. I'll be right back. I edged my way through the crowd toward him, 
Hoping that in view of the solemnity of the occasion, none of the pickpockets among the mourners would make use of the opportunity to swipe my suspenders. Five yards away, he turned. He saw me and started to run. I put my head down like a sprinter and turned to follow. There's nothing like a merry chase in a merry place like a cemetery. And just when I thought I had him... Ooh! What are you doing running into tombstones? Oh, well, I suddenly remembered it's been years since I had a collision with a tombstone. Oh, what were you chasing that guy with a fancy suit for? I wanted to find out who his tailor is. Look, uh, Otis got a good look at that twerp I was chasing. Tell him to go through Rogue's Gallery and try to identify him for me, huh? Yeah, but where are you going? Me? No, I think I'll go to a ball game. <laughs> It was a good game as games go, fast and exciting, and my girls did themselves proud. Eight to three. Even though the girl who was playing second in place of the missing Lottie made three errors. After the game, I was in the corridor outside the dressing room talking to Billy, the first baseman. The one who didn't think I should have been hired to bird dog the missing girl. Look, Diamond, this is all for nothing. Lottie ain't missing. We never called on you. There's no case. Now, that's the same tune with a slightly different lyric and ugly in a gabardine suit sang to me. It's a good thing I'm stubborn. It's a bad thing, Diamond, for you. It's going to maybe cost you your life. No. No. Don't. It happened that fast. By the time I turned around to see who did the shooting, he had disappeared in the crowd. Dirty heel. Diamond, what happened? I heard shooting. Stand back, everybody. Send for a doctor. Oh, my God. He grabbed me. I was on his team. Who, Billy? Who? I told him, Marge, called on you to find Lottie. Who, dear? They'll kill Lottie. They'll kill Lottie. Billy. Uh, uh, Billy. Diamond. Is she? Is she? If anyone asks you who's on first, the answer is no one. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. I've discovered lately that a lot of people think they don't need to take any precautions against vitamin deficiency during the summer months. But the truth is, we're just as apt to be low on vitamins during the summer as any other season. Then you think people should continue right through the summer taking a vitamin supplement? Indeed I do, ma'am. And the one I recommend is Rexall Plenamins. Why exactly? Well, just two plenamin capsules a day give you more than your minimum daily requirement of every vitamin for which such requirements have been established, plus valuable liver concentrate and iron, plus other beneficial factors of the vitamin B complex. Say, with all that, they must be expensive. On the contrary, plenamins cost you only pennies per day. Ask for plenamins at any Rexall drugstore. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name... Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond, this department isn't in operation so that you can find girls. I don't care how she looks in her baseball uniform. Oh, but this is business, Walt. I tell you, she's been kidnapped. Another girl on the team was just murdered. Another murder? Where? West Frampton. West who? Frampton, out on Long Island. City limits? No. Uh, that's the quickest case I ever marked closed. What do you want to waste my time with imported homicides for? Don't I have enough to do right here? Oh, but Walt... Don't got... butt me. They've been knocking each other off like flies this week. We're so jammed up, I got three stiffs that don't even have a place to lie down. Four, if you include Otis. Oh, just for that wise guy, I ain't talking. Oh, if I could only be sure of that. I mean, I ain't talking about the guy you played tag with in the cemetery. I found him in the picture book, all right, Diamond. It took me two hours. And just for making cracks at me, I ain't telling you his name. Whose name? Joe Gabardine's, that's whose. And I ain't telling you what else I found out about him in the picture book either. Why not? Because you think you're smarter than the whole police department put together. That's why not. Oh. And so if I go spill to you that this Joe Gabardin used to work as a gunsel for the late Bigfoot Grafton, you're going to right away say Bigfoot Grafton ain't dead after all. 
and that I'm a dope. Walt, you hear that? The guy that threatened me if I went looking for Lottie Wirecheck, this Joe Gabardine, is one of Grafton's boys. Say, who told you? Was one of Grafton's boys. Grafton's dead. No, but maybe not. Maybe all these shenanigans are part of Grafton's plot to put some sucker in his coffin and stay undercover. Sure, sure. Maybe Lottie Wirecheck knew in some way or other that the guy they fished out of the river and buried today wasn't Grafton. Look, Walt, you got a... Uh, 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 Diamond, help me. Uh, that name you said, the, the one that sounds like something spelled backwards. Wirecheck? That's funny. What's funny? That's the same name as this dame's in the file missing person sent over. Only this one's name is Lottie Wirecheck. So is this one, you dope. You mean there's two dames with a name like that? Yeah, just like there are two heads on a sergeant named Otis Loveloon. Now, listen here. Who reported her missing? Just for being a fresh guy, I ain't going to tell you. You ain't going to tell him what? That it says here on the file card that this doctor reported her missing. Who said anything about a doctor? Huh? You sick, Otis? You need a doctor? I ain't sick. Besides, he ain't that kind of doctor. He's a dentist. Who's a dentist? This Dr. Alman. Dr. Percy Alman. 223 Park Avenue. So? What do you mean, so? What about him? What do you mean? What about him? Well, you brought him into the conversation. Dr. Percy Alman. You said 223 Park Avenue. What made you mention him if you don't have anything to say about him? He's the guy who reported this laddie watch him a check missing, you dope. Gee, Diamond, are you dumb? Dr. Percy Alvin's home for decrepit teeth at 223 Park Avenue was a fancy schmancy establishment where bad little molars and becuspids went in for punishment. I could tell even before I met Alman that he was the kind of drill artist who assured the customers there'd be no pain. No pain at all, and there usually wasn't. Until the customers got their bills. The office was a ground floor professional suite that opened directly on the street, and when I pushed open the door and went in... This kind of nice middle-aged guy greeted me with... Yes? I'm, uh, looking for Dr. Alman. I'm Dr. Alman. But it's after my office hours, young man, unless it's an emergency. Well, it's, uh, it's about Lottie. Lottie Wirecheck. Lottie? You're from the police. You found her. Well, not yet, no. And I'm not from the police. Not... Who are you? My name is Diamond. I'm a private investigator. Oh. <laughs> you gave me quite a turn for a moment. Well, I'm sorry. Doctor, I'd like you to tell me a few things. What sort of things? Lottie Wirecheck. What's she to you? Oh, presently just a friend. Uh, formerly the best dental assistant I ever had. An extremely nice girl. Yeah, yes, I, uh, I saw her snapshot. A dental assistant, huh? Yeah, lovely, lovely girl. Um, I hated to lose her. But this baseball thing had been burning in her for a long time. Look, Diamond, just how much do you know about all this? Uh, I know that Lottie's missing. Maybe in trouble. Well, uh, I do need help, and perhaps I'd better tell you everything. I'm game. But I think I should warn you, the information I'm going to give you is dangerous. It may mean your life. Well, I'm uh, still game. Maybe not as much as a few seconds ago, but... Very well. A year or so ago, I had a patient, a man who called himself Dunn. George Dunn. And then you found out that Dunn wasn't Dunn at all. That he had very big feet and he was a racketeer named Grafton. Yes. You're a very clever, Diamond. It was a gentle chart he wanted. He threatened me. I felt that if I ever gave it to him, he'd feel the necessity for for killing me. So I gave the chart to Lottie to keep him here. It happened so fast, I barely had time to leap behind a chair. One second, the doctor and I were talking. The next, everything was bedlam and confusion. And blood and death and anger. My anger. The doctor had caught one smack between the eyes. And I got mad, shooting mad. I charged out of that office maybe ten seconds behind the killer, just in time to see him get into a car and melt away into the traffic. He headed east, then south and east again, then stopped at a crummy-looking building and went in. And that's when smart, shrewd, clever private detective Diamond climbed a drain pipe, tore his pants, looked inside a second-floor window, saw a girl tied to a chair, and like Lockenbar, broke in to rescue the fair second baseman in distress. Lottie? Look out! Oh. oh, this was getting monotonous. The billy caught me on the back of the neck, and while it didn't knock me out, it didn't make me feel like dancing either. The first thing I was aware of when I oriented myself to my new condition was the biggest pair of feet I'd ever seen. 
And the next thing I saw was the gabardine suit containing in its bright, clean folds the filthiest little murder artist I'd ever seen. So I made like a possum and pretended I was asleep. So, say, Grafton, I told you the shamus followed me. I won him. He's all yours, Joe, I promise, but later. Why later? Why wait? Because I gotta get that dental chart, that's why. Now that you've rubbed off the dentist and that goofy Billy the ball player, that chart's the only thing in the world that can prove Bigfoot Grafton's still alive. So why does that have to hold up Diamond's execution? Because maybe he knows where the dental chart's hid. I'm giving up on the dame here. She'd have told us long ago if she knew. If Diamond knows, he'll talk. Even if he don't know, he'll talk. And scream, too. Later, Joe. Now put that pig sticker back in your pocket. I don't hear you, Grafton. This Diamond made me unhappy, and I don't like to wait. I said put that knife away, Joe. I still don't hear you. All right, Joe. I I knew this was the only chance I'd get. They were too busy showing each other their fangs to give me their undivided attention. And so the possum stopped playing possum and made a stab at playing tiger. The act started with a well-aimed kick to what the fight reporters call the midsection. (laughs) And the gabardine suit folded limply and sagged to the floor like it didn't even have a man inside it. And that's when Grafton pulled the gun, and that's when I made a grab for his knee. And you guessed it, there was a shot. And then there was a punch that made a mess out of a jawbone. And I'm happy to report that this time it wasn't mine. Oh, you're wonderful. What's your name? Well, honey, my name's Diamond. Diamond? Yes, dear, and believe me, a diamond is a girl's best friend. And anyone tell you I was a lonely one tell you I used to lie awake and wonder if there could be a someone in the wide world just made for me now I see I had to save my love for you I never gave my love till you and through my lonely heart demanding it Cupid took a hand in it. I hadn't any one to you. You're so romantic, even with a black eye. Oh, thank you, dear. Oh, Ricky, darling, it must have been dreadful. Oh, it uh, it had its moments, Helen. Yes, I saw that photograph. The second baseman. What's the matter with the second baseman? Well, Ricky, if she were any good, wouldn't she be a first baseman? Honey, honey, I don't think you understand too much about baseball. Teach me. Oh, it takes years, baby. Years. Well. Hmm? Well, uh, well, baseball's a game that's, uh, that's, uh, divided into innings. Nine innings. Innings? What's an innings? Maybe I better teach you how to play post office. No, no. Ricky, please. Well, uh... Well, uh, let's see now. An inning is a, a sort of a division, a, a stanza, a, a, a frame. Yeah, that's right, a frame. A frame? An inning's a frame? Hey, you're digging it. No, I'm not, Ricky, not really. Maybe we'd better forget it. All right, all right. An inning is a frame. That's right, dear. An inning is a frame. Hmm. Ricky, was she nice? Lottie? Mm-hmm. Well, I'll say this for her. She sure had a beautiful inning. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Don't wait until you're already suffering from acid stomach and then wish you had Bismarex on hand. Buy a bottle tomorrow. This famous Rexall antacid often neutralizes excess acidity within one minute. 
More than that, Bismarck's gives relief that's continuous and prolonged because its scientifically balanced ingredients work in sequence, easing gastric distress and leaving a soothing protective covering on irritated stomach membranes. Ask your Rexall druggist for Bismarck's. He'll tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Michael Camroy with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, John Daner, Bill Conrad, Virginia Gregg, Gloria Blondell, and Sidney Miller. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hiya, beautiful. Get lost, Bristlepuss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids, like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll go stag. That's it. Join the stag line now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Yes, to make girls care. Go stag. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Dick Powell, who stars as Richard Diamond each week at this time, is a chime star... And there are many more of your favorite entertainers who are chime stars on NBC. Listen for the familiar NBC chimes. They're your invitation to fine radio entertainment. Whether it's action-packed adventure mystery, comedy, music, drama, or news, you'll find the very best on your favorite NBC station. Listen again next Wednesday at this same time for another exciting adventure with Dick Powell starred as Richard Diamond. And remember, three chimes mean good times on NBC. In two weeks, enjoy the Halls of Ivy with Ronald Coleman on NBC. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This is your Rexall family druggist speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names and who recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Rexall aspirin, for example. There's no faster-acting aspirin made than Rexall aspirin. When swallowed with water, Rexall aspirin is ready to go to work for you even before it reaches your stomach. Quality like that is what we family druggists are talking about when we tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now, your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, 
starring Dick Powell. No, no, no. Oh. Yeah? Well, what's the matter with you? Oh, hello, Helen. Nothing has gone right all day. I called your office, but you left an hour ago. What took you so long getting home? Well, I had to stop by the laundry. Didn't have any clean shirts. Are you forgetting we're supposed to be at my mother's at seven? No, honey, I'm not forgetting. What time is it now? A little after six. No, nuts. What in the world's wrong? Well... First of all, I haven't seen anything that looks like a client for two weeks. That's unusual. I only got two hours sleep last night. You're complaining. Oh, no, 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 honey. Then what is it? Well, that stupid laundry gave me the wrong bundle. I can't go over to your mother's with my bare chest hanging out. Well, can't you go back and get the right bundle? Well, it closes at six. Oh, be practical. It was the laundry's fault, so use one of the shirts out of the wrong bundle. They'll have it clean. No, what if it doesn't fit? Make it fit. Now, I won't have you being late again. No, well, all right, all right. I'll see you at seven. I still love you. Then tell your mother not to suggest Monopoly again. I have to get some sleep tonight. The shirt wasn't bad. A little short in the arms, but with my charm bracelet, no one would notice. I shaved, cussed a little, showered, cussed some more. Really let loose with some choice ones while I got dressed and kept it up all the way over to Helen's. She walked out in a green number that plunged so far it could have been arrested for attempted suicide. Sure cure for cussing. Like it? The guy who went off the Golden Gate didn't have half to drop. Oh, stop perspiring and come on. Helen's mother lived in a 40-room vault on Long Island. We had a wonderful dinner. Soup, salad, pheasant on the glass. The only thing missing was cracked crab. Until Helen's mother suggested Monopoly, then I nearly shelled her and ducked her in the mustard. About one o'clock, my eyes felt like two, three-minute eggs lost in a sand pile, so I gave up and went to sleep right in the middle of a tricky trade for my railroad. Helen apologized, looked at me hatefully when I suggested a piggyback ride to the car, and by two o'clock, she dropped me in front of my flat on 53rd. You were horrible. Oh, well, how did I know your mother had the electric company, too? Oh, no. I'll talk to you tomorrow. All right. Kiss. Well, you can't even keep your eyes open. This is going to stop me. I do my best work with my eyes closed. No. All right. Honey, are you growing a beard? That's my mink coat. Oh. Night. Good night. Um. <sighs> Diamond? Yeah. What do you want? I got some laundry that belongs to you. Well, that's nice. Nothing like getting your laundry at 2 o'clock in the morning. You got mine. We'll stop around about noon tomorrow and we'll swap. I'd like it now, friend. I gotta leave town. Oh, look, I'm a little tired, friend. I want the laundry. Yeah, well, you're dealing with a bad customer. I just traded Pennsylvania Avenue for one lousy railroad. What? Come back tomorrow, friend, and I'll give you your laundry and a detailed explanation. I want the laundry now. Now, look. You look. Well, if anything could have opened my little old sleepy blue eyes, it's that lovely gun. You look divine together. Now let's go up and get the laundry. What's the matter? You got the only long underwear but sequins? Move. And I moved. Up to my little flat with the laundry man sticking close enough so I wouldn't forget the big gun on his hot little hand. We went in and traded bundles. You opened it, huh? Well, what did you want me to do? Put it on a table and offer up prayers? You're a little too wise for your own good, but... I got what I wanted. No hard feelings. Yeah, well, I hope your socks fall down. You just stay put until I'm out of the building. Thanks, friend. Well, any other time, I might have done something ridiculous, like chasing the guy or calling Walt up and complaining about the inadequacy of the old police department. But this wasn't any other time. It was after two in the morning, and I was tired. Sure, it was unusual to trade laundry at that hour, but I was in no condition to try and figure it out. So I brushed my teeth, left my clothes in a neat pile in the corner, and stumbled into bed. Oh, no, no, I'll never get any sleep. I'm coming, I'm coming. Yeah? Mr. Diamond? 
Yeah, who is it? This is Mr. Green, Mr. Diamond. Well, thanks for calling, Mr. Green. Good night. Oh, wait, wait. Please wait, Mr. Diamond. This is Mr. Green, the man who owns the Blue Bell Laundry. Well, how's business? Well, can you come over to my apartment right away? Why? Someone's going to try and kill me. What time is it? Three o'clock. Look, can't you hide in a closet or something until noon? I tell you, someone's going to kill me. Well, get in the closet and close the door. If anyone opens it, take a bite out of the nearest coat and head for the closest bright Dude, light. This is serious, Mr. Diamond. I haven't got much time. Well, if you don't think you can look like a moth, maybe I'd better drop around. What's your address? Savoy Arms, Apartment C. And hurry, I'm desperate. Well, if you're just half as desperate as I am sleepy, you're really in trouble. I'll be right over. <laughs> I stumbled back into my clothes and downstairs and a quick walk down to park where I could grab a cab. Then ten minutes later, I was knocking at the door of apartment C. No answer. I was about to try the door when it opened. Uh, Mr. Green? You're too late. Mr. Green? He opened the door all right, but that was as far as he got. He just slid down and stretched out on his stomach, head turned sideways, thick glasses pushed up at an angle... His weak eyes trying hard to see everything there was to see before they closed for good. I kneeled down beside him. Jones. Wrong laundry number. Jones. Green. Green. Well, everybody dies. He'd been shot just under the heart from the back. A warm breeze made me turn and look out the open window on the far side of the room leading out to a fire escape. I went over and looked out. Nothing. But it was a good bet that the killer had shot Green from there. I put in a call to Walt, and in ten minutes he was standing over Green. And this is the guy who owns the laundry and gave you the wrong bundle. That's right. How do you always get mixed up in things like this? Well, it's a talent. Did he say who he thought was after him? Oh, he just told me that he was in fear of his life. Now, what about the guy who shoved the gun in your face and took away the bundle of laundry? No, oh, about my size. Had a hat on, light gray suit, brown eyes, heavy eyebrows, high cheekbones, very sharp features. Well, let's go down and run through the gallery, see if we can get an identification. Okay. But first, let's take a run down at the Blue Bell Laundry. Might be a good idea to find out what this is all about. <laughs> Uh, here it is, Lieutenant. Blue Bell Laundry. Oh, he read the sign. Mm. If a guy with fangs and a long black cape answers, drive a stake through his heart. Or shoot him with a silver bullet. You keep your suggestions to yourself, Sergeant, or I'll open this door with your head. Uh, these keys are a better shape. I tell you, we can't use them. If no one answers, then we got to get a search warrant. Why? Because that's the law. What is? That we got to get a warrant to search the laundry. Well, what do you want to search the laundry for? What do I want to search it for? Because a man's just been killed. Okay, so what? What's that got to do with the laundry? The guy who was killed was the guy who owned the laundry. You told me yourself it had something to do with getting the bundles mixed up and that guy who stuck you up tonight. Okay, but you can't just go busting into a laundry just because of a stupid little old hunch. What do you mean, stupid? You could be wrong, you know. Just because you think you might solve this case, that's no reason for you to go busting into a laundry. Well, why not? The answer to this whole thing might just be in that laundry. Well, you've certainly been right in the past. No, oh, not always. Oh, most of the time, Walt. Well, just lucky. Well, if you think it's best, here are the keys. Well, you understand. Right? Oh, sure, sure, Walt. Lieutenant. Yeah? Oh, nothing. You stay out here, Sergeant. Well, we're in. I hope the commissioner doesn't hear about it. About what? Breaking and entering. Breaking and... Why, why, you... You... Fiend? Yes. Walt hopped around for a while until he ran out of steam, and then we went to work and took the laundry apart. The way it stacked up, I had gotten the wrong bundle of laundry. The guy who'd stuck me up in two in the morning had gotten mine. So the bundle that I'd gotten by mistake figured to be pretty important. There must have been something else in there besides clean shirts. So, Green, the owner, made a mistake. Oh, but that's kind of hard to do, Walt. You've got to have a ticket to get your laundry. Ticket with a number on it? Well, sure. It should correspond to the numbers on those bins. Hey, wait a minute, yeah. wait a minute. Before Green died, he said something about a wrong number. And a name. What name? Uh, uh, uh Jones. Jones. Now, look, when I brought my laundry in, Green wrote my name and number down in a book. 
Let's see if we can find that book. Walt took one side of the shop and I took the other. Inside of ten minutes, we had the book. We turned to the page with deliveries dated for the day before and found my name. Now, here it is. Richard Diamond. Uh-huh. Laundry number 99. That's right. That was the number on the ticket I gave him. Then Green didn't make a mistake. But Dean have to to give you the wrong bundle. He couldn't get mixed up with the bins, Mark. Walt, turn that book around. Turn it around? Upside down. Huh. Now, if that number was on a ticket and I handed it to you upside down... 66. Yeah. Who's listed under 66? Say it's not on this page. Uh, here. Well, I'll be... John Jones. No address. John Jones. Green had said Jones before he died. Jones had the laundry ticket marked 66. Green had evidently looked at my ticket upside down and given me Jones's bundle. Green couldn't have known anything important was in that bundle or he wouldn't have made the mistake. Then why was he killed? Doesn't figure. Well, if he was just a go-between, it does. He didn't put the important something in the bundle or he would have just held the bundle until Jones arrived and given it to him. Then the bundle came wrapped with the something in it. Now, now look, Walt. You know how these small places work. They, They send their stuff out to a large laundry and cleaning plant. Yeah, but which one? Hey. Hey, I got a shirt on it from that wrong bundle. I bet he's got a laundry mark. Should be on the collar. Let's see. Well, let's not strangle me, huh? Maybe unbutton a few buttons. Like Scott. Well, go ahead, grabby. Let's see. Yeah, there's some writing on the collar. I'll read it out, and I'll write it down. Uh, eight, six, A, four, five, L. What kind of a laundry number is that? Find out, and you might have the guy who slipped something in that bundle and was responsible for Green's death. We went through the rest of the place, but found no evidence to show us what big plant Green sent his laundry to. I bowed out as gracefully as possible and went home to get some sleep. It was 4 a.m. when I stumbled into my flat with just one thought in mind. Sleep. And I got it in a hurry. Oh, Rick. Mm-hmm. Rick, come on now. Snap out of it. No. Mm-hmm. Come on, come on. Sit up. No, leave me alone. Somebody sapped you. No, I don't care if you split my head in sections. I went to sleep, didn't I? What happened to your shirt? My shirt? All right. Oh. Oh, so that's it. What's it? The shirt. That's what the guy was really after. You suppose it was Jones? Oh, sure it was. Walt, when he when he traded bundles with me, he didn't have any way of knowing that I'd taken a shirt out of it. That shirt was what made that bundle important. Those numbers on the collar. I checked. They weren't a laundry mark. Uh, you still got them? Yeah. Well, they sure mean something. Let's see if we can figure out just what. <laughs> gave Walt a pencil and paper, and we put our two brilliant minds to work trying to figure out the numbers that had been written on the collar of the shirt. Just numbers with two letters, A and L. Easy problem for two brilliant students of criminology. I got it. You have? Let's take the numbers down to the decoding department. Oh, that's what I like. Perseverance, a sharp mind, and nothing's too tough for us. Well, come on. Come on, Art. You've been working on those numbers for nearly five minutes. Well, I've been sick. Could this be a code for some kind of a pickup? Ah, guess it could be. Well, let's use times and dates. First number is eight. Well, today's the eighth day. Well, the letter A could stand for A.M. 6A, 6A.M. Could 88, 6A.M. Then 46L could be the where. Hmm, 46th in any street beginning with L. Out of the way corner. 46th in Lexington, and that's not out of the way. Oh, I'm sure glad you broke that code, Walt. Ah, experience and a little common sense. Come on, you and me are going over to 46th in Lexington. You and I, Walt. I could stand for idiot. That's another <laughs> code, Arch. Fourth letter in Levinson. Oh, come on. We haven't got all morning. <laughs> You're listening to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, brought to you by the makers of Rexall drug products and your Rexall family druggist. 
And here he is. Every woman will tell you that the ideal home antiseptic is one that will serve as a mouthwash, gargle, and breath deodorant, all with equal effectiveness. And that's exactly what Rexall MI-31 does. Well, now how did you know that? Because I read all about it in your big ad in this week's issue of Life. Say, isn't that a good ad? A whole page crammed full of top-quality Rexall products. Some of them at special bargain prices, good all this month. And every one of them just as reliable as Rexall MI-31, America's popular all-round mouthwash. What's more, Rexall gives you a full pint of MI-31 at the same price as other leading brands of smaller quantity. That's why I've learned to watch for your ads. I learn all about these wonderful money-saving values. And they always remind me of so many things I need, too. Then maybe I'd better tell our listeners that this same full-page ad is appearing in current issues of Collier's, Look, Saturday Evening Post, and Country Gentleman. Check it carefully. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Yeah, this is a good spot. No one on the corner of 46th and Lexington yet. What time is it? Uh, five minutes to six. Yeah, well, I hope we figure this out right. Car 86, car 86. Yeah, that's us. Car 86, Levinson, go ahead. Sergeant Otis wants to speak with you, Lieutenant. Oh, go ahead. Well, Lieutenant, I checked and found out where the Blue Bell Laundry sends its cleaning. Two companies, Monarch and the Superior Cleaning and Dying Works. Uh, Mr. Ralph Collins owns Monarch and, uh, Mr. Arthur Levin owns Superior. Find out the addresses of the plants and the home addresses of the owners and then put a stake out at the homes of the owners. Don't pick them up, but stop them if they're trying to leave. Wilco, Roger and out. Oh, I'm surprised he didn't get tired of Roger and use McGillicuddy just to be different. Hey, Walt, there's our boy. Huh, Jones? Yeah, across the street on the corner. Same guy who got the bundle from me. Let's go. Yet. He's waiting for something. It's about two minutes to six. Yeah. Got a car pulling up. Jones is going over to it. Get going. The guy in the car gave Jones a package. They spotted us. You get the car, I'll take Jones. Stop! Stop that car! Stop, Jones! Jones! Okay. Uh, car got away, but I put some bullet holes in it. Drop the gun, Jones. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm, I'm hurt bad. Don't, don't shoot again. Get me an ambulance. What? Walt, he's got another bundle with him. I'll get back to the car and get the wagon. I, I think it got me the stump. You want to talk? Yeah, yeah, okay. What's in the bundle you got from the car? Junk. A hundred thousand in morphine. How did Green figure? Oh, it just didn't go between. He worked for the big boy. Took our money. Sent it in with an order for the stuff. Instructions in the collar of one of the shirts. Yeah. Uh, you killed Green? Yeah, yeah. Who's the big boy? Jones. Jones. The wagon's on its way. Uh, he's dead. What was he picking up? Narcotics. Well, Walt, we know the code was put in the laundry bundles at one of the cleaning works. Well, go to bother. They've been checked. Yeah, and you could never tell what else might turn up. We waited until the wagon pulled up and carted Jones off, then we headed across town toward the first of two stops, the Superior Cleaning and Dying Works. 7.30 when we pulled up in front and let ourselves in with one of my pass keys. This is the only one we can check quietly. They open at 8, don't they? Yeah. Got a half an hour to make a noose for a pretty big operator. So we went to work on the Superior Laundry. Guys like Jones were caught every day, but the big boys, the ones who dished out the stuff from the top, the big syndicate operators were tough to catch. And here was a chance to catch one. We got into the office and found the order books. Jones appeared in nearly every one. This was the place where Green sent Jones's laundry. But it still doesn't prove enough. We've got to prove that the code was slipped in the bundle from this plant. Then we got to find the guy who does it. Well, come on. we got to work fast. This joint opens up in a half an hour. Hey, Walt, hold it. Car pull up outside. Yeah. I can see it out of the window. Rick, it's the same car that passed the junk to Jones. The one I put the bullets in. Hey, he's coming in. He's, he's coming up here. Get in the other room. Yeah, leave the door open. Well, 
Hello, Mr. Levin. Yeah, hey, Charlie. Yeah, there was some trouble. Cops were waiting. Yeah. I'm down at the place. Uh, I got away clean. Uh, Jones had the bundle. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'll blow. Let's take him. Hey! Hold it. He's making a break. Stop. Let's get out of He's got a gun. Blow him up. Well, he's had it. Yeah. Know him? Charlie Asher. Narcotics record. Yeah, this shirt turned into a mess. Yeah. Let's go see Mr. Arthur Levin of Superior Cleaning and find out what kind of cleaning works he's been running. Hi, Lieutenant. We got the whole place surrounded. Levin hasn't tried to leave? He's been out of the house once, went to the garage. Have anything with him? Well, now, when he came out, went in with a big box. All right, let's take him. You better get out of sight, Otis. You'll see that uniform and get jumpy. Get down there in the end of the porch. All right. Yes? Police, Mr. Levin, we'd like to talk to you. Oh, well, uh, come in. Thank you. I was just going to my office. Where is your office, Mr. Levin? I own the Superior Cleaning and Dye Works. You do laundry for Mr. Green's Blue Bell Laundry? I do work for a lot of laundries. I believe that Mr. Green happens to be one of them. You know a man named Jones? I know more than one Jones. How about a man named Charlie Escher? Charlie? No. No, I don't know him. He called you 20 minutes ago. (laughs) No, he didn't call me. You're very much mistaken. Now, would you mind telling me what this is all about? How many workers do you have at Superior, Mr. Levin? About... Forty. Any of them have police records? No, not to my knowledge. And you don't know Charlie Usher? No. No, I told you, I do not know him. Well, he had a key to the front door of your laundry. He used your office phone. I can't help that. He called a Mr. Levin. But I have never talked with a man named Charlie Usher. I, I what swear What was in that box you brought in from the garage? Box? Books. Books. I brought some books in. Where are the books, Mr. Levin? Oh, I already... I put them in the shelves in the library. What did you do with the box? I, I, I burned it. Uh, I, I don't like dirty boxes lying around the house. You went outside and burned it? Yes, yes, in the incinerator. My men said you only came out of the house once, Mr. Levin. Then your men are mistaken. I went out twice, once to get the box, uh, the books, and the second time to burn the box. Look, what right have you got to hide outside my house and watch it like a bunch of burglars? I know my rights. I want to call my lawyer. Oh, sure, sure, Mr. Levin. You go right ahead and call your lawyer. In the meantime, we'll see if anything was burned in the incinerator. It would be burned out by now. That was uh, 20 minutes ago. About the time Charlie Usher called He you. did not call me. I don't even know him. Well, even if you did burn the box 20 minutes ago, Mr. Levin, there'd still be some smoking ashes. And if it wasn't burned in the incinerator, Mr. Levin, we'll take this house apart piece by piece until we find it. I'll go check it out. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, yes, Mr. Look, Levin. Look, I'm, I'm not sure I, I burned the box. Then you didn't go outside the second I, time? I, I don't know. I, I don't remember. I, I'm all mixed up. Look, you got to give me time to think. Well, if you didn't go out the second time, the box is still in the house. Look, please, please do this. Give me time. Give What's me... in the box, Mr. Levin? Books, I told you. Books. Where is it? I don't know. Leave me alone now. Now, will you leave me alone? I know my rights. Start taking the house apart. No, wall. no, no, please. Where's the box? Please. The box, Mr. Levin, the box. Yeah, where's the box? Uh, under the sink. Where under the sink? There's a sliding paddle under the kitchen sink. Narcotics, Mr. Levin? Yes. Yes. Oh, I'm ruined. You marked the shirt collars and sent Charlie Usher to deliver the stuff. That's right. I had ten laundries working for me. Green was one of them. I'm ruined. Ruined. Oh, relax, Mr. Levin. You can be happy about one thing. Jones and Usher didn't cooperate like you did. And they're both dead. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. If you're often troubled with acid stomach, or if you're looking for a gentle, non-irritating way to achieve regularity, try Rexall Milk of Magnesia. Pure, mild, creamy, smooth, and with no unpleasant earthy taste. Rexall Milk of Magnesia is justly popular. Buy the economy size quart bottle. It costs only 69 cents at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall.
Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, Clayton Post, Sidney Miller, Virginia Gregg, and Stacey Harris. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hi, you beautiful. Get lost, Bristle Puss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids, like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll go stag. That's it. Join the stag line now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Yes, to make girls care. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's entertainment in store for you every Wednesday night on NBC. In addition to the action-packed adventures of Richard Diamond, beginning next Wednesday, listen to Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman returning over most of these stations with their delightful series, The Halls of Ivy. In four weeks, laugh with Groucho Marx and you bet your life on NBC. While the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. This is your Rexall family druggist with a welcome from the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names. We've done that because we recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Plenamins, for example. Rexall's famous multivitamin capsules. Two Plenamins a day give you more than your daily minimum requirements of every vitamin for which such requirements have been established, plus valuable liver concentrate and iron. And yet, Plenamins cost only pennies per day. Ask for Plenamins at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency. Handy hints on happy homicide. I beg your pardon? I said Diamond Detective Agency. Handy hints... Yes, yes, I heard the last part, but I just wanted to be sure there was nothing the matter with my phone. Uh, Mr. Diamond, I wish to hire you. I'm touched. One hundred dollars a day in expenses. I'm touched. Well, if the figure depresses you a little, I suggest getting out in the fresh air. Exercise. Play a little golf. If you could use a dandy caddy on Sunday... I can easily afford the fee, Mr. Diamond, but... To be frank, it wasn't exactly what I expected. Isn't it a little high? Well, frankly, yes. 
But if you hire another detective, you won't be getting the prettiest. I see. Uh, can you come to my house at six this evening? Name, address, and reason for hiring me? George Lexington, Golden Strand, Long Island. And I'm in fear of my life. I'll see you at six, Mr. Lexington. On the dot. Please be prompt. Just have a substantial retainer ready. Aside from my blue eyes, greed and promptness are my two most outstanding features. Well, that's the way a buck's made my business. I sit around the office for a week, passing the idle hours, playing old Welsh mining tunes on a comb. Then someone gets in trouble, opens the phone book, and naturally the first thing that must catch their eye is my very gaudy full-page advertisement on the Diamond Detective Agency. After that, a phone call, and I'm in business. At six sharp, I was ringing the doorbell at the home of Mr. George Lexington, client in fear of his life. Yes, sir? Mr. Diamond, to see Mr. Lexington. Mr. Lexington is busy at the moment. Does he expect you? I have an appointment with him at six... Oh, I see. But please step in. If you'll wait in the library, sir, I'll tell Mr. Lexington you are here. Uh, uh, what was that? Unless you keep a car in one of the upstairs rooms, that, my friend, was a gun going off. Come on. With the butler right behind me, we took the long, curved staircase three steps at a time. The butler managed to pant out that Mr. Lexington was in the study at the head of the stairs. So that was the door we went through, only to be stopped cold on the other side. Standing in the middle of the room was a girl. The word girl in this case, to be identified with adjectives one might think up after having spent three lonely years on a life raft in the middle of the Atlantic. The only thing that kept my eyes from melting and running down on my shirt was the thirty-two revolver she held in her gloved hand. And Miss Morris, no! Give me the gun, honey. No, no! Uh, Drop it, honey. You just scorched my money belt. She dropped it, and we all went to pieces. I helped her to a seat and let her cry it out. The gun I could have passed off as a whim or too many Hopalong Cassidy adventures, but the man sprawled across his desk on the other side of the room changed the whole picture. I called the 5th Precinct Police Station and got Lieutenant Walter Levinson started for Long Island. The police? You shot a man, didn't you? Yes. You tried to kill yourself, didn't you? <laughs> Well, they're both against the law. Want to tell me about it? He deserved it. Uh, Mr. Diamond. Yes? I just found something rather strange. Well, don't scratch it. Miss Moore is shot, Mr. Lexington, all right. I never denied it. Well, what's bothering you? The thought just occurred to me. Who also took the trouble of stabbing him? Stabbing him? He was shot. Then how do you explain this carving knife in his back? Oh, now, Diamond, you stop that. But it's true, Walt. Sure is, Lieutenant. Been shot in the chest and got a knife in his back. Now, oh, how do I get in on these things? This is uh, Miss Morris, Walt, the girl who shot him. How do you do? Oh, you shot him, huh? Yes, Lieutenant. Well, who stabbed him? I have no idea. Swell. Miss Morris, why did you shoot this, uh, uh, what's his name? Lexington, George. Why did you shoot him? I refuse to answer. Okay, suit yourself. Where's the coroner, Walt? Should be here any minute. I didn't stab him, Mr. Diamond. When you came in, did you talk with Lexington? I, I just opened the door, saw him sitting at the desk, and I shot him. Did you talk to him? Oh, sure, sure, Walt. She played 20 questions with him while he was trying to paw the knife out of his back. I was just trying to trap her. Why? Why? Because if she said she'd talk to him, it would have been an admission that, uh, uh, uh... She'd talk to him. No, that he was still alive before she shot him. Okay, who stabbed him? How do I know? Well, if he was still alive before she shot him, she talked to him, then she must have seen who stabbed him, right? Yeah. Well, if she saw who stabbed him, she couldn't have done it, right? Right. And no one would have stabbed Lexington if he'd already been shot, right? No one would have stabbed Lexington if he'd already... Yeah, of course. You think I'm stupid? Uh, Lieutenant... You shut up. So if they stabbed him, he hadn't been shot and he was alive. Of course. Then if he was alive and they stabbed him, the girl didn't do it to confuse you. Huh? So if she didn't do it, she can go home. Go on home, Miss Mars. Oh, but Mr. Diamond... You heard him. Go on. Uh, that's what I was trying to tell you, Lieutenant. Diamond's at it again. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant? Take the girl, the butler, and Diamond down to the car. And when the coroner gets here, we'll all take a little drive down to the station, understand? Yes, Lieutenant. What are you yelling at? I don't know. I, uh, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Well, 
Well, the coroner finally arrived and suggested an autopsy for the corpse and a bath and some hot mud for Walt. Then we all climbed into the squad car and headed for downtown New York in the 5th Precinct Police Station. On the way, I told Walt about my phone call from Lexington about 3.45 that afternoon and the few details leading up to finding June Morris with a smoking gun and the dead Mr. Lexington. At the station, we continued to question the girl as to her motive for the killing, but she refused to say anything. The butler could add nothing, so they were taken out to await further question. She was allowed to call her lawyer, and we all settled down to wait for the coroner's report on the autopsy. Yeah? The dame's lawyer is here, wants to see you first. Okay. Girl's lawyer. Mr. Farnsworth, Lieutenant. Hello, Lieutenant. What is this all about? Mr. Diamond, Mr. Farnsworth. How do you do? How are you? I just got a call from Miss Morris. Uh, Lieutenant. Uh, pardon me a minute. Well, what do you want, Hammerhead? I got the girl's personal effects. Well, give them to me. Okay. Gee, what did I do? Nothing, Sergeant, but your family sure bust things up. Oh, there you are, Lieutenant. Thank you. Gee, I don't know. Am I to understand that Miss Morris is being held here on a murder charge? That's right. Just whom is Miss Morris supposed to have killed? You know a Mr. George Lexington? Why, uh, yes, he's the boy. Maybe you can tell us why she would want to kill him. I suggest you question the witness, Mr. Diamond. But let me warn you beforehand. My advice to my client will be to say nothing until I can find out more about this thing for myself. Now, about Miss Morris. She stays put. Lieutenant, I have a great deal of influence. Then get her rich. She stays put. What about this George Lexington's background, Mr. Farnsworth? Let me give you one more suggestion before I leave. Find these things out for yourself. I have a fair reputation in the legal profession. Good evening, Mr. Farnsworth. I'll have that writ, Lieutenant. Ah, oh, go to blazes. Mm, nice fella. A doll. Well, let's see if there's anything in these personal effects here. Take a look through the purse. Okay. Uh, Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Bring in the butler. Right. Here's something, Walt. Well, what is it? A uh, typewritten note in the bottom of her purse. Well, let's say. Meet me at the house at a quarter of six this evening. Bring $15,000 and be prompt or you will regret it for the rest of your life. Signed, George. George Lexington. Mm, well, bully for you. Diamond, I swear. Out of the butler, Lieutenant. <sighs> Come in. Sit down. Well, thanks. My face... That you, just... Melonhead. Get out of here. Oh, well, okay. I just thought... Otis... Yeah? When the coroner's report comes in, bring it right in and bring the girl along with it. Yeah, Lieutenant. How do you feel, Arthur? A little upset, sir. This has been quite a strain. Last name, Cameron? Yes, sir. How long have you worked for George Lexington? About four years, sir. Ever since Mr. Lexington came east. Did you know him before that? No, sir. You ever mentioned where he was from? California, I think. Had a lot of money? I presume so. I was paid regularly. He maintained a good-sized house and entertained frequently. To my knowledge, he never had any debts that weren't paid immediately. How long have you known Miss Morris? Well, she and Mr. Lexington were engaged two years ago. It only lasted a few months. But they still saw each other occasionally. Did you know Miss Morris was expected tonight? Yes, sir. She called and said she would be there at uh, 5.45. You sure about the time? Yes, sir. But you didn't expect me at 6. Uh, no, sir. Mr. Lexington said nothing about it. Hmm. Is there another way into that study? Uh, yes, sir. A back door leading down to the garden. Did uh, Lexington have any other visitors during the day? No, sir. Was he in from three to five? Yes, sir. Uh, I got the coroner's report and Miss Morris, Lieutenant. Okay, that's all, Arthur. We'll have to hold you until this thing straightens itself out. You go along with Sergeant Lovelorn. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Arthur. Yes, sir. Does Mr. Lexington own a typewriter? No, sir. All right. Come in, Miss Morris. Sit down. Uh, here's the report and the bullet taken out of Lexington and the knife. Take the butler downstairs. Right. Let's go, Arthur. Yes. When did you receive this note, Miss Morris? Oh, where? Uh, we found it in your purse. When you become a murder suspect, I'm afraid nothing's very private. This morning. It's from George Lexington? Yes. He has something on you. Okay, you're just hurting yourself. Miss Morris, did you know a man named Jack Short? No. Who's Jack Short, Walt? Just read this report. Here's what it says about the late Mr. George Lexington. Fingerprints check one Jack Short, arrested 1936, 38, 39, petty theft, 
suspicion of robbery, suspicion of possessing narcotics, three arrests, one conviction. Did a year and a day in Alcatraz. When did he have time to do his laundry? He was arrested again in 1942 for manslaughter. Went to trial, case dismissed for lack of evidence. Lovely boy. You mean George Lexington? Was, was really Jack Short a criminal with a record? But his house, servants, the, the money he spent. That's something we're going to find out about. What does the coroner's report say, Walt? The knife did kill him, not the bullet. Oh. And the knife has got your fingerprints all over it, Miss Morris. What? It's got what? That's right. Ever see it before, Miss Morris? I, I don't know. It's a carving knife. One that might belong to a cent. <gasps> Something wrong? That's my carving knife. I missed it this morning. Sure. When was the last time you used it? Last night. I gave a small dinner party. Do you own a typewriter, Miss Morris? Yes, I do. Hello, June. you better come along with me. Oh, Mr. Farnsworth. Uh, just a minute. What's the idea of busting in here like this, Farnsworth? I, I tried to stop him, Lieutenant. You should have stuck out of one of your big feet. Those things could trip a tank. I told you I would be back with a writ. Well, I'm here, and there's the writ. Come, June. She stands right here. Lieutenant, you don't seem to understand. No, you don't seem to understand, Mr. Farnsworth. You got that written and was sustained because I was nice enough not to issue a formal complaint. Also, there's a little matter of influence. You're John Wright, and I'm going to show you how it works. I'm making a formal complaint right now, and the charge is murder. And if you don't think I can make it stick, I won't even bother to throw you out of my office. I'll let the commissioner do it for me. Now get out of here. Gee, you're wonderful, Lieutenant. You shut up! <laughs> Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. One of the questions most often asked a druggist is this. What can I take for fast relief from acid stomach? I've often wanted to know that myself. What's your answer? Naturally, ma'am, it's Bismarex. Rexall's justly famous antacid. Why? What is it that makes it so outstanding? Well, the secret lies in the scientifically developed formula. You see, the active ingredients in Bismarex vary in the time it takes them to dissolve in the stomach. That way, the relief it gives is not only fast, but continuous and prolonged. Excess acidity is often neutralized in less than one minute. Then the other ingredients, dissolving more slowly, ease up that gastric distress. And finally, Bismarex leaves a soothing, protective covering on irritated stomach membranes. Oh, I'll have to remember that. Bismarex. Is that how you say it? That's right, ma'am. B-I-S-M-A hyphen R-E-X. Bismarex. Ask for Bismarex at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, Farnsworth got the idea in a hurry and took off like a rabbit with his tail on fire. Walt lived up to his word. After making the formal charge and producing the evidence, the writ was dismissed. He then secured a search warrant for both Miss Morris's flat and George Lexington's house on Long Island. Our first stop was Miss Morris's apartment, and when we went in, I thought how much it looked like her. Small, beautifully decorated. We went over the whole place, nothing except in the small den. There's the party list you told us about. Hmm. Good 30 names here. Typed. Well, there's a typewriter. You got that note you had in the purse? Yeah, here. Yeah. Top of the E is blocked out like on the note. Same machine. No. Bring the typewriter, Otis. Right, Lieutenant. You going over to Lexington's home? Yeah, aren't you coming along? No, I got an idea. Do me a favor, will you, Walt? Well, sure, why? When you get over there, besides checking that back door to the study, put in a call to the phone company and see if a call was made around 3.45 this afternoon to El Rado 1234. It's a toll call from there, and they'd have a record. Now, let me write that down. El Dorado 1234. Yeah. I'll call you at Lexington's in about an hour. If that number wasn't called from there, check every name on that party list. Well, there are 30 names there. You want me to check each one to see whether a call was made to El... What's the matter? El Dorado 1234. That's your office number. Walt, 
Bye. I left Walt turning that awful green and headed for the Times building. It was a little late when I got there, but an old friend at the morgue noticed the $5 bill I was wearing in my lapel and agreed to take care of it for me while I looked through the newspaper files. I dug up everything on Jack Short and his alias George Lexington. The stuff on Short wasn't much, except the trial for manslaughter had made the front page. The items on George Lexington could all be found in the society columns. From what I could gather, he'd started his social world in 1944. He'd been engaged several times, and each time to a wealthy woman. I even came across a picture of June Morris on the evening they had announced their engagement. Well, having all the information I could get, and with one little item dated California, June 26, 1942, tucked away in my pocket, I put in a fast call to Walt, who was at the home of the late George Lexington. Yeah? What did you find out? Well, someone could have gotten in the back door. There were some blurred footprints outside in the garden, but they won't help. If you had a key, you could let yourself in and walk right up the study. What about the phone call? There was no call made from here to your office, but uh, one of the names on the list paid off, a uh, Mrs. Julia Wright out of Long Island. Now, uh, would you mind telling me what this is all about? Now, you stay right there, Walt. I'm going out to see Mrs. Julia Wright. Well, if she called your office today at 3.45, you certainly must have talked to her. George Lexington called my office today at 3.45. But he couldn't have. The butler said Lexington wasn't out of the house and the call wasn't made from here. Well, someone called. Maybe it was the right day. Maybe she got a low voice and told you she was Lexington. Walt. No. Oh, forget it. You wouldn't like it anyway. Diamond? Uh, how do you do, Mrs. Wright? My butler says your business is a matter of life or death. Well, that's a little exaggerated, but it's one sure way of getting by the red tape. And then what is your business, Mr. Diamond? I, uh, I'm from the police. Oh. Do you know of Mr. George Lexington? Why, yes, slightly. Are you married, Mrs. Wright? Very happily. What is your interest in Mr. Lexington, Mr. Diamond? Do you know June Morris? Mm, quite well. I've known her family for at least 20, uh, 10 years. She's being held for the murder of George Lexington. Oh, that poor girl. She was engaged at Lexington at one time, wasn't she? Yes. He was a beast. Believe me, Mr. Diamond, he deserved killing. I thought you said you only knew him slightly. Why, oh, I, I, June used to tell me how terribly he treated her. A phone call was made from your house yesterday at approximately 345 to El Dorado 1234. Mm, I don't believe I know anyone at that number. Are you sure? A man made it. I talked to him. Well, my husband wasn't home yesterday. Oh, perhaps it was my lawyer. He was here about that time. In fact, I believe he did make a call. Said it was on business. A call from the library. What's your lawyer's name, Mrs. Ryan? My, Mr. Lucius Farnsworth. I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. I certainly don't like the guy, but his reputation's been spotless. It's just got to be, Walt. Here's the girl, Lieutenant. Uh, come in, Miss Morris. Thank you, Lieutenant. Hello, Mr. Diamond. June, the note you received was written on the typewriter in your den. What? Lab just sent up a report. You think I sent that note to myself? No, no, no. But can you remember anyone using the typewriter in the last two days? No. No one has used it but myself. What about the night of the party? Who uses a typewriter at a party? Anyone go in the den and maybe lock the door? Why, Why yes. As, as a matter of fact, Mr. Farnsworth said he had to make some business calls. He went in and closed... You don't think that... That Farnsworth did it? Why, it's absurd. He's been with my family for years. Did he introduce you to George Lexington? Yes, it was at a party at Julia Wright's. Did Mr. Farnsworth know that you owned a gun? No one knew it. Were you actually using that knife the night of the party? Yes, I, I sliced some turkey. Hmm. You remember what kind of a suit Mr. Farnsworth was wearing that night? He was wearing a dinner jacket. Lexington was blackmailing you, wasn't he? I can't answer that. Oh, honey, believe me, if you don't trust us and it comes out anyway, we'll have no way of stopping it. All right, it was blackmail. I was going to marry George. There were some letters, some... a picture. He broke off the engagement and began demanding money. Last week he mentioned something about leaving town, and I received the note. 
I couldn't afford that kind of money, and I was just tired of paying month after month. I decided to kill him. And I was going to kill myself. I guess I lost my nerve. Let's go see Mr. Luke Farnsworth, Rick. June, you sit right here until we get back. Be careful. Uh, you can make a book on it. I'm going to drive you home. <laughs> Use your paw. All right, all right. There he comes. Yes, what did... You... Oh. What do you want, Lieutenant? I've got any hot coffee? If this is your idea of some kind of a joke... Mind if we come in? I most certainly do. Thanks. How dare you break in here like this? I can cause you a great deal of trouble, Lieutenant. How well did you say you knew George Lexington? Only slightly. Hey, get a load of these fancy ashtrays, Walt. Yeah, but I don't go much for modern. Pretty drapes, though. Oh, the policemen are being casual. You only knew Lexington slightly, huh? Yes, and this is the third time I've said it. You must make a lot of money. I have wealthy clients. How much did Jack Short pay you to get him out of that manslaughter charge? What? You remember him. Sensational case. Made you quite a reputation. Of course, I remember it. This shirt was sure a handsome fella. Uh, did he uh, change his name later? I, I, I don't know. That, uh, that was a long time ago. Didn't he uh, change it to Lexington? George Lexington? What is this all about? Mind if we look around the place? I most certainly do. Is that your bedroom? You have no right to go in there. Where's your warrant? Hmm. Nice bedroom. Get out. Get out. I'll call the commissioner. Why don't you do that? Uh, these your keys? Put, the, put those down. Take it easy. I wonder if one of these fits a back door to George Lexington's study. Don't be ridiculous. I've only been to Mr. Lexington's house twice in my life. Arthur the butler will verify to that. You mean you've only been there twice by the front way? I mean exactly that. What are you doing in that closet? Nice wardrobe. This your dinner jacket? Lieutenant, I warn you. No, I'm going to warn you, Farnsworth, officially. Anything that you may say will be held against you. I'm charging you with the murder of George Lexington. <laughs> this is really one for the books. Would you mind telling me what proof you have? You called my office at 345 this afternoon from the home of Mrs. Julia Wright. Disguised your voice and told me you were George Lexington. Really? Hearsay. You were at a party given by June Morris. You stole a carving knife that she'd been using, probably wrapped it up in a handkerchief to keep her fingerprints on the handle. Did someone see me? For some reason, you wanted George Lexington out of the way. He'd been blackmailing victims that you introduced him to. You made sure that Miss Morris would be at his home at exactly 5.45. You wrote a note on her typewriter telling her to be there. You called me to be sure that someone would catch her. Interesting theory. You went up the back way into the study, probably with one of these keys. You stabbed Lexington and got out just before the girl came up. You made one mistake. You didn't figure that the girl might try to kill Lexington. What? Yeah, she shot him. But she shot a dead man. She shot him? After he was dead. You don't know it, Buster, but you just missed the perfect crime. Now prove it. The girl said you were wearing a dinner jacket the night of her party. This the coat? Yes. And to get the knife out, you had to put it in a pocket or someplace on you. She had been carving turkey. Ever hear of a spectrograph? Of course. Sure. Have the pockets analyzed, and if we find traces of turkey, we'll know you swiped the knife. And if the key to Lexington's back door is on this ring, it'll cinch it. I'm afraid not to. Come back here, Barnes. He's going for the window. Barnes, stop it, you go. Let me go. Not on your life. Not on your life. You don't take it the easy way. Get out of his head. No, no. Got him. No, 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 no. Why didn't you let me jump? What difference would it have made? Well, it sure would have saved the state some money. But a quick trip to the sidewalk doesn't make up for a killing. That's the easy way, Farnsworth. You forget when you commit murder, there's a little thing called society. And if you can't live with people, they'll decide what to do with you. Oh, that last mile is a Lulu. <laughs> Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. If you're a user of mineral oil, remember that Rexall mineral oil is carefully refined by a special process to achieve an extra heavy body. What's more, because it's so exceptionally pure and gentle in its action, Rexall mineral oil is non-irritating, non-habit-forming. 
You'll also like the fact that it's tasteless, odorless, colorless. Next time, try Rexall Mineral Oil. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, Ted Osborne, Betty Moran, Howard McNear, and Virginia Gregg. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hiya, beautiful. Get lost, Bristlepuss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids, like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll go stag. That's it. Join the stag line now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Yes. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. evening. This is your Rexall family druggist with a welcome from the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names. We've done that because we recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Rexall Milk of Magnesia, for example. Here's the milk of magnesia that's so pure and creamy smooth, so free from that unpleasant earthy taste. Even children spot the difference. Ask for the Rexall Milk of Magnesia at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency. With camels who know their detectives best, it's Diamond, two to one. Ricky? I won't admit a thing. Last person who called me Ricky saw me stocking a bubblegum factory. Whole deal blew right up in my face. Ricky, this is Pat. I'm in trouble, bad trouble. Somebody steal your last name? This is Pat Stenz. Pat Stenz. An old friend of several years standing. Blonde, attractive, and the owner of a plan to eliminate cranium luster. To the aging juveniles of the world's biggest city, she might easily be called the mother protector of hairlines. In other words, like the sign says on the front of her uptown salon, she grows hair. You've just got to come down to the place. Honey, I've graduated. You told me so yourself. Another treatment and I'll be wearing a snood. Ricky, I'm on the level. I'm in trouble. Something's happened to one of my customers. What's the matter? Did he sprout feathers? Well, almost. He sprouted wings. He's dead. <laughs> Now, phone games with Pat weren't a hot She might kid a customer about the condition of his scalp, 
But when she called me to say she had a corpse on her hands, I knew she hadn't been sampling her hair tonic. I told her I'd be right down, call Helen, broke my date, locked the office, set a few traps for impatient clients, and 15 minutes later, I was in Pat's office talking to a pretty frightened little blonde. Oh, Rick, I just don't know what to do. Oh, now, honey, first calm down. Now, who's dead and where? A man named Wiley. John Wiley's on the vibrating table. Well, why didn't you call a doctor or the police? Because I think he's been murdered. Murdered? Looks like his neck's been broken. I didn't know what to do. I was afraid of calling the police. Well, baby, if one of your customers got his neck broken in here, you're going to get mixed up with the law sooner or later anyway. The publicity will ruin my business. Honey, murder always ruins something. You got any idea who might have done it? No. Well, who was in the place when you discovered the body? My usual three girls and two customers. Anybody leave or come in? No. How many people know about it? Just the girls. Neither one of the customers. Oh. Well, first we lock your front door. I don't want anyone to leave. Then we'll take a look at the dead man and find out if his neck really is broken. If it is, we call homicide. We locked the front door and Pat let me down a hall with booze on either side. In two of the booths, I spotted the customers relaxing as girls in white uniforms worked on their receding foreheads. At the end of the hall, we stopped at another booth, enclosed by a white curtain. In there, Rick. Okay. The vibrating table was centered in the middle of the room, an enclosure about six by 14 feet. The table was built at an angle, so that when a patient climbed up and stretched out on his back, his feet were elevated a good 16 inches above his head. The angle and the vibration increased the flow of blood to the scalp, and under normal conditions, it's considered very healthy. But the man lying on the table now wasn't getting the full benefit of the treatment. His shoulders extended over the end of the table, leaving his head hanging down at a grotesque angle, rolling from side to side with a monotonous rhythm of the vibration. Oh, Rick. Not very pretty, huh? I forgot to turn the table off. I think I'm going to faint. Uh, just take it easy. Is I right? You had to be. A circus rubber man would need vulcanizing if he turned his head that far. Busted neck, all right. Guess we better call the police. Can you keep the customers out of here? What if one of them gets inquisitive? Tell them the table's out of order. I'm going to call homicide and tell them Mr. John Wiley's in the same condition. As frightened as she was, Pat played it pretty well. She tipped off the girls and started swapping jokes with her balding clients to keep them happy. I went in the office, put in a fast call to the 5th Precinct Homicide, and ten minutes later, Lieutenant Walt Levinson and Otis, his trained anthropoid, were looking at the late John Wiley. Sure looks like murder. I guess it would be better if he had a knife in his chest with a sign on it. Who was in the place when it happened? Pat, three girls, two customers, and a dozen assorted gay gypsies. Oh, for Pete's sake. Pete has an alibi. What was the dead man doing on the table, anyway? Trying to grow hair. Oh, that's silly. Who ever heard of anybody growing hair on a table? <laughs> Sergeant Lovelone. Well, I thought it was pretty funny. Go out and round up everybody in the place and take them into the office. Then call the precinct and get the coroner down here. Then, if you're a good little boy, you can go out and play in the traffic. Well, a murder is a mess any way you look at it. A man lying on a table with his neck broken. Four women and two men, the only ones around when it happened. Bad publicity for a nice little working gal named Pat Stenz. But you can't hide it when it happens. Someone gets killed, someone gets hunted. And everybody concerned gets mixed up in it. Walt herded everyone into the office and the questioning started. The men were very unhappy. That bad publicity it couldn't be helped. Mr. Robert Wells, songwriter. Look, I don't know anything about it. I never saw the man before. Surely you can't possibly suspect me. Why in the world would I want to kill him? It's ridiculous. And the other, Mr. Jacob Green, jeweler. Oh, my goodness. My head is still wet. John Wiley? I never saw him before in my life. Not in my whole life. Hey, Pat, give me another towel, will you? Kill him? Oh, why? I got a mother-in-law. First things come first. Yes. <laughs> now, you see? You see? My death I'll catch from Jersey. <laughs> two prosperous men, two prosperous denials. The girls came next. Three girls who worked for Pat. First, Mary Carroll, the girl who had worked on John Wiley. The one who had helped him up on the table and massaged his neck and forehead for five minutes. Sure, I put him on the table, but I left him like always. 
We let them lie in there and relax for about ten minutes, don't we, Pat? That's right, Lieutenant. That's the way it works. Mary left him and went over to start on Mr. Wells. That's right, Lieutenant. She did. Mary's a pretty strong girl, isn't she, Mr. Wells? Yeah, she could break... Break your neck? Oh, now, wait a minute, Lieutenant. You think she could, Mr. Wells? She's pretty strong, I guess, but she wouldn't do that. Any one of us could have gone in that back booth at one time or another, Lieutenant. You found him, didn't you, Miss Stenz? Yes. Do you usually go back to see how your customers are? Sometimes. Sometimes they go to sleep and the girl who left them is too busy with someone else, so I wake them up. Next girl, Lillian Wooster. Yes, I went back by that booth several times. Why? Wants to make Mr. Green some coffee. You're black and strong. She brung it to me. And the other times? Wants to get some hair formula later to get a clean comb. A clean comb for him? Don't laugh. I got a few left. Look, it up here on top, you see? You're fairly new here, aren't you, Lillian? Three weeks. How'd you know that, Rick? Well, I completed my treatments last month. Lillian wasn't here then. You mean you... <laughs> now, now, now. People laugh at psychiatrists, too, Walt, and some of them end up playing canasta with Lady Macbeth. We were rejuvenating his spit curls. Thank you, Patricia Stems. They've been spitting better than ever. All right, all right. You, you're the last girl. What's your name? Nancy Cummings, Lieutenant. The last girl in her story was no different than the others. Yes, she had left her customer and walked down the hall past the last booth. No, she had not slipped in and popped Mr. John Wiley's neck while he lay resting. The coroner arrived and the whole party went down to the precinct to sign formal statements. They were then all released and sent home, pending further investigation. I took Pat home to her apartment. Don't you drink, Rick? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Water? Mm-hmm. Uh, you didn't kill him, did you, Pat? Don't be silly. He was growing hair. Kill off my advertising? Here. Thanks. You got any ideas, Rick? No. Nope. How long has John Wiley been coming to the shop? Oh, about six months. What do you know about him? Not much. He was a wolf. By your standards or Kenzie's? He got grabby occasionally. Put him straight. Know what business he was in? Well, whatever it was, he had a lot of money. Big tipper. Oh, excuse me. Yes. Oh, yes, just a minute, Lieutenant. For you, Rick. Thanks. Hello, Fatty. I got something on the dead man. Got a record. Blackmail. Oh? Know where he lives? We're checking. Now, wait a minute. Pat, you wouldn't by any chance know where John Wiley lived, would you? Well, I sent a bill to him every month. I've got a duplicate set of books here in the apartment. I'll uh, get the address. Well, Pat's got his address. I found something else in his personal effects. Key to a safety deposit box. Otis is checking to find out which bank. Well, we should at least have the answer by doomsday. Here's the address, Rick. John Wiley, 709 East 45th Street. I told Walt I'd meet him at Wiley's place, down my drink, gave Pat a pat, and a half hour later we were tearing Mr. John Wiley's apartment to pieces. Nothing. No? Well, I, uh, I at least turned up a kazoo, grab a comb and some tissue paper, and we'll do a fast course of Swanee. Hi. No tissue paper? No, here's a date calendar. Good, good. Maybe we've been working on a holiday. Here's a name, Nancy. That comes after April, doesn't it? Same name on some of the other pages here. The 28th, Nancy, 6 o'clock. Again on the 22nd, Nancy, 8 o'clock. Again on the 18th and, and, and the 12th. Hey, one of the girls who works at Pat's is named Nancy. Yeah, I know it. Well, do you think we should go over and see her or sit down around a card table, hold hands and make her pop out of the wall? You know, someday I'm going to get very mad at you, Rick. Only when you find somebody prettier. Come on, Grouchy, let's go over and see Nancy Cummings. Hi, here's her apartment. She lives with that new girl. Lenny Wooster? Yeah, and stop flexing your claws. Who is it? Ah, uh, please. Yep. Open up or we'll huff and we'll puff and we'll... My, what big noises you make, Grandma. The better to scare the men out of your closet, my dear. We'd like to talk to you, Miss Cummings. Certainly, Lieutenant. Come in. I was just making some lemonade. Would you like some? Oh, thanks. It's pretty hot out. Maybe you'd like something stronger? Uh, lemonade's fine. I I'm on duty. Uh, he's on duty. You better give him some torpedo juice. Miss Cummings, uh, you didn't tell us that you had dated John Wiley. Would you like your lemonade, sweet Lieutenant? Uh, medium. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. You never asked me if I dated John Wiley. The lieutenant found your name written on Wiley's date book. A 
been out with him six, seven times, I think. You know what his business was? He never discussed it. Ever meet any of his friends? No. Did he ever mention any of the other girls in the shop? No, I don't think so. Hmm. You, uh, you live with Lillian Wooster, don't you? That's right. Huh? Hey, who's, uh, whose picture is that on the piano? Lillian's father. You still don't have any idea why anyone would want to kill Wiley? No. How did Lillian Wooster happen to move in with you? I asked her to. When she went to work for Pat, she was living in a terrible place. One small room. I told her she could come in with me and share the rent. Well, how well did she know John Wiley? She'd seen him at the shop, seen him here when he came to pick me up. Where's Lillian now? Shopping, I think. Well, thanks, Miss Cummings. We'll be talking with you again. More lemonade? Or later, maybe. When things start getting a little hotter. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. Here's an important fact about Rexall aspirin I'd like you listeners to remember. It's simply this. There's no faster-acting aspirin made. Oh, but what do you mean by fast-acting? Well, ma'am, aspirin itself is too fine to hold together in tablet form. So it has to be bound with an ingredient that will quickly disintegrate. That is, break up the tablet. So the aspirin itself will immediately be free to do its job. Well, you mean the aspirin can't go to work until the tablet breaks up? Exactly. And that's why Rexall scientists developed a binder so low in moisture content, it begins to break up the very second it touches water. Now that means that when swallowed with water, the five full grains of pure aspirin in every Rexall aspirin tablet are ready to go to work for you even before they reach your stomach. Well, that's fast enough for me. And it's fast enough for 10,000 family druggists, too. Quality like that is what we're talking about when we tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, private detective starring Dick Powell. Three in the afternoon, out of Nancy's cool apartment and down in the blistering street. The thermometer crowding night here and the humidity sticking to us like a steaming blanket. I feel awful. A terrible day to solve a murder. Yeah. I want to go look through some newspaper files. What for? That picture on the piano. Lillian Worcester's father? Mm-hmm. I've seen that someplace before. News story connected with it. Uh, I'll drop you off. I gotta get back and see if Otis has found the safety deposit box that fits John Wiley's key. Walt dropped me off at the newspaper, and I went down to the morgue file to do some hunting. The air conditioning made the job easier, and by four o'clock, I walked into Walt's office with an interesting bit of information. We found the bank and the safety deposit box. Oh, anything turn up? Wiley was doing some pretty fancy blackmailing. Here's a bundle of evidence and a list of names. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I can understand why someone would pay to keep these out of circulation. Lousy photography. Uh, What did you find out? Well, here. Newspaper clippings. Mm -hmm. Oh. Picture of Lillian Wister's father. Same picture as the the one on the piano. Ah, prominent banker leaps to death. William Baker. William Baker? The girl's name is Worcester. That's what she calls herself. William Baker. Give me that list we got out of the deposit box. I've just been looking at it. William Baker's name is on here, all right. That clipping I just gave you mentions that he left a daughter and a wife. Well, let's go pick up Lillian Worcester or Baker or whatever her name is. Well, it might not have meant a thing... But at least we had found one person who had a strong connection with John Wiley, other than socially. The girl who called herself Lillian Wooster was the daughter of one William Baker, deceased, and one of John Wiley's blackmail victims. We climbed to the squad car and hurried back to Nancy Cummings' apartment, where Lillian Wooster lived as roommate. Let's go. Hey, hey, wait a minute. What's wrong? Hold it. Lillian Wooster coming out of the building. All right, we pick her up on the street. Uh, The doorman's hailing a cab for her. Let's see where she's going. Wouldn't it be easier to just ask her? Oh, stop trying to ruin my afternoon. There's nothing more relaxing than a pleasant drive through quiet, peaceful little old Manhattan. We started tailing Lillian Wooster's cab across town, along the river, and across the George Washington Bridge. She's headed for Jersey. Ah, you looked at your compass. That's not fair. 
We kept going through Hackensack, past the outskirts, and on out Route 17. Pretty expensive cab ride. Pretty expensive makes it pretty important. We kept following like that. Lillian's cab a good quarter of a mile ahead so she wouldn't notice us. They're turning off on that road. Oh, you're absolutely amazing, Patty. I probably would have missed it completely. Oh! We took the road to the right off the highway and spotted the cab up ahead, pulling into the entrance of a large white building. The sign over the tall iron gate read, Woodview Sanitarium. She's getting out of the cab and going in. Uh, wait till she gets inside. Then let's go up there and find out who Lillian Wooster is visiting in the Woodview Sanitarium. Yeah? Something I can do for you? I'm looking for a girl. You know, honey, something that doesn't look like a man. Now you stay out of this, Diamond. Don't you start getting me confused again. He gets confused? At the drop of a hat. Watch, I'll drop my hat. Now, you stop that. He doesn't like it, does he? Oh, it nearly drives him with... <clears throat> now, you, you understand. Yes, of course. Where are you going? I think you better talk with Dr. Gerson. All right, run him out. Temper, 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 temper. Rick, I swear, if you don't stop these confounded routines... Routines? Well, you know what I'm talking about. Who's on first base? Oh, don't you know who's on first? Huh? I'm Dr. Gerson. Uh, my friend here is given to uh, mass demonstrations in the aisle. Oh, shut up, Rick. I'm Lieutenant Levinson. I'll bet you're with the cavalry. You get wise with me, Mac, and I'll bust you one. Extreme persecution complex ever since Uncle Julius took away his mandolin. Well, we have some lovely mandolins here, Lieutenant. I am Lieutenant Levinson, New York Police. Now, 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 it's more fun in the cavalry. Maybe you'd think it was more fun in a cell. Well, it's wonderful. We have some very nice ones. Let me show you. Now, listen, I am Lieutenant Levinson, New York Police, 5th Precinct Homicide. And if you don't lay off this foolishness to help me, I'll tear you limb from limb. I'll get some help. You won't get anybody. Get away from that phone. Look, I I, I think you better uh, let him tell you why he's here. Will it calm him down? I'm here trying to catch a girl. A wreck. That's right. He's here trying to catch a girl. Certainly. Why don't we all try and catch one? Look, would you do me a favor, friend? Why, of course, Lieutenant. Take a look at those credentials. Certainly. Oh, my goodness. I'm afraid he's a real policeman. I need no help from you, Mr. Diamond. Grouchy. Oh, my goodness. Satisfied? Well, yes. Aren't you a little out of your territory, Lieutenant? I am not making an arrest. <laughs> Just trying to catch a girl. I am following a girl. She may be a murderer. She came in here a few minutes you ago. You mean Miss Baker? Then Baker is her right name? Who's she seeing? Her mother. What's wrong with her mother? Mrs. Baker is seriously ill. Have anything to do with her husband's suicide? Everything to do with it? I doubt Mrs. Baker will ever recover. We went back out of the car and tried to put it all together. Lillian's father had jumped off a roof. He was being blackmailed and couldn't take it. The shock had driven Mrs. Baker into a permanent breakdown. And John Wiley had been responsible for the whole thing. Motive enough for Lillian to get a job with Pat Sten so she could get her hands on John Wiley's neck. We waited until Lillian's cab turned out of the driveway and headed back for New York. We stayed close, watched her get off at her apartment. Then we went over to see Pat Stenz. You going to get a hair treatment tomorrow, Rick? That's right, honey. I, I want you to be sure that Lillian takes care of me. Did she do it, Rick? I, uh, I think so. But why? She seemed like such a nice girl. Well, she had pretty good reason. But we need a confession, and Rick's got an idea how to get it. I want Lillian working on me through the whole treatment. Especially when I get on the vibrating table. Your scalp looks pretty good, Mr. Diamond. Oh, it's been itching a little. Uh-huh. Losing any? Mm, some. Hi. Oh, hello, Pat. His hair looks pretty good, Miss Dan. Let's see. Hmm. Um, use both solutions. Okay. I'll see you later, Rick. Nice girl, Pat. Very nice. Have you found out anything about Mr. Wiley's death? Oh, the police have gone to see our news. The lieutenant wants to see your roommate. As you told me, I hope you don't suspect her. She rather liked Mr. Wiley. She wouldn't have any reason to kill him. All right. Let's go down to the uh, 
other booth. Huh? You mean, uh, you're going to stick me on that vibrating table? Not if you don't want to. Well, full treatment. That's what I came here for. Let's go. Mm-hmm. You don't mind going in there, do you? No. Why should I? Oh, some people are funny about rooms where a murder's been committed. It doesn't bother me, Mr. Diamond. Give him a good rub and let him relax for about ten minutes, Lily. Yes, Miss Dins. All right, up on your back. Uh, Slide down, little, please. Uh, all right, yeah. That's good. What did you do before you went to work for Pat, Lydia? Oh, not much. Went to school. Finally decided to look for a job and found this one. Ever study this sort of thing? No, there's really not much to it. Pat shows us how to wash, apply the formulas, and rub the neck and shoulders. And all you need is a strong pair of arms, huh? I guess so. Your family live in New York? No. Oh, I noticed the picture of your father on Nancy's piano. A fine-looking man. He's dead now. Sorry. So am I. Mother's still living? No. Oh, oh. oh I'm sorry. Am I rubbing too hard? It's okay, it's okay. Well, you've got the strength for the job. Did the police find out anything about Mr. Wiley? Yeah, uh, he was a blackmailer. Ouch. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I'm a little nervous today. Maybe I'd better get one of the other girls. No, 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 no. That's okay. I'm just, just a little tied up. Next step. Yeah, try to relax. I guess I keep thinking about Wiley and his broken neck. Think I might break yours, Mr. Diamond? Well, it wouldn't be hard. If I was good and relaxed, you could snap it in a minute. I guess I could. So Mr. Wiley was a blackmailer? Yeah. I had a record. They're the foulest people on earth. They certainly are. You think he was blackmailing someone here in the shop? Well, not necessarily. Well, if he wasn't, then no one in the shop would have a motive for killing him. Well, I've got a theory about that. I think someone in the shop hated him so much they waited until no one was looking and the girl was out of this booth. And they slipped in on him and twisted his neck until it broke. Why would they hate him that much if he wasn't blackmailing them? Oh, somebody else he might have blackmailed. Someone very close and dear to the killer. Maybe the person Wiley was blackmailing couldn't stand it and committed suicide. Interesting theory. Take your family, for instance. Ouch. I'm sorry. You weren't relaxing. Uh, supposing Wiley was blackmailing a member of your family, your father, for instance. I can't rub your neck unless you relax more. Maybe your father couldn't take it. Maybe he couldn't pay him anymore. Instead of disgracing his family, he committed suicide. Just turn your head a little to the side, Mr. Diamond. Uh, better. Much. Well, if that happened to my family, Mr. Diamond, I guess I'd kill Mr. Wiley and not mind it a bit. Think of the shark. I even put the wife in a sanitarium. It probably would. Well, how did your father die, Lillian? He jumped off the roof. Now, if you'll turn your head a little more, I'll try to pop your vertebra. Uh... We followed you out to Jersey yesterday, Lillian. I'm going to adjust your neck, Mr. Diamond. It's better if you relax so it won't hurt. Well, if you wanted to, you could pop it anyway. I couldn't stop you in time. I don't guess you could. There. Now the other side. No. Did you kill John Wiley? Yes. Relax. All right, Mr. Diamond. Let's go down to the police station. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. If you're looking for a way to save money on drugstore needs, buy Rexall MI-31, the triple action antiseptic that makes an ideal mouthwash, a soothing gargle, and an effective breath deodorant. What's more, Rexall gives you a full pint of this quality product at the same price as other leading brands of smaller quantity. Ask for Rexall MI-31 at any Rexall drugstore. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall.
Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Mary Jane Croft, Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, Virginia Gregg, B. Benaderet, and Larry Dobkin. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hiya, beautiful. Get lost, bristle puss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because Stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids, like Stag Brushless Shave Cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll go Stag. That's it. Join the Stag line now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Yes, to make girls care, go Stag. <laughs> This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Listen, while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist with a welcome from the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names. We've done that because we recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made with the Rexall Drug Company, like Rexall Mineral Oil, for example. This is the mineral oil specially refined for extra heavy body. What's more, Rexall Mineral Oil is tasteless, odorless, colorless, non-irritating, and non-habit forming. Quality like that is what we family druggists are talking about when we tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Oh, pardon me. Uh -huh. You know where I might find Mr. Richard Diamond? You want to hire him? Yes. Well, stop being so bashful, friend. Come in, come in. Thank you. You're Mr. Diamond? Well, any resemblance to the Irish washerwoman is purely intentional. Do you always do your own laundry? Always. Keeps my petty cash from looking too petty. Sit down, Mr. Uh... Baxter. Clay Baxter from Oak Mulgee, Oklahoma. Clay Baxter from Oak Mulgee, Oklahoma, was a man, I guess, to be in his early 50s. Straight up, he crowded six foot three, counting the two-inch heels on his handmade boots. Looking at him, I thought of an old Remington print and suddenly felt like singing a chorus of Home on the Range. I'd like you to come to Oak Mulgee with me, Mr. Diamond. Well, why, Mr. Baxter? My brother was killed yesterday. The sheriff and the coroner said it was an accident. I don't believe it. How did you happen to look me up? I raise cattle, Mr. Diamond. I do a great deal of business in Chicago and New York. I wanted a detective with experience, someone with a good reputation. Bless you. I called a friend on Wall Street, and he recommended several men. One of them was you. I checked your background. I'm satisfied. Oh, good. I charge 100 a day in expenses. Chicken feed. I'll pay it, and if you catch the man who done it, I'll give you a $1,000 bonus. Oh, well, now, I, I can't leave right away. It'll take me at least five minutes to get my affairs in order. <laughs> yeah, I can certainly see you appreciate a buck. <laughs> Mr. Baxter, I appreciate a buck like a Texan appreciates Texas. 
Texas? Never heard of him. How was your brother supposed to have been killed? Thrown from his horse. Skull fracture. And you don't believe it? I do not. Why? Too good a horseman. That could have happened. Well, if it did, he'd have taken the fall right. Might have busted something, but wouldn't have killed him. Anything else? His wife. My brother was a wealthy man, Mr. Diamond. His wife will inherit everything. Ranch, cattle, all worth about eight or ten million. You think she had something to do with his death? You tell me, Mr. Diamond. I called Helen, told her I was off to Oak Mulgee, promised I'd send her a couple of Navajos or whatever they had out there. Then I took Clay Baxter over to my flat and threw a few things into a suitcase. <coughs> Oklahoma's dry. So's Richard Diamond. Might get arrested. I don't want to leave it here. Wouldn't make any difference if it was empty, would it? No. Got a couple of glasses? A fifth usually adds up to a full evening, but that's only when Clay Baxter isn't around. When he poured one for the road, the water line receded six inches. I had a quick one, and he finished it. Uh, how dead soldier? How do you feel? Oh, lively. Why don't we forget the plane? You just start running for the window, and I'll climb on. Uh, <laughs> Oak Mulgee, Oklahoma. Population 17,091, according to the last census, and very hot in August. Baxter's station wagons waiting at the airport, and the driver took us into town where I was introduced to the local law. This here is Sheriff Billings. How are you, Sheriff? Jim, this is Mr. Diamond. He's a private detective from New York. Howdy, Diamond. Howdy. Private detective, huh? Oh, I've been called other things. Still ain't satisfied, huh, Clay? Not yet. And you ain't either, and you know it, Jim. How about it, Sheriff? You think Mr. Baxter's brother was killed deliberately? Coroner says it was an accident. Hit his head on a rock. That ain't what Mr. Diamond asked. Well, uh, Will Baxter was a pretty good rider, but he could have been thrown. Yeah, I do. All the evidence says he was. Could see plain where his horse bolted. What could have made his horse shy? Snake, maybe. Not that horse, and you know it, Jim. Well, uh, maybe stepped in a chuck hole. He was limping right bad when he got back to the barn. No signs of anyone else near the body? Well, when I got there, some of Will's boys had already ridden out. Who found him? A couple of old miners. Luke and Phineas Merriweather. Well, let's go out to the ranch, Mr. Baxter, and take another look at the spot where your brother died. Will Baxter's ranch is 40 miles from here, Mr. Diamond. Maybe you'd like to go out to my place and freshen up a bit first. <laughs> You go ahead and shave and shower. I'm going to go build me a drink. Hey, this is quite a place, Mr. Baxter. I'm glad you like it. Take a swim in the pool if you'd want, but watch out for the catfish. Catfish? I, I'm a bachelor. Don't use the pool much, and I don't usually have guests. Love catfish for dinner, so I keep them in the pool. I caught a guy once floating bodies in his bathtub. Don't say. Funny, Harvey. I showered and shaved and met Baxter out by the pool where he was feeding his catfish. I watched a pound of liver disappear like leechy nuts in the Tong War. And we all headed back to town where we picked up Sheriff Billings. Forty miles later, we pulled up in front of the late Will Baxter's ranch. A little different architecture, but just as impressive as my clients. Afternoon, Sheriff. Oh, Wilma. Afternoon, Wilma. Wilma, this here is Mr. Richard Diamond. Wilma Baxter, my brother's wife. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Diamond? Private detective. Come up from New York. Oh? Well, why don't we all go in the house? It's too hot out here. Uh, Mr. Diamond wants to go out and look at the spot where Will got himself killed. Certainly. Have one of the boys fix you up with some horses. When you're done, why not stop back for dinner? Mr. Diamond's eating with me, and he's going to be pretty busy for a while. Now, I'll give you a rain check, Mr. Diamond. Oh, thank you. I'd like you to tell me about New York. It's been a long time, and I've almost forgotten what it's like. Let's go, Jim. It's getting late. Bye, Mr. Diamond. Nice meeting you. Goodbye, Mrs. Baxter. Seems all broken up, don't she? Yeah. Where was she when her husband got killed? Perfect alibi. In town all day. A lot of people saw her. Mighty fine-looking woman. Mighty. We all rode down to the stables, and one of the hands saddled up three horses, and we started out across the open desert. For a man who had spent all his life riding around in taxi cabs, the experience was just short of agonizing. Just up ahead, Diamond. Swell. 
Never rode much, did you? No, I always bounce like this. I like to make my money belt jingle. <laughs> well, here it is. Whoa. Yeah, whoa. Oh. Oh. Well, here's where they found the body. Now, uh, uh, what did he hit his head on? That rock right there. Mm-hmm. Did you take an impression of the wound to see if it matched? No. Nope. Well, why not? Never thought about it. Well, that's a pretty good reason. Anyway, let's dig that rock out and take it back with us. I spent the next minutes limping around looking for something and came up with nothing except a longing for a hot Epsom salts bath. We dug up the large rock and took it back with us to Wilma Baxter's ranch. Ooh. Oh, 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 hey, oh, 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 Diamond, this is Frank Kelly, the ranch foreman. Howdy. Detective fellow, huh? Miss Baxter told me about you. Said you was doing some investigating. Yes, sir. Scientific investigation. The way the city boys do it. What you going to do with that raw? A hopscotch. Oh, uh, on second thought, I, I think we'll take turns on tying the knots in my back. Good warm shower and you'll feel fit as a fiddle. Well, I got a good start. I'm shaped like one. You'll find it a little bit rough out here, Diamond. Oh, I'll get used to it, Mr. Kelly. I hope you're right. Ain't much like the big city. Oh? Huh? Just what is the big city like, Mr. Kelly? I ain't never been there. Just what I've noticed. Looks like a man can get pretty soft living in the city. Mm, well, I'd like to show you where I was brought up sometime, Mr. Kelly. We never got around to playing cowboy, though. We were too busy kicking each other's teeth out. See you later, Mr. Baxter. So long, sir. I, I don't think Frank likes you, Diamond. Uh, well, what about Will Baxter's horse? I can take a look at him. Right over there in that stall. Really pulled up lame. Oh, good horse. Never figured you're shy at anything. Man, look at that. Uh, His hip's swollen. Yeah, he really twisted something. <laughs> Steady, boy. Steady. Hey, that looks like an infection. Yeah, it's a funny thing. It kind of does. What are you getting at, Mr. Diamond? Oh, I'm not getting into thing, Mr. Baxter. I just said it looked like an infection. Yeah, we better tell Mrs. Baxter or Frank. Have someone take care of it. Tell me, uh, boys, if you jabbed a horse with something, would that make him bolt? Come on, I want to get back to town and talk with the coroner. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. Last week, a customer said to me, I wish I knew some way to be sure I'm getting enough vitamins. Some way that's easy, yes, and inexpensive, too. Why, ma'am, millions of people have found the way to do that. They take Rexall plenamins. Plenamins? Rexall's popular multivitamin capsules. Just two plenamins a day give you more than your minimum daily requirement of every vitamin for which such requirements have been established. Well, you can't expect much more than that. Yet plenamins do give you more than that. For they also contain valuable liver concentrate and iron, plus other factors of the vitamin B complex. Say, they must be expensive. On the contrary, ma'am. Rexall plenamins cost you only a few pennies per day. Ask for plenamins at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember... You can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Now, look here, Jim. Ain't my word good enough? Why, sure it is, Coroner, but Clay hired Mr. Diamond to do some investigating, and he's doing it. Clay, I tell you, your brother died from natural causes. I don't think so. But if you insist, I'll show this detective fella the body. I want the head wound matched with this rock. Okay, but the mortuary ain't gonna like it. They got him all ready to bury. The coroner led me across the street and into a funeral parlor where I took a look at the late Will Baxter. Six years with the fifth precinct homicide and a couple of dozen killings should have conditioned me. But like always, the first look shakes something loose in the middle of my stomach and I have to keep swallowing hard. Looks right natural, don't he, Clay? Yeah. They do a good job, Ed. Uh, bully for them. And he hit his head right here. Concussion, plain and simple. No other marks or bruises? Mm, nope. 
while the coroner rolled the late Will Baxter into one of the back rooms and made a comparison with the head wound and the rock we'd brought in from the ranch, we went out on the front porch for some air. I lit a cigarette and thought about an old case I'd worked on five or six years before. You got a cigarette? Sure, Doc. Piggy Uni, all right? Hmm. Funny thing. Head wound doesn't match the rock. Sure doesn't. Hmm. Wound is too deep. Rock's round and flat. Nothing sticking up to go that deep. Then I want an autopsy. Why? Fracture still killed him? No, I doubt it. When someone plans a murder, they don't count on one blow to do the trick. Bet there's nothing else that could have done it. Well, nothing you can see. I've met someone here in Oak Mulgee that I'm pretty sure is wanted for another killing very similar to this. Now, Doc, go make that autopsy and fast. You think maybe you found something, Diamond? You, you think Will was killed deliberately? Maybe, but we'll have to wait for the autopsy. In the meantime, I'd like to go out and visit those two old-timers. Luke and Phineas? That's right, Sheriff. Well, it's my dangerous. Come on, I'll take you out. Uh, you better wait here for the report. Mr. Baxter and I will go on out. All right, you can use my horses, so you won't have to go all the way back to the ranch. Horses? Well, the Merriweather is on the other side of town, not oh. about ten miles, no roads. Oh, horses, ten miles. I mean, never play kick the can again. <laughs> Don't take the horses, do you, Diamond? Uh, uh, maybe if you could find me a nice long thin one. <laughs> Holy Ike. Whoa, 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 Steppy. That's one of the Merryweathers. Well, let's get out of here. Come on, horse. Now, come on, I'm yellow, and I admit it. Now, it's, it's okay, Diamond. That's just the boy's way of letting you know not to come any farther, unless they say so. Oh, swell greetings. What happens now? Hey, up there. Luke, in here. What you want? It's Clay Baxter. I got a friend here who wants to talk to you. Ain't it? Yeah, Luke? Hey, Baxter, got some friend who wants to palaver. I don't feel like palavering. Better shoot him. Giddy up. Just take it easy. Take it easy. They always act like this. Penny don't want to palaver. I gotta shoot you if you don't promote. It's important. About my brother. Penny? Yeah, Luke? It's about his brother, the digging we found the other day. Oh... All right, I guess. Let one of them come up. Thank you. Yeah, Luke. Send your friend on up. And up I went, leaving my better judgment running off across the desert. I climbed a small hill and found myself standing at the entrance of an old mine shaft. Luke and Phineas and Merriweather stood on either side, shotguns ready, pointed right at my chest. Start talking. Well, uh, uh, gentlemen, my, my name is Diamond. Don't pay no import your names. What do you want? Just wanted to ask some questions about the man you found the other day. You a policeman? Well, kind of. Shoot him. Oh, now, 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 wait a minute. I'm not a real policeman. Then what are you? I'm a, I'm a private detective. Luke? Yeah. What's the matter? It's an honest profession. A fellow's got to make a living. You a real live private detective? Well, I'm a private detective. The real live part I'm depending on. Well, my goodness gracious. Come on in, have some vittles. Huh? Why, mister, me and Finney read all them stories about you fellas. Uh-huh. We filled up one whole tunnel with old detective magazines. You fellas really are something. Wait a minute. What's wrong? Let's see your badge. Oh, oh, yeah. Sure, sure. There you are. Oh, yes, sir. Well, I'll be dog. Come on in, friend. Come on in. I'd like to ask you some questions about this here Dick Tracy fella. Well, one minute I'd face two shotguns. The next I was turned into an honored guest. I had coffee and biscuits with Luke and Phineas and answered enough questions about the private detective business to fill a dime novel of my own. I squeezed in enough questions to find out that the boys hadn't seen or found anything unusual when they discovered Will Baxter's body. Four cups of coffee and a dozen biscuits later, I bid the Merry Weathers a fond farewell and return to Clay Baxter. They loved you? Oh, worshipped me. Hmm. They're starting a Richard Diamond fan club. Well, did you find out anything? No. Uh, well, give me your hand. I'll help you up on your horse. Oh, couldn't I just walk back? 
Come on, horse. Hold still. Steady, boy. <laughs> Clay Baxter, sitting in the saddle, had leaned down, grabbed my hand to help me up on my horse, and that was when he got it. His horse took out with the wounded man still up and hanging on. I booted my horse in the ribs. Oh! <laughs> I took off after Baxter like citation on a good day. I closed my eyes, prayed a little, and tried to remember every jockey I'd ever seen before. Suddenly, I looked up and spotted Baxter's horse dead ahead, standing still and right in my path. Whoa! Ooh! Well, I guess it's just my time. If I don't die from this bullet I got in me, I'm going to do it from laughing. <laughs> How is he, Doc? Oh, he'll be all right. Bullet went clean through just under the collarbone. Didn't break anything. How do you feel, Mr. Diamond? Uh, crippled. Any idea who shot Clay? No. Clay said he thought it might have been the Merriweather boys. Oh, uh, I, I, no, it couldn't have been. Why not? Well, the Merriweather boys use shotguns, not rifles. What about that autopsy, Doc? Well, come on, what about it? You was right. Will Baxter didn't die from a skull fracture. What was it? You don't know what was used for sure. A long, thin instrument. Whoever did it pulled the lower eyelid down, killed Will Baxter by jabbing something through the eye into his brain. Probably hit him over the head to knock him off the horse and then got down and made sure. And then jabbed his horse in the flank to make him bolt. Nasty way to kill him, man. Well, it's been done before. Not a man's way of killing. Wilma Baxter was in town all day. When Clay comes around, tell him I borrowed his station wagon. Going out to see Wilmer? Going out to her ranch. I want to take another look at Will Baxter's lame horse. And, Doc, I want to borrow a pair of surgical probes. I climbed into the station wagon, and close to an hour later, I pulled up on the side of the road. The gate to the ranch house was another hundred yards up ahead. So I piled out, climbed the tall white fence, and slipped into the barn. <laughs> Steady, fella. Steady. Steady. The horse's left flank was still swollen, very close to a serious infection. I ran my hand over the spot. <laughs> Steady, boy. There was something still stuck in the flesh, so I used the surgical probes and prayed the horse wouldn't kick my brains out. Whoa. Whoa. Steady, boy. Steady. There. Sorry, fellow. I didn't know you were a vet, Mr. Diamond. Huh? Oh, good evening, Mrs. Baxter. You know, in this part of the country, you can get shot for horse stealing. Oh, not stealing. Just taking this out of your horse's flank. What is it? That's a piece of a long needle. Might be a hat pen or something. I think you'd better tell me what this is all about. Oh, certainly. You're, uh... Your husband was murdered. That's impossible. Uh, suit yourself, but he was. Somebody hit him over the head, knocked him from his horse, jabbed this needle into his eye, then jabbed it into the horse's flank so the horse would pull up lame, look like he'd shied. The killer tried to shoot me this evening, but he missed and got Clay Baxter instead. And who do you think did this? I don't know. The method doesn't fit a man. A woman, then? Well, the blow on the back of the head rules out a woman. Too much force. What have you got left? What I started with. A man. And a woman. Very interesting theory. Uh-huh. You're uh, from New York, aren't you? I've been there. I thought so. Your face is familiar. I haven't been in New York in at least ten years, Mr. Diamond. Oh, funny. Well, I've got to go out to the Merriweathers. With those two old miners who found my husband? Mm-hmm. They saw the murderer. What? Yeah, that's why I know how it was done. I was out there earlier, and I've got to go back after a sworn statement. Oh, why didn't they speak up before this? Afraid. Said it was none of their business. See you later, Mrs. Baxter. Have another biscuit, Inspector. Uh, uh no thanks, fellas. Ten's plenty. Uh, so, uh, Will Baxter was murdered, huh? That's right, and Mrs. Baxter thinks you two saw who did the killing. Gonna lay a trap, huh? Yes, Luke, gonna lay a trap. Mm. Now, look, I remembered Mrs. Baxter from someplace the first time I saw her. 
And then when I found out how the murder was committed, I recalled a case very similar back in New York. A man was hit over the head, pushed down a flight of stairs, and his brain pierced by a hat pin. A man actually did it, but a woman planned it. The man was caught, but uh, the woman disappeared. Why'd they do it? Uh, the victim was insured. They wanted to make it look like an accident. Ah, uh, come on, we better spread out. We should have company pretty soon. The two old-timers took off their coats and gave me some beat-up pants, which I stuffed with pillows and blankets. In five minutes flat, I had two dummies sitting with me at the little table. You think they'll fall for it? Well, you can't tell, but uh, you two go on outside and wait until somebody comes in. I just want him to try for one of the dummies. Well, what if he tries for you? Killjoy. Luke and Phineas took their place outside the mine, and I smoked a dozen cigarettes, and then I heard someone coming in, moving quietly up the tunnel toward the light. I played it big. Well, that's, uh, that's fine, Phineas. Uh, now, if you'll just sign this statement. I rolled, and the dummy that represented Phineas Merriweather doubled over from the force of the slug. He shot again, and Luke's dummy toppled. I kicked the lamp out before he got around to yours truly. Two down and one to go, Diamond. I'm afraid I got a big surprise for you, friend. I ain't worried. You should be. That wasn't even close. You're a lousy shot. Yeah. You missed earlier this evening and got Clay Baxter instead. I'll make up for it. No, you won't, train. Drop it. Uh-oh, uh-oh. You heard him, drop it. Okay, all right, don't you? Wait a minute. Where will I get the light? Yeah. Well, hey, it's a Kelly fella. Yeah, you're getting way out of line for a ranch foreman, Kelly. <laughs> Give it to him, Mr. Diamond. Who had you kill Will Baxter? You know, Kelly, you said something today about getting soft in the city. Wonder just how soft I've gotten. Maybe you'd like to find out. Turn him loose, boys. Yes, sir. You are now. Go to it, Mr. Diamond. I don't like getting shot at. It makes me real unhappy when anyone runs around killing people. No, uh, oh, Lord, stop him, Lord. Shut up, Finney, and let him fight. Now, now, Kelly, why'd you kill Will Baxter? Well, my Baxter talked me into it. Promised me a share of the ranch. And for that, you killed a man, huh? It's a big ranch. Now get up. Sure hate to see you leave, Mr. Diamond. I hate to go myself, boys. Love them biscuits. Mm, maybe we'll get up and see you in New York sometime. Hey, Kelly's coming, too. Hmm? Doesn't like being tied to a horse like that, I guess. Then, eh? Yeah, Duke? Fellas coming, too. Hit him with something. <laughs> sure. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. I often think there's no common ailment quite so distressing as acid stomach. And there's certainly no relief for it quite as fast and effective as Bismarex. This famous Rexall antacid often neutralizes excess acidity within one minute. And the scientifically balanced ingredients of Bismarex work in sequence, easing gastric distress and leaving a soothing protective covering on irritated stomach membranes. Yes, Bismarex gives relief that's not only quick, but continuous and prolonged. Ask your Rexall druggist for Bismarex. He'll tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Hal March, Arthur Q. Bryan, Virginia Gregg, Barton Yarborough, Wilms Herbert, and Wally Mayer. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle.
This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hiya, beautiful. Get lost, Bristlepuss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids. Like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll go stag. That's it. Join the stag line now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Yes, to make girls care. Go stag. Next week, both Groucho Marx and Bob Hope will be back on NBC. And while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Rexall family druggists speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names and who recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company, like Rexall MI-31, for example, Rexall's popular and versatile mouthwash, gargle, and breath deodorant. Full strength MI-31 kills contacted germs almost instantly, yet will not harm the delicate membranes of the mouth and throat. Ask for Rexall MI-31 at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Detective Agency, I'll help you out if you're in trouble, but if it's a murder, it'll cost you double. Rick. Oh, hello, Helen, baby. What's new with the wealthy? Not much. Only we had a date last night, remember? Well, did we have fun? Oh, no. Only we'd had more fun if you'd shown up. Now, Helen, don't overestimate me. I don't. Oh. Look, honey, I am sorry about last night. Set up with a sick aunt, you know. Tender. Well, don't you believe me? No. Expect me to? No. Then we're even. Hmm. Well, and I hate people who hold grudges. You busy tonight? Uh-huh. Well, I'm doing what? Oh, I'll probably end up listening to some idiot play the piano. Hmm. Anyone I know? Maybe. He's a little boy who never grew out of the cops and robbers stage. Oh, yes. The good-looking one. He's the guy. Co- Uh-oh. Client just walked in. I'll call you back and squirm later. Bye. Diamond, in the rough. What can I do for you? You seen the morning papers? Only the funnies. Seen the story on page two? Now, what are you, a traveling quiz show? Look at it. Hmm. Pete Rocco broke out of prison. That's right. You sent Pete up for murder. He always said he'd get out and take care of you. Gee, I wish I hadn't cut my fingernails. I got nothing to chew. You better find something. Pete's a nasty little boy. Hmm. Well, what's all this to you? My name's Danny. Danny Rocco. I'm Pete's brother. Oh. Looking for a piece of cheese? I found one. Get your hat, Shamus. There was a bulge in Danny's coat pocket that hadn't come as a suit. Believing in the safety first slogan, I picked up my hat and was led to a car outside. We drove through town and then the Mulberry Street near Five Points to the section that used to be the heart of the city. 
stopped in front of a cigar store. Okay, Diamond, get out. Oh, it's so comfortable here. Come on, move. Well, if you put it that way. Hmm, the Rocco Smoke Shop. Yeah, it's mine. Bet you sell opium. In the back, behind those curtains. That's far enough. Ma! Hey, Ma! I'm right here, Daniel. You know I don't like shouting. Standing in the doorway was a little gray-haired old lady with a sweet, tired smile on her face. If this was Pete Rocco, he wore quite a disguise. You lift your diamond? I've given up a denying it. Sit down, please. Daniel, stop looking mean. Go outside and tend the shop. Oh. Daniel. Okay, Ma. Well, now I've seen everything. Daniel's is a good boy, Mr. Diamond. But one must be stern at times. Oh, yes, yeah, one must. You're probably wondering why I sent Daniel to bring you here. Well, I have thought about it between prayers. Mr. Diamond, I tried to raise my boys the best I could. Peter and Daniel had every chance for success, but Peter failed me. He killed a man. Go on. I think my boys could be pickpockets. That was during their school days, of course. Oh, yes, of course. Later, I take them to a nice, tidy little bookmaking business. Like any mother, I wanted to keep them away from violence. Oh, uh, very thoughtful. Mrs. Diamond, I've known crime and criminals all my life. My husband was an immigrant. A criminal killed in a gang war. The only life I could teach them, but Peter saved me. Peter turned to murder. Uh, Mrs. Rocco, this is very interesting, but why was I brought here? I'm getting to that. Please be patient. I'm sorry. You see, as long as my boys stuck to bookmaking, I was happy. I was proud of them. But when Peter killed that man, yeah, he failed me. Oh, uh, you said that before. Yes, yeah, so I did. Mr. Diamond, you're the one who sent Peter to prison. Police couldn't catch him, but you did. I want you to send my boy back where he belongs. Behind bars. I see. I'll pay you usual fee. If Peter's out long, he might kill another man. I couldn't stand that. I don't hold with violence, Mr. Diamond. There was a sad look on her face as she pushed the buzzer beside her chair. She was a proud little thing, but you could see the hurt in her eyes when she spoke of Pete. She was determined to have him put back in prison. After all, she'd only raised him to be a pickpocket. Ah, oh, this modern generation. Absolutely no regard for their parents. You ring for me, Ma? Daniel, drive Mr. Diamond back to town. I'll watch the shop. Oh, dear. You haven't said that you'll take the job, have you, Mr. Diamond? Ma would like for you to, Shamus. <coughs> well, I... Uh... Thank you so much. Daniel, you're looking mean again. Danny drove me downtown. Instead of going to my office, I went to the 5th precinct, where I found Sergeant Otis laboring over a crossword puzzle. Poor Otis. He couldn't find a four-letter word for something that swims, even if he hit him in the face with a herring. Well, hello, brainchild. What? Oh, you. Clever as always, I see. Shamus, why don't you dig a hole and jump in it? And disturb your wormy relatives? Oh, I'll perish the thought. Get lost. My, I'd be touchy today. Well, can't you see? I'm working a puzzle. See it? Yes. Believe it. Oh, that's another matter. Have it work on a genius. I'm going to see Walt. Oh. Good afternoon, Lieutenant Levinson. My, you look impressive with your feet on the desk. Saving shoe leather? Rick, where have you been? I called you 50 times this morning. Well, I've been chatting with a very pleasant little lady. Mm, blonde or brunette? Neither. Her hair was gray. Well, for you, that's a switch. But boy, you better go in hiding for a while. Pete Rocco's out of prison. Yeah, so I heard. Is that why you called me? Right. Rocco said he'd get you, and he's not the type to kid. He'll be looking for you, Rick. Well, that's just Andy, Walt, because I'll be looking for him. What? I've got a client who wants Rocco back behind bars. Any idea where he is? Uh, not much to go on. He's here in town somewhere, that's for sure. Why do you say that? 
Well, remember that roll he took from that bookie before he plugged him? Mm -hmm. More than 50,000 bucks. He never would tell where he hid it. Oh, yeah. You think he'll hang around long enough to dig it up and then go south, huh? That's how it looks to me. On the other hand, you might contact one of his old cronies here to get the dough and meet him somewhere else. Maybe. But Pete wouldn't trust many people with 50000 Oh, it's, uh, there was a guy named Roscoe Ward used to pal around with Pete a lot. He's yeah. still around town? Yeah, I got a location on him this morning. Seems he's a bowling fanatic. Bowling? Yep, hangs out in an alley around North Broadway. Joint called Atlas Alley. Mm, yeah, yeah, I know the place. Well, I think I'll get a little exercise. Bowling, maybe? Beat snooker. See you around, Walt. I drove up to the Atlas Alleys and parked in a lot across the street. The bowling fanatics were at it hot and heavy, and I sat down in one of the spectator's seats. Half an hour later, a pale little punk came in, got an alley, and began bowling alone. I decided to join him, not because he looked lonely, but because his name happened to be Roscoe Ward. Do I know you? Well, I have the ugliest friends in town. Maybe you'd like to be one of them. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm antisocial. Mind if I bowl with him? Yeah. Thanks. I'll go first. Oh, I knocked them all down. Now, what will you play with? Hey, hey that's not bad. you got a swell approach. Thanks. What's your pitch anyway? What do you want from me? Well, I'd like to meet some of your friends, Roscoe. Like I said before, a man is social. So is your friend I want to meet. Just got back in town and won't let anyone see him. Oh, well, what? Hey, now I remember you. The name's Diamond. Good memory. Let's try it again. Know where Pete Rocco is? Oh, oh, oh so that's it, huh? But you better head for the Catskills. Word says that Petey's going to put a slug through your private eye. Yeah, so I heard. I thought I'd look him up and beg for mercy or something. Yeah, I bet. But sorry I can't help you. You'll look it. But if I should see Pete, I'll tell him you was looking for him. <laughs> yeah, he get a big kick out of that. Now beat it, leg man. I got a bowl. Roscoe went back to his game and I left the alleys. The only thing I knew about Pete Rocco was that somewhere in this city of millions he was waiting to kill yours truly. Not a pleasant thought. But then I'm not in a very pleasant business. I crossed the street to the parking lot and went to my car. Hi, pal. I've been waiting for you. Wow, oh, Pete Rocco. Yeah, yeah. Get in. You look thinner, Pete. Can I go across the street and get you a hot dog? No, thanks, pal. Right now, I've got my heart set on a little ride. Now, get in. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective... Here's your Rexall family druggist. Last week, a customer told me that... Something I really like about Rexall Milk of Magnesia is that one bottle won't be so thick I can't even pour it, and the next one's thin and watery. Somehow, Rexall Milk of Magnesia always seems to be just right. Well, ma'am, that's because every bottle of Rexall Milk of Magnesia has to meet an exacting standard of viscosity, or it won't wear the Rexall label. What do you mean by... Viscosity. Well, an easy definition would be the degree of thickness in a liquid. Now, Rexall scientists conduct scientifically precise tests on every batch of Rexall milk of magnesia to make sure it meets this constant standard of viscosity, because that's one big reason why you'll always get a uniform dosage from every bottle. Oh, and I thought it was all just an accident. Oh, no, ma'am. There are no accidents behind the fact. You can always depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. With a gun pointed at me and Pete Rocco at my side, I followed directions and drove to a Harlem address. Pete led me upstairs and into a half-furnished flat. Far enough. Now sit right here, bright boy. That's good. You know, pal, I've been waiting a long time for this. I'm you always were the patient type. What are you waiting for now, Pete? An audience? No, I'm in no hurry. You just sit there and square me for a while. Who's there? 
Peter. He was looking for you. Let's not rub it in, boys. Hey, what you waiting for, Petey? Take care of him. Let's beat him. Shut up. We don't leave till I get word it's all clear to pick up the money. Yeah, but when are you going to find out? Who's going to let you know? Don't get too nosy, Roscoe. Alan, after you picked me up, I had a rough time. During that trial, I didn't know what they were going to throw at me. Life with a chair. You just had to wait. Well, that's what you're going to do. You're going to sit there and you're going to wait. When you're least suspecting it, I'm going to put three slugs through your head. My barber won't like this. Yeah, just keep making cracks, wise guy. You'll break before long. Yeah, you'll break before long. Is there an echo in here? Roscoe, did you shake that police tail? If it's here, uh, he's still looking for me. In the bowling alley. Good. Tie Diamond up tight and keep an eye on him. I'm going out for a while. Ah, oh, Pete, you ain't going to take a chance on getting seen. Shut up. Been away for five years. I'll do what I want. I'll tie him up. Pete kept the gun on me while Roscoe tied my arms behind a chair. Then he put the gun he had taken from me in his left pocket and his own in his right. He resembled a walking armory as he went out the door. You know, Snoopy? You're not so bad. Oh, now, watch it, Roscoe. You'll hurt my feelings. Well, Pete's a rough boy. I'm going to enjoy watching him settle with you. Oh, you have such simple taste. What's in this for you? Pete giving you a cut? Yeah, if he ever gets around to picking up the dough. He's got to wait until he gets the all clear signal out. Oh, so there's someone else in this. Who, Roscoe? I don't know. If I did, I wouldn't yap to you. No, it's too bad you'll be a corpse. Hmm? Oh, thanks for the pleasant thought. No, I mean it. That strike you made at the bowling alley tonight. That, that just wasn't luck. You got a swell approach. You think so? Yeah. That's when I have my trouble with my approach. But when Pete gives me my cut at the door, I'm going to buy me an alley and bowl all the time. Oh, how exciting. Say, you want to give me a few pointers? What? The approach. Maybe you could help me improve mine, huh? Now, look. This floor is kind of slippery. Now, watch. Now, I always hold the ball like this. You see? I swing it back. And approach like this. Ed, yeah. how'd it look to you? Well, I, uh, I couldn't see too well from here. Suppose you untie my hands. Oh, no, and... no, 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 no. You gotta stay tied there. Oh, I'm afraid I can't help you then. Uh, come around this side. I can't see through that table. Oh, all right. Yo, I got it, I got it. I'll slide towards you this time. All right. Yeah. What do you think of that? Well, I, uh, I won't hurt you now. No, go on. Be brutal. Well, it's, it's too sloppy, Roscoe. You keep your head up too high. The head, huh? Oh, yeah, sure. And keep the head down. That's right. Ward followed instructions and kept his head down low, just in line with my foot. Chalk up a strike for Diamond. He went down like the number 10 pen. I managed to work my hands up over the back of the chair... Then a few calisthenics and my hands were in front of me, still tied, but free enough to call Walt Levinson on the phone. Fifteen minutes later, he arrived, put the cuffs on Ward, and untied me. Hey, you're loose. You know, maybe I should have kept you tied up. You might stay out of trouble then. You're so considerate, Walt. I'll put some men around the house. When Pete comes back with... Uh-oh. Maybe him now. Otis, bring Roscoe Ward over here. Come on, Ward. Ward, you pick up that phone and act like nothing's happened. Hold the receiver so we can hear who's on the line. If you don't, I'll see that the judge throws the book at you. Uh, uh, hello. Costco. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is this Pete? Of course, you don't want it. Wrong? Oh, no, 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 Pete. No, everything's fine. You're so funny. Uh, take the phone out and put the receiver in front of Diamond. Yeah, uh, sure, it's sure, your Pete. That's it. I heard him. Give me the phone. Uh, hello, Pete. Take up to see if I'm comfortable? How long you been loose, pal? Come again? Diamond, I left you in a chair across the room. The phone don't reach that far. Well, Pete, you're getting smarter. Yeah, thanks. Too bad I'll have to postpone those three slugs in the head. But maybe later. I'm glad you said maybe, Pete. I have different ideas. Yeah, we'll see, pal. We'll see. Well, he fixed us, Walt. He won't be back here. Does this bird know where he is? Yeah, I don't think so. 
Costco, you mentioned that Pete had to wait for the word from someone before he could pick up that money. Who is that someone? I told you before, I don't know. Look, punk, you're all through. Help us out and you'll get a better deal in court. Yeah, but if I knew, I'd tell you. All I know is that Pete won't go near the door until this someone gives him the green light. No. I think he's telling the truth, Walt. Take him downtown and book him. I'm going to visit him. I drove back out Mulberry Street to the Rocco Cigar Store. I was hoping Pete's brother, Dan, might remember some of Pete's old hangouts. I wanted to wrap up this case quickly for two reasons. One, Pete was a killer, might kill again at any minute. And two, I might be the one he'd kill. Simon? Oh, yeah. Hello, Danny. I'm trying to get you in your office. I think I know where Pete is. So, Mr. Zama. I'll tell you later. I do hope you have something to report. Well, uh, uh, not much, Mrs. Rocco. Well, I met your son today on the wrong side of a gun. I don't know where he is now. Oh, well, that's too bad. But you will catch him, I'm sure of that. Peter must be punished. I don't hold with violence, Mr. Diamond. Uh, Ma, don't you want me to drive you over to visit Mrs. Montelli? Oh, well, that would be nice, Daniel. I'd like that. Well, uh, uh, you get your wrap and we'll go now. All right. And Mr. Diamond, remember... I want my son caught quickly before he can kill again. Good day. Now then, Danny, what were you saying about Pete? I know where you can locate him. I didn't want to talk in front of Ma. I want to get out of this. Go on. Pete called me a little while ago. He's coming over tonight. I'm taking Ma to visit a friend, so she'll be out of the way. Tonight's your chance, Diamond. Tonight. I made plans to meet Danny out in front of the shop around 8, then I went back to my office. I called Helen, wrote my dinner date for that evening, and waited as the hours ticked by. 7.30, and I was ready to go. Pete had taken my gun earlier, so I slipped a spare in my pocket and drove to the cigar store. I parked down the street, walked halfway up the block, and met Danny. Diamond? Yeah. My boy showed up yet? No, but he should be here soon. Come on. We walked up to the shop and Danny unlocked the door. The shop was dark as I entered and I tripped over something on the floor. Hey, can we have some light in here? Sure, why not? That's better. And then I saw what I tripped over. Pete Rocco with six bullet holes in his body. And then it was clear. Why had Pete come here? To get the money. That made the strong-armed boy behind me to contact. The one Pete was waiting for to give him the all-clear was little brother Danny. Are you, Shamus? I'll be honest. Yes, I am. Pretty smooth, huh? Here, catch. <coughs> yeah, that's good. You'll notice it's your gun. Pete was bragging about how he took it from you. He let me see it. And that was fatal. Right. And this gun I got on you now was Pete's. I kill you, put the gun in Pete's hand, and I'm clear you shot each other. No one will blame me. You thought this all out, huh? That's right. Pete and I robbed that bookie together. He left the dope for me to keep after he was picked up. I figured he'd never get out, but when he did... Well, it's real convenient your being around. Now say your prayers, Samus. This is it. Is he? Is he dead, Mr. Diamond? No, you, uh, you hit him in the shoulder. Better call an ambulance, though. Yes. My boys. Peter and Daniel, look at them. When I tried to teach them, I told them I wouldn't stand for violence. But they wouldn't listen. You know... Sometimes you've just got to be stern. You rang for me, Miss Hillis? Yes, Francis. Will you fix us some drinks, please? Soda with mine. And you, Mr. Diamond? Oh, I'll take soda too, Francis. About a jiggerful. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Rick, uh-huh. don't you ever get tired. Playing the piano? Oh, never. That's not what I meant. 
By today, you were almost killed twice. Honey, you can only be killed once. All right, then. You were threatened twice. Don't you ever wish you were in a different profession? For instance? Oh, insurance, maybe. You can talk fast enough. Well, you uh, may have something there. Need a lot of gals in the insurance game. On second thought, you'd be better as a good humor man. Need a lot of children instead. Hmm. Gals are like better. And so I've noticed. Oh, hello. What's wrong with my own business? Now, where else could I find excitement all day and a beautiful girl to sing to at night? Hmm. Flattery will get you everywhere, Mr. Diamond. Don't I know it? A little bit independent in your walk. A little bit independent in your talk. There's nothing like you in Paris or New York. You're awfully easy on the eye. A little bit independent when we dance. A little bit independent towards romance. A bit of sophistication in your glance. And yet you're easy on the eye. Whenever I'm with you alone, you weave a magic spell. And though it be a danger zone, I only know that you're swell. A little bit independent with your smile. A little bit independent in your style. How can I help but love you all the while when you're so easy on the eye? Rick. Yes, baby? I've been wondering which holds more attraction for you. Me or my piano? Hmm? Oh, come here, baby. Here's your drink, Mr. Oh! Mr. Diamond. Miss Helen. Oh, dear. Why did I ever leave Cambridge? Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Whenever you have a headache, remember this about Rexall aspirin. When taken with water, the five full grains of pure aspirin in every Rexall tablet are ready to go to work for you even before they reach your stomach. So whenever you have a headache, remember that about Rexall aspirin. Ask for it at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember always, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role, with music composed and conducted by Frank Wirth. Look for Dick Powell in the Metro-Golden-Mayer production, Right Cross, in which he co-stars with June Allison and Ricardo Montalban. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next week at this time, when we will again present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hiya, beautiful. Get lost, bristle puss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids, like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll go stag. That's it. Join the stag line now at Rexall Drugstores Everywhere. Yes, to make girls care, go stag. <laughs>
listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. This is your Rexall family druggist with a specially important news for you. This week's issues of the Saturday Evening Post, Life, Look, Colliers, and the Farm Journal carry a two-page advertisement on Rexall's famous one-cent sale that starts October 19th. You'll find 150 guaranteed Rexall products, every one of them offered at two for the price of one plus a penny. And that's not all. There are 53 other specials too good to miss. So be sure to check this ad on Rexall's big one-cent sale. And when you see it, remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you another half hour with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. I'm Roger Renard, uh, real estate. Well, uh, have a seat. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's get right to the point. Oh, so it's me, $100 a day plus expenses. Oh, yes, your uh, fee. Well, it's not much, but it's all mine, and I love it. Uh, <laughs> What's that racket? Nothing. Excuse me. M- Mr. Diamond, I'm, I'm being blackmailed. Well, it happens in the best of families, especially in the best of families. Mr. Diamond, I'm engaged to marry a very wealthy widow. What's that clicking? Have you got a wild lifesaver in your mouth? I have false teeth, Mr. Diamond. Is that so amusing? When they start making bird calls? Yes. They're new. Just got them yesterday. Mm. Awful nuisance. Oh. Well, you were engaged to some wealthy widow last I heard. I don't appreciate your humor, Mr. Diamond. I happen to be very much in love with my fiancée. Sorry. It so happens that I dabbled in a rather, uh, shall we say, off-color business in my younger days. Shall we say what we, you mean? Mm, perhaps it would be better. Yes. Twenty-five years ago, Mr. Diamond, I became rather discouraged working for a living. Especially when I saw less gifted men enjoying the real fruits of life. Having some education and a bit of charm. Excuse me again. You know, if you learned the Morse code on those things, it would be the life of the party. Briefly, I courted wealthy women. Predominantly widows who sought romance, uh, flattery, etc. I married several times without bothering to obtain divorces in between. Oh, well, wait until the Reno Chamber of Commerce hears about you. In due time, the police caught up with me. My accumulated crimes cost me eight years in jail. But when I was released, I decided to turn my talents toward more legal pursuits. Glory be, you're saved. Saved, indeed. Can you imagine what my fiancé would think if she learned of my past? She'd surely suspect my motives. And the irony is that I do love her deeply. Oh, I see. Well, who's the killjoy that shares your little secret? Now, that's the puzzle. Nobody in New York knows of my past. I haven't told a soul. But I received this letter in the morning mail. Here. See how smart you are. He gave me a square white envelope. The dozen for a quarter variety. And I slipped the letter out of it. It was typewritten and point by point looked like a pocket biography of a one-time Casanova. It ended up by ordering Renard to have a $100 bill ready that night when someone called Andy would be at his home to pick it up. I relaxed a little. The case began to look like the standard kind of blackmail as found in the detective's manual. I know you think $100 isn't much. Well, that all depends how often you have to pay it. I don't suppose you know who Andy is. I do not. Oh, well, that makes the next step pretty obvious, Renard. What's your address? Here's my card. I'll expect you at nine. Leave a candle in the window. Uh-oh. Nailed down everything, Lieutenant. It's the shamus. Why, Sergeant Otis, don't tell me it's you. You've brightened my whole day. I don't know why, but that's too bad. Well, the boys in the pool room told me you were drafted. I cashed in all my war bonds. Now I can buy them back. <laughs> uh, Otis, stop trying to figure that one out. What's doing, Rick? Oh, nothing much, Walt. 
How'd you like to come along with me tonight? Help me wrap up a screwy blackmail deal. Might learn something. It's a new angle. What's new about blackmail? Well, the whodunit part in this case. My client doesn't know who's blackmailing him, but some character named Andy is supposed to pick up the cabbage tonight. Want to come along or not? I'd like to, Mr. Diamond, if the invitation is still open. Well, that's very nice, Lieutenant Levinson. It's open to you for a nominal fee. Oh, I'm prepared to pay. Oh, hey, cut it out, Rick. Can I go too, Lieutenant? Sorry, Otis. This is strictly stag. Oh, I didn't know. Excuse me. One moment. Oh, uh, come in, Mr. Diamond. Who is this other gentleman? Roger Renard. Meet Lieutenant Walt Levinson. The police. Mr. Diamond, I expressed my... Take it easy, take it easy, Mr. Renard. I'm here unofficially. What time is it, Walt? Nearly nine. Mm. Quiet. I just heard something. Oh, relax, Walt, relax. Mr. Renard is suffering from a set of mechanized molars. Oh. (laughs) Store teeth, huh? Yes, it has become unbearably embarrassing. Oh, would you gentlemen care for a drink while we're waiting? I'll take a double of anything. Oh, I don't think I'll have Oh, go ahead, Walt. Get an unofficial snootful. Wait. Oh, (laughs) sit tight, Renard. I'll get it. I'll cover you, Rick, just in case. A package for Mr. Raynard. Come right in, Andy. What do you mean, Andy? My name's Sheldon. Are you Raynard? I'm Renard. Oh, sign here. I'll sign it, uh, Renard. It uh, looks like straight goods. We're getting anxious. All right, then. Here. Uh, Here's your package. Keep this side up. Okay, Sheldon. Sorry for the trouble. Here. Catch. Hey, thanks. Thanks a million. Uh, false alarm. Hey, that's a screwy-looking package. Look at those holes all over the top. Can't imagine who would be sending me anything. Why don't you open it as long as we're killing time? Yes, yeah, good. Well, <laughs> heavy cardboard. Uh, <clears throat> there. Rick, what? look. It, it, it's alive. It's a pigeon. Oh. All right, you. Talk. What are you yelling at that bird for? Well, I thought he might be a stool pigeon. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Gentlemen, look at this nameplate on the bird's leg. Here, underneath the capsule. Says Andy. That must be the bird's name. Let me see that box it came in. Uh, yeah, there's a note. Listen to this. Mr. Renard, by now you have met Andy, my pigeon. You will please roll the $100 bill very tightly and place it in the capsule attached to Andy's leg. Then simply release him outdoors. Please check your watch, Mr. Renard. If Andy isn't safely home by 9.30, your secret will be turned over to the papers in the morning. You will hear from me again next week. Hmm, no signature. How do you like that? You get it, Rick? Andy's a homing pigeon. Oh, don't explain it, Walt. Just pick out a nice hard wall for me to knock my conceited head against. Mr. Diamond, it's almost 9.15. What shall I do? Well, here's my overpaid opinion, Renard. If you don't pay off, you know what'll happen. If you do pay off... We'll just keep working on the case and hope for the best. Rick, do you think we oh, could... Oh, Walt, follow... Walt, Walt, don't say it. The chances of following a pigeon between New York skyscrapers, especially at night, is strictly for radar. Something we don't happen to have handy. Well, what's it going to be, Renard? Uh, I'll pay the money, of course. There's no other way. But this will be me dry week in, week out. Uh, looks that way. Well, that will be the end, then. I can't raise that much cash each week. Well, here's the money, Mr. Diamond. Will you gentlemen take care of the details? There wasn't any use hanging around. Walt drove me home, and I spent the rest of the night dreaming about flying blackmailers. Sure, we could check the delivery outfit that brought the package, but I'd give odds the turn address was phony. Come morning, I washed the sour taste out of my mouth with some coffee and went to my office. While I was draping some black crepe around my license, business picked up. A nervous young man walked in, introduced himself as John Miller, hemmed and hawed for a minute, and then blurted out with, Mr. Diamond, I need your help right away. I'm being blackmailed. Just because I sat there with my mouth open, he thought I was interested and told me more. He was married, and several years ago, another girl had come along. Nothing serious. The romance had died in a few weeks, but his wife might not understand, so on, so on. Uh, Mr. Diamond, why are you staring at me that way? Who is blackmailing you? What's the strangest part? I don't know. Oh, don't sit there and lie to me. You've got to know. Blackmail means that somebody has got... Oh, no, never mind. Well, there's one thing, though. Tonight at 9 o'clock, someone named Andy will be... Andy? Oh, no. No, no, no! (laughs) 
Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, here's a lady with a question for our Rexall family druggist. I want to know more about the ad on Rexall's one-cent sale. Well, ma'am, the ad appears in this week's Life, Look, Collier's, the Saturday Evening Post, and the Farm Journal. Two big pages crammed with 150 guaranteed Rexall products. Every one of them offered to you during Rexall's famous one-cent sale at two for the price of one, plus a penny. Golly, what an opportunity to save. And that's not all. The ad also lists 53 other specials that can help you cut your cost of living to a minimum. Now, in front of every item, there's a little square so you can check what you need in advance. Why well, I can use the ad as a shopping list. That's exactly what we intend it to be. It's your big chance to stock up for months in advance. Because on October 19th, the starting date of Rexall's one cent sale, you double your buying power simply by adding a penny. Where did you say the ad appears? In this week's Collier's, Look, Life, Saturday Evening Post, and Farm Journal. Look for it. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. So it had come to me as it must to all private detectives. A strange little voice inside my head began nagging. Get out of this business while you still have all your marbles. Get into something sensible like taming Python. It wasn't enough to have one client being blackmailed by someone he didn't know. A second guy has to walk in with the same routine. And the payoff was that a certain miserable homing pigeon called Andy had a feather in the pie. A foul, foul, that Andy. After a while, my second client, Miller, began to fidget in his seat. Probably because I began sharpening my letter opener. Uh, Mr. Diamond, do you feel all right? Oh, yes, I I feel great, simply great. Just keep me away from open windows. I beg your pardon? Oh, forget it, forget it. Now, let's see now. You're being blackmailed, but you don't know by whom. And a certain Andy will be at your office by 9 o'clock tonight to pick up the money. Uh, yes, that's right. Oh, well, now, Miller, I'll I'll be kind. I won't tell you who Andy is right now. First of all, you tell me, uh, do you know Roger Renard? Roger Renard? Mm-hmm. Mm, no, I, I, I don't believe so. Now, think hard, Miller. Small guy, bright blue eyes, cultured voice. No, I don't know anyone like that. Who is he? Well, he happens to be in the same hole you are. Andy paid him a visit last night. Really? Yeah. This is bargain basement day and blackmail. Well, what do you know? Well, let me think. Renard, Renard. Now, look, look, I got a better idea. You just sit tight and leaf through my collection of unpaid bills. It'll keep your mind off your own worries. Well, there's got to be an answer to this. Hello? Uh, Renard, this is Diamond. Can you get to my office in 15 minutes? Of course. Has anything happened? Uh, don't ask. But, uh, Just it... hurry. There'll be a diagram for you when you get here. When Roger Renard arrived, I introduced him and revealed my last hope. Somewhere, there had to be a familiar connection between Miller and Renard. A familiar place, a mutual friend. Well, they finally caught on and began playing the game known as... Haven't I met you somewhere before? Now, let's see, Miller. Uh, were you in Kansas in the winter of 1942? I had a dear lady friend there at the time, name of Sophie Holloway. Never been in Kansas. I spent uh, two years in Seattle, though, 1938-39. No, never had the pleasure of being in Seattle. Um, pardon me. Bad job done on my new team. Oh. <clears throat> now, about New York. Have a frequent... And so it went on and on. If these guys had been stranded on a desert island 20 feet square, they probably never would have bumped into each other. But the fact remained. Somebody knew about the pass of both and was using the same technique to blackmail them. An hour and three aspirants later, my head began to feel like a ping-pong ball being smacked from Miller to Renard, from Renard to Miller, from Miller... Well, I've done my best to stay away from physical exertion, and I must say that I've been rather successful at it. The, the devil take these artificial bicuspids. I go to all the expense of having New York's best oral surgeon work on my mouth, and then some incompetent dentist can't turn out a proper hitting dentist. Uh, well, we're not getting any place, and I have an appointment in two minutes. You learn anything new, Mr. Diamond? You'll be sure to call me, won't you? If something doesn't happen soon, I... Well, I just don't know. No, don't worry, Roger. We'll catch the culprit or my name isn't... Uh... Oh, oh, well, it doesn't make any difference anyway. 
Well, goodbye, Mr. Dunn. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Dunn. Uh, goodbye, Renard. Whew. That guy was driving me crazy with that clack-clack of his teeth. You think an oral surgeon with Cutler's reputation would recommend a competent dentist to his patients? I thought he was great. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now, look, Miller, isn't there anything else I can do for you? Find out who stole your yo-yo in 1922 or maybe get you... Look, just find out who's blackmailing me, Diamond. I haven't slept in days. I know, I know. Somehow I feel that soon you won't be alone. If you could only find out where that pigeon is. Hello, pigeon. Rick, what are you doing here in the middle of the afternoon? Oh, I'm looking for a place to hide, Helen, dear. Can I borrow your closet? Hide from what? Pigeons, false teeth. A pigeon with false teeth? No, 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 dear. A client with false teeth. The pigeon's blackmailing him. Oh, a stool pigeon. No, I tried that. This pigeon flies. He has a plane? Honey, honey, this is a real pigeon with wings yet. You know, like this. Oh, just lie down on the couch and take it easy. You must be working too hard. I don't want to lie down. You want to fly. No, no. Well, make up your mind. Well, I'm trying to tell you why I came over. Two guys who never saw each other are being blackmailed. By a pigeon. Yes. The same pigeon. Yes. And it flies. Yes, and it goes coo, 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 brr, coo, coo. Uh, are you sure you wouldn't like to lie down? No, I just want some peace and quiet so I can figure this thing out. Rick, darling... At least try and take it easy. No, no, come on. Nothing's that bad. Smile for Helen. Smile? <laughs> oh, come on. Let's see your pearly teeth. Hmm? I said, let's see your pearly teeth. Helen, Helen, that's it. That's wonderful. Now, how about a nice cool drink? No, no, listen. Renard said he went to New York's best oral surgeon. Later, Miller said an oral surgeon with Dr. Cutler's reputation should have recommended a competent dentist. And he was probably right. Now, why don't you just try... How did Miller know Renard was talking about Dr. Cutler? Ouija board? Because Miller must have been treated by Dr. Cutler, too, and knows he's the best oral surgeon in New York. Helen, i got to make a phone call. I grabbed the phone book, looked up the office of Dr. Cutler, oral surgeon, then called Walt. Twenty minutes later, I met the good lieutenant on the tenth floor of an office building on Madison Avenue. Walt assigned Otis to guard duty outside of Dr. Cutler's office. His orders were to trip any guy in a white smock that seemed in a hurry to take the day off. Walt and I agreed to underplay our police affiliations just in case we were wrong. Then we went in. We slowed up when a white mountain of a woman stood up from her desk and announced she was Miss Barrows, Dr. Cutler's nurse. Could have fooled me. From the size of her, Notre Dame could have used her last week. What seems to be the trouble, gentlemen? Well, it's, uh, it's somewhat important, Miss Barrow. We'd like to, uh, see Dr. Cutler as soon as possible. My name's Diamond. I see. In just a moment. Yes, Miss Barrow? Doctor, there's a Mr. Diamond and his friend here to see you. They say it's urgent. Thank you. I'll be right out. Won't you sit down? Uh, no, 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 thanks. We'll, we'll stand. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, hello, Doctor. How do you do? What seems to be the trouble? May uh, may we go into your office, Doctor? Oh, yes, of course. Go right in. Uh, Miss Barrow, are those x-rays ready and that impacted molar? I'll have a look, Doctor. Mm, thank you. Now, gentlemen. The doctor was an old, red-faced gentleman with puzzled blue eyes. As tactfully as I could, I told him about Renard and Miller. And the fact that they were in trouble. He remembered them. Oh, yes, Mr. Diamond. I removed Mr. Renard's teeth last month. As for Mr. Miller, he was in just last week. Uh, the rest of it is pretty blunt, Dr. Cutler. Both of these men are being blackmailed by the same party. And it just so happens, Doctor, that you are the only acquaintance they have in common. What? Now, look here, now, young... Don't get excited, Doc. Rick isn't accusing you. We just have to check these things. I realize that. I think my position and past record in dental surgery are proof enough... If you care to see a statement of income from my practice, plus stock dividends, you'll see how foolish... Yeah, yeah, Doc, you're right. Rick, it just doesn't figure, not for a lousy couple of hundred bucks. No, I know, Walt. It sure looks that way. But if this isn't the end of the line, we'll be on this sleigh ride forever. Dr. Cutler, is there, a, is there anyone else in your office who gets to know the patients well? Just myself and Miss Barrow. She's the nurse's heart side. I could call her in. No, no, no. In a minute, Doctor. Does she uh, just answer the door and take temperatures or, or what? Oh, no, of course not. 
Miss Barrow was a registered nurse and a trained anesthetist. You mean she gives your patients Novocaine? Is that it, Doc? Novocaine, yes, in some cases. For specific cases, we must use a more general anesthetic like sodium pentothal or gas. Or sometimes... Doctor, doctor, isn't sodium pentothal sometimes called the truth serum? Yes, in narcosynthesis. It's sometimes used in psychiatric treatment. Some patients will answer any question truthfully under the influence of sodium pentothal. See, it weakens the conscious will and... Pen- the x-rays are ready, doctor. Oh, that's Miss Barrow now. I'll call her. No, no, no. Don't do it, doctor. Stall her. Just ask... Ask her to uh, wait outside. I don't understand, but... Very well. One moment, Miss Barrow. What are you going to do, Rick? Uh, doctor, I want you to pretend that I'm an emergency case. Must be treated at once. Can you? Oh, of course, but... Now, can you have your nurse give me something harmless instead of pentothal? Well, yes. Distilled water could be substituted. Well, we're in business. Walt, you make like the old friend who came along for laughs. Uh-huh. Now, Doctor, call Miss Barrow in and turn her loose on me. Just relax in the chair, Mr. Diamond. There's nothing to worry about. Oh, I hope not. My my, my whole mouth feels like it's burning. Now I'll mm. have to strap your hand down for the pentothal action. Mm. This won't take long, will it? You won't feel a thing. Now, there's the tourniquet. Now we're ready. Well, let's, let's get it over with. Very soon, Mr. Diamond. Very soon. Mm. 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 You're getting drowsy now. Very tired, aren't you? Um, yeah, I... You can talk, Mr. Diamond. Oh, I... Patients oh, I... often talk away their troubles while I take care of them. Oh, yes, talk. Uh, talk away troubles. It's up to you, of course. But if you want to get anything off your conscience, why, just go ahead. Oh, wonderful. Everybody has something that's bothering them. Something they're ashamed of. Ashamed? Oh. You can tell me. Ashamed of? Oh, ashamed. Yes. Go on. I. I used to steal money from a friend of mine. He was a wonderful guy, big, fat, but but dumb from the word go. I. I'd steal him blind. His his watch, his, his cash. He, he never knew what was happening. That was terrible of you, wasn't it? What's his name? Levinson. Walt Levinson. Oh, but then I... Yes, I'm listening. Well, then... Then he... He became a policeman, a a lieutenant. One night he caught me stealing. I... I had to kill him. He was going to arrest me. And you escaped? Yes, escaped. But his ghost haunts me, haunts me. In fact, Lieutenant Walt Levinson is sitting in the next room, badge and all. Okay, Miss Barrow, we've all heard enough. Andy's going to miss you. Come on, Walt. What? Why, you... All right, lady, hold it. Watch out, Walt. Walt ducked just in time to miss being scalded by the boiling pan of surgical instruments. But it gave her enough time to run out of the office. I had just freed myself when I heard a scream from the hall. Walt and I rushed out there and found Otis helping Miss Barrow to her feet. Gee, miss, I'm sorry I tripped you, but but you was wearing a white smock and I got mixed up. I'm sorry, honest I am. Shut up, Otis. What? what? Oh, Otis, Otis, I don't know what to say. You you doing this, I... Otis, you... Oh, Otis, you are without a doubt. Feel better? Mm hmm. All calmed down. Oh, sure. No more problems? Mm, not a single one. Uh, how's the pigeon? Oh, we found him over at a nurse's house. He was staying with the nurse? In the garage, yes. Had a friend there, too. The nurse worked for Dr. Cutler, an oral surgeon. Well, I thought you said your client was the one with the false teeth. Oh, well, that's right. Then what was the matter with the pigeon? Nothing. He was just a little tired from making all those trips with that money tied to his leg. Uh, why don't you sing something? Mm, all right. It's wonderful. It's marvelous. 
you should care for me. Soft nights, paradise, what I love to see. You've made my life so glamorous. You can't blame me for feeling amorous. Oh, wonderful, marvelous that you should care for. How was that? Hmm? Oh, oh, fine. Fine. I don't even think you were listening. Rick, uh, about the pigeon and what you said about money tied to his leg and... Ah, come here. Now, wait a minute. I'm confused. Come here. You said that you had a client who... He had false teeth. Mm -hmm. And a pigeon with money... Mm -hmm. Still confused? Uh-huh. Confuse me some more. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. You listeners will have at least one of these magazines in your home this week. Life, Look, Collier's, The Saturday Evening Post, or The Farm Journal... Pick it up and turn the pages till you come to the two-page ad on Rexall's one-cent sale that starts October 19th. Take a long look at this opportunity to buy twice as much for just a penny more because this ad lists 150 guaranteed Rexall products, all offered at two for the price of one plus a penny. In addition, there are 53 other sales specials you can't afford to miss. So check this ad on Rexall's big one-cent sale. And remember, starting October 19th and continuing through October 23rd, you can buy twice as much for just a penny more. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Joe Morheim and Hal Bloom and edited by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Dick Powell's soon-to-be-released picture is the Metro-Golden-Mayer production, Right Cross, in which he co-stars with June Allison and Ricardo Montalban. Featured in tonight's cast were Ted Osborne, Wilms Herbert, Arthur Q. Bryan, Bob Sweeney, D.J. Thompson, and Virginia Gregg. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is produced and directed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to join us next week at the same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Check the double-page ad in this week's Life, Look, Collier, Saturday Evening Post, and Farm Journal on Rexall's one-cent sale that starts October 19th. Mark the date on your calendar. It's your chance to buy two top-quality guaranteed Rexall products for the price of one plus the penny. Hear a thrilling police drama on Dragnet tomorrow night on NBC. While the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective.
Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist with a message that will save you money. Tomorrow morning at Rexall drugstores everywhere, Rexall's world-famous one-cent sale begins. From then on through Monday, October 23rd, you can buy two regular guaranteed Rexall products for the price of one plus one cent. For example, the regular price for the 100-tablet bottle of Rexall aspirin is 54 cents. During Rexall's one-cent sale, you get two bottles for 55 cents. That's right. Just a penny more buys twice as much. What's more, this offer of two for the price of one plus a penny applies to literally hundreds of items. From vitamins to mineral oil, from cold cream to iodine, from shaving needs to Christmas cards. And what's more important, these are Rexall products, and you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you another half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, we can solve any crime but television. Diamond, stop clowning and get right down here. Well, Sergeant Lovelum. What's the matter, Otis? Didn't the zoo pick up your option? Oh, now quit that. You gotta get right down here. Something terrible's happened. They haven't made you commissioner. Worse than that, Lieutenant Levinson's been kidnapped. Diamond to see you, Captain. Hello, Collins. Sure. All right, Diamond. Uh, Otis just called me about Walt. Now, look, Rick. I know Walt's a personal friend of yours. He's a good friend of mine, too. But this is police business. A cop's been kidnapped. Diamond was a cop for six years. I don't need a case history, Sergeant. Oh, get off it, Charlie. I'm down here to help. Of course you are. But there's one thing I won't stand for, Rick. The way you operate. Well, what's the matter with the way I operate? I know how you feel about Walt, and when a guy feels that strongly about someone, he's liable to do a lot of things to get a few answers. Oh, for Pete's sake, Charlie. What are you going to do, hold a tea party and hope someone will spread some gossip? That's not fair, Rick. Well, if you think I'm going to sit back knowing that Bert Fisher's got... Who said anything about Bert Fisher? Well, nobody had to say anything. Pretty obvious, isn't it? Walt sent Bert's brother Art to the electric chair. Bert swore he'd get Walt for it. Fisher dies tonight, doesn't he? Yeah. Sure, I think it's Bert Fisher, too. And we're going to do everything about it we can. Bert's been to Detroit, hasn't he? Yeah. We've got a call into Detroit. Should be hearing any time. This phone call you got saying they had Walt. I didn't have time to trace it. The guy Mm. said Walt was being held, and when Art Fisher dies tonight in the chair, so does Walt. Charlie, I'm going to work on this thing whether you like it or not. That figures. But I promise you, Rick, I won't save your skin if you get out of line. Mm. Any leads yet? No. They're rounding up the usual stoolies. Well, I know a couple of boys who might have a few angles. Who? Nobody who would give you any information. These guys aren't stoolies. They might tell me because I think they like me. You see, Charlie, sometimes it pays not to be a cop. I'll expect any information you get, Rick. Oh, sure. Well, I'll see you later. Now, Rick. Yeah? Be a good boy, will you? Uh, Collins, if we don't find Walt by 11 o'clock, can you hold up Fisher's execution? No. Oh, it's swell. I'll keep in touch. Hey, Diamond, you think you can do anything? And I can try. Do me a favor, Otis. Okay. Get me a complete background on Bert Fisher. Everything. All his friends, his record, as far back as you can go. Gee, Diamond, I'm scared for the lieutenant. You're not alone with that one, Otis. In the Bowery, living in a broken-down rooming house, was a man. Twenty years ago, he'd come to the big city with his trumpet tucked under his arm. He'd started playing with little combinations along 52nd Street, and pretty soon the word got around. Everyone came to listen to him. They called him the Dean of Jazz, and the title stuck. Then one night he had an argument with one of the Fusari mob, and the next morning they found him in an alley, half dead, his face beaten to a pulp. It was a long time before the Dean could get around again, and it was a lot longer before he could play his trumpet. And by then, no one would have him. He couldn't make enough of the horn, so he tried crime. That's where I met him. I did him a favor, and a short time later, he went straight. He'd still kept his underworld connections, but he... He wasn't a stoolie. I'd just done him a favor once. Yeah, who is it? Uh, 
Uh, Richard Diamond. Well, hello, Diamond. How are you, Dean? Like to see you. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of figured you would. Dean, uh, you ever run into a guy named Fisher? Bert Fisher? How about a drink? No, thanks. Skull. Oh, man, it's going to be hot today. This, uh, Bert Fisher grabbed Lieutenant Levinson. Says he's going to kill him. I can't help you. Oh, Dean, I just need one little lead to get started. Yeah, sure. I wish I had a fan in here. How's business? It isn't. I make enough to pay the rent. How about a few bucks to keep you going? Well, I ain't proud, but it won't buy you anything. The lieutenant's a good friend. Yeah, yeah. Word got around this morning. Yeah. Here's ten. Buy yourself some groceries. Oh, thanks. You... You did me a favor once. Forget it. Bert Fisher's got a lot of rough hoods working for him. They're most all from Detroit. But they kill the same as anyone from here. Mm-hmm. Dean, do you know anything at all? I might. Who wants to die? Blow pretty good. <laughs> Cure me and Vix. Well, I'll see you around. Yeah, thanks for the ten. Oh, uh, Dean, about eleven o'clock tonight, play a few bars of the funeral march. Oh, uh, Diamond. Yeah? You, uh, you remember this tune, don't you? as any name can be. You got it, pal. See you around. Fifth Precinct, Sergeant Lovelum. Oh, this is Diamond Otis. What did you find out? Oh, I got reports on everybody we know is connected with Bert Fisher. You want me to read them off? Anybody on that list named Mary? Mary? No. These guys are all named Hallelujah or something. Look, uh, check all of those names and see if Fisher or any one of his boys ever knew a girl named Mary. Then after you do that, I'll... You'll what? Holy smoke. I'll talk to you later. Dean! 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 The Dean had blown his last note. He was sprawled face down on the dirty carpet, clutching the shiny trumpet. A thin line of red was spreading out from a bullet hole in his chest. And the open window sent me across the room in a hurry. I looked out on the fire escape to see a man drop to the alley below. We both fired a split second apart. He staggered as my slug knocked him against the building... And then before I could try again, he disappeared around the corner. I turned, looked down at the dean, and wondered if Gabriel was getting a lesson in jazz. Diamond, I warned you before you left here Okay, that I... okay, Charlie. A nice guy's been killed, but all the crying in the world isn't going to help. Hey, I got something, Diamond. Let's see. Good grief. He's got the whole department working for him. Come on, Otis. What have you got? Uh, is it all right, Captain? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I should be in the second-hand business. Report on one of Fisher's old mob, Lou Baxter. Only one of the whole bunch who had a girl named Mary. Mary? Who's Mary? Charlie, look at this picture. Lou Baxter. I've been looking at it all morning. Oh, take another look. This is the guy I shot climbing down off the fire escape after he killed the dean. What? Holy smoke. You know where you can pick him up? Oh, he's a local boy, all right. Didn't go back to Detroit with Fisher. I've had a call out him since 10.20 this morning. Hey, what about that girl, Otis? Name's Mary Sinclair. Uh, used to go with Lou Baxter, Captain. No address on her. Mary Sinclair and Lou Baxter, huh? Well, it's the first lead we've had. I'll get the boys on it. Charlie had his methods and I had mine. 
Otis got in touch with the musician's local, and in half an hour, I had a list of all the places the dean had worked since the union had a record on him. I started checking. Dives, restaurants, jam joints. Questioning owners, bartenders, waiters. No one knew a girl named Mary Sinclair. Around 3 o'clock, I wandered into a place on 52nd Street known as the Red Parrot. Hey. I'm uh, looking for information. Your cop? Private cop. Mm-hmm. You, uh, you remember a guy who played here last year? Trumpet man? The dean? Sure. Everybody knows the dean. Something wrong? Uh, the dean got himself killed. Oh, no. See, that's too bad. Real nice guy. You ever know a girl named Sinclair? Mary Sinclair? Uh, no. No, I don't think so. Uh, okay. Hey, mister. Yeah? Why don't you ask it? He's the boy with the fingers playing the piano. He knew the dean pretty well. Thanks. You, Ed? Yeah. What can I do for you, Pops? I understand you're a good friend of the dean. Sure, we're compatible. But I ain't seen him in a while. You looking for him? No, for a friend of his. A Mary Sinclair. Cute chick. Uh, where can I find her? Why do you want to find her, Pops? Well, the dean was murdered a few hours ago. He used to live over on 47th Street, 69 West. That was a year ago. You sure about the address? Couldn't forget it. We had a few balls up there. She was kind of a flip. We had a little combo in here, pretty crazy, too. She used to come in and listen. Real hep on jazz. Knew all the old-timers by name. Like the dean. Remembered when he was tops, before he got hurt. You ever hear him in those days? Yeah. I played with him a lot. Used to watch him real close sometimes. After hours. And the boys would just sit around and blow because I felt like it. The dean used to lean back and close his eyes. And blow things like he was getting a word from the other side. It was great. Might have been the greatest. Well, we all got to go on ahead sometime. I guess it ain't so bad, though. The harp's a real wild instrument. I left the piano player and headed to the address he'd given me. There was a good chance Mary Sinclair wasn't living there anymore but it was the closest I'd come to any kind of a lead. When I got there, I held my breath and looked at the mailbox. Score for Diamond. Miss Mary Sinclair still lived in the building. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, here's your Rexall family druggist. And tonight, I have money-saving news. For tomorrow morning at every Rexall drugstore in the country, Rexall's famous one-cent sale begins. The sale where you get two fine-quality, guaranteed Rexall products for the price of one, plus one cent. Exactly how does that work? Well, for example, the regular price for a pint bottle of Rexall's Milk of Magnesia is 39 cents. But during the one-cent sale, you can buy two bottles for 40 cents. Why, that means... A penny more buys twice as much. Exactly, ma'am. What's more, you'll find some 347 of these twin bargains in our stores. Everything from Rexall rubbing alcohol to stationery, from Rexall foot remedies to Rexall dental products, plus 85 other sales specials you can't afford to miss. Well, I'm putting my pennies to work tomorrow. Then use a lot of them, ma'am, for every one of them doubles your buying power. Best of all, you'll be getting Rexall products. And you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Yeah? Uh, Mary Sinclair? Yeah. Whatever you're selling, I'll take a dozen. I'd like to talk with you. A 
I'd like you to some other time. I'm busy right now. I'm afraid this can't wait. It'll have to, baby. Give me a call. Plaza 45466, Mr. Uh, Diamond. Okay, doll. Call me tomorrow, huh? You got your foot in the door, honey. Old habit. Can't seem to break it. Well, I'll break it for you, honey. Your whole leg. You'll be sorry, doll. Mm. All right, baby. Make it quick, huh? What do you want? Let's talk inside. I told you. Yeah, yeah I know. It was cooler in here. The coolest. But it won't be for long. Where's Lou Baxter? Who? You know, the boy you used to run around with. I ran around with a lot of boys. Ever since I was in grammar school, I ran around with boys. It's a hobby. Where's Lou Baxter? Baby, I don't know. You want to twist my arm? Go ahead, it might be fun. He just killed the dean. He did? Shame on him. Forget it, Mary. Hey, Lou. Get out of the way. That's the guy who put a slug in me. Looked like you're in pretty bad shape, Baxter. Doctor's coming. But he ain't gonna be able to help you. See, honey, you should have come back tomorrow. Shut up. Well, wouldn't have been half so painful. I want Bert Fisher. Yeah. Good for you. Get away from that door. Now, walk into that other room. Stop it, back. Uh, you didn't want to play. Oh, you shouldn't have done that, Charlie. I needed him alive. That's gratitude for you. I knew you'd get into trouble, Diamond. So I tailed you from that last bar on 52nd. Is this uh, Mary St. Clair? Charmed, I'm sure. Or to stay here. Call the wagon. Right. There's a doctor coming up. I doubt if he's legit. Wait for him, then bring him down to the station, Otis. Right. Come on, Miss Sinclair. Sure, honey. You know, Mr. Diamond, I think I'll have to break that date for tomorrow. Here are Baxter's things, Captain. Watch, wallet, nothing much. Yeah, let's check the wallet. Hmm. Book of matches. Danny's Diner, Route 51. Check on that, Otis. Right. Uh, nothing much in the wallet. Social security, driver's license, some money. Uh, quite a lot of money. Want to take a look? Yeah. No addresses, huh? Uh, here's a ticket to a shoe repair shop. Uh, nothing much here that would give us a lead. Uh, yeah. Danny's Diner is about 160 miles out on Route 51. And guess who runs it? Who? Chino Amalo. That does it. Call the authorities in that area. Right. Chino Amalo. Hmm. Eight years for armed robbery. Used to work for Bert Fisher. Yeah, maybe this is it. What time is it? Uh, going on seven. This better be it. We only have four hours, and you got to drive 160 miles. Captain Collins talked to the sheriff's office and set up a rendezvous with him near Danny's Diner. Then we piled into a squad car and roared across the 59th Street Bridge for Route 51. Step on it, Otis. We're doing 80 now. Then do 90. It's getting late. Now, Rick, uh, you think we should bust right in the diner and take Amalo? No. Amalo doesn't know me. Never seen me. You stake out your men around the place and I'll go in. Give me a couple of minutes, then you come in, work on Amalo a little, and then leave. If he knows where Fisher is, you'll try to get in touch and I'll tag him. Uh, yeah, a uh, uh, cup of coffee and a piece of pie. You got raspberry, chocolate, lemon, peach, custard. Oh, uh, raspberry. Yeah. Mm. Here you are. Uh, where's the closest gas station? About a mile down the road, but I think it's closed. It's after 10. Closes at 10. Oh, uh, thanks. Miss? Oh, uh, miss? Yeah. Where's Tino Amalo? In the back. You want him? Call him. Sure. Hey, Mr. Amalo, someone wants to see you. Okay, be right there. Yeah, something I can do. Well, what are you doing way out here, Captain? This your book of matches? Yeah, that's the name of my place. Found these matches on Lou Baxter. Baxter's dead. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, you're not going to tie Baxter up with me, are you? Lots of people come in here and take my matches. If Baxter came in here, you saw him. You're an old friend. Well, sure, I, I know, Lou, but I ain't seen him in years. We got word your old boss is in town, Bert Fisher. Oh, is that right? Now, where we might find him? No, I haven't seen Bert in years either. Look, Captain, I've been going straight. Sure. You're uh, a little out of your territory, ain't you? This is unofficial. 
If you were in my jurisdiction, I'd haul you in. Look, I tell you, I'm going straight. I don't know nothing about Lou Baxter or Burke Fish. Okay, Amaro. You may hear from me again. Well, nice seeing you again, Captain. Now, uh, miss. More coffee? Yeah. Where's the phone? Right over there on the wall. Is there another one? In the kitchen, but you can't use that. Mm-hmm. Hey, you can't go back there. Honey, it's the police. You stay where you are. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Tina. Let me talk to Fish. I... Hey, what are you doing? Don't move, Amalo. What is this? Cover up that mouthpiece. Cover it up. Okay, okay. Now, when you get Fisher on the line, say what I tell you. Hold that receiver out so I can listen. Look, friend. You I... look. Say one thing wrong, and I'll use this gun. Your cop? None of your business. Well, look, look I got. Hello, who do you want, Amalo? There he is. Tell him you just heard Baxter was killed. Hello, hello. Tell him, tell him. Uh, hello. Look, I just, uh, just got news that the Baxter was killed. Yeah? Okay, anything else? Say no, that's all. Uh, no, no, that's all. So what's the matter with you? Uh, nothing, nothing. Okay. You got any more of those? Keep in touch. Hang up. Now, where's Fisher hiding out? <laughs> Get up. Where's Fisher hiding out? You dirty flat foot. You nearly bust my jaw. Only nearly? Where is he, Amalo? Well, you kill me if I tell you. That's getting late. Are you going to tell me? Okay, to... okay. He's, he's in a cabin about a mile up the road. Come on. You're going to show us. It's just around that bend. Yeah, we better get out here and walk. How many men has he got in there with him, Chino? Uh, two. Uh, whose cabin is it? Mine. Otis, get out and tell the rest of the men to douse their lights and come over here. Right, Captain. Uh, here's a piece of paper. Draw us the floor plan of that cabin. Here, I'll give you some light. Okay, go ahead, Amalo. How many rooms? Uh, three. Uh-huh. Hey, we're all set, Captain. Okay. One big room with a door here, a kitchen here, and a bedroom here. Oh, where's Lieutenant Levinson? I only been up there once since they got in. He, he was in the bedroom. How about closets, back door? Uh, one closet in the main room here, one in the bedroom here. Let's see, a broom closet in the kitchen and the back door here. Has it got an attic? I no, no. Where's Fisher's car? Uh, parked around the back in the shed. Okay, I'll have the men stake out the place. You're going to take me up there, Amalo? Me? He's going to take us up there. You're a civilian, Rick. If there's any shooting to be done, if there's going to be any shooting, I'm going to be in on it. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who said I was going to take you guys up there anyway? I did. I, did. I told you everything I know. I ain't going to get my head shot off. You're going to walk us up there, Amalo, and you're going to knock on that door. No, no, no. And no. you're going to get them to open up. Look, they're loaded with artillery, shotguns. When the door opens, you duck. Okay, suicide. You heard what the captain said, Amalo. I'm a civilian. Without a badge, I'm allowed to get pretty nasty with you. Look, you can't make me do something I don't want. I know my rights, Captain. You know something, Rick? I think I'm catching a cold. I can't hear a thing. All right, now, wait a minute. I'll go check the men. I, uh, trust you'll not take advantage of the prisoner, Rick. I couldn't hear if he yelled or something. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, okay. Fine cop. All right, let's go. All right, men. Yes, sir. Listen now. I'm going up with Diamond. Three of you take that side of the house. Three take the other. Yes, sir. You and you go around in the back to the shed where the car is. Yeah. Otis? Yeah? You and this man cover the front, but stay out of sight. If it comes, it'll come in a hurry, so close in fast. Yes, and look, boys, the lieutenant's in the back room, so try and be as careful as you can. All right. All set? Yeah. Let's go, Amalo. Front window. Yeah, it's ten minutes of eleven. I hope their watches aren't fast. Keep going, Amalo. Okay, Otis. You two drop here. Right, Captain. Good luck. What are you stopping for, Amalo? I, I just remember they told me to yell if I came up. If you try to pull anything... No, no, no. Honest, honest. They told me to yell. Okay. You stay here. We're going up on that porch. Count twenty, then yell. And play it smart. I won't fool with you, Mallow. Okay, okay, Captain. But I'm scared, Steve. You're not alone. Come on, Charlie. 
Get on that side of the door. Hey, Bert! Bert, it's me, Chino! Hey, Bert, I gotta see you! You alone? Yeah, yeah. Can I come up? Too late, Animad. Okay, come on up. Get him right there. Why are you kidding? Stop it! One going in the middle. Take out! Okay, okay. Don't shoot anyone. I'm hurt. See you, Walt. Okay. Walt? Well, it's about time. Get these ropes off me. You okay, Walt? Yeah. Thanks, Charlie. What time is it? Eleven o'clock. Happy birthday. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Once more, let me remind you that tomorrow, Rexall's mighty one-cent sale begins. The sale where you get two guaranteed Rexall products for the price of one plus a penny. For example, the pint bottle of MI-31, Rexall's famous mouthwash, regularly costs 69 cents. Tomorrow, you can get two bottles for just 70 cents. And remember, there are some 347 of these twin bargains, plus 85 other super specials. Make your pennies by dollars during Rexall's one-cent sale. Tomorrow through Monday at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards, with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Dick Powell can soon be seen in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer production, Right Cross, in which he co-stars with June Allison and Ricardo Montalban. Featured in tonight's cast were Wilms Herbert, Bill Johnstone, Sidney Miller, John Stevenson, Arthur Q. Bryan, Virginia Gregg, and Jay Novello. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is produced and directed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to join us next week at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Remember, tomorrow starts the four biggest bargain days in the year. Rexall's nationwide one-cent sale. The sale where you get two top-quality guaranteed Rexall products for the price of one plus one cent. Remember, tomorrow, Friday, Saturday, and the following Monday, just step inside a Rexall store where you buy twice as much for a penny more. Your chime master, Robert Young, is expecting you tomorrow on NBC. Listen, while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Bill Foreman speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of their own store names. They've done that because they recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. This evening, we want to call your particular attention to Rexall's exciting two-page ad in this coming week's issues of Life, 
Look, Collier's, the Saturday Evening Post, and in the current issue of Farm Journal. One page is devoted to ten great new health aids, developed and perfected in Rexall's world-famous laboratories, and now available at Rexall drugstores everywhere. The other page features ten headline bargains, available all during the month of July, plus 53 additional values in Rexall money-back guaranteed products. So remember, for new and better health aids, for timely household bargains, be sure to check Rexall's sensational two-page spread in this coming week's issues of Life, Look, Collier's, The Saturday Evening Post, and The Current Farm Journal. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond? That's right. Come in. My name is Hayden. Gustav Hayden. How do you do, Mr. Hayden? Won't you have a seat? Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. What can I do for you? I would like for you to protect me for the next two days. Protect you from what? Well, uh, maybe I should start at the beginning. By trade, I am a gun maker. Before I was fortunate to come to this country, I worked in German. Uh, do you mind if I smoke? Go right ahead. He pulled out a very old hand-carved pipe and stuffed it into a worn leather pouch. He was a little man, a few inches over five feet. I guess his age to be somewhere in the 60s. He talked of his home in Germany before Hitler had moved in with the stormtroopers. He told me about his wife and how she died in a prison camp because she was anti-Nazi. They allowed me to work because I was making a very advanced rifle. And Adolf could use such a rifle. But when he took my wife, I destroyed my blueprints and was myself interned in another prison camp. They tried to beat my secret out of me. I lived, somehow. Then the war was over. Your uh, pipe's gone out. Oh, so it is. I hope I'm not boring you, Mr. Diamond. Well, not at all, no. I have a sister, Anna. I sent her to America before the trouble came. She's a widow and has one son. Perhaps you have heard of her son, Mr. Diamond. William Early? No, I can't say that I have. Well, you will. He's a lawyer. Someday he will be a very big lawyer. You uh, said you wanted me to protect you, Mr. Hayden. Yeah. My sister, with the help of William, arranged for me to come to the United States. I was quite ill when I arrived, and they sent me to the summer cabin in the Catskills. I soon was better and took great pleasure in this place. So they have allowed me to stay at the cabin and make it my home. Oh, then they even made for me a complete workshop at my disposal. And in the last two years, I've occupied myself with my old trade. Making guns? Yeah. I have finally produced my new rifle, Mr. Diamond. And someone has tried to steal it. Well, if somebody's trying to steal it, you should go to the FBI. Or the police. I think of that, Mr. Diamond. But it would involve my sister and her son. I'm not sure how good this rifle is until after I test it. And I don't wish to have my family involved unless the rifle is a good one. Have you any idea who might have tried to steal him? No. Hmm. How long do you want protection? Only for two days when I test the gun. And then I want somebody to go with me to the right people. So I may show the rifle to them. Well, I, uh, I charge a hundred a day in expenses, Mr. Hyden. Oh, I have no money, only what Billy gives to me each month for living cost, but if you will take a chance with me, Mr. Diamond, that the rifle is a success, I will see you are well rewarded. And if the government doesn't want the rifle? Sir, so, like myself, I also have lost such a time and effort. Mm. Where's the rifle now? In my shop in the Catskills. Well, if somebody's already tried to steal it, aren't you taking a big chance? Oh, such a caretaker. The, my nephew hired him when I moved in. Where was the caretaker when the attempt was made to steal a rifle? Uh, we were both asleep. I heard a noise in the shop and went out to see. Albert, uh, that's the caretaker, had it also. We both got to the shop about the same time. Uh, whoever it was, we must have frightened him away. But someone had been there. The window was open, and much of my equipment had been moved. 
All right, Mr. Hyden. I'll gamble with you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Diamond. Thank you. I am going to see my sister now, but I will meet you at the ticket window 11, Grand Central Station, at 8 o'clock. Just walked in. Hello, Sergeant Otis. You're looking exceptionally well this afternoon. Had a haircut, didn't you? Yeah. How's it look? Doesn't it confuse your barber working on two heads at once? No. No. Hello, Walt. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Diamond. Why don't you do me a favor, Fatty? Rick, I've thought of everything. There's no way I can get rid of Otis and make it look like suicide. Then do me another favor. All right. Check on a man named Gustav Haydn, German citizen, been in this country for a couple of years. What's it all about? A little confidential. I'd like to tell you, but I can't. Okay, I'll see what I can find out for you. Thanks. I've got to take a little trip tonight around 8. I'll be at home if you come up with anything. What the... Don't try to get up and we'll have to belt you again. Oh, uh, what's this all about? We want the plans. Oh, you do, huh? And we're going to get them. Oh, I, I guess I'm in a hole. I I don't give you the plans. You work me over. Believe me, I hate to mention it, but I haven't got them. Take off your coat, Max. Sure. Go over and turn on that radio. Right. Now, look, I told you. Yeah, that... I know. You don't have the plans. I, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. And remember, friends, there's a federal excise tax to pay on all television. Get some music. So buy now and... Turn it up. Okay, come here. You want me to take over? Yeah. I'll keep the gun on. No. Oh, why, you just... Lie down. Go on. Work on these ribs. Okay. Hey. Oh. You, you better tell us. Oh, you, you knuckleheads. I, I can't tell you if I don't know. Oh, he's sure stubborn. Mm-hmm. Hold it. Not a noise out of you, Diamond. Blue eyes. Blue eyes. Come on, open up. Who is it, Diamond? My brother-in-law. Come on, Diamond. Get out of the sack. I got something for if you. You don't want him to get hurt. Get rid of him. Uh, but he's got something for me. Well, get it and tell him to beat it. Go on over to the door, but don't let him in. I'll be right behind you. Okay. Okay. Well, it's about time. Hey, what's with you? Well, I thought you... Uh, Walt, uh, uh, tell Marge and the kids I, I can't come over. I'm busy. What? Look... And, uh, and uh, about the fur coat. Tell her I couldn't get it for under 418. Huh? 418, and uh, I don't want to get stuck with it. Oh, yeah, sure. I'll tell her. You uh, said you had something for me? It'll keep. I'll give it to you when you got more time. Sorry, but you know how it is. Business. Sure. Uh, tell Marge I'm sorry. I, I couldn't come over. I'll tell her. See you soon. Hey. Yeah? What kind of a coat do you buy for 418 bucks? Oh, uh, 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 a beaver. A beaver? Well, I could have gotten it for you for half. Forget it. Over on the bed, Diamond. Oh, look, I, I swear, I don't know about plans or anything else. We got a lot of time. Maybe after a little while you'll remember. Move. All right. Now, let's see. Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Come on, Diamond. The plans the little guy gave you. Sorry, I wish I could help. <clears throat> 
We know the guy came to your office an hour ago. If he didn't give you the plans, he told you where they are. I had one customer in the office today. Yeah. And what did he want? Max. Look, look, now, look. It, it wasn't anything about plans. What was it? Uh, again, Max. <laughs> Max kept working, and I took it. For one reason, because I had to. For another, I knew Walt had gotten a 418 tip. And police code, that meant a slugging. It was sooner than I expected. I looked over at the open window at the back of the room, and there was Walt, looking in from the fire escape. Come on, Diamond. I'm getting tired. And I feel rested, huh? Okay. Up the gun. Rick. Okay. Here. Get this guy off me, Walt. Okay. Hey. Oh, oh, thanks, thanks. Well, this one's had it. Oh, you, you got both of them. This one tried, and the other went for his. They're both dead. Oh, turn off that radio, will you? Okay. Why were they working you over? Well, they wanted something I didn't have. Something they thought my client gave me this afternoon. Gustav Hyden? Yeah. You find out anything about him? Well, nothing incriminating. Got a whole background on him here. I'll read it on the way down to Grand Central. Hyden didn't want the law in on this, but with two men dead, as far as I'm concerned, that puts it right in your lap. coming week's issues of Life, Look, Collier's, the Saturday Evening Post, and the current Farm Journal carry an important two-page Rexall ad. One page features ten great new health aids, developed and perfected in Rexall's world-famous laboratories, and now available at Rexall drugstores everywhere. The other page features ten headline bargains good all during July. Here are just a couple of examples. Rexall 5X Multivitamins. The tablets that are five times stronger than the established daily requirement of all vitamins with known minimums. Special introductory offer, 10-day trial size, a regular dollar and 79 cent value, free of extra cost with the purchase of the regular bottle of 50. Stag brushless shave cream, regular 50 cent jumbo tube, now only 25 cents, exactly half price. So remember... For new and finer health aids, for bigger and better bargains, be sure to check Rexall's sensational two-page ad in this coming week's issues of Life, Look, Collier's, The Saturday Evening Post, and The Current Farm Journal. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. This is Ed Walt. I was supposed to meet him here at the ticket window. Oh, where is he? Ah, I uh, don't see him. This is ticket window 11. Mm-hmm. Let's give him a few minutes. And we gave Gustav Hyden more than a few minutes. At 8 o'clock, we were still waiting. At 8.15, the train Hyden and I were supposed to take pulled out. You stood up? Yeah. Let's check with the ticket seller. Uh, pardon me, sir. May I talk with you for a minute? Certainly. What can I do for you? Police business. Oh. Did, uh, did you notice a little man standing near this window? About 5'3", big bunch of gray hair, old brown hat and suit, button shoes. Smoking a big pipe? I said. Sure, I couldn't help but notice him. Stood around for about 15 minutes. See him leave? Yeah, left with a man, big guy. You remember what the big guy looked like? I uh, didn't pay much attention, just big. What do you think, Rick? I think we better look up Gustav Hyden's sister. But what is this all about, Lieutenant? Gustav left for the train station an hour ago. He was going back to the mountain. Ah, it's nothing to be alarmed about, Mrs. Alec. He just didn't take the train. Are you certain? We checked. But I still don't understand. Mr. Diamond, what is your interest in my brother? Well, he retained me this morning to protect him. 
to protect him. Protect him from what? Well, Mr. Ellick, he said someone was trying to steal a new rifle he was developing. A new rifle? A gun he started designing a long time ago in Germany. He never told us anything about it. Well, I don't believe he wanted to involve you until it was all finished and tested. Oh. If it was a success, he was going to turn it over to the government. Mm, he certainly kept it a secret. I helped him fix up a workshop that I just thought it was to keep him occupied. An old man, you know, wanted to keep him busy. And Mr. Diamond, you think something's happened to him because of this rifle? Well, maybe not. But if you hear from him, please contact Lieutenant Levinson at the 5th Precinct Police Station. Anna Ehrlich gave us the location of the mountain cabin where Hayden was living, and we left. Walt went back to the station, put out a description on the missing gunsmith, and I caught the next train for the Catskills. It was morning when I climbed off the train and hired an old car to take me the five miles back into the woods. Twenty minutes of bumpy road, and I arrived at the cabin to be met with the caretaker. Thanks, daughter. You want something? Oh, yes, uh, Mr. Hyden. Uh, what did you want him for? He's here. Well, didn't you think he'd be? I'd like to talk to him, please. I don't know. He's in kind of a strange mood. Came in about four this morning, acting like he'd seen a... Albert. Uh, yeah, Mr. Hyden. Show the gentleman in. Yes, sir. It will be all, Albert. Yes, sir. Hey, Mr. Diamond, what are you doing here? I saw your sister. You talked with my sister? That's right. Your face is bruised. Two men beat me up. Mr. Diamond, I did not meet you at the station because I changed my mind. I am so sorry you made this long trip, but I have no need for your service. No? What changed your mind? I decided not to go on. Hmm. Who was the man you left the station with, the big man? The ticket agent saw you. Oh, he must have made a mistake. This is police business now, Mr. Hyden. Please leave. I can't. I want to know what this is all about. Please, please, I can't tell you. I'd like to see your rifle, Mr. Hyden. Mr. Diamond, I don't care what has happened. I cannot allow it. Mr. Hyden, you might as well cooperate. If I leave here, I'll leave with you. Oh, no, sir. You don't know what that would mean. Look, the two men who beat me up are dead. There's a dragnet out for you. Now, if you want me to help, maybe I can do you some good. It's up to you. Uh, I must think. Okay. But while you're thinking, I'd like to see that rifle. Of course. I keep it locked in this closet. All that's left is to test it. Hmm. Beautiful. I'd like to fire it. I have decided to tell you everything, Mr. Diamond. I'm glad. You were right about the big man I was leaving the station with. He warned me to forget my dealings with you and not to call in the police. Then he drove me here and demanded the rifle and the plan. I told him the rifle was not nearly finished, but I gave him a set of blueprints and he left. Then they've got the plans? They have some plans. I expected something like this, and I drew up several sets of blueprints that will be no good to anyone. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what to do now. My sister and her son are in danger. The first thing we've got to do is get hold of Lieutenant Levinson and tell him I found you. We'll give your family an armed guard if necessary. But we don't know who these men are, who they're working for. You can't guard my sister and nephew forever. That's a matter for the FBI. We've got two dead bodies to identify. They might give us a lead. Oh, uh, somebody just drove up. Uh, we can see from this window. Oh, you know the car? Well, it looks like Willie's car. Oh, it is your nephew. Oh, why did he come here? Really? Oh, Uncle Gustav, we've been worried sick. We couldn't wait to hear from Mr. Diamond, so I drove up. Mother's beside herself. Oh, sorry, Willie. I should have notified Mr. you. Mr. Diamond said you left the station with a man. We'll tell you all about it on the way back, Alec. I've got to put in a call to the lieutenant and tell him to call off the dogs. Uh, the telephone is in our room, Mr. Diamond. Thanks. I'm sorry to make all this trouble, Willie. I couldn't do anything else. What's this all about? Mr. Diamond mentioned something about a new rifle. I was going to tell you, but I wanted to wait until I was certain of a performance. But you certainly could have told me. I could have told you. I told you, but if the Hello? Hello, was no good, it would have you curry. Hello, operator. Okay, stop. You think that would have made... Operator. What have you done? What you and Anna have done for me? <laughs> oh, 
Oh, Mr. Diamond. Hey, the phone's dead. Gus? We've never had any trouble with it before. That's what I was afraid of. Where's that caretaker? He was here a moment ago. Albert! Albert! Yes, sir? The phone's dead, Albert. Well, it was, it was working all right a little while ago. I, I called the store and ordered some, uh, some groceries. Mm. Come on, you're going to show us those phone lines. <laughs> That's the phone line coming down from the trees. Over the house, right? Well, what do you know? Yeah, the line's been cut. What? That's right, Mr. Hyden. Mr. Diamond. Now, just take it easy. Mr. Ehrlich, we're all going to pile in your car and get out of here. Wait. Don't you see what this can mean? My sister's alone back in New York. You can't reach the police to give us the necessary protection. Well, we certainly can't stay here. We must. I can't take a chance on my sister's life. I will give them the rifle and the plane. Oh, don't be ridiculous. If you give it to them, you don't think they're going to let you live, or for that matter, let any one of us get out of here alive. I'm an old man. It doesn't matter. Sorry. We're all getting into that car. No, Mr. Diamond. I cannot. Uh, wait a minute, Diamond. In a way, he's right. My mother's life is important also. I can appreciate that, Mr. Ehrlich. But we're only presuming she might be in danger. We know that your uncle is, and that rifle's too important. I won't leave. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to, and I wouldn't like to use force. Now, come on. All of you get in that car. Wait just a minute, Mr. Diamond. No one's leaving this cabin. Look, Ehrlich, you look. Really? You don't have to use a gun. I'm afraid I do, Uncle. But you can't. Shut up and get over there with Mr. Diamond. Really? Shut up, you old fool. Get over there. You better do as he says. But I don't understand. It's not too hard to figure out. Albert. Yeah? Go and get that rifle. Well, now, wait a minute. Go and get the rifle. Look, I'm the man you've been expecting. You? Of course. Do you think I would have hired you as caretaker unless I knew you were working with us? Now, go bring that rifle. Yes, sir. Really? You were behind all this? Oh, now, now, don't be so naive, Uncle. I've been with the party for years. The party? Certainly. <laughs> you didn't think we were a bunch of thugs, did you? There's a difference? That's all right, Diamond. Enjoy yourself. You don't have too long. I simply can't believe it. And Anna? Mother knows nothing about it. She couldn't understand. And Albert telling everything I did. That's how they kept such close tabs on you, Mr. Hyden. They tried to get the gun first by stealing it. When you came to my office, they thought you'd given me the plans and sent two of their strong arms to beat it out of me. That didn't pay off, so they had you picked up at the station. You gave the big man the wrong plans, and up came your sweet little nephew. But why didn't Albert have steal it? He could have many times. Well, he'd have been the first one suspected. Quite shrewd, Mr. Diamond. Oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a deli. <laughs> you said it pretty cozy, too, Ehrlich. Even your own man didn't know you were running the show. Here it is, Mr. Ehrlich. I brought some shells in case you wanted to see it work. Ah, good. Well, Uncle, I suppose you're just as interested in the performance of your rifle as I am. Uh, you can try it right here, Alfred. Yes, sir. Pick a good target. Uh, walk down the road about 100 yards and see if you can kill Mr. Diamond on the first shot. Really? Now, relax, Mr. Hyden. There's nothing we can do about it. You are completely right for the first time, Mr. Diamond. Go ahead, Albert. Uh, move away, Uncle. And if you try anything, Mr. Diamond, then I shall have to shoot you. Move away, Uncle. No. No. I think I shall stand with my friend. Mr. Hyden, please. I am sure they don't intend to let me live anyway. Oh, on the contrary, Uncle. We were planning a long voyage for you. We know of a place that could use a man of your talents. I see. I prefer to stand with my friend. Very well. Albert! Yeah! Don't do it, Mr. Hyden. After Mr. Diamond, Mr. Hyden... Both of them. First, Mr. Diamond, then my uncle. Okay. It's good enough. Uh, no, move farther down. I want my uncle to see how good his gun really is. Okay. But the first couple of shots might be off. This thing hasn't been zeroed in yet. Mr. Hyden, please get out of the way. Is it all right if I smoke my pipe? Oh, certainly. There's nothing like a good pipe and good tobacco. Did you ever see Germany before the war, Mr. Diamond? No. 
in the spring, beautiful. I used to take long walks and smoke my pipe. I can't complain. I have some wonderful memories. Do you ever see Hell's Kitchen in the middle of the summer? No. Stinks. It's okay! Well, Mr. Diamond? I'll get it over with. Well, that's fine. All right, Albert. I hope to talk with you again, Mr. Diamond. Some place. You're a nice guy, Gus. <laughs> Mr. Diamond! Is he dead? No, oh, I don't know. I'm still too scared to find out. You're scared? Yes. I didn't know whether I could hit him or not. You made a fine rifle, Mr. Hyden. Mr. Diamond, he shot really. He wasn't even trying to hit you. Oh, I think I'd better sit down. But I don't understand. Oh, wait until good old Albert gets back here. I, I think you'll find out he's more than a caretaker. Bless his little heart. <laughs> And good old Albert was a little more than a caretaker. His real name was Baxter, special agent for the FBI, working for the past six years as undercover man inside Ehrlich's organization. The last time I saw Gus, the government had accepted his rifle. He was smiling and smoking his old pipe. We talked for a long time, just like he had hoped he would. In the summertime especially, lots of women are unhappy about their figures. If you're overweight, why waste another minute? You can get rid of those ugly extra pounds quickly and easily with the new Andela Field Reducing Plan. This is a safe, sound, scientific way to slim down with no drugs, starving, or calorie counting. Still, you may lose up to five pounds a week and lose where it shows. No, it's not magic. It's the work of famous beauty and health authority, Ann Delafield, who has successfully reduced more overweight people than any other expert in the world. So you see, you're sure of the best. You get vitamins, appetite-reducing wafers, and a big beauty book to guide you. Ask for the new Ann Delafield Reducing Plan at Rexall Drugstores everywhere. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Dick Powell directed the RKO production, Split Second, which is now in release. And his latest film appearance was in the Metro Golden Mayor award-winning The Bad and the Beautiful. Heard in the night's cast were Wilm Herbert, Arthur Q. Bryan, Clayton Post, John Daner, Virginia Gregg, and Tim Graham. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Sunday at this time when Rexall Drug Products again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Remember, for new and finer health aids, for bigger and better bargains, Check Rexall's important two-page ad in next week's issues of Life, Look, Collier's, The Saturday Evening Post, and in the current Farm Journal. listens to 105 million radio sets and listens most to the CBS radio network.
Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Paul. Diamond? Yeah? What's the matter? You got to do something for me. Hey, you're hurt. Yeah, yeah. I'm... Hey, hey, now take it easy. Sit down. Oh, no, you, you got to listen to me. You're bleeding all over the place. I'll call the doctor. No, please, please wait. But look, I've been when... knifed. I've been knifed bad. I don't think I've got much time. Here, take this. They're right behind me. I'm going to call the doctor. No, no, listen. Listen. Key or quest to get envelope to the... Oh. Hey. Hey, you. Oh, no. The man, whoever he was, had toppled over on his face and was very dead. He handed me a plain white envelope, sealed with no address on it. I went over to my desk to put in a call to homicide when I heard someone moving around in the hall. I turned and saw the shadow of a man silhouetted against the glass section of my office door. I grabbed a pen and hurriedly scribbled the address of Lieutenant Walter Levinson, 5th Precinct Homicide, on the envelope, stuck a stamp on it, then headed for the hallway. I was about to open the door when the shadow was joined by another one. They opened it for me. Uh, excuse me, gentlemen. Wait a minute. We want to ask uh, you... Later, don't... later. I, I got hey. a mail a letter. Hey, stop him! Don't let him mail that thing! They were both big men and could run. I beat them to the mail chute by a split second and dropped the envelope. They made a dive for it, and when they missed, they forgot it and started concentrating on me. To you. Oh, where are your wings, honey? You look as though someone had beaten you up. No, don't be silly. It's the latest thing. Hey, I'm back in my office. I found you lying here. You want me to call a doctor? No, no, call homicide. Well, someone did? Certainly. That guy right over... What guy? Oh, dandy. Well, honey, there was a guy. In fact, he was lying just about where I'm lying, and he was dead. Look, you can see the blood. I thought that was your blood. Oh, Rather than try and convince you, maybe you'd like to tell me why you came up to see me. Well, my name's Nancy Lang. I want to hire you. To do what? I'm giving a big party tonight, some very wealthy guests. I just want someone around to keep an eye on things. Well, I'd like to help you, but I've got a bit of a problem with a missing body. Oh, that's too bad. I was prepared to pay you $500 for the evening. Uh, $500? Well, so a body gets lost. Who wants to hunt a corpse when he can attend a perfectly good party? Well, good afternoon, Sergeant Otis. Oh, oh how are you, Diamond? Still breathing. Why don't you try it sometime? Oh, go jump in the lake. Only if you'll lend me one of your shoes to paddle around in. No. Hello, Walt. Hi, Rick. Oh, no. What happened to you? Well, two charming gorillas used me for a fast game of squash. Who were they? Never saw them before. But I got a hunch they killed the guy. Let's have a look at your mug file. I gave Walt the story and told him about the mysterious envelope he would be getting in the mail. But after two hours of checking the rogues' gallery, we came up with nothing. So I went home, shaved and changed, and went out to my client's house where she met me in a well-appointed library. Her appointments were, uh... Well, uh... Missy Diamond, right on time. You look much better. Well, I, I tried to wear something that wouldn't clash with my bruises. I'd like you to meet Senor Giardo. Giardo? An old friend, a very wealthy politician from South America. This is Mr. Diamond, Mr. Giardo. Uh, how do you do, sir? Uh, how are you, Mr. Giardo? Mr. Diamond is a private detective. He's here to guard the wealth. How oh, very interesting. Kind of an official watchdog, Mr. Yardo. Well, there will certainly be enough to guard. Uh, Miss Lang's guest list is made up of some very wealthy and prominent personalities. In fact, I am very flattered to be among them. I, uh, I've seen you before. Oh, very possibly. Have you ever been to South America? A couple of times, but that's not it. And my home is in Bogota. No. Well, it doesn't matter. I'll think of it. If you'll excuse us, Mr. Giardo, I want to show Mr. Diamond around the house and grounds. Uh, certainly, certainly. A pleasure meeting you, Mr. Diamond. The house is my father's. 
He died several years ago. He used to love this garden. That's beautiful. Smell the jasmine? Yes. What made you become a private detective? Oh, I don't know. I I make a pretty good living. My own boss. I was a cop for a long time. I like to work. Well, that's uh, quite a fountain. Trying to give Rockefeller Center competition. Well, it looks beautiful with the lights on. There. Yes, it certainly does. You're not the type to be a private detective. Oh, I'm definitely the type. Sure, like everything else, it gets dull sometimes, but when things start popping, it can get pretty interesting. Like this afternoon? Getting beaten up? The man you said was killed in your office? Well, he wasn't killed there. He just died there. Besides, how many guys can wake up lying on their office floor and have a beautiful girl offer them $500 to come to a party? <laughs> I see what you mean. <laughs> Don't you think you'd better get back? Your guests are probably all right. Yes, I'll switch off the fountain light. Don't you leave them on. My father used to sit and watch it for hours. I don't like to show it to everyone. Hmm. Kind of like a part of the garden died. You certainly are a strange man. Never noticed myself. But I have. I like you. Uh... Where did you meet Mr. Guiardo? In South America. He was a good friend of my father's. Wealthy politician. That's right. Mr. Diamond. It's Rick. Rick? Yeah. Oh. I, uh, I think we'd better go back to the party. I'm a fairly normal guy. Nancy was a very exciting girl. And the kiss in the garden was as nice as anybody could ask for. But there's one thing I do pride myself in... And that's a certain lack of stupidity. There was something wrong. Nothing I could put my finger on, but I sensed it. Like being lost in a dark room with a loose high-tension wire. I circulated around and nothing out of the ordinary happened. By three o'clock, the party broke up and Signor Giardo and Nancy were the only ones left. A hey, most enjoyable party, Miss Lang. Oh, thank you. It was nice of you to come, Senor Gallo. Well, I must say good night. Uh, have you remembered where you have seen me before, Mr. Diamond? Well, uh, not yet, Mr. Gallo. Oh, it's too bad. Uh, thank you again for a charming evening, Miss Lang. Uh, good night, Mr. Diamond. Good night. Good night. Oh, God. A little beat myself. You want some coffee? Love it. We had some coffee and Nancy drove me home. I kissed her goodnight and left with a promise to call. As I reached my floor, I could hear my phone ringing. I opened the door and stumbled into the biggest mess I'd seen in a long time. My room was a wreck. Someone had torn it to pieces. Yeah? Diamond? It's a quarter to four in the morning. What do you want, Fatty? We fished a body out of the river about an hour ago. Died from a knife wound in the back. Did he fit the description of the guy who died in my office? This one didn't fit any description. Someone was very careful to fix his face so we couldn't identify him. Check his fingerprints? You're playing around with some pretty gory individuals. They amputated his fingers. Ah. Oh. Somebody's given my room a good going over. Really took it apart. It's an odds-on bet they were after that envelope. Now, when you get it tomorrow morning, give me a call. It might tell us everything we want to know. Okay. Walt, you ever heard of a man named Guillardo... South American, supposed to be mixed up in politics? No. Why? Nothing. I met him at the party tonight, and I... They worked the racket to miss this guy at a party and his wife. Hey, Dick, what's the matter? Nothing. 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 Who is this? This is Lieutenant Levinson. Who is this? Mr. Diamond is unconscious. What? And if you ever want to see him alive again, listen carefully. Okay. Go ahead. From Mr. Diamond's conversation, I understand you are to receive the envelope. When you do, go directly to the Staten Island Ferry. Ride on it, all day if necessary. A man will meet you and pick up the envelope. Be alone. Do not notify the police, or Mr. Diamond will surely die. Someone had sapped me and sapped me good. I had a dull, throbbing headache, and when I began to find my way back to consciousness, 
I felt my coat pulled off and my right shirt sleeve rolled up. There was a sharp pain in my upper arm, and several seconds later, my headache disappeared in a surge of heat that spread out over my back and shoulders. I tried to fight it, but it, but it was like being on a sinking ship, trying to crawl back up the slanting deck. The ship dragged me down, and I swallowed up in the black water. next thing I remembered was a blinding circle of light overhead like the sun if you were looking at it through a sheet of wrinkled cellophane. I shut my eyes and I could hear voices far off, hollow, not making much sense. The light hurt my eyes, but I I couldn't seem to shut it out. So I tried to relax and wait, give the drug time to wear off. After what seemed like hours, the voices began to make sense. The light was easier to look at. It was just a plain ceiling lamp. As the feeling in my fingers began to return, I realized I was lying on a bed. There's a restaurant on the corner. I won't be more than ten minutes. The other man had promised to be back in ten minutes, so I had to do something in a hurry. I kept tightening my muscles, trying to get the circulation back. I had to make a try. I wasn't sure of my strength, but I had to try. I rolled off the bed. Hey! Hey, coming out of it, huh? Trying to break your neck? He leaned down to pick me up, and I hit him just below the Adam's apple with the side of my open hand. The man choked and turned blue. He grabbed for his shoulder holster, and I kicked out with both feet. He doubled over and fell on his face. The effort had put him out of commission, but I was exhausted. I grabbed his gun, staggered for the door. But getting out of that room was like wading through an acre of glue. I made the hall somehow and started down the steps. I met the other man coming up. His arms were filled with beer and sandwiches. I shot him right through his dinner. Feel better? Yeah, yeah, Walt. Uh, a little more coffee, huh? You really had a rough time. They pumped you full of this stuff. Yeah, I'm amazed. I was out nearly 14 hours, huh? Yeah, you lost a whole day. How you managed to get down here, I don't know. I guess I'll never know. Drink your coffee. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, you gave them the envelope, huh? Yeah, about an hour before you staggered into the station. I rode that ferry all day. Five o'clock, a man came up to me, and I gave him the envelope. Oh, I was smart. I had three men on the ferry and three men at each landing to tail him. He was a little smarter. He took the envelope, stuck it in a waterproof case, and jumped overboard. Fast speedboat picked him up. No identification on the guy I shot? Uh, No record. Nothing on him by the time we got there. What did the other guy look like? I was so punchy, I couldn't tell much. You'll have a sore throat for a long time. But they were the ones who beat you up yesterday at your office. They were. When you feel like it, I want you to take a look at that guy we dragged out of the river. See if you recognize his clothes or anything. He just might be the one who died in your office. All right. Now, uh, what was in that envelope? Well, I had a photostat made before I took it to the ferry. Looks like part of a map. Here. Hmm. So this is what's caused all the trouble. Boy, it must be worth a lot. Can you make anything out of it? Oh, water, section of land, and here's a, oh, here's a longitude reading, but uh, hmm, no latitude reading. Probably on the other half. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. Well, I've got a hunch about this. I want you to send Otis over to pick up Nancy Lang, then take me over to the newspaper office and help me look at the files for something on a man named Giardo. You know what you're looking for? Yeah, this guy Giardo, Senor Giardo. I know I've read about him or seen his picture. I... Hey, Walt. You find something? Yeah, here he is. But his real name isn't Giardo, it's Ortiz. Yeah, look at those headlines. Julio Ortiz assassinated. Rebel leader killed after plot to take over government failed. Yeah, listen to this. 
Ortiz was expecting a large amount of American dollars to finance his army. Although the rumor is not confirmed, it was reported that Ortiz shipped a million dollars in gold bullion to someone in the United States. The plane was supposed to have crashed, and it is interesting to note that the recent plane crash in which two American pilots escaped, John Bishop and Bernard Combs, were found floating off Key West. Key West? Holy smoke, that's what the guy in my office tried to tell me. He said Key West before he died. Huh. Hey, Walt, don't you see? Ortiz is still alive. Maybe those two pilots double-crossed him. He hid the gold. That's what that map is all about. All eight to five, that man you've got down in the morgue is one of those pilots. John Bishop or Bernard Combs. I'll have the FBI send us the files on both those guys. If one of them is John Bishop or Bernard Combs, we won't need fingerprints nor a face. We'll check their dental records, birthmarks. Now, uh, let's get back and see if Otis has got the lovely Nancy Lang. That's right, Lieutenant Shane in town. She's gone on a vacation, a butler said. Did he say where? Uh, no, he said he didn't know. He said this Miss Lang left town about 4 o'clock this afternoon. And I'll bet she's with Ortiz. Walt, when you talk to the FBI about those two pilots, have them check Nancy Lang, too. I'm going to Key West. Send any information to the chief of police there. Well, glad to know you, Diamond. We just got a telegram from the lieutenant identifying the body. It was Bernard Combs, one of the pilots. Hmm. Well, here's, here's the half of the map. Tell me, does that look like any section of coastline around here? Well, no, that's hard to say. I'll have a check. Uh, you ever heard of a man named John Bishop? He's the other pilot. Oh, sure. When them two boys was found floating around, they brought him into Key West. Mm -hmm. They was in the hospital here a couple of days. Bishop still lives in Key West. Well, I hope so. He may have died here very recently. And you think this here Ortiz is in Key West, too? I'll bet on it. He wants the other half of that map and may have it by now. He's got to go after that gold. You'll need a boat and some diving equipment. Well, what makes you think the gold's in the water? This map's got a shoreline, too. Well, those two pilots couldn't carry a million dollars in gold bullion. It either went down with the plane or they dumped it and then bailed out and let the plane crash. Well, I'll get Bishop's address. We'll go over and have a talk with On the next floor. Oh, I hope you're right. Well, that's where he's been living. Right down here. Bishop. Hey, Bishop. Doors locked. You got a pass key? Yeah. Bishop. You... Lord of mercy. Yeah. Is that Bishop? Yeah, that's him. Boy, he sure is dead. Well, that accounted for the two pilots. So now all we had to do was find Julio Ortiz. It figured he now had both sections of the map, but his next move would be to hire a boat and diving equipment. There weren't many places in Key West where a man could rent a boat and diving equipment. So the chief rounded up his men, and we all started checking. It didn't take long. No, Captain. Party hiding my ship ain't come back yet. We ain't due to sail for an hour. What did the party look like? Pretty girl. Can't figure what she wants to go diving for, but I just ran them to keep my mouth shut. Mm, probably Nancy Lang. Ortiz is staying undercover until the last minute. Well, I'll spread my boys around. We'll keep out of sight. And when they show up, Skipper, you don't say nothing about us. Sure, sure. I just ran them to keep my mouth shut. About ready for that boat to sail. Well, they'll wait for the last minute. Mm. Just imagine a million dollars in gold, just like a pirate story. Well, enough killings mixed up with it to be one. Uh, hey, hold it. Is that them? Yeah, that's Nancy Lang. But Ortiz isn't with her. Who are them two fellas? I've never seen them before. Some of Ortiz's men. They're probably checking to see if everything's clear before Ortiz comes aboard. <laughs> We got as close to the schooner as we could and waited. The two men walked over and checked the diving equipment while Nancy Lang went below. We kept waiting, and still Julio Ortiz didn't show. Hey, they started an engine. I don't see Ortiz anywhere. They're casting off. We better take them. Yep. Quick, 
gonna have to jump. Look out for that one. He's got a gun. I got him jump. The other guy's running forward. Stop! You! He's going over. Well, my man will pick him, huh? Yeah. I'm going below. Captain, what's the world? Hello, Nancy. How did you find him? Where's Ortiz? I don't know who you're talking about. Uh, is this the girl? Nancy Lang, meet the Key West Chief of Police. How do you do? Where's Ortiz? She says she doesn't know who he is. Okay, young lady, I'm going to hold you for the New York authority. Hold me for what? Murder. John Bishop and Bernard Combs. So we can make it stick. It might go easier on you if you tell us where Ortiz is at. I still don't know any Ortiz. Guillardo, the man I met at your party. That's ridiculous. Now, look, we know all about the gold. You don't have a chance of raising it, and eventually we'll get Ortiz. Yeah, we're back to Dell. Uh, if you don't help us, Nancy, it's pretty sure you'll get life for complicity. Then if I do help? I can't promise a thing. But it will make a difference with the court. Julio's waiting ten miles down the coast. We would pick him up, then go out and raise the gold. He has the map? Yes. I'll tell the skipper to shove off again. We'll sail that ten miles and grab Ortiz. What's your connection with Ortiz, Nancy? He's my husband. A dozen police officers came aboard and hid below decks. The skipper put out to sea and sailed parallel to the coast. Nancy told me all about her husband and his history as a rebel leader in South America. I was stranded in South America for the show that folded. I married Ortiz. After the gold was lost, he faked assassination and came to the United States. We located the two pilots. My husband was suspicious, so I played up to the one who came to your office. I got him drunk one night, and he told me about the gold and his half of the map. We've gone to ten miles. I'm glad it's over with. I see a man standing on the beach. Mr. Diamond. Yes? I was supposed to lure you into that garden. Figured. What I said at the fountain. I really... Oh, forget it. Yeah. No sense in making it any tougher. We pulled into a cove and got as close to shore as possible. Then we swung a dinghy over the side, and the chief and I climbed in behind Nancy. We kept our hats down over our faces and hoped our tiz wouldn't notice until it was too late. We both rowed and kept our backs to him. Nancy sat in the stern facing us. Rick. Now, we headed right. I don't want to turn around. You're headed all right. Rick, my husband has always been good to me. Well, I'm glad he was good to somebody. He sure made a mess out of a couple of guys I can think of. But he was good to me. Hey, we're nearly there. Hello, darling. Hello. Julio? Yes? The police are with me. Why, you stupid little... He's running for it. Save the girl. Let him go. My men will pick him up. I got a score to settle. Ortiz, stop. Okay. Well, that, that makes the assassination permanent. Detective stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. This is Bill Foreman speaking. Richard Diamond, private detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. First sign of a cold, take Rexall antihistamine. Bottle of 15 tablets, only 39 cents at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And now listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective.
good health to all from Rexall. Now, your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Mr. Diamond? Yeah? What's the matter? You, you got to do something for me. Hey, you're hurt. Yeah, yeah. I'm... Hey, now, take it easy. Sit down. Oh, no, Sit down. you, you got to listen to me. You're bleeding all over the place. I'll call the doctor. No, please, please wait. But look, I've been friend... knifed. I've been knifed bad. I don't think I've got much time. Here. Here, take this. They're right behind me. I'm going to call the doctor. No, no, listen. Listen. Key or west. Get envelope to the... Oh. Hey. Hey, you. Oh, no. The man, whoever he was, had toppled over on his face and was very dead. He handed me a plain white envelope, sealed with no address on it. I went over to my desk to put in the called homicide when I heard someone moving around in the hall. I turned and saw the shadow of a man silhouetted against the glass section of my office door. I grabbed a pen and hurriedly scribbled the address of Lieutenant Walter Levinson, 5th Precinct Homicide, on the envelope, stuck a stamp on it, then headed for the hallway. I was about to open the door when the shadow was joined by another one. They opened it for me. Uh, uh, excuse me, gentlemen. Wait a minute. We want to ask uh, you Later, so... later. I, I got to hey. mail a letter. Hey, stop him. Don't let him mail that thing. They were both big men and could run. I beat them to the mail chute by a split second and dropped the envelope. They made a dive for it, and when they missed, they forgot it and started concentrating on me. to you. Oh, where are your wings, honey? You look as though someone had beaten you up. No, don't be silly. It's the latest thing. Hey, I'm back in my office. I found you lying here. You want me to call a doctor? No, no, call homicide. Is someone dead? Certainly. That guy right over... What guy? Oh, dandy. Well, honey, there was a guy. In fact, he was lying just about where I'm lying, and he was dead. Look, you can see the blood. I thought that was your blood. Oh, Rather than try and convince you, maybe you'd like to tell me why you came up to see me. Well, my name's Nancy Lang. I want to hire you. To do what? I'm giving a big party tonight, some very wealthy guests. I just want someone around to keep an eye on things. Well, I'd like to help you, but I've got a bit of a problem with a missing body. Oh, well, that's too bad. I was prepared to pay you $500 for the evening. Uh, $500? Oh, well, so a body gets lost. Who wants to hunt a corpse when he can attend a perfectly good party? Well, good afternoon, Sergeant Otis. Oh, oh how are you, Diamond? Still breathing. Why don't you try it sometime? Oh, go jump in the lake. Only if you'll lend me one of your shoes to paddle around in. No. Hello, Walt. Hi, Rick. Oh, no. What happened to you? Well, two charming gorillas used me for a fast game of squash. Who were they? Never saw them before. But I got a hunch they killed the guy. Let's have a look at your mug file. I gave Walt the story and told him about the mysterious envelope he would be getting in the mail. But after two hours of checking the rogues gallery, we came up with nothing. So I went home, shaved and changed, and went out to my client's house where she met me in a well-appointed library. Her appointments were, uh... Well, uh... Mr. Diamond, right on time. You look much better. Well, I, I tried to wear something that wouldn't clash with my bruises. I'd like you to meet Senor Giardo. Giardo? An old friend, a very wealthy politician from South America. This is Mr. Diamond, Mr. Giardo. Uh, how do you do, sir? Uh, how are you, Mr. Giardo? Mr. Diamond is a private detective. He's here to guard the wealth. How oh, very interesting. Kind of an official watchdog, Mr. Giardo. Well, there will certainly be enough to guard. Uh, Miss Lang's guest list is made up of some very wealthy and prominent personalities. In fact, I am very flattered to be among them. I, uh, I've seen you before. Oh, very possibly. Have you ever been to South America? A couple of times, but that's not it. My home is in Bogota. No. 
Well, it doesn't matter. I'll think of it. If you'll excuse us, Mr. Guy, though, I want to show Mr. Diamond around the house and grounds. Yeah, certainly, certainly. A pleasure meeting you, Mr. Diamond. The house was my father's. He died several years ago. He used to love this garden. It's beautiful. Smell the jasmine? Yes. What made you become a private detective? Oh, I don't know. I I make a pretty good living. My own boss. I was a cop for a long time. I like to work. And that's uh, quite a fountain. Trying to give Rockefeller set a competition. It looks beautiful with the lights on. There. Yes, it certainly does. You're not the type to be a private detective. Oh, I'm definitely the type. Sure, like everything else, it gets dull sometimes, but when things start popping, it can get pretty interesting. Like this afternoon? Getting beaten up? The man you said was killed in your office? Well, he wasn't killed there. He just died there. Besides, how many guys can wake up lying on their office floor and have a beautiful girl offer them $500 to come to a party? <laughs> I see what you mean. <laughs> Don't you think you'd better get back? Your guests are probably arriving. Yes, I'll switch off the fountain light. Don't you leave them on? Your guests would, would love it. My father used to sit and watch it for hours. I don't like to show it to everyone. Hmm. Kind of like a part of the garden died. You certainly are a strange man. Never noticed myself. Well, I have. I like you. Uh, where did you meet Mr. Guiardo? In South America. He was a good friend of my father's. Wealthy politician. Huh? That's right. Mr. Diamond. It's Rick. Rick? Yeah? Oh. I, uh, I think we'd better go back to the party. I'm a fairly normal guy. Nancy was a very exciting girl. And the kiss in the garden was as nice as anybody could ask for. But there's one thing I do pride myself in, and that's a certain lack of stupidity. There was something wrong, nothing I could put my finger on, but I sensed it. Like being lost in a dark room with a loose high-tension wire. I circulated around and nothing out of the ordinary happened. By three o'clock, the party broke up and Signor Giardo and Nancy were the only ones left. A hey, most enjoyable party, Miss Lang. Oh, thank you. It was nice of you to come, Senor Gallardo. Well, I must say good night. Uh, have you remembered where you have seen me before, Mr. Diamond? Well, uh, not yet, Mr. Gallardo. Oh, it's too bad. Uh, thank you again for a charming evening, Miss Lang. Uh, good night, Mr. Diamond. Good night. Good night. Well, I'm exhausted. A little beat myself. You want some coffee? Love it. <laughs> We had some coffee and Nancy drove me home. I kissed her goodnight and left with a promise to call. As I reached my floor, I could hear my phone ringing. I opened the door and stumbled into the biggest mess I'd seen in a long time. My room was a wreck. Someone had torn it to pieces. Yeah? Diamond? It's a quarter to four in the morning. What do you want, Fatty? We fished a body out of the river about an hour ago. Died from a knife wound in the back. Did he fit the description of the guy who died in my office? This one didn't fit any description. Someone was very careful to fix his face so we couldn't identify him. Check his fingerprints? You're playing around with some pretty gory individuals. They amputated his fingers. Oh. Somebody's given my room a good going over. Really took it apart. It's an odds-on bet they were after that envelope. And when you get it tomorrow morning, give me a call. It might tell us everything we want to know. Okay. Walt... You ever heard of a man named Guillardo, South American, supposed to be mixed up in politics? No. Why? Well, nothing. I met him at the party tonight. Not... Hey, what's the racket? You met this guy at a party in, in what? Rick. Rick, what's the matter? Rick! Who is this? This is Lieutenant Levinson. Who is this? Mr. Diamond is unconscious. What? And if you ever want to see him alive again... Listen carefully. Okay, go ahead. From Mr. Diamond's conversation, I understand you are to receive the envelope. When you do, 
Go directly to the Staten Island Ferry. Ride on it. All day, if necessary. A man will meet you and pick up the envelope. Be alone. Do not notify the police, or Mr. Diamond will surely die. back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Someone had sapped me and sapped me good. I had a dull, throbbing headache, and when I began to find my way back to consciousness, I felt my coat pulled off and my right shirt sleeve rolled up. There was a sharp pain in my upper arm, and several seconds later, my headache disappeared in a surge of heat that spread out over my back and shoulders. I tried to fight it, but it it was like being on a sinking ship, trying to crawl back up the slanting deck. The ship dragged me down, and I swallowed up in the black water. next thing I remembered was a blinding circle of light overhead like the sun if you were looking at it through a sheet of wrinkled cellophane. I shut my eyes and I could hear voices far off, hollow, not making much sense. The light hurt my eyes, but I, I couldn't seem to shut it out. So I tried to relax and wait, give the drug time to wear off. After what seemed like hours, the voices began to make sense. The light was easier to look at. It was just a plain ceiling lamp. As the feeling in my fingers began to return, I realized I was lying on a bed. The restaurant on the corner. I won't be more than ten minutes. The other man had promised to be back in ten minutes, so I had to do something in a hurry. I kept tightening my muscles, trying to get the circulation back. I had to make a try. I wasn't sure of my strength, but I had to try. I rolled off the bed. Hey! Hey, coming out of it, huh? Trying to break your neck? He leaned down to pick me up, and I hit him just below the Adam's apple with the side of my open hand. (laughs) The man choked and turned blue. He grabbed for his shoulder holster, and I kicked out with both feet. He doubled over and fell on his face. The effort had put him out of commission, but I was exhausted. I grabbed his gun, staggered for the door. But getting out of that room was like wading through an acre of glue. I made the hall somehow and started down the steps. I met the other man coming up. His arms were filled with beer and sandwiches. I shot him right through his dinner. Feel better? Yeah, yeah, Walt. Uh, a little more coffee, huh? You really had a rough time. They pumped you full of this stuff. Yeah, I'm amazed. I was out nearly 14 hours, huh? Yeah, you lost a whole day. How you managed to get down here, I don't know. I guess I'll never know. Drink your coffee. Yeah. And uh, you gave them the envelope, huh? Yeah, about an hour before you staggered into the station. I rode that ferry all day. Five o'clock, a man came up to me, and I gave him the envelope. Oh, I was smart. I had three men on the ferry and three men at each landing to tail him. He was a little smarter. He took the envelope, stuck it in a waterproof case, and jumped overboard. Fast speedboat picked him up. No identification on the guy I shot? Uh, No record. Nothing on him by the time we got there. What did the other guy look like? I was so punchy, I couldn't tell much. You'll have a sore throat for a long time. But they were the ones who beat you up yesterday at your office. They were. When you feel like it, I want you to take a look at that guy we dragged out of the river. See if you recognize his clothes or anything. He just might be the one who died in your office. All right. Now, uh, what was in that envelope? Well, I had a photostat made before I took it to the ferry. Looks like part of a map. Here. Hmm. So this is what's caused all the trouble. Boy, it must be worth a lot. 
Did you make anything out of it? Oh, water, section of land, and here's a... Oh, here's a longitude reading, but, uh... Hmm, no latitude reading. Probably on the other half. I wouldn't doubt it. Well, I've got a hunch about this. I want you to send Otis over to pick up Nancy Lang. Then take me over to the newspaper office and help me look at the files for something on a man named Guiardo. You know what you're looking for? Yeah, this guy Guiardo. Senor Guiardo. I know I've read about him or seen his picture. I... Hey, Walt. You find something? Yeah, here he is. But his real name isn't Guillardo, it's Ortiz. Yeah, look at those headlines. Julio Ortiz assassinated. Rebel leader killed after plot to take over government failed. Yeah, listen to this. Ortiz was expecting a large amount of American dollars to finance his army. Although the rumor is not confirmed, it was reported that Ortiz shipped a million dollars in gold bullion to someone in the United States. The plane was supposed to have crashed, and it is interesting to note that the recent plane crash in which two American pilots escaped, John Bishop and Bernard Combs, were found floating off Key West. Key West? Holy smoke, that's what the guy in my office tried to tell me. He said Key West before he died. Huh. Hey, Walt, don't you see? Ortiz is still alive. Maybe those two pilots double-crossed him and hid the gold. That's what that map is all about. I'll eight to five, that man you've got down in the morgue is one of those pilots. John Bishop or Bernard Combs. I'll have the FBI send us the files on both those guys. If one of them is John Bishop or Bernard Combs, we won't need fingerprints nor a face. We'll check their dental records, birthmarks. Uh, let's get back and see if Otis has got the lovely Nancy Lang. That's right, Lieutenant Shane in town. She's gone on a vacation, a butler said. Did he say where? Uh, no, he said he didn't know. He said this Miss Lang left town about 4 o'clock this afternoon. And I'll bet she's with Ortiz. Walt, when you talk to the FBI about those two pilots, have them check Nancy Lang, too. I'm going to Key West. Send any information to the chief of police there. know you, Diamond. We just got a teletap from the lieutenant identifying the body. It was Bernard Combs, one of the pilots. Hmm. Well, here's, here's the half of the map. Tell me, does that look like any section of coastline around here? Well, no, that's hard to say. I'll have a check. Uh, you ever heard of a man named John Bishop? He's the other pilot. Oh, sure. When them two boys was found floating around, they brought them into Key West. Mm -hmm. They was in the hospital here a couple of days. Bishop still lives in Key West. Well, I hope so. You may have died here very recently. And you think this here Ortiz is in Key West, too? I'll bet on it. He wants the other half of that map and may have it by now. He's got to go after that gold. You'll need a boat and some diving equipment. Well, what makes you think the gold's in the water? This map's got a shoreline, too. Well, well those two pilots couldn't carry a million dollars in gold bullion. It either went down with the plane or they dumped it and then bailed out and let the plane crash. Well, I'll get Bishop's address. We'll go over there and have a talk with him. He's on the next floor. Oh, I hope you're right. Well, that's where he's been living. Right down here. Bishop? Hey, Bishop. Door's locked. You got a pass key? Yeah. yeah. Bishop, you... Lord of mercy. Yeah. Is that Bishop? Yeah, that's him. Boy, he sure is dead. Well, that accounted for the two pilots. So now all we had to do was find Julio Ortiz. It figured he now had both sections of the map, and his next move would be to hire a boat and diving equipment. There weren't many places in Key West where a man could rent a boat and diving equipment. So the chief rounded up his men, and we all started checking it didn't take long. No, Captain. The party hired my ship ain't come back yet. We ain't due to sail for an hour. What did the party look like? Pretty girl. Can't figure what she wants to go diving for, but I just ran them to keep my mouth shut. Mm, probably Nancy Lang. 
Or Tiz is staying undercover until the last minute. Well, I'll spread my boys around. We'll keep out of sight. And when they show up, Skipper, you don't say nothing about us. Sure, sure. I just rent them and keep my mouth shut. About ready for that boat to sail. Well, they'll wait till the last minute. Hmm. Just imagine a million dollars in gold, just like a pirate story. Not enough killings mixed up with it to be one. Huh? Hey, hold it. That them? Ah, that's Nancy Lang. But Ortiz isn't with her. Who are them two fellas? Well, I've never seen them before. Some of Ortiz's men. They're probably checking to see if everything's clear before Ortiz comes aboard. We got as close to the schooner as we could and waited. The two men walked over and checked the diving equipment while Nancy Lang went below. We kept waiting, and still Julio Ortiz didn't show. Hey, they started an engine. I don't see Ortiz anywhere. They're casting off. We better take him. Yep. We're gonna have to jump. Look out for that one. He's got a gun. I got him jump. The other guy's running forward. Stop you! He's going over. Well, my man will pick him, huh? Yeah, I'm going below. Captain, what in the world? Hello, Nancy. How did you find me? Where's Ortiz? I don't know who you're talking about. Uh, is this the girl? Nancy Lang, meet Key West Chief of Police. How do you do? Where's Ortiz? She says she doesn't know who he is. Okay, young lady, I'm going to hold you for the New York authorities. Hold me for what? Murder. John Bishop and Bernard Combs, and we can make it stick. It might go easier on you if you tell us where Ortiz is at. I still don't know any Ortiz. Guillardo, the man I met at your party. That's ridiculous. Now, look, we know all about the gold. You don't have a chance of raising it, and eventually we'll get Ortiz. Uh, we're back at the door. Uh, if you don't help us, Nancy, it's pretty sure you'll get life for complicity. And if I do help? I can't promise a thing, but it will make a difference with the court. Julio is waiting ten miles down the coast. We were to pick him up, then go out and raise the gold. He has the map? Yes. I'll tell the skipper to shove off again. We'll sail that ten miles and grab Ortiz. What's your connection with Ortiz, Nancy? He's my husband. A dozen police officers came aboard and hid below decks. The skipper put out to sea and sailed parallel to the coast. Nancy told me all about her husband and his history as a rebel leader in South America. I was stranded in South America with a show that folded. I married Ortiz. After the gold was lost, he faked assassination and came to the United States. We located the two pilots. My husband was suspicious, so I played up to the one who came to your office. I got him drunk one night, and he told me about the gold and his half of the map. We've gone to ten miles... I'm glad it's over with. I see a man standing on the beach. Mr. Diamond. Yes? I was supposed to lure you into that garden. Figured. What I said at the fountain. I really... Oh, forget it. Yeah. No sense making it any tougher. We pulled into a cove and got as close to shore as possible. Then we swung a dinghy over the side. The chief and I climbed in behind Nancy. We kept our hats down over our faces and hoped our tiz wouldn't notice until it was too late. We both rowed and kept our backs to him. Nancy sat in the stern facing us. Rick. Yeah? We headed right. I don't want to turn around. We're headed all right. Rick, my husband, has always been good to me. Well, I'm glad he was good to somebody. He sure made a mess out of a couple of guys I can think of. But he was good to me. Hey, we're nearly there. Hello, darling. Hello. Julio. Yes? The police are with me. Why, you stupid little... He's running for it. Save the girl. Let him go. My men will pick him up. I got a score to settle. Ortiz, stop. Okay. <laughs> well, that, that makes the assassination permanent. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Good health to all from Rexall. (laughs) 
Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Dick Powell may currently be seen in the Metro-Golden-Mayer production, Right Cross, in which he co-stars with June Allison and Ricardo Montalban. Featured in tonight's cast were Barton Yarborough, Barney Phillips, Virginia Gregg, Wilms Herbert, Arthur Q. Bryan, and Lou Krugman. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to join us next week at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, murders are better than ever. Mr. Diamond. I stand condemned. Uh, my name is Arnold Bryce. I'm an art collector. Well, unless you're looking for empty beer bottles, I'm afraid you have the wrong man. You're a detective, aren't you? That's right. Well, then you're the man I want. How soon can you come over to my home? Well, that depends on two things, where you live and what you want me for. I live at 9607 Riverside Drive, but I'd rather tell you the nature of your assignment in person, if you don't mind. Well, that suits me, but my fee is 100 a day in expenses. Still want me to come over? Money is no object, Mr. Diamond. Please hurry. <laughs> My name's Diamond. I'd like to see Mr. Bryce. Mr. Arnold Bryce? That's right. Well, come in, sir. Thank you. Mr. Bryce is busy with an art dealer in the library, sir. You can wait in the gallery. The gallery? The art gallery. This way, sir. He led me down the hall and into a room that looked like it was once a den. There was a piano in the room, and hanging over the fireplace was a large painting of the Mona Lisa. The other three walls were all covered with pictures, too. This, I took it, was the gallery. Just make yourself comfortable, sir. I'll tell Mr. Bryce you're here when he's finished. Thank you. Beautiful room, isn't it? Hmm? Oh, oh, yes, yes. Lots of paintings. I didn't mean the paintings. I meant the room. Oh, I take it you don't like the art? No, sir. I only appreciate what I can see in the picture. This room used to be a study... Until Mr. Arnold Bryce came. And who had it before? Mr. Jasper Bryce. He died two months ago and left this house to Mr. Arnold. Well, I must get on with my work, sir. The butler gave a disgusted look at the paintings and took his leave. Come to think of it, I agreed with the old boy. Most of the paintings were what is called modern, which is sort of a nasty poke at the present period. Hi there. You're a burglar, just help yourself. Take them all if you want to. Well, I didn't know I had company. That's because you're not a very good burglar. You should be more careful. You, no doubt, are the local police force. <laughs> no, I won't turn you in. I... Oh, what's the use? Used to be I could joke. Used to be I liked to joke. Now it's no fun. Who are you, really? What do you want here? Can I fix you a drink? Hey, that's a lot of questions for a little girl. Little girl? <laughs> She staggered over to a couch and sat down while I took a good look at her. Beautiful is a word thrown around a lot these days, but it could only describe her. She had soft brown hair, big brown eyes, with a sort of a pleading look about them. She was wearing a pair of lounging pajamas, but her figure was nothing to speak of. When you found one like this, you kept the news to yourself. Ugly. What's that? I said ugly. Oh. Meaning those pictures. You like pictures? Oh, you look like the type who would like pictures. Well, I'm flattered. Look at that one. You ever see such a mess? 
That's night chasing away the morning in September. Well, you could have fooled me. That's my husband's favorite. You a friend of my husband? No. Neither am I. All he does is buy paintings. He's a nut about paintings. He should have married one. You must be Mrs. Bryce. I must be. Then that's life. Well, who'd you say you were? I didn't, but the name's Diamond. My name's Della. You know... Mr. Diamond, Mr. Bryce will see you now. Oh, get lost, Timothy. Mr. Diamond and I are just getting acquainted. But Mr. Bryce said... Mr. Bryce. Mr. Bryce. All right, you better go and see him, Mr. Diamond. My husband hates to be kept waiting. Me, I'd rather be alone anyway. I'm going to sit here till I figure out just why in Blaze's night is chasing morning away in September. I left Della Bryce staring at the picture and followed Timothy to the library. Inside, I met Mr. Arnold Bryce. He was a big man and looked old enough to be Della's father. On the desk lay another modern painting, and he sat admiring it like it was the deed to the Taj Mahal. Look at it, Diamond. Look at it. Uh, yes. Um, a masterpiece. Masterpiece. Well, it's original, all right. Of course. I buy nothing but originals. Can't stand copies, can you? Well, I, I really haven't thought about it lately. I, uh, tell me, is this a uh, masterpiece what you wanted to see me about? Oh, no, 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 no. Just thought you'd enjoy seeing it. Mm-hmm. Well, now that we've had our kick, suppose we get on to business. Fine, fine. Mr. Diamond, I'm number 34 on this city's social register. Do you follow me? No, I'm about six million. Please, sir, I'm very serious. Sorry. Now then, one in my position must be discreet. Divorce, heaven's knows, is scandal enough. But, well, to have a roust about for a wife, that I cannot tolerate. Heaven's no. I was married a little over six months ago, and to be frank, Mr. Diamond, my wife doesn't like me. Go on. That's all. I want to get rid of her. Uh, Mr. Bryce, I'm a detective, not an assassin. Of course, of course. I, I want you to help me find grounds for divorce. Oh. Well, a case like this can take a long while. At a hundred a day, that can add up to quite a bill. I hired you because I've heard you're the finest detective in New York. Oh, well, thanks for the flattery, but the fee is still a hundred a day, and I told you over the phone money meant nothing to me. Here. Here's a check I made out to you. It's for five hundred dollars. That should serve as a retainer. Well, uh, yes, that's... Uh, well, I... Now then, we can get on with this. Uh, I think my wife is in love with another man. No. Yes. And I think that... <laughs> I keep forgetting these walls are soundproof. Uh, we've only lived in this house a few weeks. My Uncle Jasper left it to me. Yes, your butler told me. Uh, Timothy? Uh, queer duck, Timothy. Uncle Jasper left me him, too. Oh. Well, uh, let's get back to your wife. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, Mr. Diamond, when I married Bella, I thought we'd be well suited. She's very beautiful. And uh, I guess where we met? I have no idea. In an art gallery. Naturally, I thought Della would be an art lover like myself. I could just picture her sitting in front of the fire on cold winter evenings, gazing at my originals. Thrilling thought. Yes, but it wasn't to be. Della deceived me. She hates my paintings. Well, it takes all kinds to make a world. Yes, but my world is art, Mr. Diamond, and Della is no part of my world. I see, but that uh, hardly sounds like grounds for divorce, Mr. Bryant. Oh, I realize that, but maybe this is. You see, Della used to date a boy named David Farb. Now she's been going out a lot lately, and I think she may be seeing him again. Mm-hmm. You think? Well, oh, I... Oh, I know it really may be nothing, but if she should be seeing him and we could prove it, wouldn't that be grounds? Well, no, no, possibly. Yeah. Now, now, this boy used to work for the Gorman Department Store. And if he's still in town, I want him watched. All right, I'll, uh, I'll check with the store and report to you later. Good, good. Timothy will show you out, Mr. Diamond. I left Mr. Arnold Bryce admiring the monstrosity he had purchased earlier. On the way out, I took another peek into the gallery to see if Della Bryce was still around. She wasn't. And then I noticed the Mona Lisa again. Somehow it seemed so out of place. I was staring at it when Timothy came up behind me. I see you admire the lady. Say, don't you ever make noise? Beautiful, isn't she? The Mona Lisa? Yes. Look at that face. The most lovely face in the world. I thought you didn't like art. Not what Mr. Bryce calls art. Only that picture. Do you know about it? Do I know about it? Oh, so many things. It really has a colorful history... Da Vinci painted her over 400 years ago. No. Yes. 
Zenobia del Giocondo's wife posed for Leonardo four years before it was finished. My, my. Everyone loves it. Francis I of France paid 4,000 golden florins for it. You really know the facts, huh? Oh, yes, sir. I've read many books about La Gioconda's history. I come here often and just stared into her face. Do you know that men have stared into the mystery of that face and then killed themselves? You don't say. Yes. But I'm probably boring you this way, sir. He took a last tender look at the picture and then led the way to the door. It was a crazy house full of crazy people and felt good to be outside again. The job I had was strictly routine, but as long as Bryce paid for my services, he'd get them. I took off for lunch, then went to the Gorm department store to find David Tharp. There I found Tharp, had joined the Army six weeks ago and was now stationed in California. That meant that Bryce's suspicions about his wife were unfounded, at least as far as Tharp was concerned. Hello? Let me speak to Mr. Bryce. Who's this? Oh, that worn-out voice sounds familiar. Walt? Yeah, is this Diamond? Yeah, but what are you doing there? Or did I dial the wrong number? You calling Arnold Bryce, Rick? That's right. Then you have the right number. Was he a client of yours? Uh-oh. I don't like the way you said was. You guessed it. Better get over here, Rick. Arnold Bryce has been murdered. <laughs> In my pocket was a check for $500, signed by one Arnold Bryce. This same Arnold Bryce was now dead, according to Lieutenant Walt Levinson, who was very reliable in these matters. I took a cab to the Bryce home on Riverside Drive. Timothy, the tall, gaunt butler, again let me in. His expression hadn't changed since I'd seen him earlier. Well, Timothy, a lot of excitement around here, huh? Yes, sir. The police are in the gallery. So is Mr. Arnold's body... Gruesome sight. Rick. Oh, hello, Walt. He's in there. Want to have a look at him? Why not? The boys in the lab are all finished. There. There he is. Hmm. Head bash then, huh? Coroner says he's been dead for about two hours. That place is the time of the murder around noon. Found the murder weapon? No. Nope. Figured it must be the missing poker from this fireplace set. Got the boys upstairs now looking for it. Who found the body, Walt? Mrs. Bryce. Otis is in the library now, taking your statement. What's your angle in this? Well, uh, Bryce hired me for some stock investigating. He was thinking of divorcing his wife. Well, at last we've got a motive. She finds out he's getting rid of her and knocks him off. Uh, maybe. Who else was in the house? It's the butler, the maid, and Mrs. Bryce. Otis is sure the butler did it. Been reading murder mysteries again. No. How about visitors? Anyone come to see Bryce around noon? No, apparently not. Looks like an inside job, Rick. We've got three suspects, and all we can do is grill them till one of them breaks down. So we might as well start on the wife. Mind if I sit in? No. Come on. We left the gallery and walked down to the library. Inside sat Della Bryce, patiently answering the questions of that master detective, that super sleuth, Sergeant Otis Loveloon. Hello, Lieutenant. I got a statement down on paper, and I'm asking some questions on my own. She's, uh... Oh, Diamond. Don't look so happy, Otis. Hello, Mrs. Bryce. Well, you come back. That man, Lieutenant, he's the one who saw my husband earlier. Yes, we know that, Mrs. Bryce. This is Richard Diamond. He's a private detective. Oh. Well, what would Arnold want with a private detective? It seems he was planning to divorce you. Or didn't you know that yet? Divorce me? <laughs> You're kidding! <laughs> You want to tell us the joke, too, Mrs. Bryce? Oh, this is a good one. <laughs> oh, come now. Maybe it's Otis, Walt. After all, she's been looking at that face of his for an hour. Can you blame her? Hey, I heard that. Oh, I'm sorry, but that just struck me funny. That worm of a husband was going to divorce me. Well, I've already talked to a lawyer about getting rid of him. I take it you and Mr. Bryce didn't get along? You said it. I married Arnold because I thought it'd be fun to have a big home and a nice car... All those things money can buy. Go on. Well, the money part was okay, but Arnold. Well, a girl can only take so much. It's a nice, respectful way to speak of the dead. All right, so he's dead. So now I get all that money and don't have to put up with Arnold. I should cry? Maybe a jury will think you picked up a poker in order to get that money. Now, look. 
just because I'm not crying and moaning about how much I loved Arnold doesn't mean I killed him. I didn't. We'll decide that. And will you please tell this baboon to stop asking me questions another hour and hear with him and I'd confess to anything? Good old Otis, the traveling third degree. Now look, Shama, take it easy, Otis. Now, Mrs. Bryce, you say you were upstairs fixing your hair around noon? That's right. What about your lunch? Don't you eat? I'm on a diet. Look, it's all there in my statement. Around one o'clock, I came downstairs and found the body. I called the police, and that's all I know. Well, then, if you're innocent, you won't object to answering questions. So, make yourself comfortable. Walt kept asking questions, and Della kept answering them. Half an hour later, Walt was getting tired. Della was getting tired, and I was already tired. Grilling a suspect is the most boring thing in the world, and it was a relief when Walt sent the girl upstairs. Otis, you see that she goes to her room and then bring that maid in here. Right, Lieutenant. Well, Rick, what do you think? I think she's innocent, Walt. Oh, you do? And huh? why? Because she leaves herself wide open. She admits she's glad the guy's dead. So maybe that's all a front to throw suspicion off her. She makes everything point toward her, and she thinks we'll figure she couldn't be that dumb. Mm, maybe, but uh, I don't think so. I think Otis was right. Huh? What are you talking about? Well, you said he thought the butler did it. So do I. Rick, I'm in no mood for jokes. Look, Walt, the guy was bashed in the head, right? The top of the head. Now, Bryce is close to six feet tall. So is Timothy. Della's too short. She couldn't hit him on top of the head unless she stood on a ladder. Yeah, sort of that. But you can't convict a guy because he's tall enough to hit Bryce on top of the head. Besides, maybe Bryce stooped over to tie a shoelace. Any number of reasons. Mm, maybe, maybe. But I, I still bet Timothy killed him. Okay, Sherlock. Tell me one more thing. Why? Why did he kill him? He'd only worked for him two weeks. No money's missing. Where's the motive? I'm not sure, Walt. But I think it's in a picture. Huh? Oh, now, Rick. Walt, when I was here earlier, I talked to Timothy in the art gallery. We talked about the Mona Lisa. Well, what about it? He knew everything about it. A lot of its history. Now, here's a guy who hates all these paintings around but one. The Mona Lisa. But what's it doing here? What's what doing here? The Mona Lisa. Bryce told me himself he only collected originals. But the Mona Lisa hangs in the Louvre in France. That picture over the fireplace is only a copy, and Bryce hated copies. Go on. That's all. I don't know exactly why or how all this happened. I only know things don't add up. Timothy's admiration for that one painting and what's it doing here. Hmm. Somewhere in there you think there's a murder motive. Why not? Sure, Della might have killed him for the money. That's a nice, big, fat motive. But, Walt, how many murders have big, fat motives? Darn few. Well, yeah, you're right there. A girl kills her sister because she called her fatty. A man shoots his wife for nagging. A woman poisons her neighbor for gossiping. A lot of little things can turn a twisted mind into a murderous mind. Okay, okay. But this picture angle doesn't impress me. Where's the motive? Even a small one. I can't... Here's the maid, Lieutenant. In here, miss. Oh, look, Danny, I'm saying so sorry about this thing. I am feeling to cry. Please, you can't think I have anything to do with it. I hardly know, Mr. Uh, Wright. Just sit down, miss. We just want you to answer some questions. Now, don't be frightened, dear. We we don't think you killed Mr. Bryce, but you might help us find out who did. Oh, well, I'm glad to help. Good. Now, uh, how long have you worked here? Oh, well, let me see. It has been uh, uh, five years. Uh, five years they have been here. They worked for Mr. Bryce's uncle. Then can he die, eh, stay on. Uh-huh. And Timothy, how long has he worked here? Oh, yes, my Timothy has been here all his life. He has told me about it. His father worked for the old Mr. Yes, for Bryce and his mother, too. Timothy, he grew up in this house. Then when his father died, he'd take over his job. I see. Now, uh, about the young Mr. Bryce, Arnold. Was he easy to get along with? Well, he don't know him so well, but they have no trouble with him. Timothy does not agree with him at times, but they have no trouble. Timothy doesn't agree with him? What do you mean? Well, Mr. Arnold changed a lot of things. New furniture and such. Timothy thinks they look better where they have always been. Just this morning they argue. Mr. Bryce wants Timothy to get rid of something, but they do not remember what it is. Oh. Then one more question. The room with all the paintings. Do you remember that room before Mr. Arnold Bryce came here? Oh, yeah. They used to clean there. But there was not all the paintings there then. No painting? Uh, not all there is, no. Just the one. The painting of the pretty lady. The Mona Lisa. Uh, what did you say? The Mona Lisa. Yeah, that's it. 
that is what Amity and Mr. Bryce was having words about this morning. The Mona, uh, Mona Lisa. That was it. I looked at Walt, and I could see that he was interested. Now there was a motive. Oh, not the big headline motive, just the kind you'll read on page six of your local paper. The kind of story that usually says the murderer is now undergoing sanity tests. Otis showed the maid out and left Walt and me with our little brains racing a mile a minute. I don't know. We still haven't got anything to convict him. Walt, he's a psycho, that's for sure. Now, the way I see it, he's crazy about that one picture. He grew up in the house. Maybe it means something to him. Then in comes Bryce with all his modern junk and orders Timothy to get rid of the Mona Lisa. Yeah. But Timmy argues and Bryce insists. They were both in the library, so maybe Bryce was even going to take it down himself. Well, it could be. Then our boy gets mad, grabs the nearest thing, which happened to be the poker. Okay, so it fits. We have a theory. But we still need one thing to convict him. A confession. Yeah. Maybe we can use the Mona Lisa. What? He killed for it. He may talk for it. I outlined my plan to Walt. Timothy was a psychopathic... And I knew we'd have to get him in the right kind of mood. Walt agreed with the plan, and we headed for the gallery. They had removed Bryce's body from the room, and only a deep red spot in the carpet was left. Walt went looking for Timothy, and I moved over to the piano. In here, Timothy. Oh, hello, Rick. Hi, Walt. Just thought I'd pass the time at the piano. It's all right. Just sit down, Timothy. I want you to wait here where I can locate you. We'll want to question you later. Yes, sir. I'll call you if I need you, Rick. Okay, Walt. My playing bother you, Timothy? Uh, oh, not at all, sir. I like music. Oh, me too. You know, that painting up there reminds me of a song I heard not long ago. Pretty thing. It went like this. Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa, men have named you. You're so like the lady with the mystic smile. Is it only cause you're lonely they have blamed you? For that Mona Lisa strangeness in your smile. I watched him carefully as I sang. At first he stared at me with a strange look in his eye, but gradually he settled back in his chair and listened to the words. His eyes rested on the beautiful painting over the mantelpiece. This was the mood I'd wanted. Many dreams have been brought to your doorstep. They just lie there. And they die there. Are you warm? Are you real, more? Or just a cold and lonely, lovely work of art. Well, did you like that? Hey, Timothy. Hey. Huh? Oh, uh, the song is very beautiful. It's fitting of her. Uh... Mm-hmm. Well, I guess I'd better stop fooling around at the piano and do what I came here for. His eyes were on me as I got up from the piano bench and walked over to the fireplace. I tried not to look at him as I reached up for the picture, but I heard him jump from his chair. What are you doing? Leave that alone. Well, I'm sorry, friend, but Mrs. Bryce is all upset about her husband's death. She asked me if I wouldn't carry out his last wish and get rid of this. Clutters up the other pictures, you know. Leave it alone. Take the others, but leave that alone. Sorry, but out it goes to the trash pile. No, it belongs here. The living part of this house. Put it down, I said. Put it down! I warned you. Now, now, Timothy, take it easy. Put on that shovel. When you put down the picture. Oh, and if I don't, you'll swing that shovel at me just the way you swung a poker at Bryce. He was an idiot. Throw it out, he said. Throw it out and leave that other trash on the walls. Now you... You want to throw it out, too? No. No, give me that painting. All right, Timothy, you've got it. Rick, are you all right? Yeah. See how Timothy is. He'll come around. You heard from the door? Yeah, enough. Imagine. 
Call this over a picture of a dame. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Zick Powell in the title role. It was written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. This is Bill Foreman speaking. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, if it ain't Richard Diamond, the smiling gumshoe. Well, if it ain't Sergeant Otis, the laughing hyena. The lieutenant in? Yeah, go on in and spoil his afternoon. You know, Otis, I think you've got the kindest, most wonderful face in the whole wide world. You do? Absolutely. But I do wish you'd do me a favor. Well, sure, anything. Stop wearing it upside down. Hello, Walt. Hello, Rick. Sit down. Oh, thanks, thanks. Uh, what's doing? Want a sandwich? Mm, I'll take some of that coffee. Sure. Something on your mind, Rick? No, I just got tired of sitting around the office. No business? Not in a week. Hmm. <laughs> got any sugar? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Here. Yeah, Otis. Uh, Lieutenant, I got some guy in the phone who won't give me his name. Says he wants to talk to you. Matter of life and death. Okay, put him on. Right. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. I'm going to say this once, so listen carefully. Tonight, somewhere in New York City, I'm going to kill a man, and there's nothing you can do about it. What? Promptly at 8 o'clock, somewhere in this city, I'm going to kill a man. Hello? Hello? Something wrong? Some guy says he's going to kill somebody at 8 o'clock tonight. Oh, dandy. Crank. Did he say who his victim was going to be? No, just crank. I should have humored him. Made suggestions. My landlord, for instance. Be a little gruesome if he really did it. Yeah. You'd have a hard time protecting eight million people from a killer you don't know anything about. Hope it was just a crank. Otis. Yeah, what's that? If that guy calls back, put him through and trace the call. Right. It sure would be miserable if that call was on the level. Oh, Relax. I'll have some more coffee. I had some more coffee. Walt worried a little. Not a lot. Because the big precinct caters to a good number of cranks every day. We talked about old times, and around six, I matched Walt for dinner. He stuffed himself at the automat until I ran out of change and begged for mercy. Then he dropped me off at my flat on 53rd and went back to the precinct. I showered, shaved, slipped into my blue suit, and headed to the door. Yeah. Do me a favor, will you, Rick? You gotta stop stuffing yourself, Walt. You sound like you got indigestion. I'm down at the morgue. Meet me here, please. Oh, now look, I got a date with a live one. I'm in on the start of some trouble. It's liable to grow. That guy who called made good. He stabbed a man to death on Broadway at eight o'clock. Yes, Lieutenant. Hello, Walt. Hi, Rick. Thanks for coming down. Okay, Hal. Who is he? Or, uh, who was he? Brother identified him, Abraham Weiss. Stabbed in the heart from behind with a long, thin instrument. On Broadway at 8 o'clock. That's right. Hmm. A dozen people saw him stagger to the curb and fall. Most of them just thought he was drunk. You think your boy on the phone did it? 8 o'clock, right on the nose. Whoever did it must have walked up behind him, jabbed him just below the left shoulder blade, and kept on walking. What do you want me for, Walt? If this guy on the phone did kill Abraham Weiss and we can't find a motive, it's a little more than a simple killing. We may be mixed up with a madman. Oh, so I qualify in that league. You're one of the few guys who really is interested in criminal psychology. Well, I think it's the answer. You can't stop something unless you know the cause. Well, you give me a hand, Rick. 
Sure, sure. I've got Weiss's family at the station. Let's go see them. Why? Why, Lieutenant? Why did this happen to Abe? That's what we're going to try and find out, Mrs. Weiss. We were hoping you might help us. Well, he, didn't, he didn't have any enemies. He was a good man. We have three children. I left them with Mrs. Bellotti, my neighbor. It, it's going to be hard on them. You're sure your husband didn't know it? No. He didn't have any enemies. He was a good husband and a good father. Everybody liked him. But only last week, Mrs. Dowd up the street from us. We'd like a list of your brother's friends, Mr. Weiss. Where he worked, people he had business with, anyone you can remember who might give us a lead. Been sitting out there thinking about that. There just isn't anyone that I know would want to kill Abe. He was a good guy, did his job, took care of Louise and the kids. He didn't bother nobody. How long were Louise and Abe married? For, uh, no, six years. Maybe a little more. Nice girl, Louise. Oh, the best. Good wife. What happens to her now? I'll take care of him. You're not married, huh? No. Quite a job taking care of a widow and three kids. I'm doing all right. It's the least I can do. You got a girl? Yeah, why? Maybe going to get married, huh? Well, I'm engaged. I've been thinking about it. It'll have to wait for a while, I guess. Until Louise gets back on her feet. Okay. Tell us about some of your brother's friends. Well, I guess his best friend was Art Brearley. They was off close to the year. He told us about everyone he could think of. Gave us a dozen names and addresses we could check. Like Louise, Martin couldn't figure why anyone would want to kill Abraham Weiss. The next was Mrs. Rebecca Weiss. Tired. The hurt in her eyes, enough for all the mothers who had raised a son and lost him. We'll try not to keep you too long, Mrs. Weiss. It's all right, Lieutenant. You want to help. Would you like a glass of water? No, no. When will I be able to see my son? It's right that I should see my son. A few questions first, if you don't mind. I know you're trying to help. Just me a few questions. As many as you like, Lieutenant. Not long with Mrs. Rebecca Weiss. Nothing that would help to catch her son's killer. So we checked the people who had known Abraham, and there were plenty. His boss gave us a few more names to add to the long list. All of them friends who couldn't imagine why anyone would want to kill a nice guy like Abe. At 7.30 the next morning, Walt looked at reports and poured more coffee. Here. I'll put sugar in it. Ah, thanks. If that phone call was on the level, why would a guy kill like that? Call us and tell us he was going to do it. What would be his reason? Uh, well, couldn't guess. But if that guy who called did do the killing, you can bet he'll phone again. Why? Well, he bragged he was going to do it. He'll want the credit. Well, I'm going to get some rest. A couple hours anyway. Let's both get a couple. Sorry. That doesn't matter. Lousy dream. What time is it? Five o'clock. Oh, I died, didn't I? A boy called again. Oh? You trace it? Phone booth in Grand Central. What do you have to say? How much? Wanted to know how he liked his handiwork. What's a good answer to that one? Well, I said a few things, but I guess he figured we weren't satisfied, so he promised he'd kill somebody else tonight. <laughs> Hello, Rick. Seen the papers? No. Nope. Here. Hmm. Fiend terrorizes city, unknown killer murders at will, police and baffled. Everybody's on my back. Exactly. What did he say? You want to hear? I made a recording. Let's hear it. Okay, Otis, put him on. Hello, Lieutenant. Yeah. What do you think now, Lieutenant? I did what I said I was going to do, didn't I? Look, who is this? The man who called yesterday and said he was going to kill someone at 8 o'clock last night. I don't believe it. Well, certainly you do. 
You'd like to stall so you can have this call traced. Well, you better listen. I want everybody to know just how stupid the police force really is. I'm going to kill again tonight, and there's nothing you can do about it. Look, you, whoever you are, if it's the last thing I ever do, I'll... Tonight at 8, another innocent victim will die because the police can do nothing about it. Hello. Hello. Hold it. The call came from a phone booth in Grant. He said another innocent victim. Yeah, so he's a nut. For some reason, he hates the police force. There's your motive. Well, I guess it's possible, but something sticks in my craw. Yeah? What? Eight o'clock. Why pick eight o'clock both times? Well, I guess like you said, he wants the credit. We're liable to get a couple of killings in an evening. He wants us to be sure which one he did. Okay, so he makes it eight o'clock the first time. Why the second? Why not six or seven or ten or... Just following a pattern, I guess. Uh, maybe so. Well, what do we do? Uh, I got every man possible on the streets. But, Rick, let's face it, this is a pretty big city. And it's six, two, and even. If he does kill again, it won't be anywhere near the scene of his first stabbing. I guess we just wait. Yeah. A little over an hour to go. So we waited. Walt got the coffee going, and I went through a whole package of cigarettes. Somewhere in the middle of New York, probably on a crowded street, a man was walking, waiting like we were for 8 o'clock, waiting to stab someone through the heart, waiting for 8 o'clock. Want coffee? No. Give me a cigarette. You don't smoke. Want a bet? Ah, uh, here. Got a match? Got a lighter. Ah, uh, this is no good. Yeah? Let's go. Where to? Entrance to Madison Square Garden. Man stabbed to death in the crowd going into the fights. Right at 8 o'clock. man murdered going into Madison Square Garden to see the fights. Stabbed through the heart while he stood in the middle of the large crowd. We went through the same routine, identify the body, question witnesses who had been close to him, see his friend, anyone who knew him. Name's Leon Ellis, small-time fight manager. No family, handles a young kid named Billy Martin. Wasn't fighting last night. At 10 o'clock the next morning, we found Billy Martin working at the East Side Gym. We talked to him for a while, but he couldn't help much. So we kept going, making our list of names, talking to everyone, all morning and into the afternoon. By 4.30, we were holding each other up. Look, we're working with a madman who kills anybody close to him so he can show how helpless we are to stop him. The whole city's in a panic. The newspapers are blasting everybody in the department, yours truly in particular. Yeah? I got him on the line again. He even bragged to me about this last killing. Trace it as fast as you can. Right. Start that recorder, Rick. It's our boy again. Okay. Go ahead. Fifth Precinct, Lieutenant Levinson. You can skip the formalities, Lieutenant. Your sergeant told you who was on the line. Well, I did it again last night, didn't I, Lieutenant? Okay, so we can't stop you. I admit it. I'll admit it to the papers. That should make you happy. The police department can't do anything about it. That's what you want, isn't it? Again tonight, Lieutenant. One more person will die. Now, wait a minute. At least give me a chance to talk to you. While you trace the call? No. Tonight at 8 o'clock, and you can't stop me. Hello? Yeah? Call came from a phone booth in Rockefeller Center. Picks the right place to call from. We look pretty silly rounding up everybody in Rockefeller Center. Walt looked sick, and I felt it. What could we do? We knew nothing about our killer or where he'd strike next. Walt called in the reporters and gave them the story. The papers were blasted to the department, but it was the best way to warn the public to stay off the streets. The department was alerted, the radio stations were given bulletins to broadcast, and Walt and I climbed into a prowl car and started cruising. At 8 5, it came in. Attention, all units in the vicinity of Zone 12. A 211 in front of 415 West 64th, 415 William 64, ambulance, dead body. Car 73, come in, please. 73, go ahead. 211 at 415 West 64 is a stabbing, Lieutenant. Roger. That's it, Rick. (laughs) 
The victim was an elderly man dressed expensively and lying face down on the sidewalk. Again, no witnesses to the killing. Most of the people who had seen the man fall realized almost immediately what had happened because of the publicity on the last two killings. But like one man said... Well, how are you going to see who killed him in a crowd like this? Maybe a hundred people on the block when it happens. Boy, you guys better start doing something. Yes, sir. Does Mr. Arthur Reeves live here? Yes, sir, but Mr. Reeves is not in at the moment. I'm from the police. Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Homicide? Oh, I'd like to talk with everybody in the house. Certainly, sir. Has something happened to Mr. Reeves? He's been murdered. Oh, no. No, not Mr. Reeves. How many people in the house? Myself, the maid, and Mr. George Reeves, Mr. Reeves' nephew. Tell him I'd like to talk with him. And we talked with the three people in the dead man's house. The maid, the butler, and George Reeves, the nephew. I warned him not to take his walk tonight. I showed him the papers. Did he usually take walks at night? That's for the past 15 years. Know why anyone would want to kill him? Mr. Reeves? Of course not. You know very good and well it was that fiend what did it. How about you? Can you think of why anyone would want to kill your employer? No, sir. I've been with Mr. Reeves for over 20 years. I'm acquainted with most of his friends and associates. Look here. I can assure you that my uncle knew no one who would want to kill him. You're his nephew? That's right. Your uncle took walks every night? Yes, every night. Now, well, if you don't mind, we'd like you all to come down at the station to make statements. Okay, we got the statements and other list of names and a long one. None of these killings tie together. Nobody on the first list has any connection with anybody on the second list. Let's face it, if that madman calls again, we can't stop him. Oh, take it easy, Well, will you? can we? I want to talk to the maid, the butler, and the nephew again. Why? It's just the same as all the others. I want to talk to them, okay? I'm sorry. Getting jumpy. No, you're tired. So am I. Otis, send in the maid. What are you doing? Fixing the recorder. I may want to listen to it again. So we again talked to the maid, then the butler... Than the nephew, and the tape recorder picked up everything they said, and it sounded very much like everything everybody else had said after the first two killings. Walt let them go home and went up to talk to the commissioner. When he came back, he looked pretty discouraged. I'm sure on the griddle. Solve it or turn in my badge. I want you to listen to something. Oh, sure. I've cut out sections of tape, stuck them together. Mr. Reeves took walks every night after dinner, and dinner was always at seven? That's right. Then he always left sometimes close to eight? Yes, 7.30 or a quarter to eight. He was never gone more than half an hour? No. What time did he leave tonight? About a quarter to eight. Weren't you worried when he didn't come back within half an hour? Well, certainly. Both the maid and I were very anxious. Were you all in the house between a quarter of eight and the time we arrived? Yes, sir. Where was Mr. Reeves' nephew? In his room. He went up right after dinner. How wealthy was your employer? He was very wealthy. Mr. Reeves, who inherits your uncle's fortune? Why, I do. Was Mr. Reeves ever longer than half an hour with his walks? Never more than a few minutes, one way or the other. Who handles your uncle's affairs, Mr. Reeves? Well, Richard B. Gregg. He's been my uncle's attorney for many years. Young Mr. Reeves has always been excitable. Gotten a lot of trouble in the past. Yes, he argued with his uncle many times. No, Mr. Reeves didn't come down and ask why his uncle had been gone so long. Certainly I worried about my uncle. But I thought he might have stopped along the way for something or other. Okay, so you took out pieces of the testimony and stuck them together. So what? Just this. Every one of these killings have taken place at 8 o'clock. I know, and it's worried you. Now, this is the first time that one of our victims was certain to be out on the streets at 8 o'clock. Coincidence? Uh, maybe, maybe. Mr. Reeves was a wealthy man, very wealthy. And the nephew gets his money, and the nephew was in his room at the time of the killing. Who saw him? The butler and the maid both say he was up there. So he climbs out a window. His uncle was killed only two blocks from the house. Plenty of time to stab him, get back through the window. You're really reaching out, aren't you? Uh, sure I am. What do you want me to do? Well, the nephew's voice certainly doesn't match the ones we got on the threatening phone calls. So he disguises it. I got an idea. What? Let's put a tail on all three of these people anyway. It's not much. It's all we've got so far. I'm going out to check on something. Oh, 
Bob. Here's something that'll make your hair curl. I just saw the attorney for the Reeves estate, and he said the old man was planning on changing his will, leaving all his money to charity, not his nephew. He was supposed to meet with Mr. Reeves this morning. And Reeves gets killed last night. Pretty convenient for the nephew. We can't arrest him on that. No, but it makes a good motive. You think the nephew would kill two men and then his uncle just so it would look like a madman had picked out another innocent victim? You've got to admit it'd be pretty clever. There's an understatement. Yeah. He's on the line again, Lieutenant. I'm tracing him. Oh, no. Our boy again. There goes your theory. Hello. You can't do anything, Lieutenant. I've killed three men and you can't stop me. I'm going to kill again tonight at eight. Hello. It was him, all right. Tonight at eight. Rick, we've just got to do... Yeah? Call came from Grand Central again. Okay. Well, what happens to your theory now? Well, he might do it again. Expect you to react just this way. Uh, who's tailing George Reeves? Harrison. When does he report in again? Checks in on the hour. Last time was about 20 minutes ago. 40 minutes ago, huh? No way of contacting him? No. Okay, we wait. Yeah? Yeah? Where was he at 446? Don't let him out of your sight. Well? At 446, George Reeves made a phone call from a booth in Grand Central Station. He's home now. Well, we had something. A motive and a man calling from Grand Central, but not enough to make an arrest. We waited until 7 and then headed for the Reeves' house. The area is surrounded. He'll have two men on him no matter where he goes. He's still in the house? According to Harrison. No, I want to do more than pick him up with a knife. Here he comes. Yeah. Climbing into his car. Attention, car 31415. Suspect heading east. Proceed east on your street. We tailed him, keeping in contact with the other cars as they stayed parallel. When Reeves turned off, we went on ahead, notified the car in our right or left to pick him up. That way, Reeves wouldn't suspect a tail. About 7.30, we got a call that Reeves had parked. We headed to the spot in a hurry. Suspect is heading north on Calder. Oh, get ahead of him. Park at the corner of Davis. We'll pick him up there. We stopped at the corner and got out of the car. We waited until we spotted Reeves walking in our direction and then let him pass and followed, staying close. We kept after him until five minutes to eight. He swung out on Broadway and was pushing his way through the crowd. Then it happened. Where'd he go? We've lost him. Come on. Three minutes to eight. Let us through, please. Well, I never... Get out of the way. Oh, you push. Shut up. You see him turn off? No, he's got to be... Walk, walk. Crossing the street. Let's go. Breathe. No. Look out for the knife. No, no. Let me go. Let me go. Drop it. You okay? Yeah. Here's the knife. Young man. Young man, what right have you got to hit that nice gentleman? He was helping me across the street. I have a good mind to report Lady, you. lady. If this man was helping you across the street, just forget about him. Go bet on a horse or something. This is your lucky night. Diamond Private Detective stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. This is Bill Foreman speaking. Richard Diamond Private Detective is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective.
Good evening. This is Bill Foreman speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of their own store names. They've done that because they recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. This month, Rexall family druggists are introducing 10 great new products direct from the famous Rexall laboratories. One of them is Rexall Multivitamin Formula V10. Here's a really pleasant-tasting, really easy-to-take liquid that supplies twice the minimum daily requirement of vitamin B1, five times the requirement for iron, plus the minimum daily requirement of vitamins A, D, and B2, plus red crystalline vitamin B12. Rexall Formula V10 aids in the formation of hemoglobin, stimulates appetite, and is especially good for convalescence. Remember and ask for it by this name, Rexall Formula V10 at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, not a corpse in a carload. Rick? Hi, Helen. Hi. What are you doing? Oh, trying to think of a new ad for the phone book. Well, what's the matter with the old one? Doesn't seem to be bringing in the business. Oh. Hey, see what you think of this one. Diamond Detective Agency, we'll split any case you've got. Bonded or dead on arrival. Well, by all means, use it. Like it? No, but think of all the business you'll get from the psychiatric ward. Oh, you're a living doll. Well, I see you tonight. Mr. Diamond? Uh, Helen, dear, I'll talk to you later. I think I've spotted the client. Bye. Bye. Well, come in, come in. Uh, you're Mr. Diamond? That's right. My name is Quimby, sir. How do you do, Mr. Quimby? Pull up a chair. Uh, thank you. Something I can do for you? Uh, yes. You see, Mr. Diamond, I'm the manager of the Far East Importing Company. And when I went down to the store this morning... Our night watchman was missing. So? Also about $50,000 in unsaid gems. Why come to me instead of the police? But those jewels were on consignment to the store. I was in hopes you could recover them before I had to make an accounting to the owner. Mm, who owned the gem? Uh, Mr. Philip Lasdown. He's a very eccentric collector. He has many things on display in the store. He's a very good client. Aren't you insured? Naturally. But if Mr. Lasdown knew that a robbery had taken place, he'd never again do business with my establishment. And uh, you want me to recover the missing jewels? If you can. Mm. You think the night watchman is responsible for the theft? Well, I don't know what else to think. The night watchman's name is Block. Arthur Block. He lives in an apartment on the east side. But I have already checked with his landlady and he hasn't shown up. Uh, how long have I got to recover the jewels, Mr. Quimby? But I have no idea. It's impossible to tell when Mr. Lasdown will want an accounting. Well, I charge you $100 a day in expenses. Oh, yes. Well, 100 be enough for now. Well, if you have nothing to do for the next few minutes, I'd be more than happy to grovel at your feet. I beg your pardon? Well, now, I want the night watchman's address, also the address of your shop. Then you go back to the shop and wait to hear from me. Quimby gave me what I wanted, then minced happily out of my office. I locked up, grabbed a cab for the east side of town, and 20 minutes later, I was talking to the missing night watchman's landlady. Sure, honey, Arthur Block lives here. You're the second one to come asking for him this morning. He killed somebody or something? Is he in? No, he ain't been in since yesterday evening before he left for work. Can I take a look at his room? Well, I don't know, Blue Eyes. It's against the rules. Oh, my goodness, I dropped a five dollar bill. <laughs> my goodness, so you did. Don't hurt your back, bending over, honey. I'll get it. Right. Little rheumatism, but anything for a fin. <laughs> Say, you got any more loose ones around? I'll show you every room in a joint. Just the one where Block lives. Right down here. You ain't no cop, honey. Shamus? Yep. Figured. Right in here. There you are, handsome. Thank you, Mother. Mother! <laughs> when you're done, stop back at my room and have a beer. I never touch anything stronger than opium. <laughs> The night watchman's room was a shabby affair, about 15 by 20, and I went over it inch by inch, cockroach by cockroach. Apparently, Block hadn't taken anything with him. The drawers of the broken-down dresser were filled with an assortment of socks and underwear. 
In the closet, I found the rest of his clothes and an old empty suitcase. Yes, if Arthur Block had skipped, he was figuring on buying a wardrobe someplace else. I left, keeping on my tiptoes as I passed the landlady's door. Then I headed for the address of Mr. Quimby's antique shop. Hey, Mr. Diamond, did you find out anything about the night watchman? Well, his landlady's a lush and likes blue eyes. <laughs> Oh, 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 my goodness. What's the matter? Uh, Mr. Lansdown. Mm. Um, <laughs> good afternoon, Mr. Lansdown. I do hope you... Good afternoon, young vulgarism, sir. It's a perfectly wretched afternoon, as you very well know. Uh, yeah, yes, it is. A very... <laughs> Pardon me. Mr. Diamond, Mr. Lansdown. Philip J. Lansdown. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Jimmy, I've come for my Buddha. You've come to your... Oh, it's been no. it quite long enough. Where is it? Mr. Lansdown, I have someone who's interested... I've decided in... not to sell it. Now, come, come, come. Where, where is it? It's over there in the corner, Mr. Lansdowne. In the corner? Uh, yes, sir. I see. It's not enough that I suffer the tall man's of lending my exquisite stature uh, to a firm that employs a Philistine as manager. No. I am now subjected to the ignominy of having it secreted in a corner behind a variety of bric a bra one would expect to find only in the men's lounge at Coney Island. Mr. Lansdowne. Maybe I told you that Buddha was to enjoy this room's most favorable location. You made a grave mistake, sir. A momentous mistake. But, but please, Mr. Lansdowne. Enough, sir. I'm repossessing my Buddha forthwith. For years, I forced myself to deal with you in a patient and forbearing manner. But never again. This is the crowning blow. Far be it for Philip Lansdowne to cast pearls before spies. Oh, that man, Mr. Diamond. Oh, that terrifying man. I, I must have been born under an unlucky star. Well, relax. Things could be worse. You've still got a little hair on your head. Uh, even that's getting thin. So who wants fat hair? I left Quimby wringing the cold sweat out of his hands and took a cab over to the 5th Precinct Police Headquarters. When I walked in, the clock above Lieutenant Levinson's desk said 12 noon, and Lieutenant Levinson said... Oh, no. Well, what's the matter, Fatty? I remind you of your lost youth? No, lost cause. Well, you might as well face it, Walter. You hate me because I have an athletic waistline. Ha, ha, ha. Eureka. At last, a three-syllable word. I knew you could do it, Otis. I'm going to let you do me a favor. Yeah? Mm-hmm. I want you to check with the morgue and all hospitals and jails for an Arthur Block, lately employed as the night watchman of the Far East Importing Company. Oh, well, I'll check, but not because you told me to. Mm-hmm. Then why? Because I'm stupid. I guess I told him. What's all this about, Rick? Uh, it's a missing night watchman and fifty thousand dollars in jewels, Walt. But you can't stick your nose in a jet. Nobody's dead. I've got a sergeant who can make a liar out of you. What do you know about a guy named Philip J. Lasdown? Never heard of him. Mm, shove me that phone, will you? Yeah. Thanks. Forget it. Just leave a nickel. Oh, he's a collector of rare art objects and nasty dispositions. Want me to check on this lad down for you? Mm, might be a good idea. Okay. <laughs> yes? Quimby? Oh, Mr. Diamond, I was hoping you'd call. You and 10,000 foolish debutantes. Mr. Lansdowne has had the Buddha removed, and he is sending his lawyer over in the morning for an accounting. Now, should I tell him about the jewels now or wait until morning? Oh, wait, if you want this thing solved. What's Lansdowne's address? Blue Heron Road at Long Island. Thanks. I'm going out to see him. I'll check with you later. Please. I do not read pick, look, see, quick, or popular mechanics. I refuse to endorse a petition, and as far as a free excursion to the Bahamas with all expenses paid, I couldn't be less interested. Now, if you'd be so kind as to remove your person from my property. I'm warning you, sir. Look, Your Highness, remember me? I met you this afternoon at the Far East Importing Company. I remember you. Good day. Uh, 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 uh. Young man, if you do not remove your foot from my door, I may resort to violence. You will kindly remove your foot. By all means, as soon as you answer a few questions. Who are you, sir? I mean, what's your occupation? I am a private detective. How earthly. Well, what do you want? How many things do you have on consignment in the Far East Importing Company? Oh, good grief. What kind of a question is that? The first of several. I have many things on consignment there. Anything of extreme value? What are you getting at? Just curious. Yes, disgustingly so. Of course, there are many things of extreme value. 
Approximately fifty thousand dollars in rare gems, a dozen priceless antiques. As a matter of fact, that Buddha which you saw this morning, my most priceless possession. Aside from being very old, the eyes are two perfect pigeon blood rubies. Now, is there anything else? I'm sure your foot must be going to sleep. Did you ever know or meet a man named Arthur Block? Never. He was the night watchman at the shop. The night watchman. So our conversation's at an end. I find your reference to my association with the night watchman the lowest form of discord. Now, good day. Gesundheit to you. Hey. Hey, bud. Sorry, I do not read tick, click, quick, look, spook. Hey. Who's taking the census? Uh, Just want to know if a party named Larsdown lives here. Well, you could hardly call him a party. More like a friendly street fight. Look, friend, I got to pick up some luggage. Does Larsdown live here? Yeah, with a bosom Buddha. Larsdown's a one of the two pay. <laughs> Oh, oh, Mr. Diamond, I was just closing up shop. Have you found out anything? Well, not much. Tell me something, Quimby. Where do you keep those jewels? Why, in the safe. Did the night watchman have the combination? Yes, in case of fire. There were also some perishables in with the gems. Did he know much about the rest of the merchandise in the store? Yes, of course. He had a list and made inventory every night. Hmm. Did he know Lazdown's Buddha had ruby eyes? Well, I don't know. Well, how'd you find out? Lazdown told me. If the night watchman knew about those rubies, I wonder why he didn't pry them out and take them along. I never thought of that. Have you touched that safe? Yes, when I opened it and discovered the loss. Well, don't do it again. It may have some of the night watchman's fingerprints on it somewhere. Tell me, did you, uh, did you know Lazdon was planning on leaving town? Leaving town? No, no, I didn't. Well, I'm not sure that he is, but I've got a hunch. Are you going home after you lock up? Yes. yes. Well, give me your phone number. I'm going down to the precinct and may want to reach you later. <laughs> Still looking for Block? That's right. Has he shown up? No. Hey, honey, you just skipped off without saying goodbye. Had a beer all open for you. Oh, I bet you were so unhappy you poured it down the drain. <laughs> you sure are the one. <laughs> yeah, I sure am. I sure am. Look, sweetheart, if Block shows up, call me at the 5th Precinct Police Station. Name's Diamond. Sure has him. Oh, you fracture you, me. Well, it's an idea. <laughs> I couldn't find nothing on that missing night watchman, Shamus. Oh, well, thanks, anyway, Otis. In appreciation, I may send you a large can of Red Heart. Liver flavor. Oh, go chase your tail around the block. Otis. Yeah, and I got plenty more things to say. Funny things? Funny as your face. I'm tired of you making fun of me. I ain't no dog. <laughs> you having trouble with Otis again? Oh, I don't think it's anything serious. But I would suggest a rabies shot. Well, here's something that might interest you. Philip J. Lasdown booked passage on the Star of the Orient... Sailing for the Far East tonight at 11 o'clock. Famous beauty expert Ann Delafield says that women are tired of endless jars and bottles that cost so much time and money. She says that more than one cream is just nonsense. But can just one cream do everything for your skin? It certainly can. That is, if it's Anne Delafield's all-purpose deep cream. Here's a cleansing cream, face cream, night cream, eye and throat cream. All creams in one. A special blend of all the fine, rich, natural oils so necessary and good for care of your skin. Sounds wonderful. Does Anne Delafield have makeup, too? Yes, indeed. She's designed a whole new, no-nonsense cosmetic line just for you modern women. There are vitamins for true beauty from within. Fine powder with built-in foundation. Everything you need for looking your loveliest. All this must be pretty expensive. But you're wrong. You'll find that the Anne Delafield Cosmetics give you most for your cosmetic dollar and save you so much time as well. So look for them today at Rexall Drugstores everywhere. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, Waltz and Lightning bit of information certainly seemed important, so I sat down to try and figure out exactly what I had to date. 
My client, Quemby, had come into my office and hired me to locate a missing night watchman named Arthur Block because $50,000 in gems had been pilfered from Quemby's shop. The gems belonged to a particularly disgusting character named Philip J. Lasdown. The missing night watchman, Block, was still missing. And by the looks of his room, he'd skipped without taking anything with him. And by the look of his landlady, I couldn't blame him. Well, I tied it all together, and the conclusion was amazingly simple. I had exactly nothing. Hey, I got something hot, Lieutenant. A 211 on River Street. I fished the guy out of the bay at the end of Pier 16. I identified as one Arthur Block. Hey. That's your missing night watchman, isn't it? That's his name. They bring the body in? Yeah, it's down the morgue now. Uh, get Quimby down there for identification. Here's his phone number. Does Block have any family or anything? I don't know, but you might check with his landlady. She can get you an identification, too. Otis, get this Quimby and the landlady. Take him down to the morgue. We're going up to see Verdier in ballistics. Right. Here's the slug, Lieutenant. Huh? Almost like a ball. This is really most amazing. That slug was fired from a weapon made in 1831 by Samuel Colt. He patented it in Europe in 1835 and in the U.S. in 1836. What did the gun look like? Well, it was the forerunner of the Colt 44. A single barrel with a revolving breech carried five slugs. During the Fieschi Revolution in France in 1834, Fieschi had a rifle made like it. It tried to assassinate Louis Philippe. Lieutenant... Well, what is it, you mallet head? Carl just came over with a hot shot. That guy, Philip Lasdown, said someone had bust into his house and tried to rob him. He said he chased the guy off, but he was screaming for protection. Come on, Walt. I think we'd better go over there. Well, things were beginning to shape up. Walt and I piled in the squad car and headed for Long Island, the house of Philip J. Lasdown. When we got there, Lasdon was hopping around like a kangaroo with a hot foot. Fine state of affairs. He's getting sure a man isn't even safe in his own home. What's the city coming to? A police force is obviously second only to the Boy Scout. Now, now, calm down, Mr. Calm Lasdown. down, my good fellow. I have no intention of calming down. How would you enjoy walking into your own living room and there, sneaking around in the dark, a pathological fiend intent on robbing you of your most priceless possession? What was he after? My Buddha. The object of your particularly uncouth interrogation of this afternoon, Mr. Diamond. By the way, where were you 40 minutes ago? Oh, relax. Did you get a look at this guy? The lights were out. Well, did he take you, Buddha? He most certainly did not. But had I not walked in at the precise moment, he would probably be carrying his piggyback to the middle of Times Square. And your observing police force would undoubtedly stop traffic for him. That's the Buddha right over there, Walt. Keep your hands off it. Now, look, Lassie. You called the police. The police are here, so relax before someone puts their foot in that big mouth. Well, really? Yeah, really. You're getting ready to leave town, aren't you? I don't see that that's any concern of yours, Lieutenant. Well, Buster, in case you don't know it, you're the number one suspect in a killing. I beg your pardon. Do you uh, own any antique guns? Guns? Sir, I do not collect weapons of any sort. I demand to know what you mean when you say I'm suspected of a killing. The night watchman at Quimby's antique shop was shot to death and dumped in the river. Uh, the night watchman again. I told Mr. Diamond once that my association with the night watchman was as ridiculous as General MacArthur sending Sally in a charm bracelet. Nothing has been touched on the Buddha? Nothing. I assume that the thief knew the value of the ruby eyes. Has there been any publicity about the Buddha? Some. Hmm. Walt, come here. You excuse us a second, Mr. Lasdown? You couldn't make it a year, could you? Charming, Philip. Yeah. Look, Walt. In some way, the night watchman, the missing gems, Lasdown, and his boot are all mixed up together. Okay, so what? We haven't even got the murder weapon. Well, if the night watchman did swipe the jewel down to the safe, then someone probably killed him for them. Yeah, that figures. Hmm. If he was planning on stealing them, wouldn't he be all ready to skip town? Sure. Well, he hadn't packed a thing. His apartment hadn't been touched. Oh, that's not much. Okay. If someone wanted to get that Buddha, why not break in the store? Because it's easier to break into a house out on Long Island. The Buddha was just moved this afternoon. Who knew Lasdown took it? Yeah. And if the potential thief is mixed up with the original jewel theft, why didn't he grab the rubies in the store? I never thought of that. No. I think he wanted that Buddha for something else. Oh, uh, uh, Lasdown. What do you want? Is there anything else about that Buddha besides the eyes? I told you once, it's a very rare piece. Yeah, aside from that. Could anyone hide something in it? Hide something? Why, yes, of course. It's hollow. The whole back swings open. Wealthy families used to place a valuable possession inside the Buddha for protection. Show us. Certainly. 
There you are. You see, the space inside is quite... Good grief. Don't touch it. Isn't that a gun? certainly is, and there may be fingerprints on it. Well, I assure you, that does not belong to me. Do you know anything about a gun like this? Well, only that it's apparently very old. An antique. Eight to five, that's the one that killed the night watchman. Give me a handkerchief. Yeah. I'm afraid you'll have to postpone your trip, Mr. Lasdown. Well, I've already purchased my ticket. Have you any idea why the night watchman was killed last night? Not whatsoever. All of those uncut gems you had consigned to Quimby were stolen. What? That's right. Well, why was I notified? Because Mr. Quimby thought I could recover them before you found out. That Shylock, that deceitful little pipsqueak. After all the business I've given him. Come on, Walt. Now that I shall personally take extreme delight in exposing him to discredit to his profession. Come on. You won't leave town, will you, Lassie, old boy? You have my word, sir. At least not until I'm dealt with that traitor personally. But he's a suspect. We can't leave him. Rick! Rick! With Walt protesting all the way, we climbed in the squad car and pulled it down the street to wait. In about two minutes flat, Lazdon came streaming out of the house, piled into his own car, and took off for the city with us right behind. A half an hour later, we watched him go into a building on the east side, and we followed. The mailbox gave us Quimby's apartment, and by the time we reached the floor, we could hear Lazdon raising his blood pressure up past the boiling point. How dare you? How dare you? Good evening, Mr. Lazdon. How dare you? Yes, He's really going at it. Oh, Mr. Lansdowne, you couldn't blame me. I couldn't do anything else but blame you, Quimby. The ghost did. Please, the neighbors. I assure you, your neighbors will only be the first to hear of this atrocity. Well, when they find the night watchman, they have found it. There you are. Floating in that filthy river out there. And who put that gun in my boot up? You found it? Fought up. You knew it was there. That does it. No, no, no. Wait, no wait. I don't know anything about it. Liar! Why did you think I found it? The police discovered it. The police? Yes. They believe it's the same gun that killed. Quimby. Quimby, you didn't. What's going on? I don't know. We'd better get in it. Quimby. No. We'd sure better. No, no, no. Don't shoot. Stop it, Quimby. No, 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 no. <laughs> you all right, Rick? Yeah. Yeah, I'm all right. Can you imagine such a frogery? That assassin's apprentice was going to shoot me. Uh, Here's his gun, Walt. Looks like I got him in the leg. I can't believe it. I, Philip J. Lysdale, be subjected to such distasteful melodrama. I'll call an ambulance. <laughs> I haven't viewed such a spectacle since I was eight and a half. Uh, sitting in the balcony of the Savannah Opera House, watching a third-class road company chase little Eva across the ice. I can imagine, Lassie. Now, let's have a look at Quimby. Come on, Quimby. Better tell me about it. You killed the night watchman with that antique gun. Yes, I, I kept the gun in my desk at the office. I was taking the jewels from the safe to make it look like robbery when when Block came on duty. He was early, and he surprised me. Shot him. I hid the gun in the Buddha. That's why you were so shocked when Lazdown came and got it today. Yes, when you told me he was leaving town, I, I feared he would take the Buddha with him and discover the gun inside. It was you who broke into my house this evening. Yes, Mr. Lazdown. The wagon's on the way. Well, Mr. Lazdown, you were pretty lucky. What a revolting display of uncontrolled emotions. Lazdown. Oh, my goodness. Mr. Lazdown's fainted. Were you so late, Rick? Oh, I got mixed up with a screwy one. I was going to leave the station earlier, but Otis got to discussing Freud with a very learned gentleman named Lazdown. Otis was discussing Freud? Mm-hmm, it's true. Couldn't tear himself away. <laughs> Seems, according to Otis, that this year Freud plays second base for Brooklyn. <laughs> then we got around to Kenzie and discovered he was batting 200. Oh, I don't believe it. Neither did I, but Otis explained he'd been in a slump all season. <laughs> you and your friends. Mm-hmm. I hate to mention it, but you qualify in that league. Oh, but you love me. I do not. I just breathe hard from an irritated sinus condition. Well, use the condition and sing me a song. Mm. Okay. What are you going to sing? I don't think it's any of your business. Oh, that's a nice song. How does it go? Well, uh, you pick one. All right. Let's see. No. 
I like. New York in June. How about you? That's cute. I like Gershwin too. How about you? I love it. I love a fireside when a storm is due. I like potato chips, moonlight, motor trips. How about you? I'm mad about good books. Can't get my fill. And Doug MacArthur's looks give me a thrill. Holding hands in the movie show when all the lights are low may not be new. But I like it. How about you? I like it. You like me? Well, I... Come here. Oh. Oh. Well, do you? I don't think it's any of your business. If your summer fun is being spoiled by the misery of athlete's foot, your Rexall family druggist has a great new product for you. It's Aerosol Fungi Rex, a greaseless, stainless spray-on relief that's easy, quick, and clean. Fingertip control spray eliminates messy application, gives positive coverage to the entire infected area, and all the burning, itching, and discomfort of athlete's foot are quickly relieved. Ask for Aerosol Fungi Rex. That's F-U-N-G-I hyphen R-E-X. Aerosol Fungi Rex at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Dick Powell directed the RKO production Split Second, which is now in release. And his latest film appearance was in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer award-winning The Bad and the Beautiful. Heard in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Howard McNear, Jeanette Nolan, John McIntyre, Arthur Q. Bryan, Wilms Herbert, and Harold Dianforth. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Sunday at this time when Rexall Drug Products again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Now get new and better relief from acid upset stomach. Try Bismarex Gel, the new liquid antacid that gives four-way relief. Bismarex gel contains aluminum hydroxide for the plus benefits of absorbing and neutralizing excess stomach acid and leaving a protective covering. Ask for Bismarex gel. B-I-S-M-A hyphen R-E-X-G-E-L. Bismarex gel at Rexall drugstores everywhere. This is the CBS Radio Network. Present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. cigarette do you smoke, doctor? That question was asked of doctors in every branch of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand name most was Camel. 
Yes, according to this recent nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Make your own camel 30-day test, the sensible cigarette test, and see how mild, how flavorful, how thoroughly enjoyable camels are. Transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Yes. Oh, Mr. Diamond, come in, sir. Well, thank you, Francis. How's the pantry Einstein tonight? Oh, oh, my goodness, sir. That was a dandy. Oh, you like that, huh? Oh, yes, sir. Well, <laughs> chuckle along and tell Miss Asher sweet and frostbitten is downstairs. Right away, sir. I'll be in the study. Yes, sir. The snow is snowing. The wind is blowing. But I can weather the storm. Why do I care how much it may storm? I've got my love to keep me warm. Hi. Hi. What's new? Nothing with me. I want to know about you. Uh, nothing much with me either, honey. What have you been doing for the last couple of days? Mm, case. Oh. Got a nice big fat retainer. Oh. Yeah, oh. Look at the eyes light up. Well, I'm happy for you. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't want your money. But now that I'm independently wealthy, you figure you don't have to feed me anymore. Rick. Don't have to take me to any more shows. Stake me to an occasional chocolate market. Oh, don't be silly. You know I don't mind. Just because I made a couple of hundred dollars. A couple of hundred dollars? Stop kissing my hand. Rick. You idiot. Mm. I have tickets for the ballet tomorrow night. Dinner at 21 after the show. Oh, Rick. <laughs> Afterwards, we neck. I love you. Of course. Now, I suppose you want to hear all about the case. Well, not unless you want to. Well, as long as it's optional... You'll be too tired some other time. It all started three days ago. You don't really have to. I can hear about it any time. I was sitting in my office. You don't have to put yourself oh, up. Oh, shut up, woman. <laughs> as I was saying, the whole thing started three days ago. I was sitting in my office reading Gaylord Hauser and soaking my feet in a tub of blackstrap molasses when the door opened and then walked six feet of mink cape wrapped around five and a half feet of what little girls are made of. I remember thinking about the sugar and spice and everything nice, and even with the mink cape covering most of it, I decided that this little girl could have given a bee farm a nervous breakdown. Mr. Diamond? You have been reading the sign on the door. I'd like to hire you. Well, I'd like you to. I charge a hundred a day in expenses. I want protection. From what? My husband. What's the matter? Can't he stand the pace? He's getting out of prison at five o'clock this afternoon, and he's threatened to make trouble. I think you better tell me the whole thing, Miss... Uh, uh, Connors. Marilyn Connors. Uh, okay. Uh, who's your husband? His name's Joe Connors. Oh. You know him? Helped send him up ten years ago. Armed robbery, wasn't it? Yes. He hasn't served all of his time, but he's being paroled. Go ahead. Well, since Joe was sent up, I had to find work. A man Joe used to work for gave me a job in his club. Martin Cope? Yes. Do you know him? Mm, slightly. We're hating acquaintances. Mr. Cope has been very wonderful to me. I'm sure he has. I don't think I like that. Your husband doesn't either, huh? You're very blunt, aren't you? Like the front of a streetcar. I don't like your boss, and I don't like your husband. I think it's better that you know now before you make any investments and then have to fire me. You're the best private detective in New York. Only because I'm brilliant, shrewd, and loaded with talent. <laughs> and a little ridiculous. <laughs> oh, Sure. Add that on and just think what you're getting for a lousy hundred a day in expenses. Even though you don't like Joe and Mr. Cope, you'll still take the job? Look, uh, Mrs. Connors, I I've been honest with you about your husband and Cope. I never let personalities interfere in my business. A job's a job. Besides, I'm starving to death. She gave me a slow smile, complete with a high fever, handed me a retainer, and swayed out of the office like Mata Harry leaving an atomic research stag party. We agreed to meet again at four o'clock, so I spent the next hour on the roof, relaxing in three feet of snow, and around four o'clock, walked my frozen blood pressure down to Martin Cope's nightclub, the only king-size safe decorated by Bergdorf Goodman, complete with an intellectual piano player, a $15 minimum, and enough intrigue to make a Senate investigation look like a taffy pole. Ask me, I could write a 
The girl who had been to my office earlier was standing on the edge of the empty dance floor rehearsing a song while the piano player was trying his best to overdo the accompaniment. I grabbed a chair and sat down to listen. Something wrong? Look, if you'd like to do a single, why don't you say so? You're unhappy? When you're playing for me, I would appreciate it if you just backed me up quietly, simply. Stop hating our Tatum. Darling, I'd be happy to do anything you say except for one thing. Yes? You can't sing. Why, you anemic excuse for a musician. You couldn't get a song right if you ran it through a player piano. Temper, darling. You listen to me, Bernie. I've put up with you for a long time. You've put up with me? Yes, with you. Oh. I've let you mess me up night after night. You did that all by your little lonesome, honey. You just better remember who's paying your bills, honey. I get out here and break my neck to try and give a good show. Don't you get cute with me. You better wise up, Buster, or you're going to end up playing for your meal down on Skid Row. Oh, for Pete's sake, Marilyn. No, Bernie, I'm... They kept going round and round. And about the time the piano player looked like he might possibly throw caution to the wind and stamp his foot, a door opened at the other side of the room, and Martin Cope, big-time gambler and owner of the club, walked over to the piano. Look, if you two insist on raising the roof, take it to the back room where nobody can hear you. I'm sorry, Martin, but Bernie just was Mr. Cope, I can assure you that it wasn't... You I stay was... out of this. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. You two can kick the walls in when I'm not in my office, but honey, when I've got work it to do... It won't happen again. What's the matter? Who's that? Who? Sitting over there. Well, I'm surprised, Cope. I thought you'd spot my blue eyes. Oh, it's Mr. Diamond. Diamond? Yes, he, he says you know each other. You mean Diamond, the private detective? Sure. You remember, Cope, all those times down at the precinct, playing 20 questions? What are you doing here? I got tired of talking to nice people. Beat it. I asked Mr. Diamond here, Martin. You did? Well, I know you're not worried about Joe, but I am. And you had this two-bit gum shoe? Temper, temper. Mr. Diamond's supposed to be the best private detective in the business. Says who? Well, I did mention it a few hundred times. Did Sloan put you up to this, honey? Martin, with Joe getting out this afternoon... I told you not to worry about Joe. Did Sloan tell you to hire yourself a bodyguard? He thought it would be a good idea. He did, huh? Everybody's got a good idea. Nobody thinks I know what I'm doing. I just happen to run the place. Sloan was thinking about you, Martin. Yeah, but I'll give him something to really think about. Now, Martin... No, I'm you... tired of the whole mess. Everybody's scared stiff of a two-bit punk who's getting out of stir. Hiring an ex-cop who couldn't protect an old lady from a boy scout. Have you been tested for rabies lately? Look, Diamond... Martin, I'm afraid of what Joe might do. Oh, but hiring a private cop and to top it off, you got to pick this one. Look, uh, uh, Mrs. Connors... I don't want to cause a lot of trouble. Well, you're trying real hard. Maybe you'd better just take your retainer and we'll forget the whole thing. That is the only bright thing you've ever come up with, Mr. Diamond. How about it, uh, Mrs. Connors? Well, you keep the retainer, Mr. Diamond, but maybe under the circumstances it would be better... Sure, keep get... the money, Diamond. Go buy yourself a new joke book. I don't want it. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll donate it to your restaurant's hospital fund, Cope. We haven't got one. <laughs> That's the trouble with you, Cope. No vision. You should always have a little insurance in case of a bad accident. I left the club with Martin Cope, stretched out on the dance floor, and Marilyn Connors looking too startled to say much. Bernie, the piano player, accompanied my exit with a fast course of the funeral march, and I headed for my quiet little apartment. I napped for the rest of the afternoon... And by 8 o'clock, I was appropriately dressed in my best blue suit. The other one being a casual sienna and suitable only for badminton and runyon hunting. I had paused to admire myself, surreptitiously humming a few bars of temptation when, uh... Yeah? Richard Diamond? Depends on who wants him. My name's Sloan, William Sloan. Oh, uh, I'm Diamond. What can I do for you? I'm here because Miss Marilyn Connors asked me to come by and talk to you. Well, come in. Thank you. I believe Martin Cope mentioned your name earlier this afternoon. In all probability, he did. I'm Mr. Cope's attorney. I have seen. Thank you. Cope uh, seemed a little unhappy with you, Sloan. That was because I suggested that Marilyn hire herself a private detective. I gathered as much. I picked you because of your reputation. I had no way of knowing that Martin didn't like you. Why are you here, Mr. Sloan? To ask you to go back on the job. Protect Marilyn until we're sure that her husband is not going to cause trouble. I'd like to know something, Mr. Sloan. Why do you expect Marilyn's husband to cause trouble? 
Isn't it obvious? Maybe I'm a little dense. Why, but... Marilyn and Martin Cope have been in love since Joe Connors was sent to prison. You think that's enough to make Joe Connors try something? Well, it uh, goes a little deeper than that. How deep? Joe Connors used to work for Martin. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wait a minute. I'm beginning to remember. Joe Connors swore Cope had him framed. That's correct. He swore that when he got out, he'd get him. Well, it's a little tough under the circumstances. It'll just cause another argument between Cope and Marilyn if I show up again. Why don't you get yourself another boy? A lot of good private detectives in New York. Because you'd be about the only one who wouldn't be afraid of Martin. And uh, Marilyn has a great respect for you. Even after I belted her boyfriend? Well, I think that convinced her you were the one for the job. Hmm. Joe Connors got out this afternoon, didn't he? That's right, at 4.30. Where's Mrs. Connors? At the club. Well, if I go down there, there's going to be more trouble. Martin went out about an hour ago. That's why we want you to come down. Martin got a phone call. He seemed worried. Marilyn was in the office with him. She said that when he left, he didn't say where he was going, but uh, he took his gun with him. Sloan and I went downstairs, climbed into his car, and headed for Martin Cope's nightclub. When we went in, Marilyn Connors was on stage. So we went to the back of the building and sat down in her dressing room. About ten minutes later, Marilyn came in. She was wearing something thin enough to make a silkworm come at Harry Carey. Hello, William. Mr. Diamond, I'm so glad you reconsidered. I think we both reconsidered, didn't we? Has Martin come back yet? I'll go see. I'll be right back. I'm worried, Mr. Diamond. Uh, how long ago did Cope leave? About half an hour before I went on. If you'll excuse me, I have to take off my makeup. Oh, sure, go right ahead. He's back. Martin? Yes, and I'm sure something's happened. He's worried sick about something. I'll go see him. Uh, Mrs. Connors. Yes? Uh, do you want me to stay? No, no, I, I don't think that'd be a good idea. Why don't you go over to my apartment and wait? It's 48 West 74th Street, number three. It's a walk-up. All right. Wait, you'll need a key. Here. She handed me her key and left with William Sloan. I walked out of the club, grabbed a cab, and 20 minutes later, I was walking upstairs to her apartment. The room was in darkness. I felt around for a light switch near the door. Then I froze. The room was still and quiet, but there was a smell in the air. A heavy, pungent odor that a gun leaves after it's been fired. The smell was cordite. I flipped the switch on and looked down at the dead body of Joe Connors, lying on his back, shot through the head. Before we continue with Richard Diamond, Private Detective... Here's an important question. How mild can a cigarette be? One sniff won't tell you. One puff won't tell you. It takes day in, day out smoking to judge the mildness of a cigarette. To see how well it gets along with your throat. Make the sensible cigarette test. The thorough cigarette test. Smoke only camels for 30 days and you'll know how mild camels are. Pack after pack, week after week. Yes, for 30 days, enjoy the rich, full flavor of Camel's costly tobaccos and see just how mild a cigarette can be. In a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only Camel's for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking Camel's. Make your own Camel 30-day test, the sensible test. And see for yourself why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now back to Richard Diamond starring Dick Powell. Who is it? The police. Oh, goody. Otis. Yeah? You're standing on my foot. Oh, sorry, Lieutenant. Well, good evening, Lieutenant Levinson. Who's dead, Diamond? Right over there. Name's Joe Connors. Shot in the head, Lieutenant. Well, Otis is getting brighter. 
Who did it? How do I know? Whose apartment is this? Uh, Mrs. Marilyn Connors. Same name as the dead man. No, his name's Joe. Oh, I mean the last name. Look, meathead. Well, it is. Well, he's right, Walt. They were married. What are you doing here? Me? Well, I come with you. Oh, it is. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, what are you doing here, Diamond? Well, Marilyn Connors asked me to wait for her. And let's all wait. Walt, Walt, have you noticed all the windows are locked? So it's cold out. Well, let's not wait. Let's go over to Martin Cope's nightclub. What's Martin Cope got to do with it? Leave orders here until the coroner arrives. Put a tag on him so the coroner will be sure to get the right body, and I'll tell you about the whole thing on the way over to the club. Lieutenant Levinson to see you, Martin. Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Hi. What are you doing here, Diamond? He's with me, Cope. You own a gun? What is this? He said, do you own a gun? Yeah, so what? Mind if I look at it? Okay. It's loaded. Let's see. Hmm, been fired. You're nuts. Rick. Has been. What is this? I haven't fired that gun since I owned it. You took it out of here with you, didn't you? What's that to you, Diamond? You took it out tonight, didn't you? Don't answer that, Martin. Now look. Let's go down to the station. What for? Martin, you knew Joe Connors, didn't you? Yeah. Well, somebody shot him. You think I... Martin, don't say any more. I'm surprised it's you, Sloan. You were the one who told me Martin took the gun with him. You did? How the devil did I know Diamond would go to the police? What were you doing with Diamond anyway? Marilyn hired him. And fired him. She hired him again tonight. He was working for her. Anything I told him was in confidence. Murder just isn't confidential, Sloan. Look, uh... Wait a minute, yeah. Yeah, you're right. I, I went out to see Joe Connors. He, he phoned me. Martin. I didn't kill him, though. Yeah, I took my gun, but I didn't use it. He was dead when I got there. You went to Marilyn Connors' apartment? That's right. Well, let's all go down to the station and have ballistics check on this gun. And in the meantime, Cope, I'm holding you on suspicion of murder. Well, here's the ballistics report, Rick. Cope's gun was the one that did the job. Slug they took out of Connors matched. Hmm. Now let's talk to Marilyn Connors and Sloan again. Why, we've got our boy. Just want to talk to them. Send in Miss Connors and Mr. Sloan. Now what have you got on your mind, Rick? Oh, I was just thinking about all the windows being locked. So what? You want to see us, Lieutenant? Mr. Diamond does. Have a chair. Mr. Diamond, I'm sorry things worked out this way. Well, so am I. Oh, uh... Here's your apartment key. Thank you. How many people have a key to your apartment, Mrs. Connors? What? Martin has the only other one. Mm hmm. What time did Martin get that phone call? Oh, about 7.30, I guess. I got to the club about 7.15. Martin usually comes in about 7.30. I met him in his office and he got the call. And he took the gun and left right away? Uh, it's all right. Uh, Martin has already admitted taking the gun. Yes, he took the gun and left almost immediately. Mm -hmm. Where were you, Sloan? At home? I got to the club just after Martin left. Marilyn told me what had happened, and I came right over to you. Oh. Well, all right. Thank you very much. Hmm. That's all? Are you going to defend Mr. Cope? I doubt it. I don't think he wants me to. Well, thank you very much. We'll be talking to you. Goodbye, Lieutenant. Mr. Diamond, so long. Goodbye. Goodbye. Now, what was all that about? I want to talk to Martin Cope. Rick, now look. I we... want to talk to him. I'm going to find out how Joe Connors got into a locked apartment without a key. I don't want anything to do with you, Diamond. You better cooperate. Diamond's got an angle that's worth listening to. I didn't shoot Connors no matter what that ballistics report says. You have a key to Marilyn's apartment. Yeah. Connors was dead when you got there. Yeah, I told you that. You left the club about a quarter of eight. That's right, about a quarter to eight. Connors had been dead about three hours when I found him, Walt. I found him about 9.30. By gosh, that's right. And that, uh, that part of your story stands up, Cope. He, he was dead when you got there. What about the gun? You always keep that gun in your desk, Cope? Yeah. Who was in the club with you? Oh, the usual people. Waiter, bartenders, busboys. Marilyn? Yeah. And now, wait a minute. Uh, who knew you kept the gun in the desk? Oh, half a dozen people, maybe. You think somebody lifted that gun, killed Connors, and put it back in the desk? You always come in about 7.30, don't you, Cove? Yeah, every night. 
According to the death certificate, Connors had been dead about an hour before you came in. What time did you leave the club this afternoon? Right after you slugged me. Oh, you got up rather suddenly. It was about 4.30, wasn't it? Somebody could have gone into your office, taken that gun, killed Connors, put the gun back before you came in at 7.30. Then I'm cleared? No, 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 not a bit. You have a key to Maryland's apartment. The killer had a key to let Connors in. Miss Connors said there were only two keys. Well, Walt, let's go talk to Mrs. Connors. Uh, Mrs. Connors, where were you around seven this evening? Seven? Where were you? Why, downtown. You weren't in your apartment? No. Did you come back from downtown before going to the club? No. Well, who was in your apartment? Why, no one that I know of. Have you ever given your key to anyone except Cope and, uh, oh, me, of course? Yes. Who and how long ago? My piano player, about a week ago. Hello, Bernie. Hello. Oh, hello. You're the nice man who slugged Mr. Cope this afternoon. Let me buy you a drink. Oh, no, thanks, Bernie. This is Lieutenant Levinson. Lieutenant? Hi. Uh, what time did you get the club this evening, Bernie? Oh, about 7.30. Why? The cook says he saw you come in around 7.15. Mm, Fifteen minutes one way or the other. Where were you at 7 o'clock, Bernie? My house, I guess. Oh, Bernie. Bernie, we checked with the state prison. They, uh, they censor letters up there. Do they? Mm-hmm. A man named Joe Connors got a letter two days ago... Telling him to meet someone at Mrs. Connor's apartment around 6.30 this evening. Hmm. What's this all about? Well, we'd like to have you come down to the station for a paraffin test, Bernie. A paraffin test? Yeah, we can determine if anyone has shot a gun in the last 48 hours. Oh. When did you take Mr. Cope's gun, Bernie? Right after he left this afternoon. You had a duplicate key made from the one Mrs. Connors gave you several days ago? Mm-hmm. Uh, the green hardware shop, I believe, over on 64th Street. Why'd you do it? Oh, love, hate, lots of reasons. What difference does it make? For a week now, I've heard him talking about Joe Connors and what he might do when he got out. I saw a chance to get rid of Martin Cope, so I had the key made, wrote Joe Connors a letter, and killed him with Mr. Cope's gun. After you killed Connors, you came back, put the gun back in the drawer, and when Martin Cope came in, you called him and said you were Connors. From that phone booth right over there. Were you in love with Marilyn Connors? That is an extremely earthy question that can do no good at all. Well, let's go, Lieutenant. I was getting tired of playing the piano anyway. It's too bad it didn't work. Think what Marilyn Connors in for when she marries Martin Cope. Oh, speaking of Marilyn Connors, you certainly did take a lot of pains describing her um, her attributes. Oh, really? Well, it wasn't painful at all. Was she really that pretty? Pretty, pretty. Well, I'm jealous. Well, don't be. She had one thing that was wrong. What was that? She had long blonde hair that hung all the way down to the floor. Well, that sounds beautiful. But it was her mustache. Uh, better sing something, huh? I think you'd better. Mm, what would you like? Anything that will make up for that last remark. I thought it was pretty clever. Just sing. Okay. How about this? Maybe I'm right. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm weak. And maybe I'm strong But nevertheless I'm in love With you Maybe I'll win And maybe I'll lose Maybe I'm in For crying the blues But nevertheless I'm in love with you Somehow I know at a glance The terrible chances I'm taking Fine at the 
start Been left with a heart that is breaking Maybe I live a life of regret And maybe I'll give much more than I'll get But nevertheless, I'm in love with you. Oh, that's better. Mm, thank you. Rick. Hmm? I'll bet she really did have pretty hair. Oh, I guess so, but she kept it all rolled up on her head. Well, what's the matter with that? Well, I like yours better. I wear mine up. Yeah, but I've seen you with your hair down. <laughs> Rick. Come here. Rick? Dick Powell will return in just a minute. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Yes, more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Among the millions of camel smokers, there are many stars whose voices are their fortunes. John Wayne, Reza Stevens, Martha Tilton are a few. They find that camels' cool, cool mildness gets along fine with their throats. Friends, make your own 30-day camel mildness test and see why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, no one deserves the appreciation of the American people more than the men and women who have served in our armed forces. The camel people send weekly gifts of cigarettes to those servicemen and veterans who are hospitalized. This week's camels go to Veterans Hospital, Martinsburg, West Virginia, and Carl Gables, Florida. U.S. Army Station Hospital, Camp Hood, Texas. U.S. Naval Hospital... Chelsea, Massachusetts. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell, was written by Blake Edwards. Our director is Helen Mack. Pipe smokers, enjoy the national joy smoke, Prince Albert. Yes, P.A. is made from choice tobacco, rich tobacco that's naturally flavorsome. Prince Albert is specially treated to ensure against tongue bite and crimped cut for smooth smoking. So get P.A. in the handy pocket tin or the pound size. It's America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. Makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. One puff won't tell you. One sniff won't tell you. It takes day in, day out smoking to find out how mild a cigarette is, how well it agrees with your throat. Make the sensible cigarette test, the 30-day camel mildness test, and see just how mild a cigarette can be. Yes, and you'll find out why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette.
transcribed is Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, the Milton Burl of Homicide. Pretty bad. Oh, hi, Helen. What are you doing? Playing canasta. Who's there? Well, just me and that Japanese beetle I found hiding in my bills. Japanese beetle? Yeah. And you're playing canasta? Well, what do you expect us to do? I'm tired. He just finished giving me my judo lesson. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't think you believe me. Oh, sure I do. Who's winning? I am. He can't speak English. Besides, I make up the rules. Mm Mm-hmm. Am I going to see you tonight? Well, I... You what? I don't know. Something just came into my office. What? I don't know. Here comes another one. One what? Beats me, but they're pretty strange. Hey, uh, where'd you leave your saucer, fellas? Maybe they're shills for the beetle. I'll call you back. Bye. Bye. Well, uh, what can I do for it? Hey, wait a minute. If I was lying in the middle of a crowded sink and someone had piled all the dishes on my head. They turned on the faucet and I floated up with a dirty coffee cup and took a look around. I treaded water and squinted through my dewy eyelids at two of the ugliest dishwashers I had ever seen. Look! He's twitching! Mm, Oh. (laughs) You see, Salvador, it's just a little lazy. How do you feel, Diamond? Oh, let us know when things start making sense. Oh, oh, not, uh, what's going on? What happened? Mm. He's confused. Yeah. Uh. I think maybe you sapped him too hard. Oh. Yuki, I take that as an insult. You know how careful I am. I apologize, Salvador. Thank you. Hey. Hey, uh, how, how'd you monkeys get in here anyway? Well, it sounds like he's collected most of his marbles. <laughs> Looks like a complete recovery, Yuki. I want to know what this is all about. Oblige the man, Salvador. Sure. But keep him with us. <laughs> Naturally. Hey, now, wait a minute. Oh. That's enough, Salvador. That's enough. <laughs> Can you hear me, Diamond? Eh, it's going to be obstinate. I don't think he likes it. Belt them across the ears. He'll listen. Mm. Can you hear me now, Diamond? He's nodding his head. I guess he don't want to open his mouth and let the blood out. Oh, that's fine. Now, Mm. listen, Diamond. In a while, you'll get a call from a Mr. Wharton. Mm. He'll offer you a job, but you will not take it. Do you understand? Salvador, please, see if he understands. <laughs> he says, yeah, he understands. But now he's got a sore arm. Uh, remember, Mr. Wharton, you don't want to work for him. I think he understands, Yuki. Yeah. But he looks tired from the strain. He certainly does. Look at those dark circles under his eyes. Well, put the man asleep, Salvador. Certainly. Nice. <laughs> Mr. Diamond? Mr. Diamond, can you hear me, Mr. Diamond? Oh, 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 this can get monotonous. Go away, will you? Should I call the police, Mr. Diamond? Huh? Oh. Oh, I was expecting uglier company. Can you sit up? Oh, I'll take a crack at it. <clears throat> oh, 
know. I, uh, I'll bet your name's Wharton. Well, that's right. How did you know? Get out of here. Well, I want to talk to you. Well, I just had one long conversation. It was too one-sided. Now, go on. My health is doubtful, but it's fun to have it around for company. Maybe $500 would pick you up. Yeah, it might for a while, but I don't like to waste that kind of money on funerals. Seven fifty. dollars eh, So they line the coffin with velvet. A thousand. Well, you're beginning to make a short life sound practical. If you do the job successfully, there will be another thousand. You just bought yourself a corpse. Let me wash up. Uh, talk some more. I, I can hear you. Well, it's my son, Roger. He thinks he killed a man. He, he thinks? What do you want me to do? Find out for sure so he can brag about it? Ever heard of a John Alter? Oh, sure. Walt Levinson sent him up five years ago on a manslaughter rap. Well, he doesn't like it up there, and he'd like to get out. I don't blame him. What's this got to do with your son? I'm chairman of the parole board. You look much better now, Mr. Diamond. Oh, you're chairman of the parole board. Yes. Some of Alter's friends promised to keep quiet about my son if I let Alter go free when he comes up before the board next week. Uh Uh-huh. And you think maybe your son was framed? Yes. About a month ago, he met a girl in Florida. Her name is Lenore Brown, and she's a friend of Alter's. When Roger went to pick up the Lenore girl at her apartment, he found her struggling with some man. That happens. It looked like he was trying to kill her. There was a gun on the floor, and she called to Roger for help. He picked up the gun and shot the man. She told Roger he'd killed him and that he must get out. When we went back, they were both gone. About a month later, some of Alter's friends got in touch with me. They forget about the killing if you let Alter out of Sing Sing, huh? That's right. Hmm. Well, I don't remember reading anything about it in the papers. You're the first one outside of Alter and his friends who knows anything about it. You see, they say they're hiding the corpus delecti, so there was no report of the murder. Now, you think maybe they staged the killing, put blanks in the gun, and after your son beat it, the dead man walked out on his own steam? Well, that's what I want you to find out. Uh-huh. The man your son thought he killed, uh, what did he look like? Dark man with a scar from his nose to his chin. Mm -hmm. If my son is innocent, I want you to bring the parties responsible to justice. Amen. Well, here's a check for a thousand dollars. Thank you. If you find the girl and prove my son innocent, there'll be another thousand in your pocket. Well, I'll sort the holes. Thanks, Mr. Warden. I'll start right away. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. You can reach me at the Wentworth Hotel. I'm staying there until this matter gets cleared up. Well, I won't get in touch with you unless I find something. The guys who worked me over are pretty set in their ways, and there's no sense in you tripping over a lot of dead bodies. I grabbed a pack of camels, looked at the thousand-dollar check, thought about the warning the two bruise artists had given me, and decided it was a toss-up. If I spent the thousand like I knew I would, I'd wish it was dead anyway, so I left the building, grabbed a cab for the fifth precinct. Ten minutes later, I walked into the squad room and spotted Sergeant Otis, looking like an advertisement for a sour stomach. Well, Richard Diamond, Private Sloot. Well, Sergeant Otis, Private Sloth. Huh? Look it up. S-L-O-T-H. I will. Under S. I know. The three-toed variety. And get your uniform press, won't you? Looks like you've been hanging it in a taffy machine. Oh. Well, hello, Rick. I... Hey, you must get tired changing your face every day. Somebody shove you around again? Uh, I've been catching up on my patty cake. Tell me, Walter, do you ever know a girl named Lenore Brown? Yeah, sure. John Alter's expense account. They used to hold hands before I sent him up. Know where I can find her? Alter's still got her staked out. When he gets out, he's going to come back and dig up the claim. You better forget about it. She's got the antidote for lonely nights, but some of Alta's boys are protecting it. I know, I know. They gave me a pep talk this afternoon. Then listen to them. It's better watching the game from the bench. Oh, uh, you never can tell. I might make a score. Well, you're outweighed, outclassed, and liable to be outlived. But she used to work at the Black Swan in Florida. We heard Alta was trying to get a parole, and she came to New York to be close to him. Any line on her here in town? No, but if she's seeing Alta, you might spot her on a visitor's day. Well, Rick, how are you? 
been a long time. I know a lot of people wouldn't like to hear that, Warden. <laughs> How are you? Oh, fine, fine. What's on your mind? Well, I hear Johnny Alter's been having company. I'd like to take a look at her. Oh, Miss Brown. Mm-hmm. Well, I can't blame you. <laughs> Well, I just want to spot her and see where she goes. <laughs> you can't miss. If she walked through the yard, there'd be a jailbreak tomorrow. What time are visiting hours? Well, if she's seeing Alder today, she should be downstairs right now. Like to take a look? Uh-huh. I'll have a guard take you down. Good. Well, well on uh, second thought, I'll go myself. There she is, sitting at the end table, talking to Alder. Hmm. Well, now I know why Alder needs a lot of money. She's wearing enough mink to carpet Radio City. <laughs> you should get a load of her on a warm day. Huh? Well, the coat doesn't stop me. She'd show up, she was wearing a tent. How long has she got with Alder? Mm, about another five minutes. Warden, you know, uh, maybe I'll let you put me away for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. With something like that to look forward to on Visitor's Day, I might go for the change. <laughs> You'd get tired of just talking. I hung around by the big gray buildings until she came out. She walked over to a long white convertible and got in. I decided to let her buy me a new fuse, so I walked over to the car. Uh, going into town? Oh. Back up three feet and I'll let you know. Three. Okay. Mm-hmm. Your tailor couldn't do all of that. Get in. Visiting? Oh, yeah. The, uh, the warden's an old friend. How many years did you know him? Uh-uh, baby. I've been going home every night all my life. Every night? Well, uh, almost. What do you do with the, uh, almost? It depends. Everybody likes something different. You must get tired thinking up new ideas. Oh, I don't think much. It's more fun being surprised. Hey, what's the idea? Surprise. Oh, yeah. And a nickel-plated one. Look, baby, you don't have to pull a gun. If I'm getting fresh, I'll get out and walk. You'll sit right there, Diamond. Name dropper? Mm-hmm. Expecting company? Mm-hmm. And you've met them before, honey. Well, it's nice. I wouldn't want you to get stuck with the introduction. Hey, uh, those your friends driving up? It should be. Now, you hold real still. They'll only shoot you this time. When a gal's got a gun, you don't stand much of a chance unless she's got her mind on something else. This one did. And when she looked up at the rearview mirror to make sure it was her boys, I tagged her. My two playmates were just pulling up, and I jumped out of the car. There he is, Yuki! He's locked the door. She's out cold. Well, shoot him, Salvador! Shoot him! Before we continue with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, here are a few words about smoking enjoyment. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Yes, more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. One reason is flavor. Camels' costly tobaccos have a rich, full flavor you won't find in any other cigarette. Another reason is mildness, proven mildness. In a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only camels for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Make your own camel 30-day test. The sensible, thorough test. Not just a sniff of the tobacco. Not just a puff of smoke. Only by day-in, day-out smoking can you discover how well a cigarette agrees with your throat. Smoke camels for 30 days and see how mild camels are pack after pack, week after week. See why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. <laughs> 
And now, back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. There he goes! Get him, Salvador! I was running through the trees then, and I could hear Salvador somewhere behind me, falling all over himself. I pulled my gun and thought about waiting for him. But I had another idea. I stopped and listened. He's around here somewhere, Suki. Well, come on. We're spread out, Salvador. They were somewhere behind me, and both of them were looking now. So I cut off to my left and headed back to the highway. The cars were about 100 yards down the road, and I used my last lung getting there. Lenore was still unconscious, so I climbed in the white convertible with the unconscious nylons and drove off. I'd been driving for about 15 minutes when I noticed something lying on the seat beside the still-sleeping Lenore. It was her purse, and she didn't wake up when I grabbed it. Doing a rummage job at 80 miles an hour isn't easy, but there wasn't much of interest anyway, just a little black book. I needed a gimmick, so I stuck it in my pocket. I put the purse back on the seat just as she started coming around. Well, now that's it, baby. Sit up and look at the scenery. How did you get here? Where's Yuki and Salvador? Playing Peter Pan. Jaw hurt? Yes. You heal. Well, play rough and you get hurt. Where do I take you? My apartment, I guess. I drove her to her place on East 51st and walked her to the door. She looked at me like a fat woman eyeing a French pastry, and her mouth slipped down to her shoelaces when I gave her a peck on the cheek and left her standing with an old front doorknob in her hand. I went back to the office and took out her little black book. There were a lot of names, and some of them I knew. Yuki, and after it, likes his work. And Salvador. And after his name, has own gun. And oh, yes, yes, Richard Diamond, too. I never did figure out what the three stars were for. But three other names and addresses put me in second gear. One was in the village, another down by the East River, and the last was somewhere in Chinatown. All of them were a setup for a dead man who wanted to make himself scarce. I wanted to talk with Wharton uh, before I started hunting, so I called him at the Wentworth. Did you find out anything yet, Diamond? Uh, not yet. Look, Mr. Wharton, you said the man I was looking for was... Was dark with a scar, hmm? Yes, from his nose to his chin. Oh, well, thanks. Maybe I'll call you tomorrow. I hope you clear this thing up in a hurry. Oh, well, so do I. I want to get my nerves untangled. I took the easy address first, grabbed a cab, and 30 minutes later, I was walking down the steps of a shabby little dive on the east side of Greenwich Village. You want something, Mac? Yeah, a pound of egg noodles. Just sweep them up off the floor. Hey, uh, you know anyone around named Lenore? Sure, Lenore Brown. She comes in here about once a week, listens to the kid at the piano. And why would a classy dame like that go out with him? He don't play the piano so good. You ever see a guy with her? A man with a scar from his nose to his chin? No, she always does a single. Oh, well, thanks. You've been swell. <laughs> I walked out, got back in the cab, and marked off Greenwich Village in the little black book. The second address, down by the East River. The night was black, and the fog had rolled in, staked out a claim all the way to the Hudson. I stopped cold, looked down at two gleaming eyes like two pieces of polished glass shining in the glare of the dim street lamp. Steady, boy, steady. Steady. Hold it, Lucifer. Yeah. Yeah, hold it, Lucifer. He won't hurt you, mister, unless I tell him to. Well, think about it for a while, will you? I'm a poor substitute for horse meat. What do you want? Do you know a Lenore Brown? You a cop? Shamus. Beat it, Lucifer. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, pal. I couldn't hold my breath much longer. You can come on up on the porch. You're looking for Lenore Brown, huh? Yeah, you know her? I met her. My wife works for her. Is your wife in? Yeah. Esther, come here. Some private dick wants to talk to you. She's Miss Brown's private maid. Yes? Uh, your husband tells me you work for Miss Brown. Yeah, what's she done? She got many friends. Man friends? Yeah. 
Oh, uh, you know a man with a scar? Sure, I know lots of them. What are you talking about, woman? I met someone who Miss Brown knows. What did you mean by that, mister? Look, I really don't know anybody with a scar, now you better beat it. Yeah, get moving. And I want to talk to you, woman. Get in there. Yes, yeah, honey. I knew she was going to get bruised, but he looked rough enough to cut my windpipe, and I wanted some place to pour my coffee down in the morning. So I got out of there fast and headed for the last address in the little black book. The place was on one of those narrow, dark streets that looked like the inside of a grave. The sign above the door read Tangy, so I pushed open the door and went in. If I didn't find the man with the scar here, I was out on two strikes. It was a little restaurant on the bottom floor of a two-story building. A quiet waiter slipped up and showed me to a booth. He shoved a menu in my hand and disappeared before I could ask him anything. The place was empty except for an old couple sitting near the door. The waiter said something to them and they looked quickly over at me and then they left in a hurry. The room was completely empty now. Even the waiter had disappeared. I looked up at a flight of stairs at the far end of the room. A pair of very healthy ankles came into view, and they were holding up a pair of legs that ran my blood pressure up to 190 again. I eased my gun out and held it under the table. She turned the corner and started down toward my booth like a loose snake in a rabbit pen. Mind if I sit down? Well, it's, uh, it's your party. Shame on you. Don't you know it's not nice to pilfer a lady's handbag? Now Lenore will have to spank. Looks like the last address paid off. If you're buying shrouds, it did. Where's the guy that young Wharton was supposed to have killed? Upstairs. But he's very unsociable. Hates long conversations. I only need a couple of lines. <laughs> he can't even do that. He likes to keep on breathing. The old man figures Arthur framed his son. He's not going to let your boyfriend out of Sing Sing until he finds the man with a scar. Think he can do it better than you did? I found him. Was it worth dying for? I don't know. I'm going to tell you better after I talk to him. Mama's going to have to spank sooner than she expected. Come on in, boys. Well, 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 look who's here. Are Mama's two big idiots out collecting blood? Where are your buckets? He's bitter, Yuki. A present. You've met Yuki and Salvador before, haven't you? Yeah, on the end of a fist. They want to show you the town. I know the beat. Well, I'll bet you've never seen it from the bottom of the East River. No, but if you'll put on a bathing suit, I might buy the idea. It's too bad we'll never make the beach together. I'd like to show you the sights. Boys, you'd better help Mr. Diamond out of the booth. I think he's stuck. You know how it is. The boys like to keep moving. Sure. And so do I. I shot once and caught Yuki in the stomach, and I dumped the table over on Salvador. He grabbed like he was going to waltz with it and went down on his back. I didn't have to get up. I just shot him through the table. Lenore was out of the booth fast and running for the stairs. Look out, Tony! Tony, look out! I caught up with her at the foot of the stairs, and she started up. I saw him standing on the upper landing, scar and all. All meaning gun in his hand. He missed me, but nailed her halfway up. She spun around and fell all over me. With both of us down, he was in a good spot to finish the job, but my arm hit the lower post of the staircase and swung me right into line. I just rested my elbow on the banister and let him have it. You should have kept your nose up, mister. A bad landing washes you out. Tell me, did Wharton's son identify the man with the scar? Yeah, he was the one he thought he killed. Mm -hmm. But the old man's feeling pretty good. Yeah, just left. He's happier than Otis on payday. Mm. Who was the guy with the scar? A uh, cheap hood. Record. Name of Lucio. Mm. The girl in Alter had him hidden out in that place so he wouldn't be seen. And I... I, I don't think you're funny, Diamond. Mm, what's the matter, Otis? Yeah, what do you want, meathead? I looked it up. The three-toed variety. Uh oh what are you talking about? Oh, I uh, called him a sloth. Yeah, a sloth. You should see the picture in the dictionary. It's an animal. Well? It's funny looking with three toes on each foot. 
Well... And it's noted for its laziness. Okay, Lieutenant. Just forget it. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? That question was asked of doctors in every branch of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand name most was Camel. Yes, according to this recent nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Friends, buy your Camels the handy, thrifty way by the carton. That way you always have Camels when you want them. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the Camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke Camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of Camels deem it a privilege to send free cigarettes each week to hospitalized servicemen and veterans. This week's Camels go to Veterans Hospitals Topeka, Kansas, and Oakland, California. U.S. Army Percy Jones General Hospital, Battle Creek, Michigan. U.S. Naval Hospital, Portsmouth, Virginia. More than 194 million Camels have now been sent to servicemen, servicewomen, and veterans. Now, until next week, enjoy Camels. I always do. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the Camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke Camels and see. Adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell, was written by Blake Edwards. Our director is Helen Mack. Men, for pipe smoking pleasure, get Prince Albert, the national joy smoke. Prince Albert's choice tobacco is rich and flavorsome. It's crimped cut for smooth, even burning, and specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Yes, P.A. is America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the FBI, follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. Next, we present the Dick Powell Show. Ladies and gentlemen, we want you to meet Richard Diamond. He's a private detective, and he doesn't like getting mixed up in murder any more than you do. But just relax for a half hour, and somebody will probably wind up pretty dead. It usually starts easy, like Wednesday morning when Diamond walked into his office. Mr. Diamond? That's right. Who let you in? I gave the scrub woman five dollars. I have a business proposition for you, too. I collect big bills. Something like this? He pulled out a hundred dollar bill and walked over to me. I'm not a small man, but I got a nosebleed trying to see over the second button on his vest. He had a pair of shoulders that looked like a Dwyer should lay a cornerstone for them. And the muscles under his coat made me think he was smuggling shot puts. Even if he lived across town, he was so tall if he fell down, he'd be halfway home. My name is Collins. I'm R.J. Rollins, private secretary. I bet you look silly on his lap. Sit down. I'm getting a stiff neck. Certainly. How tall are you, anyway? Seven feet, one inch. Doesn't that extra inch give you a complex? I'm not here to discuss my physical qualifications. Uh, yeah. 
You say you work for a Mr. Rollins. Is that the Rollins? Yes, he's a very wealthy man. That's an understatement. If you jumped off his wallet, you'd break both legs. He wants to retain you to find his brother, Martin. He does, huh? Would you mind coming along with me? Mr. Rollins would like to see you in person. Tell me a little more about Rollins' brother. I'd rather let Mr. Rollins do that himself. And I'd rather hear some of it from you first. I don't want to see Rollins if I'm going to turn down the job. Very well. Mr. Rollins' brother Martin was released from Sing Sing five days ago. Yesterday, he sent a letter threatening Mr. Rollins' life. Oh, and your boss wants me to find his brother before he makes good the threat, is that it? That's it, exactly. Why doesn't he call the police? Show them the letter and get the protection he needs. It'll certainly be a lot cheaper than hiring me. Mr. Rollins doesn't want any more bad publicity. There was enough of that when Martin was sent to prison. And why did Martin get sent to prison? He embezzled $100,000 from the company funds. Did Rollins try to save him? He was guilty. Mr. Rollins prosecuted him to the full extent of the law. Hmm. Was the money recovered? Why, no, they never recovered a penny. Goodbye, Mr. Collins. You you won't take the job? No, oh, now you've guessed. But why? Mr. Rollins is prepared to pay you handsomely. I don't doubt it, but it's too pat. Martin's killing mad because his brother sent him to prison. Rollins receives the threatening letter and won't call in the police, yet he wants Martin found. Why? I told you. He doesn't want any more bad publicity. So I take the job and maybe find Martin, and Rollins has a potential killer in the house. What's he going to do? Try and keep his mind off things by letting him shrink heads in the basement? Remember, Mr. Diamond, they are still brothers. So were Cain and Abel. You mean you think Mr. Rollins intends to kill his brother and that's why he wants you to find him? Uh, that's a little crude, but it's certainly a possibility. That's utterly absurd. Maybe so, but no one would blame him. You better get someone else to find Martin. Try Hearthstone of the Death Squad. You're being ridiculous. Mr. Rollins is a highly respectable businessman. His reputation is spotless. Then this looks like... Too good a time for him to start getting dirty. Goodbye, Mr. Collins. He got up and started to say something, but changed his mind. He turned and walked to the door, ducking his head as he went out. Someday, he was going to forget to duck and take the whole wall along with him. Yeah? He's a man named Collins in your office. He was. He just left. Did you take the job? Wait a minute. Who is this? If you didn't take the job, you're lucky. If you did... Better catch up on your insurance payments. You think so, huh? I think so. This is a family matter, so leave it that way or you're liable to get yourself killed. Look, would the Sherlock and me show if I deduced your name was Martin Rollins? Hello? Hello? Ah, nuts. Five minutes ago, when I brushed Collins out of my office with a quick no, I wouldn't have taken the job for a share in Manhattan Island. But when somebody starts threatening me, it's like telling a five-year-old kid to stay away from the cookie jar. The quickest way to get me to do something is to tell me not to and try pushing me around. I looked up the Rollins address, and in 20 minutes, my cab was pulling up in front of a big old English house that looked like the summer training camp for the U.S. Mint. Yes? Oh, Mr. Diamond. Tell Rollins I want to see him. Come in. I'm happy you've changed your mind. Just tell him I want to see him. He's in the garden. This way, please. We went through the big house and out through the glass doors into the garden. Rollins was sitting in a chair feeding the birds. He was reaching his late fifties with the sour look of a man who didn't want to. As he threw the breadcrumbs out on the gravel walk, a big diamond on his little finger flashed in the afternoon sun. Uh, Mr. Rollins. Hey? Oh, yes, Collins, yes, sir. Who's that with you? Uh, The detective you sent for, Mr. Rollins. Oh, yes, 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 Francis. Pull up that chair and sit down, young man. Thanks. Just feeding the little birds. Here, birdie. Birdie! I've been doing it for some time. Oh, swell. Uh, What are you standing around for, Collins? I want to talk to this detective in private. Yes, sir. If you need me, I'll be in the library. Won't need you. Here. You feed the birds for a while. Makes you feel good. Sure. Here, birdie. Birdie? That's fine. That's fine. What's your name, young man? Diamond. Hey, (laughs) Get a load of that little fella. He's grabbing enough crumbs to stuff a pheasant. No, he's the greedy one. He always does that. It reminds me of some people I know. <laughs> well, Miss Diamond, I suppose Collins told you I wanted to see you. Yeah, and I can't say I wanted the job at first. So Collins tells me. What changed your mind? A phone call. I think it was from your brother Martin. He told me to lay off. Mm, you don't like being intimidated, eh? That's good, that's good. I think we'll get along, young man. Have you got the letter he sent you? Have it right here. Read it. I'll take over with the birds for a while. Thanks. Hmm. My dear brother, I spent five years hating you, but I learned to trade. 
I used it drawing blueprints for your shroud. Martin. Oh, this will never get the pupil surprise. Martin always did go in for the dramatic. Well, you think you can find him? Was this the first you've heard from him since he went to prison? Yes, yes. I will admit the letter has my word. Aside from the dramatic, Martin has always been a hothead. Since boyhood, he's envied my get up and go. We never got along. And it was even too much for my mother. She died very young. Probably overworked from knitting straight jackets. Oh, don't be flipping your man. Will you take the job? A hundred dollars a day and all hospital expenses. Fine, fine. See Collins. He'll take care of the fee. Now, tell me one more thing. Can you think of anyone who might know where your brother is? Only one. And I'm not sure if she's even still in New York. She was going with Martin when he was caught. Only met her once, but I will say, if nothing else, my brother showed good taste. <laughs> His name. What was her name? Oh, it was Carter, Virginia Carter. Lived someplace in the village, I think. Oh, but that was five years ago. All right. Uh, now, what about your secretary, Collins? Can you trust him? Oh, Collins is above reproach. He's been with me for 15 years. Knows everything about me. Almost a member of the family. Does he know anything more about Martin? No more than I do. Oh, hmm? uh, no, young man. I'm getting tired. I want to finish feeding my birds. Good day, young man. Hey, Bertie. Bertie. I left the old man sitting with his friends. He'd have one good deed to take along with him anyway. I went back through the glass doors and a butler showed me to the library, but the cupboard was bare. Collins wasn't around. Collins! Oh, Collins! My nerves started looking for some place to hide. The shot had come from the direction of the garden and I went back there fast. Mr. Diamond! Mr. Diamond, over here! What happened? It's Mr. Rollins. Martin just shot him. I thought you were supposed to be in the library, Collins. I went out the library doors and came around the other way. I had some papers I wanted Mr. Rollins to sign. You said Martin did it? Yes. As I rounded the corner of the house, I saw him standing behind that tree. I started to yell, but he fired and climbed over the wall. Mr. Rollins was dead when I reached him. Let's call homicide. I put in a call to the 5th precinct and an old friend, Lieutenant Levinson. We were on the force together before I got restless. When you had a killing on your hands, he was a good man to have around. Homicide, Sergeant Otis. Hello, Otis. Let me talk to the lieutenant. Well, Richard Diamond, what do you want the police to do for you now? Get rid of one of their stupid sergeants. Now, put Walt on, will you? I got a killing for him. Why didn't you say so? Grant Levinson. Walt, I got a present for you. Hello, Rick. Who's dead this time? Big time. Old man Rollins. Rollins Investments. Shot while he was sitting in his garden. You got any ideas? One. His brother Martin. Rollins' secretary says he saw him do the job. Any motive? Well, the old man sent Martin up on an embezzlement rap. Martin sent him a letter threatening to kill him. A letter. Letter. What'd you say? Oh, I'm an idiot. Get out here. The address is 650 East 87th. Well, wait a minute, Rick. I can't. Oh, I'm glad I'm not on the force anymore. You'd have to fire me for this mistake. I shoved Collins aside and went back out in the garden like Olympia with a hot foot. The old man was still smiling and nothing was changed except... There he was. And the letter from Martin was gone. I remembered what Rollins had said about a girl named Virginia Carter. I went back in the library, grabbed a phone book, and started looking up the Carters. Only one Virginia in the village, so I made that my next stop. I told Collins not to touch anything and to wait for Lieutenant Levinson. I grabbed a cab and headed downtown. It was a long shot, but it could be the same girl who had known Martin. I found the address, and when she answered the door, I got the quickest scalding in my history. She was wearing something thin enough to make a silkworm hang himself. Yeah? Ah, oh, I bet you have a hard time finding something to wear in July. I'm cold-blooded. Now, what's on your mind? That's the kind of question that made Adam a meat-eater. I'm sorry. I haven't got any apples. You fooled me. Maybe if you stop panting long enough, you can tell me what you want. I'd like to know about Martin Rollins. Oh, that one. I haven't seen him in years. Maybe you've got a picture of him. I've got lots of pictures. Maybe there is one of Martin someplace. Well, let's look through the whole stack. I've got lots of time. Before I let you in, you better tell me your name. I don't want you to steal anything from me. Maybe if anybody stole something from you, they'd get their fingers burned off at the elbows. Mm-hmm. You can come in. She opened the door and walked ahead of me like she'd just oiled her sacroiliac. She led me into the living room and sat down. The shades were drawn, and I had a hard time finding the couch. Hmm, nice. How did we look at the pictures with the magic lantern? I thought maybe you'd like to relax for a minute. 
Put something in a glass. I'll cool down. I don't drink. I never keep the stuff around. That doesn't leave you much of a feel. What do you major in? Cigarettes. Have one? Yeah. I haven't got a match. Just hold on to it. It'll light up. I think I'd better get the pictures. I'll be right back. She got up and walked to a door. When she opened it, the sunlight framed her against the dark room. If Petty had been there, he'd have gone back to five-minute sketches. In about two minutes, she came back with the pictures. We can start with these. Martin isn't in this pile. I've got lots more. And you're not in a hurry, are you? No. Good. This might run into overtime. She sat close to me and handed me one picture at a time, describing each guy in the photographs. I've seen draft boards with smaller clientels. Several times she stopped and looked at one of the pictures like Diamond Jim, eyeing a ten-course meal, then passed the guy to me. It was like handling a fire sale for Dr. Kinsey. After two dozen photographs, I started thinking she was the reason for the rise in the vitamin market, and I was just going to mention an old snapshot I had of myself when she thumped one of the collection with a polished fingernail. Martin Rollins, here he is. Well, he figured to show up sooner or later. How long ago was this taken? I couldn't say exactly. I guess about six years. You should keep a file. I only keep pictures around to remember things. Uh, how did you get along with Martin? Oh, all right, I guess. He had money and he showed me a good time. What else do you know about him? He has a brother with a checking account at Fort Knox. Any unusual habits? Yes, but they wouldn't help you find him. Yeah, well, look, oh, uh, I remember something. He used to play the saxophone. Hobby? No, not exactly. He played around town with several small bands. He was a nut on jazz. Did he make money at it? I guess so. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, baby. I'll stop around again sometime and take a look at your parlor. Oh, it's been a nice, soft web. Mind if I take Martin with me? Not if you bring back a picture of yourself. Maybe I'll just bring my camera. You can take her. Good. That's why I keep the room so dark. I like to develop things. I hated to leave, but my hair was already curly enough. She'd given me one lead. Martin was a musician of sort, and sometimes he made money at it. I started to cross the street to catch another cab and was halfway there when I heard the car. It was an old trick. You drive by fast, open your door, and if anyone is in the way, you wind up with a face full of automobiles. I picked myself up and thought about chasing him, but he was so far down the street I couldn't even get the license number. I grabbed a bug-eyed cabbie and had him take me to local 802 of the Musicians Union. I went in, and a little short guy with a twitch looked up at me from behind a big desk. Something I can uh, do for you, Hops? Oh, bad twitch. Yeah, too much bump. Do you know a Martin Rollins plays the sax? Has he got a card? He makes money. Then if he ain't, you better have. We'll see if he does. I'm an old friend. I'd like to get in touch with him. But I don't know. We're, we're not so, supposed to. Well, maybe this badge will snap you out of it. Oh, a cop. Hey, wait a minute. I'll see what I can find. Yeah, now look what you've done. you got me twitching more than ever. Between twitches, he found what I was looking for. Martin had just renewed his card. It didn't show a home address, but his mail was being sent to one of the swing joints on 52nd Street. I said thanks and left him in the middle of another twitch. I walked out on the sidewalk, looked at the long gray shadows stretching out from the tall buildings. One of them moved and ducked around a corner. I had a tail. I started to chase him, but a big crowd makes that tough. I slowed down for a minute, and suddenly I had a horrible thought. I had a date with a redhead, one Helen Asher, who got very unhappy if you stood her up. Yeah, at 7 o'clock, I was due at 975 Park, Park Avenue. A warm fire, a figure with better lines than Shakespeare, and a $10 million rain check that I could cash any time I wanted to take a walk with her to the little church around the corner. I made a phone call. Miss Asher's residence. Hello, Francis. What's the gossip in the pantry? Oh, Mr. Diamond, it's good to hear your voice. Let me talk to Miss Asher and see what she's got to say about it. Right away, sir. She's just coming down the stairs. Miss Helen, it's for you. Hi. Hi. You're stood up. Oh, Rick, not again. Can't help it, baby. Got to do some catching before I get caught. Just what are you trying to catch? Man type. Plays a saxophone. Kills people. Which one's the hobby? I don't know. I'm going over to Swing Joint on 52nd Street and find out. Oh, Rick, take me with you. I'd like to listen to some music. Sorry, Helen, baby, but this one's a little too, too risky. Please, Rick, I'll stay out of the way. I can't do it, honey. 
I'd like you around for later. There's liable to be some trouble. There's liable to be some trouble if I don't see you. Tell Francis to kick up the fire and I'll be over later. I want to go, too. Bye, baby. You're mean. Bye. <laughs> Table, Mike? Hey, I'm looking for Martin Rollins. Is he here? When is he though? He plays the sax. Well, you'll have to ask one of the musicians, Mike. I don't pay no attention to the music. I'm Tom D. Thanks. Hey, can I bother you a minute? No, but you can talk to me. Move in, you can lean on the piano. Have you know uh, Martin Rollins? Martin? Yes, yeah, sure. Side man. He blows here. Which one is he? He's off tonight. We got a phone call and took over. Hello, Rick. Helen, well, the ashes are really slumming tonight. How, how did you find me in this joint? You said music on 52nd Street. I went into two clubs before this one. Oh, hello. How are you? Living. Well, it's all right, honey. My man's not here. Good. Let's listen to the music. I still have to find him, baby. Oh. You gonna hog the piano or do you want a table now? Uh, don't leave. I like the chick style. What? Uh, waiter, bring us a couple of scotch and sodas. We'll stay at the piano. All right, but I'm not on my natural element. Oh, on second thought, bring the lady a scotch and bring me a glass of milk. Sure thing, Red Hot. Want to chase it? Yeah, and while you're at it, why don't you change your apron? Looks like you've been making chicken pies on it. Hey, you sure got a crazy chick. You mean me? I'm perfectly normal. Wow, she's real square. Don't drag me, baby. Just let me dig. Rick, what's he talking about? Wait a minute, honey. Say, uh, Bud, do you know where Rollins lives? No, oh, sure, Daddy. Well, we had a ball there last night. He got a little pad on 12th Street. Oh, here's five. Come down and remember the address. Come down. A uh, 69 East 12th Street. <laughs> Don't put me on, Dad. Is the chick really a square she gives out? I'm not a bit. I dig. Crazy. Go. Does that mean he's happy, Rick? The best. Thanks, Dad. Anytime. Enjoy the music, baby. Rick, where are you going? You stay right here until I get back. All right, but I don't know the language. I went out fast, and ten minutes later, I was standing in front of Brother Martin's front door. I tried my knuckles again and put my ear to the door. I didn't tag the sound at first, but it was a light scraping sound, like a rope over wood. I tried the door and it was open. I had been right on both counts. It was a rope and it was rubbing on wood. Brother Martin was making the sound effects, but he was doing it the hard way. He was on the other end of the rope, hanging by his neck. He was turning slowly, like a weather vane in a soft breeze. A chair was tipped over at his feet, so I picked it up and sat on the thing. I started to get up when something in my stomach jumped up and kicked my mind into high gear. I looked up at the dead man and what I saw through the suicide theory right out of the window. Sitting in the chair, my head was just on a level with the shoe tops. If he had used the chair to stand on, he would have still needed the ladder just to tie the rope to the beam. I've seen a couple of guys who hanged themselves, but never one who jumped four feet in the air to do it. I shoved the chair under him just to make sure. He cleared it by a good foot. Right then I knew Collins was my man. It would take a man that size to give Martin that much altitude, but what was I going to do, have Collins picked up? With that kind of evidence, it laughed me out of headquarters. I had to prove it. I had to do it fast. But how? I started to think of all the people who had been connected with the case, and the phone rang. I knew Martin would have trouble answering, so I helped him out. Hello. Hello, Martin. Well, uh, he's tied up right now. Who's this? Well, happy Mother's Day to you, honey. Still collecting pictures? Pictures? Oh. Hello? Uh, sometimes guys are lucky. You'd have to be a deaf mute to Miss Virginia Carter's lovely tonsils. She was lying when she told me she didn't know where Martin lived. I don't like lying dames. Maybe she knew something about Collins, too. I knew how to find out. Well, Mr. Diamond, did you bring your camera? We'll play spin the bottle some other time. How did you know my name? Well, 
You gave it to me this afternoon. You're a bad liar, baby. Look out, I'm coming in. Now, wait a minute. I'm expecting someone. Well, if it's who I think it is, you better hide all the rope in the house. Now, move it out of the way. <laughs> you heard from Collins yet? I don't know what you're talking about. Now, get out of here. Okay, baby, but Collins just killed Martin Rollins. What? Yes. He strangled him first, then stood on a chair and hung the body to a rafter. How do you know Collins did it? Because he, he forgot he's a foot taller than most guys. He gave Martin a boost, left him hanging too high. What's that got to do with me? Well, I think Collins knew I'd come to you. I think he promised you the moon if you fingered Martin Rollins. He wanted to get Martin, but he wanted someone else to do it for him. He knew old man Rollins would remember you and tell me. You're crazy. How much did Collins promise you? He didn't promise me a thing. You don't think he's going to let you go on breathing when he finds out the law is after him? You're the only hole in his story. Wait a minute. He just left Martin waiting for oxygen. He's probably on his way here right now. He didn't say anything about killing Martin. I want to get out of this mess. Now, that's better. Now, slow down and tell me everything you can. Well, he met me about three months ago at a party. We started seeing each other. One day he told me he was in some kind of trouble and asked me to help. I said I would. He told me that he had been in a deal with Martin and that Martin had gone to prison for it. So Martin had come back and wanted to share, is that it? Yeah. He promised me 50 It all happened in the time it takes you to change your mind. He must have come in through the kitchen and started shooting. She went down like a diver with a Benz and died her in her face. He was trying for me when I jumped to one side and knocked over the only light burning in the room. He came close, but the flash of his gun gave me his position, and I threw enough lead to start a pipeline. He stumbled back to the kitchen, but he was dragging it. I heard him drop, and I moved in after him. The moonlight slanted down through one of the windows and splashed out on the hard floor. He was lying in it, on his back, like he wanted to get that far anyway. Don't try again, Collins. I still feel like shooting. Forget it. No reason to kill you now. The string ends with me. Before you close your eyes, tell me something. Make it quick. Why didn't you go out and get Martin Rollins yourself? Why hire me to find him? Didn't want anyone to know I was looking. You were the alibi. With Rollins dead and Martin a suicide, you'd swear Martin killed the old man. Because Rollins showed me the letter. You forge it? Yes. I shot Rollins took the letter. And then you planted that phony call to my office. Yes. You nearly got away with it. You just forgot how tall you were when you hanged Martin. I thought sure Martin was the one who was trying to run me down. I'm a rotten driver. Oh. How bad is it? You must have been a good cop. Caught all three. Should be raining out to a nice and night to die. There's a warm breeze. Pushed all the clouds back. The night's all shining. Must be nice to look at, but keep standing up. You'll never see it from down here. He died looking up like he wanted a star to take with him. I don't think they gave it to him. Homicide, Sergeant Otis. Otis, let me talk to Lieutenant Levinson. Well, it's Thomas himself. What's the matter? You get lost trying to find the Empire State Building? Look, put Walt on the line. You're not funny tonight. Oh, die. Somebody steal your bag? You put Walt on the phone, and the next time I see you, I'll scatter your molars all over the 5th Precinct. Now get him. What's the matter, Rick? Where are you? No, oh, I'm standing in the middle of a mortician's dream. Collins shot the girl, and I shot Collins. They're both pretty dead. Okay, now calm down. We'll be right over. Oh, I don't want to calm down. You'll find Martin hanging at 69 East 12th. If you want an explanation, you'll probably find me in the alcoholic ward at Bellevue. Well, uh, you want I should get you another glass of milk? Just bring the bottle. Pour half of it out and fill the rest with rum. Uh, here's the pencil, Mac. What's it for? Name, address, and nearest relative. I'll be right back. Well, you took your time. Huh? Oh, Helen, why didn't you go home? Oh, I couldn't cut out. I'm having a ball. Huh? Don't be square. Come on over to the piano and dig some music. You look dragged. Oh, now, wait a minute. What's the dialogue? Come on, Rick. What's the matter, don't you dig? Oh, you're grand. Look what I found, Nikki. Yeah, yeah, move in, Pops. Say, she says you got a fine set of pipes. She's got a tin air. Oh, no, Daddy. Oh, she comes out real fine. See? 
Go on. Show him how you come on, Nick. Oh, stop it. Go on. Go. Everybody's got some music stashed away somewhere. Make it. Ace your bed. Milk. Oh, well, thanks. Some other time, Nicky. Right now, I go on with this. Square. Oh, honey, I don't know anything about Bob. Well, now, who said anything about Bob? Now, you take Rogers and Hart. The greatest. Real crazy. Go on, Pops. This is the kind of music that makes you glad you got ears. Please, Rick. For me. Oh, okay, baby. It's too nice a night to worry about things. It seems we stood and talked like this before. We looked at each other in the same way then. But I can't remember where or where. You dig? Yeah, yeah, go on. The clothes you're wearing are the clothes you wore. The smile you're smiling, you were smiling then. But I can't remember where or when. Oh, but God, must I just wait? Some things that happen for the first time seem to be happening again. And so it seems that we have met before. And last before and Richard Diamond, private detective, was previously heard over the National Broadcasting Company and has been re-released for you men and women overseas by the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. People smoke camels than any other cigarette. Yes, camels are the favorite cigarette of people in all walks of life. Among them are singing stars, actors, announcers, people whose voices are their fortunes, people whose cigarette must be mild. Make the camel 30-day test and see how mild a cigarette can be. Puff after puff, pack after pack. See why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette.
transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, we make homicide pay for a hundred a day. Oh, that's pretty terrible. Oh, you should catch me on a bad day. Nothing. <laughs> Am I going to see you tonight? Not if you keep turning out the lights. Who turns out the lights? Oh, well, what difference does it make? It's fun. I'll expect you at eight and you'll be here. Honey, honey, of course. How's business? Oh, about as dull as 50 miles of dirt road. We'll have dinner home. Bless your little pointed head. And your empty pocketbook. Uh oh. What? Mr. Diamond? Uh, yes, sir. Come right in, will you? Uh, pull up an old bank book and have a seat. Thank you. Client? Well, keep a good thought, honey. You may be gorging yourself at 21. Bye. Bye. <clears throat> I'd, uh, like to hire you, Mr. Diamond. Well, I'd love every minute of it. I charge a hundred a day in expenses. All right. He reached for his wallet. While he was counting his money, I was looking at him. This was the biggest man I'd ever seen. I was getting a nosebleed just trying to see over the second button on his vest. He had a pair of shoulders that looked like the mayor should lay a cornerstone for them. And the muscles under his coat stood out like smuggled shot puts. My name is Collins. I'm B.E. Rollins, private secretary. Oh, is that the B.E. Rollins? Yes, he's a very wealthy man. Well, there's an understatement. He wants to retain you to find his brother, Martin. He does, huh? Would you mind coming with me? Mr. Rollins would like to see you in person. Well, tell me a little more about Rollins' brother. I'd rather let Mr. Rollins do that himself. No, I'd rather hear some of it from you first. I don't want to see Rollins if I'm going to turn down the job. Very well. Mr. Rollins' brother Martin was released from prison five days ago. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, he sent a letter threatening Mr. Rollins' life. Oh, and your boss wants me to find his brother before he makes good the threat. Is that it? That's it, exactly. Well, why doesn't he call the police? Show them the letter and get the protection he needs. It'll certainly be a lot cheaper than hiring me. Mr. Rollins doesn't want any more bad publicity. There was enough of it when Martin was sent to prison. And why did Martin get sent to prison? He embezzled $100,000 from the company funds. Did Rollins try to save him? He was guilty. Mr. Rollins prosecuted him to the full extent of the law. Was the money ever recovered? No. Goodbye, Mr. Collins. You won't take the job? Oh, now you've guessed. But why? Mr. Rollins is prepared to pay you handsomely. Well, I don't doubt it at all, but it's too pat. Martin's killing mad because his brother sent him to prison. Rollins receives a threatening letter, but won't call in the police. Yet he wants Martin found. Why? I told you. He doesn't want any more bad publicity. So I take the job and maybe find Martin. Then B.E. Rollins is a potential killer in the house. What you going to do? Try and keep his mind off of things by letting him shrink heads in the basement? Remember, Mr. Diamond, they are still brothers. So were Cain and Abel. You mean you think Mr. Rollins intends to kill his brother and that's why he wants you to find him? Well, that's a little crude, but it's certainly a possibility. That's utterly absurd. Uh, maybe so, but no one would blame him. You better try Hearthstone of the Death Squad. Now you're being ridiculous. Mr. Rollins is a highly respectable businessman. His reputation is spotless. Well, then this looks like too good a time for him to start getting dirty. Goodbye, Mr. Collins. He got up and started to say something which changed his mind. He turned and walked to the door, ducking his head as he went out. Someday he was going to forget the duck and take the whole wall along with him. Ten minutes later, I got a phone call. Yeah. Is a man named Collins in your office? Well, he was. He just left. Did you take the job? Well, who's this? If you didn't take the job, you're fortunate. If you did, you'd better catch up on your insurance payments. Oh, I think so, huh? I think so. This is a family matter, so leave it that way or you're liable to get yourself killed. Look, would the Sherlock and me show if I deduced your name was Martin Rollins? Hello? Hello? When I brushed Collins out of my office with a quick no, I wouldn't have taken the job he'd offered me for a share in Manhattan Island. But when somebody starts threatening me, it's like telling a five-year-old kid to stay away from the cookie jar. The quickest way to get me to do something is to tell me not to and try pushing me around. I looked up the Rollins address, and in 20 minutes, my cab pulled up in front of a big old English house that looked like the summer training camp for the U.S. Mint. Yes? 
Why, Mr. Diamond. Uh, tell Mr. Rollins I want to see him, will you? Come in. I'm happy you've changed your mind. Just tell him I want to see him. He's in the garden. This way, please. We went through the big house and out through the glass doors into the garden. B.E. Rollins was sitting in a chair, feeding the birds. He was reaching his late 60s with the sour look of a man who didn't want to. As he threw the breadcrumbs out on the gravel walk, a big diamond on his little finger flashed in the afternoon sun. Mr. Rollins? Huh? Oh, Collins. <laughs> Who's that with you? The detective you sent for, Mr. Rollins? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, pull up that chair and sit down, young man. Oh, thank you. Just feeding the little birds. Here, birdie, birdie. <clears throat> Been doing it for some time. Oh, swell. Well, what are you standing around for, Collins? I want to talk to this detective in private. Yes, sir. If you need me, I'll be in the library. I won't need you. Here, you feed the birds for a while. Makes you feel good. Oh, sure. Here, birdie. Birdie? That's fine. That's fine. Um, <clears throat> what's your name, young man? Diamond. Uh, Richard Diamond. Oh, hey, you gotta love that little fella. He's grabbing enough crumbs to stuff a pheasant. Mm, he's the greedy one. Always does that. Reminds me of some people I know. <laughs> yes. Well, Mr. Diamond, I suppose Collins told you why I wanted to see you? Yeah, and I can't say I wanted the job at first. So Collins tells me. What changed your mind? A phone call. I think it was from your brother, Martin. He told me not to work for you. And you don't like being intimidated. Hmm. Good. I think we'll get along, young man. Tell me, uh, have you got the letter he sent you? Have it right here. Read it. I'll take over with the birds for a while. All oh, right, thanks, sir. Hmm. My dear brother, I spent five years hating you, but I learned a trade. I used it drawing blueprints for your shroud. Signed, Martin. Well, this will never get the Pulitzer Prize. Martin always did go in for the dramatic. Well, do you think you can find him? Was this the first you've heard from him since he went to prison? Yes. I will admit the letter has me worried. Aside from the dramatic, Martin has always been a hothead. Since boyhood, he's envied my get up and go. We never got along. It was even too much for my mother. She died very young. Mm, probably overworked from knitting straitjackets. Don't be flippant, young man. Well, will you take the job? A hundred dollars a day and all hospital expenses. Fine, fine. See, Collins, he'll take care of the fee. Now, uh, uh, tell me one more thing. Can you think of anyone who might know where your brother is? Only one, and I'm not sure if she's even still in New York. She was going with Martin when he was caught. I only met her once, but I will say, if nothing else, my brother showed good taste. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, that's nice. What was her name? Carter. Virginia Carter. Lived someplace in the village, I think, but that was five years ago. All right, thank you. Now, uh, what about your secretary, Collins? Can you trust him? Collins is above reproach. He's been with me for 15 years. Knows everything about me. Almost a member of the family. Does he know anything more about Martin? No more than I do. Now I'm getting tired, and I want to finish feeding my birds. Good day, young man. Here, birdie. Birdie! I left the old man sitting with his friends. He'd have one good deed to take along with him anyway. I went back to the glass doors and a butler showed me the way to the library. But the cupboard was bare. Collins wasn't around. Collins! Collins! The shot had come from the direction of the garden and I went back out in a hurry. Mr. Diamond! Mr. Diamond, over here! What's wrong, Collins? It's Mr. Rollins. He's dead. D.E. Rollins was sitting in the chair with a bullet hole just over the heart. His head was resting on his chest, and he still held the breadcrumbs in his hand. He seemed to be smiling like he knew he was going to be able to feed the birds for a long time now. Martin did it. He did? I saw the whole thing. I thought you were supposed to be in the library. Well, I started out of the library and came around the other way. As I rounded the corner of the house, I saw Martin standing behind that tree. I started to yell, but he fired and climbed over the wall. Mr. Rollins was dead when I reached him. That's called homicide. Before we continue with Richard Diamond, private detective, 
Here are a few words about smoking enjoyment. Not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. That's what noted throat specialists reported in a coast-to-coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only camels for 30 days. That's how mild camels are. Make your own 30-day camel mildness test. Smoke only camels for 30 days and enjoy the rich, full flavor of camels' costly tobaccos. And see for yourself how mild camels are pack after pack. See how well camels get along with your throat week after week. Yes, that's the sensible test of cigarette mildness. For only by steady smoking can you judge the day-in, day-out mildness of a cigarette. Start your own camel 30-day test today and see how mild, how flavorful, how thoroughly enjoyable a cigarette can be. You'll find out why people say, once a camel smoker, always a camel smoker. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now, back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Hello, Rick. Hi, you all. Well, the great private detective. What do you want the police force to do for you now? Get rid of one of their stupid sergeants. Now, I don't oh, like... it is. Okay. Okay, yeah. This is Mr. Collins, Walt. Lieutenant Levinson, Mr. Collins. Hello, Mr. Collins. How do you do, Lieutenant? Uh, the body's in the garden. B. Rollins, huh? Yep, big time. Rollins Investments. That's right, Lieutenant. Any idea who killed him? Well, Mr. Collins here says it was Rollins' brother. That's right, Lieutenant. I saw Martin shoot Mr. Rollins. There he is. Gee. On such a nice day, too. Isn't Otis a dream? Oh, though? such a one. Well, right over the heart. Otis, you go... What are you doing, Rick? It was a letter from his brother. A letter? Sure, I read it myself. I... Holy Ike, it's gone. We searched the whole garden for the incriminating letter and came up with a big fat zero. Then I remembered something that the old man had told me about Martin. Something about a girl named Virginia Carter. I questioned Collins, but he didn't know her. So I put the old mind to work and became my usual shrewd self. I went back in the library, grabbed a phone book, and found the only Virginia Carter listed. It was a wild, long shot. But I grabbed a cab, and 40 minutes later, I was standing in front of her door. When she opened it, I got the quickest scalding in history. Hello. Oh, I bet you have a hard time finding something to wear in July. You like it? It's French silk. Love it, love it. What's on your mind? Now, uh, uh, Virginia Carter? Mm-hmm. Now, if you'll stop panting long enough, maybe you'd like to tell me what you want. Well, I'd like to know about Martin Rollins. Oh, I have not seen him in years. Maybe you've got a picture of him? I've got lots of pictures. Mm-hmm. Maybe there is one of Martin someplace. Well, let's uh, look through the whole flock. I've got lots of time. Before I let you in, you better tell me your name. I don't want you to steal anything from me. Maybe if anybody stole something from you, they get their fingers burned off the elbows. Mm-hmm. You can come in. She opened the door and walked ahead of me like she'd just oiled her sacroiliac. She led me into the living room and sat down. The shades were drawn... I had a hard time finding the couch. Right here. Oh, wow. Well, well how, do, uh, how do we look at the pictures with the magic lantern? I thought maybe you wanted to relax for a minute. Well, uh, put something in a glass. I'll cool down. I don't drink. I never keep the stuff around. Hmm. Well, that doesn't leave you much of a feel. Or what do you major in? Cigarettes. Have a camel? Oh, yes, any time. I haven't got a match. Well, just hold on to it. It'll light up. I think I'd better get the pictures. I'll be right back. Just make yourself comfortable. Mm hmm. Hoop de doo, hoop de doo. start with this. If Martin isn't in this pile, I've got lots more. You're not in a hurry, are you? Mm, no, not a bit. Good. This might run into overtime. 
There was one trouble with the setup. Looking at the pictures with her sitting close was like trying to read a mail order catalog in front of a blast furnace. She handed me one picture at a time, describing each guy in the photographs. I've seen draft boards with smaller clientels. Several times she stopped and looked at one of the pictures like Diamond Jim eyeing a ten-course meal, then passed the guy to me. After two dozen photographs, I started thinking she was the reason for the rise in the vitamin market, and I was just going to mention an old snapshot I had of myself when she thumped one of the collection with a polished fingernail. Martin Rollins, here he is. Well, he figured to show up sooner or later. How long ago was this taken? Well, I could not say exactly, but I'd guess about six years. Mm -hmm. well, you should keep a file. How'd you get along with Martin? All right, I guess. He had money and he showed me a good time. What else do you know about him? He has a brother with a checking account at Fort Knox. Hmm. Any unusual habits? Yes, but they wouldn't help you find him. Oh, yes, he used to play a saxophone. A hobby? No, not exactly. He played around town with several other small bands. He was a nut on jazz. Did he make money at it? <laughs> I guess so. Well, thanks, baby. I'll stop around again sometime and take a look at your parlor. I'll spin a nice soft web. Mind if I take Martin with me? Mm, not if you bring back a picture of yourself. Maybe I'll just bring my camera. You can take it. Good. That's why I keep the room so dark. I like to develop things. I hated to leave, but my hair was on fire. She'd given me one lead. Martin was a musician of a sort, and sometimes he made money at it. I started to cross the street to catch another cab, and I was halfway there when I heard the car. That was an old trick. You drive by fast, open your door... And if anyone is in the way, he winds up with a face full of automobile. I picked myself up and thought about chasing him, but he was so far down the street, I couldn't even get the license number. I grabbed a bug-eyed cabbie and had him take me to local 802 of the Musicians' Union. I went in, and a little short guy with a twitch looked up at me from behind a big desk. Is something I can do for you, Pop? Hmm. Bad twitch. Yeah, too much bop. Tell me, uh, do you know a Martin Rollins plays the sax? Has he got a card? He makes money. Then if he ain't, he better have. Well, see if he does, will you? I'm an old friend. I like to get in touch with him. You look like a cop. And I've got a shiny little badge. Oh, well, wait a minute. I'll, I'll see what I can find. Cop, huh? Now look what you've done. you got me twitching more than ever. Between twitches, he found what I was looking for. Martin had just renewed his card. It didn't show a home address, but his mail was being sent to one of the swing joints on 52nd Street. I said thanks and left him in the middle of another twitch. I walked out on the sidewalk, looked at the long gray shadows stretching out from the tall buildings. One of them moved and ducked around a corner. I was being followed. Fingers, can I bother you for a minute? No, oh, but you can talk to me. Move in, lean on the piano. Yeah. You know a Martin Rollins? Well, sure, he blows here. Which one is he? He's off tonight, got a phone call and took off. You know where he lives? Yeah. Well, here's five. Come down and remember the address. What do you want him for? Here's another five. What difference does it make? Solid. It's got a little pad on 5th Street, 59 East. Now, don't put me on, Dad. You got troubles? I'm going to ask him. Oh, crazy. I like his style. And when you got time, drop back and listen to the band. I don't think I could stand the altitude. <laughs> crazy guy. I went out fast, and ten minutes later, I was standing in front of Martin Rollins' apartment. I tried my knuckles and waited. I tried again and put my ear to the door. I didn't hear it at first because it was so faint. A light scraping sound like rope over wood. I tried the door. I had been right on both counts. It was a rope and it was rubbing on wood. Brother Martin was making the sound effects, but he was doing it the hard way. He was on the other end of the rope, hanging by his neck. 
He was turning slowly like a weather vane on a soft breeze. The chair was tipped over at his feet, so I picked it up and sat down to think. I started to get up when something in my stomach jumped up and kicked my mind to high gear. I looked up at the dead man and what I saw through the suicide theory right out of the window. Sitting in the chair, my head was just on a level with his shoe tops. If he had used the chair to stand on, he would have still needed a ladder just to tie the rope to a beam. I've seen a couple of guys who hang themselves, but never one who jumped four feet in the air to do it. I shoved the chair under him just to make sure. He cleared it by a good foot. I started to think of all the people who had been connected with the case, and the phone rang. I knew Martin would have trouble answering, so I helped him out. Hello? Hello, Martin. Well, uh, he's tied up right now. Who is this? Well, hello, honey. Still collecting pictures? Uh, oh. Hello? Hello? Hmm. Antisocial. Mr. Diamond, did you bring your camera? We'll play spend the bottle some other time. How did you know my name? But you gave it to me this afternoon. You're a bad liar, baby, and look out, I'm coming in. Now, wait a minute, I'm expecting someone. Well, if it's who I think it is, you better hide all the rope in the house. Now move it out of the way. Oh, you heard from Collins yet? I don't know what you're talking about. Now get out of here. Collins, Rollins' secretary, just killed Martin Rollins. He stretched his neck out so far, he started looking like an ad in National Geographic. What? Yes. He strangled him first, then stood on a chair and hung the body to a rafter. How do you know Collins did it? Because he forgot he's a foot taller than most guys. He gave Martin a boost, left him hanging too high. What's that got to do with me? Well, I think Collins knew I'd come to you. I think he promised you the moon if you fingered Martin Rollins. He wanted to get Martin, but he wanted someone else to do it for him. He knew old man Rollins would remember you and tell me. You're crazy. Oh, well, we'll see. How much did Collins promise you? He didn't promise me a thing. You don't think he's going to let you go on breathing when he finds out the law is after him? You're the only hole in his story. Wait a minute. He just left Martin waiting for oxygen. He's probably on his way here right now. He didn't say anything about killing Martin. I want to get out of this mess. Now, that's better. Tell me everything you can. Well, he met me about three months ago at a party. We started to see each other. One day he told me he was... In some kind of trouble and asked me to help, and I said I would. He told me that he had been in a deal with Martin and that Martin had gone to prison for it. So Martin had come back and wanted his shares, had yeah. it? Yes. He promised me 50... <laughs> it all happened in the time it takes you to change your mind. He must have come in through the kitchen and started shooting. She went down like a diver with a bends and died on her face. He was trying for me when I jumped to one side and knocked over the only light burning in the room. He came close, but the flash of his gun gave me his position, and I threw enough lead to start a pipeline. He stumbled back into the kitchen, but he was dragging it. I heard him drop, and I moved in after him. The moonlight slanted down through one of the windows and splashed out on the hard floor. He was lying in it, on his back, like he wanted to get that far anyway. Don't try again, Collins. I still feel like shooting. Forget it. No reason to kill you now. Before you close your eyes, tell me something. Better make it quick. Why didn't you go out and get Martin Rollins yourself? Why hire me to find him? I didn't want anyone to know I was looking. You were the alibi. With Rollins dead and Martin a suicide, you'd swear Martin... Killed the old man. Because Rollins showed me the letter? You forged it? Yes. Yes, I shot Rollins and took the letter. And you planted that phony call to my office? Yes. You nearly got away with it, Collins. You just forgot how tall you were when you hanged Martin. I thought sure Martin was the one who was trying to run me down. I'm a rotten driver. (laughs) How bad is it? You... Must have been a good cop. I caught all three. It should be raining out. Too nice a night to die. Not a cloud in the sky. Must be 
nice to look at. No. No, no. Keep standing up. You'll never see it from down here. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? That question was asked of doctors in every branch of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand name most was Camel. Yes, according to this recent nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Camel's costly tobaccos are properly aged and expertly blended for your smoking enjoyment. Make the sensible cigarette test. Not just a puff, not just a sniff. Smoke Camels for 30 days and see how mild, how flavorful, how enjoyable a cigarette can be. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild mild can a cigarette be? Make the Camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke Camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as a tribute to the men and women who have served our country, the makers of Camel Cigarettes send gift cigarettes each week to hospitalized servicemen and veterans. This week, the Camels go to Veterans Hospitals, Fayetteville, North Carolina, and Des Moines, Iowa. U.S. Air Force Hospital, Bowling Air Force Base, Washington, D.C. U.S. Naval Hospital, Memphis, Tennessee. Now, until next week, enjoy Camels. I always do. Adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell, was written by Blake Edwards. Our director is Helen Mack. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg as Virginia and Ted Osborne as Rollins. Tom Tully was Collins. Arthur Q. Bryan is Lieutenant Levinson and Wilms Herbert Otis. Men, pack your pipes with Prince Albert. The rich flavor and natural fragrance will tell you why P.A. is America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Prince Albert's choice tobacco is specially treated to ensure against tongue bite and its crimp cut to smoke cool and even. Get Prince Albert. It's the national joy smoke. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Can a cigarette be? Martha Tilton knows. Ezio Pinza knows. Vaughn Monroe knows. Yes, so many stars whose voices are their fortunes know it's camels for mildness. They choose camels because they know that camels get along with their throats. Make the 30-day camel mildness test and see how mild, how flavorful, how thoroughly enjoyable a cigarette can be. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Ah, 
Back here behind the socks. Careful the clothesline. I thought you were a detective. Oh, it's been a rumor for some time. Do you always do laundry in the office? Only on Fridays, honey. Uh, have a seat, Miss... Uh... Casper. Well, I'll be right with you, Miss Casper, as soon as I ring out these... Uh... <laughs> as soon as I ring them out. Go right ahead. Ah. Ah, there, there. Mm-hmm. All right, Miss Casper, what can I do for you? It's Mrs. Mm-hmm. Well, now, what's it all about? My husband's going to kill me. Just frisky, or has he got a reason? I... I found out he's been stealing from his partner, and when I faced him with it, he threatened me. Has he done anything more than threaten? Last night he went out and said he'd be gone for most of the evening. I I went to bed, and about an hour later, I thought I heard somebody start upstairs. I got frightened and put pillows in my bed to make it look like I was sleeping. Was it your husband? I, I hid in my dressing room and watched, and then the door opened. It was too dark to tell, but I'm sure it was Phil. He came in and had a knife, and... He jabbed the pillow several times before he realized it it wasn't a real body. Couldn't he see? What do you mean? Well, there's some things a guy remembers. Even if you slept in a diving suit, you'd have a hard time hiding them. I like lots of covers. Mm, Yeah. Now, you said Phil. Is uh, your husband Phil Caspery, the gambler? Yes, he and Max Bruno are in business together. Yeah, I know. The rooftop club. An iron claw with a cover charge. (sighs) This morning, Phil said he was going away on a business trip, but I don't believe him. I'm afraid he's going to try killing me again. I want you to come around about eight and protect me. Here's a hundred dollars. That should cover it. Well, thanks, thanks. We might be up late. Maybe I should bring a good book. Oh, you'll strain your eyes. I like dark rooms. She got up then and walked slowly across the room like a big cat that had just finished eating its keeper. She stopped at the door and smiled a promise. I thought how Samson must have looked with a crew cut. Around one, I stopped in at the corner of 51st and Broadway for a bite of lunch. I killed part of the afternoon at the newspaper morgue, looking up the past files of one Phil Caspery. No convictions, but a bundle of arrests. The partnership with Max Bruno had earned some big type from time to time, and it seemed that Mr. Caspery's partner, Max, was quite a favorite with the local authorities. They'd nailed him twice. The first time, Uncle Sam sent him away for missing too many March 15th. The second was when I remembered. A rookie cop caught him with a gun. The parole board said shame and sent him up for the rest of the stretch. I went back to the apartment, dressed, and by 8 o'clock, I was ringing Mrs. Caspery's doorbell. The skin of my back crawled up and sat on my head. Whoever was dying was doing it the hard way. The door was locked, so I gave it the benefit of one of my shoulders. It was one of those heavy panel jobs with a will of its own, but finally the hinges got tired and gave up. I stumbled into the living room and came up with my 38. The screams had stopped, and I knew the only reason she had given up yelling was because she'd given up living. She was sprawled on the bed, but she didn't look anything like she had that afternoon. The killer had made sure of that. He'd used a knife. And now, she just didn't look like anything. I took a quick look around, found no one, so headed for the phone on the nightstand to call homicide. He must have been standing behind the door. When I turned, he gave it to me. Oh! He used something heavy enough to split a block of cement. It caught me across the nose, and I went down like an express elevator. While I was thinking the floor looked silly, trying to be a funnel, he nailed me again. Mm. Oh, and this time he pushed back the ceiling and let the night in. It's easy to relax after a good beating. You just bleed a little and grow weak. When someone tries to shake you out of it, it's like trying to sober a drunk that got mulled on cleaning fluid. Come on, Rick. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Snap out of it. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I'm... Come on, kid. You're a mess. Oh, oh I'm stuck in the confetti. Mm. Oh, oh, yeah. We have a party or something? Yeah, it looks that way. Wake up, you're still running around with the squirrels. Oh, oh my. Take a look at that, uh, that bed, Walt. If I appear untidy, it makes up for things. We cleaned it off. Now try and sit up. The ambulance will be here in a minute. Oh, well, get me a bat, will you? If I can find the guy who crowned me, I'll give you another customer. We got him outside, but I can't say I blame him. And who you got? Caspery. He says you knocked off his wife. Uh, what? He called us. Said mm. he came home, found the body, and found you tiptoeing through the corpses. Yeah. Well, maybe he told you his wife came to see me today and gave out with a hundred bucks to protect her from him. No, as a matter of fact, he didn't. Well, then don't stand there on your swollen bunion, Walt. He's got me in line for a murder app, and I don't like it. Don't blame you. Otis, bring in Mr. Caspery. Yeah, Lieutenant. Get in there, Caspery. Okay, Sergeant. Okay, take it easy. Here he is, Lieutenant. Caspery, Diamond here says he'll trade you a seat in the electric chair for his pushed-in face. I don't get it. Well, stick around, Phil. We'll catch up with you. Hold it a minute, Rick. I've had my face turned into an ad for taffy machines. I've got a right to glow. Look, why the chit-chat, Lieutenant? You've got your killer. That's what Diamond thinks. He says you fit the job. He's a dirty liar. Says your wife retained him to protect her from you. For why? She found out you were robbing your partner. You made one try for her, but you missed. You graduated, Diamond. Now you're a filthy liar. All right, Rick, lay off. Okay, but I'd like to play some more. I want some answers. Then why don't you ask his partner? You know him, Max Bruno. All right. Let's all go see Max Bruno. A prowl car on Park Avenue is as conspicuous as an outside shower at a girl's camp. A crowd of people watch Sergeant Otis herd us into the back seat. Even if you aren't guilty, you feel like you've got the Chrysler building tucked away under your coat. I waved goodbye to a good-looking blonde with a poodle, and we took off for Bruno's office. It was an old building on 6th Avenue, and a goneth named Tony Garcia with a big bulge under his arm met us at the door. What is this, a convention? Hello, Tony. Tell Bruno I want to see him. The whole party or just you, Lieutenant? I'm enough. Sure. What's the matter, Casper? You look sick. You get tagged for speeding? You can tell, Max, it looks like he built the frame just the right size. I don't think you know what you're talking about. Oh, stop playing Alice in Wonderland. We want to see Bruno. I'll find out if he's in. We know how to turn a doorknob. Look out. Okay. Oh, what is this? We wouldn't wait for an introduction. Hello, Max. What do you want, Levinson? A couple of questions. You in some kind of trouble, Casper? What do you think? Well, what are you getting rough with me for? Oh, are you dirty double Shut cross? up. Well, what's eating you, Diamond? Well, that's a good one. Now, look. You look, Max. You keep your mouth shut, Casper. Not when I'm being framed. I'm going to yell my head off. Framed? Don't know nothing about it, huh, Max? I don't know what you're talking about. What is this? You framed me with that killing. Killing? Don't come on with that bitch. You know what I'm talking about. Take Casper in the hall, Otis. Yes, sir. Uh, come on, Casper. I'll get you for this, Max. So help me. Come I'm... on, you. Will somebody tell me what's going on Rotten here? liar. I swear to you, if it's the last thing I do, I'll get you. What's happened to him? Max, you don't know? How am I supposed to know? Yes? Somebody just killed his wife. Tony. Yeah, boss? Wait in the hall. Yeah, boss. Caspery knocked off his wife, huh? Well, he didn't say it was Caspery. Look, Caspery's my partner. At least he was. You split? Yeah, a couple of days ago. Why? I've been checking for a couple of weeks. Caspery's been holding out on the take. How'd you find out? His wife called me and told me. Oh, really? wonder why a wife would incriminate her husband like that. Yeah, she was scared, scared stiff. She found out what he was doing, and he told her he'd kill her. So she didn't know what to do. She called me. You knew her pretty well, huh? Not too well. She figured I could give her protection. I told her to see you, Diamond. Well, now, that was uh, very nice of you, but... What did you do about Casper when you found out he was robbing you? Told him to get out, have the money back by tomorrow morning. You tell him his wife tipped you about him? Are you crazy? Of course not. Said I'd been checking on him for a long time, that the books didn't tally. And what did he say? He said he didn't do it. What you expect him to say? Well, uh, are your books short? Two hundred thousand worth. Okay, Max, we'll be talking to you. Wife's dead, huh? About as dead as she can get. See you around. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so he told you how I've been robbing the till. Yeah, he did. Well, let's go. What's the matter, Casper? You give it up? I'm framed. That's it. Let's go. Oh, by the way, what did you do with the murder weapon? Don't be surprised if you wake up some morning and find it sticking in your back. Get him out of here, Otis. Come on, you. Come on. <laughs> well, well, Levinson did it again. Suspect in custody. What do you do for an encore? Sleep. You want me to drop you off an emergency? You could use a new face. No, I'll grab a cab and go to the apartment and clean up. Got to see Helen later. Okay, but stay off the streets. Somebody's liable to think you're dead and bury you. Oh, that's a good one. Night. Good night. Hey, cabby. Yeah? Where to, Mac? Holy yike. What's the matter? Oh, don't scare me like that. I got a nervous stomach. Well, they could sell your face for 60 cents a pound. Okay, so good housekeeping shuns me. 553 East 51st and step on it. What are you rolling the window down for? I want to see if it's still bleeding out. Thirty-five cents. There you are. Thanks. Let's take a ride instead. Huh? Don't move. Hey, what's going on? I told you we're going to take a ride. With a gun in my back I don't recognize, but you should have worn your other head, Tony. Move. <laughs> okay, okay. What's the matter? Doesn't Max give you enough to eat? <laughs> That's because I don't think you're funny. All right, all right. You're Tony Garcia and you make people bleed. Right, boy. Hold it. Now get in the car. You're bending the suit. Get in. You drive. Okay, but I'm a better pedestrian. Where to? Washington Bridge. I don't swim any better than I drive. You won't have to. You're out for high diving. Get going. Come on, come on, hurry it up. I thought we were going to a funeral. Hmm, that's a good one. What's it all about, Tony? Don't get nosy. Enjoy the ride. It's a new car. We rode like that. Tony sitting half-turned with a big forty-five in his fist, pointing right at my stomach. I drove south across town, trying to figure it out. Max Bruno's killer getting ready for a job. Why? Why me? What did I know that could get Max Bruno in trouble? Turn here. I turned and the Washington Bridge wasn't far away. I could see it stretched out across the river like a long coffin lined with bright candles. I eased down on the accelerator and by the time we reached the bridge, I was doing a good 60. Slow down. We were near the toll gate. I took my foot off the accelerator and then jammed down on the brakes as hard as I could. Before we continue with Richard Diamond, private detective, here are a few words about smoking enjoyment. You know, smoking is a day-in, day-out pleasure. We like each cigarette to taste as good as the one before. And we like the cigarette we smoke to be mild, to get along with our throats for a good long time. So it's good sense to test a cigarette over a period of time. Not just a puff of this cigarette or a sniff of that. Yes, make the sensible cigarette test. The thorough test. Smoke only camels for 30 days as you normally smoke, and you'll see how rich and flavorful camels are pack after pack. You'll see how mild camels are week after week. In a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only camels for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. That's real proof of cigarette mildness. Make your own camel 30-day test, the sensible test, and see for yourself why more people smoke camels. 
than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Starring Dick Powell. We had hit the bridge railing and stopped cold. The steering wheel had caught me in the stomach. I opened my mouth to make my lungs work. It was like sucking air through a bent straw. I didn't know how long I sat there before I finally made it. But a slow, dripping sound made me remember Tony and look over. He was halfway through the windshield, and the dripping wasn't a broken radiator. His life was running out all over the hood. I got out of the car before the guards got to it. I had to have time to figure the whole thing out, and I didn't want to hang around for a lot of long explanations. I walked until I lost the crowd that was collecting. I took in long breaths of fresh air until my head cleared, then spotted an empty cab heading back to town, flagged it, gave the cabbie the address of the rooftop club. I needed answers, and the best person to give them to me was Max Bruno. Late edition, get the late edition here. Read all about it. Read all about the Casper murder. Woman found dead in her apartment. Husband held for murder. Hey, boy, boy, paper. Yes, sir. Gee, what happened to your face? I shaved with a rake. Yeah? Gee, that's pretty funny. Holy. What's the matter? This picture. That's the dame was knocked off tonight. Caspery dame. Oh, so that's it. Huh? Here's a buck, thanks. Wow. Take my advice, mister. See your analyst. You'll get rid of them bells. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Walt, did you get to 415 at the George Washington Bridge? Yeah, about ten minutes ago. Tony Garcia ran into the bridge railing. Some other guy with him. How'd you hear about it, Rick? Well, I was the other guy. What? Yeah, Tony was going to show me the bottom of the river. Are you nuts? Not at all, no. And have you seen the evening papers? No. Well, there's a picture of Mrs. Casperi on the front page. So what? Well, so this. The girl in the picture isn't the same girl who came into my office this afternoon. Well, who was she? I don't know. Now, wait a minute, well, Rick. Well, no, no, no. Don't you get it? That's why Tony was supposed to gun me tonight. No, I don't get it. Oh, Walt, somebody wanted to frame Phil Casperi. They sent a girl to my office posing as Mrs. Casperi. So I'd swear she suspected that Phil was going to kill her. When I found the wife dead, she was cut up so bad I couldn't tell the difference. Well, then why kill you? To prevent what's just happened. Get me out of the way before I saw the evening papers. Then Max Bruno was lying about Caspery taking the money. Sure. There had to be a motive, so he cooked up the story about Mrs. Caspery calling him and telling him about filling the money. Then Bruno's our man. Oh, Walt, you're such a good boy. I knew you'd get it. Check your hat, sir. Maybe I'd better throw it in the door first. Uh, give me a pack of camels. Yes, sir. Who's running the place for Mr. Bruno? Mr. Casper, but he isn't in yet. Well, depends on what you're talking about. How's the floor show? It's all right if you got an imagination. Hmm. You know, you better keep moving. You'll catch cold in that getup. Oh, well, don't let it fool you. The bustle's real, you hot water bottle. I went in and sat at the bar... The dance floor was in the other room, but you could see it through the long glass windows. I was sitting there trying to figure my next move when the floor show started. The usual 
line of cuties came out, the hat check girl was wrong. You didn't need an imagination. They were wearing just enough to make a bathing suit look like a sleeping bag. They tripped over each other getting off, and the lights went dim, and a white spot circled the piano. She came out in a green satin evening gown. I've seen grapes with looser skins. I didn't know what time it was. She knew what time it was. She was pretty good, too. But she was better this afternoon in my office when she told me she was Mrs. Caspery. I got up and went back to the hat check girl with a warm bustle. Maybe you need a shot. Even the old ones stick around for the last show. Honey, where can I find that singer's dressing room? I thought you looked healthy. Uh-uh, Mr. Bruno wouldn't like it. Well, maybe we don't let Mr. Bruno in on it. Oh, ten bucks. You'll have to shove bamboo under my nails before I talk. She told me how to find the singer's dressing room. I thanked her and gave her a pat on the... You know, it was a hot water bottle. I walked by the bar again and listened while she poured it on. I've heard singers with better voices, but this one had the difference. She went into the last few bars, and I headed for her dressing room. I wanted to get there before she did. And unless that green satin gown was a breakaway, she didn't figure for an encore. I got in and sat down to wait. It was a quick minute before she showed up. Oh, shut up. You're flat. Oh, you get out of here. Go on, get out. Now, relax, baby. I got something to say. You want to listen or do you want to get shoved around? You just try it. I'll get some of Max's boys to let the air out of your muscles. Open your mouth and you'll be tripping on your teeth. I... Get away from that door and sit down. Not until you get your eyes full of fingernails. You little... (gasps) Now, get this. I don't like marking up dames' complexions, but you're making it easy. Who sent you up to my office? Was it Max? Why don't you ask him? He's good at answers. So was his boy, Tony. He got dead trying to figure it out. Maybe you'd like to guess. Uh, Wait a minute, Diamond. One scream from me and everybody in the joint will be in here on your back. Honey, honey, if you open your mouth, I'll shove your foot in it. Uh, if, if I tell you... Do I get squared with the law? You're an accessory before the fact. I can only give you a head start. Just give me long enough to find a healthy climate. Now, you're killing time. Come on. I want to know who built you up to fit Mrs. Caspery. Was it Max Bruno? All right. It was Max. Phil found out he was holding out in the gambling take. So he dissolves the partnership by killing Mrs. Caspery, making Phil the patsy. Neat, huh? Yeah. Like a sack full of brains. Go on. Answer it. Who is it? Open up, baby. It's me. Max, look out. Diamond's in here. Sorry, baby, but twice makes me a punching bag. I didn't want to hit her, but it was the only way to keep her tongue in. She dropped like a wet wash in an earthquake, and I jumped to the door. Max was halfway down the hall. He had a gun in his hand, and he used it. The slug threw up the wall by my ear, and before I could try my luck, he was around the corner. I thought about the hole his Luger had made, and I wondered why I was still chasing him. I turned the corner and found myself in the bandstand. Max turned fast and tried again. I was across the crowded dance floor and the panic busted loose. What's going on here? I shoved aside a drunk who thought it was the 4th of July and went to the bar like I needed the exercise. Dead man's got a gun! Max was nearly to the front door when he turned around for another shot at me. He didn't see the little hat check girl standing behind me with her arms full of coats. He backed right into her, and they both went down together. Max stumbled up, tangled, and on a sordid wardrobe. He squeezed first, but he was wearing too many coats, and he missed again. I didn't miss. Max doubled up like a tired ice bag and got himself a face full of carpet. He was pretty dead. The hat check girl looked at me for a minute and leaned over to Max. She said something that endeared her to me forever. Check your gun, Mr. Bruno. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? That question was asked of doctors in every branch of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country. 
in repeated surveys, the brand named most is Camel. Yes, according to these surveys, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Camel's costly tobaccos are properly aged and expertly blended for your smoking enjoyment. Make the sensible cigarette test, the 30-day Camel test, and see how enjoyable a cigarette can be. See for yourself why people say, once a Camel smoker, always a Camel smoker. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the Camel 30-day test, then you'll see. Smoke Camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. You know, it's a pleasure for me to make this weekly announcement, ladies and gentlemen, because each week the makers of Camels send gift cigarettes to a most deserving group of people servicemen and veterans who are hospitalized. This week's camels go to Veterans Hospitals, Fargo, North Dakota, and Alexandria, Louisiana. U.S. Air Force Hospital, Randolph Air Force Base, Texas. U.S. Naval Hospital, San Diego, California. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell, was written by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Our director is Helen Mack. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Arthur Q. Bryan, and Wilms Herbert. Men, whether you buy the handy pocket tin or the big one-pound tin of Prince Albert, you're in for real smoking joy. P.A.'s Choice Tobacco has a rich taste and delightful natural aroma. It's specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. And it's crimp cut for smooth, even, cool smoking. Get Prince Albert, the national joy smoke. America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. That's what noted throat specialists reported in a coast-to-coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only camels for 30 days. Make your own 30-day camel mildness test, the sensible, thorough cigarette test, and see why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, put up or shut up? Hi. 
Oh, hi, Helen. You busy? Oh, like a hibernating bear. No business? I've seen more action in a bankrupt turtle farm. <laughs> oh, things can't be that bad. I'm even getting an echo in here. Rick. Really? Listen. Hello? Hello? See? Rick, was that really an echo? Now, wait a minute. Hey, my girl wants to know if you're really an echo. I beg your pardon. Oh, uh, honey, I'll call you back. This echo has a man with it. Bye. Bye. Can I help you, sir? I am looking for Mr. Richard Diamond. Why? Now, that's an extremely unique question. I want to sell him ten tons of pig iron. Well, I'm very sorry, but I made a New Year's resolution that I wouldn't build another battleship until I paid up my bill at the automat. <laughs> my name is Barr, David Barr. Now, if you'll stop talking like a television comedian, I would like to discuss a business arrangement. Well, my name is Diamond, Richard Diamond. And if you're rolling in money, I'd be very happy to discuss any arrangement you could dream up. How much do you charge, Mr. Diamond? Well, that depends. Anything short of a felony, a hundred a day in expenses. How earthy. Well, it keeps my ribs from showing. Have you ever heard of me, Mr. Diamond? Well, I have a feeling this may lose me a quick sale, but very frankly, Mr. Barr... No matter, I can see by your clothes that your wardrobe must be fashioned exclusively by popular mechanics. No. Well, okay, we've kicked it around. It's been fun, but I'm beginning to get winded. What do you want to see me for, Mr. Barr? I, uh, want you to guard my store. Store? Yes, I have the most fashionable men's haberdashery and tailoring business on Madison Avenue. And you want it guarded? Perhaps I should give you some background concerning the disgusting incidents that led me to your, uh, um... Office. <laughs> for the lack of a more sordid description, yes, office. Mm, I'm sure the whole background must be very disgusting. Two nights ago, my shop was vandalized. Mm, somebody broke in and swiped something. Yes, yes. To be exact, one blue serge suit. One suit? One, one. I reported the incident to the police, and they summed it up with the same brilliant observation as you. To quote the sergeant, somebody broke in and swiped something. Now, uh, uh, look, Mr. Barr, don't tell me you want me to find that blue suit. No, this was not the end of the trouble, Mr. Diamond. Somebody lifted a hand-painted tie, maybe? Uh, naturally, my employees were questioned, and the following day the police returned to their little precinct, satisfied that somebody had merely... Busted in and swiped something. Yes, yes, yes. Well, the following night, my shop was again the object of vicious vandalizing. This time, the party, or parties responsible, took every foot of blue serge material in the shop. Oh, now, wait a minute. First, somebody breaks in and takes one blue serge suit. The next night, all the blue serge material in the store is stolen. What's the matter? Did you run out of suits? All my suits are custom-tailored, Mr. Diamond. Oh. My stock of finished merchandise is generally sparse. We complete only two or three suits a day. The missing blue serge was hanging with two other suits... The, the property, of course, of one of my best customers. And the thief didn't touch the other two suits? No, no. And on the following night, the night of the second burglary, a gray flannel was left untouched. Mm. The suit and the cloth stolen were both blue serge. Uh, correct. Naturally, I had to order another stock of the same material. It's in the shop now, and I should not be able to sleep a wink unless I was certain that it was safe. And you want me to sit up with the blue serge? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I am considerably interested in finding the motive behind these unusual robberies. Oh, well, this is certainly a first in my life. I've sat up with a lot of things, but never 15 yards of blue serge. The illustrious Mr. Barr handed me a $100 retainer, ran a white glove over the top of my desk like an inspecting general, made an observation on the pursuit of happiness, and went out of my office faster than a bad molar at a dentist convention. We had agreed to meet at his shop at 6 o'clock that evening. So I pasted the $100 bill to my instep, put the instep up on the desk, crossed the other instep over it, leaned back and dozed off, secure in the knowledge that money would never go to my head. Yeah? Mr. Diamond, this is Mr. Barr. Oh, yeah. Well, it isn't, isn't six, is it? It's 4.35. Mr. Diamond, am I correct in assuming that the moment you grabbed that $100, you became a member of my employ? Well, you're correct. 100 bucks worth. Then please come immediately to number six, Park Avenue. Something's happened, and I feel a complete breakdown coming on. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, come in, come in. Oh, what's happened? Oh, if this keeps up, I may be living on dream pills. I've been eating them like peanuts. Well, maybe if you gave me a hint... I, I have been robbed. Well, didn't we go through this thing in here, my... Here, here, I've been robbed here in my apartment. What? I came home, took a bath, went in to get dressed, opened my wardrobe, and to my complete horror, found three... My only three blue serge suits were missing. Oh, no. A potent reaction. Oh, no. Now, why didn't I think of that? I can't imagine. It's certainly simple enough. We'll spend a whole day insulting each other after you solve this mystery. So for now, strain yourself and try looking like a detective with a $100 retainer in his pocket. Well, it's not in my pocket. But if we go into that, I'll leave myself wide open. Show me your wardrobe. Mr. Barr's apartment was as overdone as he was. I stepped down into the living room and found myself wading through a carpet that called for a dog sled to negotiate it. The smell of incense made me keep looking back over my shoulder for the dancing girls. He led the way into a bedroom that George Washington wouldn't have slept in without an armed guard and opened his wardrobe. Two dozen $300 suits stretched from one end of the closet to the other, and there was enough material in that wardrobe to drive a frustrated moth into a complete fit. They were hanging, hanging right here in this space. Are you sure they couldn't be at the cleaners? They were here this morning. Oh, what's that on the bed? That's a blue serge suit. Mr. Diamond, that is the suit I was wearing when I came into your office. No, well, I was so busy looking at your money, I... Well, well, what is to be done? Well, I got to admit it's sure a strange one. You are constantly coming up with the most astute observations. Oh, well, wait till I get around to your personality. <laughs> You'd really be a likable fellow, Diamond, if I could bring myself to look at you. Oh, I'm not so bad. Think of what you must go through shaving every morning. Oh, really, Diamond? What do you think is behind this ridiculous situation? Now, very honestly, I don't know. Except the obvious. Somebody wants your blue serge suits and all the blue serge material you've got. That blue serge on the bed is the last one I've got. Do you think this could be some kind of a practical joke? Not very. It could get somebody ten years. Well, have you got any ideas at all? Yes, I have. Take that last blue surge and hide it. I'll sit in your store tonight and see that the new material you ordered doesn't get lifted. You take the suit, Mr. Diamond. You're being paid to protect it. Okay. And remember, it's new. Brand new. It would cost you $300 to duplicate it. So for the sake of your home and kiddies, don't stuff your big shoulders into it. He gave me the key to his store and told me how to shut off the burglar alarm. He gave me the phone number where I could reach him that evening in case something happened, draped the blue suit over my arm and hurried me out of the room like he was getting rid of a plague victim. I grabbed a cab and ten minutes later I was unlocking the door to my apartment. I started to toss Mr. Barr's suit on the bed, but thought better of it, so I went to the closet, opened the door and reached for a hanger. Now, unlike Mr. Byers' wardrobe, I generally sport a variety of items. A couple of sport coats, a few old letterman sweaters to fill up the space, four pair of slacks, and usually, mind you, I say usually, two suits. One of which I was wearing at the moment. The other was a blue serge. Was was right, because where my blue serge suit once was, it wasn't. That did it. First, Barr loses everything in sight that happens to be blue serge, then I come home and find that one of the two suits I had to my name had been swiped. I burned. Barr could get dozens of suits and use them for bath mats when he got tired of wearing them. Me? I was going to have to sew sleeves on the bath mats. I called Barr at home, but he'd left. I thought about calling with the number he had given me, but decided against it. I sat down to try and figure it out. But a half a dozen camels later, I was still facing a big, fat zero. One thing was sure, I had Mr. Barr's last blue serge suit, and nobody was going to get it away from me. Big shoulders or not, I put it on and headed for Barr's shop on Madison Avenue. I never made it. Hold it. Hey, hey what is this? Hey, I didn't... Well, I'm only considering it because he's got a gun in my back. Walked under that sedan by the curb. Oh, I get, uh, get car sick. You heard him. Oh, fellas, I haven't been well. Doctor recommends lots of walking. Told me to stay away from cars. No! Oh, now, look. You heard him. Yeah, I heard him. Would I be nosy if I asked... Yeah, you would be very nosy. How about you, friend? You heard him. Get in the back. Look, can I interest you boys in a deal? My secret decoder and my ray gun, if you'll only... 
They were both big boys, and they both had big guns. One of them slugged me with one of the big guns, and my head swelled up to match the whole ugly situation. I went down and out faster than a left fielder trying to steal home with a charley horse, and they rolled me into the car. We drove for a long time, me lying on the floor of the back seat, trying to bring myself back to a conscious way of thinking. Finally, I snapped out of it, and they let me sit up and take a look around. We were on a lonely stretch of road, and although the car was green, not black, and didn't look anything like a hearse, I had a gloomy feeling that we were heading for a funeral. Get out. Now, look. Go hide him. Okay, okay. Look, fellas, the least you can do is tell me... Get out of that suit. Get out of the suit? You hide him. Take it off. Take it off quick. Well, I... Well, uh, okay. Would you Would you mind turning your backs? You want to get belted again? No, no, no. I'll, I'll take it off. Take the coat, Hunts. Yeah, Hunts. Here. Now the pants. Come on, come on. Oh, all right, all right. But it's cold. I'm getting goosebumps. Hand him the pants. Now you are, Hunts. Oh, so you're the guys who've been after the blue serge suits. Walk them off the road, Hunts. Yeah, what if a car came by, me and my hand-painted shorts? Get them off far enough so they won't find him right away. Hmm? Move! Oh, now look. You heard him. Yeah, I sure did. Before we continue with Richard Diamond, private detective, here's an important question. How mild can a cigarette be? There's one sensible way to find out. It's not just a sniff, not just a puff, but steady smoking. For only then can you find out how well a cigarette agrees with your throat day in and day out. In a coast-to-coast test, hundreds of people smoked only camels for 30 days. Each week, their throats were examined by noted throat specialists who reported... Not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Make your own 30-day camel test. Enjoy the rich, full flavor of camels' costly tobaccos for 30 days and find out just how mild a cigarette can be, how mild camels are, pack after pack, week after week. It's the sensible, thorough test, a test that will pay off in years of smoking enjoyment. You'll discover why so many people say... Once a camel smoker, always a camel smoker. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. I kept walking with Hunts right behind me, his big gun pointed to the middle of my back. I could stand losing my clothes, but I'd grown to enjoy my life. So I decided I'd have to get that gun away from Hunts somehow. We were 50 yards from the road when I tried it. Give me that gun! Come on, give it to me! Well, I guess you didn't hear what I said. Hunts had tried his best to put a hole in me, but like most guys who think they've got a sure thing, he forgot a small item called luck. In this case, all of it on my side. I left him lying on his face in the moonlight and headed back for the car. But the other gunsel evidently saw my white shorts donning over the landscape and decided it was time to leave. I tried a shot at him and then went back to find Hunts and borrow a pair of pants. Sometimes when things happen that fast, a guy gets careless. Now, I'd figured Hunts, being wounded, would be in the same spot I left him. But when I got back to the spot, the one sentence killer was nowhere in sight. Somewhere in the distance, I heard a branch snap, so I knew that Hunts was on his way back home. I was getting too cold in my undies to start chasing him, so I went back to the road and walked until I spotted a house. Any other time, I would have considered carefully before walking up to a front door, attired only in my underwear. 
Thank goodness they weren't blue surge. I figured I could say I was a cross-country runner with a bad sense of direction. I rang the doorbell and waited. Yes? Could I use your phone? Ah! Oh, shut up, Walt. Boy, did you look silly when they dragged you in here. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know. Otis thought it was a burlesque raid and asked me for a date. Would you mind telling me what you were doing running around like that? Well, that woman's husband was chasing me. What did you think I was doing? Well, you can't blame the old man for chasing you. You scared his wife right out of her wig. Mm. Now, why don't you tell me what this is all about? Because I don't know. Well, how'd you lose your clothes? Uh, let me make a phone call and I'll tell you all about it. I put in a call to David Barr and asked him to meet me at the store. Then I briefed Walt on everything up to date. Walt said... Are you nuts? And I left before I had to lie. I went back to my apartment, climbed back into the only suit I had left, and 20 minutes later, I was standing in David Barr's shop on Madison Avenue. I explained the events of the last couple of hours, and Mr. Barr said... Disgusting. Ah, uh, you bet. I, I just can't understand uh, it. Move over. Don't you have any theories at all? Well, vague ones. That blue suit that you gave me. Tell me about it. The material was originally ordered for a customer who failed to show up, so I had it made up for me. Where did you get your cloth? Black and Winterfield. Although I'm certain you've never enjoyed the benefit of their merchandise, you must have heard of them. What customer was the material ordered for originally? Oh, not one of my steady customers. Uh, he left a deposit. Well, what was his name? Kingsley. Leonard Kingsley. A small man with a preposterous stomach. I had to order four yards. Mm. Well, that's Mr. Kingsley. He's never called or gotten in touch with you? No, no, no. So needing another blue suit, I use the material for myself. If he comes in, I can always order more material. Didn't you take his measurements? Uh, he was in a hurry. He picked out the surge from the book, gave me a deposit, and told me he'd be back that afternoon for the measurements. Uh, that was over a month ago. What are you driving at, Diamond? How do I know? I'm just fishing. The whole thing has got something to do with blue surge material and that blue suit. You're getting disgustingly repetitious. I suppose you're going to tell me this Kingsley sent two hired killers to steal my goods because he thought it was easier than coming in for a fitting. I don't know. Where's your phone? On the desk. It's the only thing in the whole shop that looks anything like a phone. Honestly. I got more of a description of Leonard Kingsley and put in a call to Walt at the precinct. I gave him the information, asked him to run a check. Then I said goodnight to Mr. Barr and settled back in a chair to guard the store. I'd been sleeping about an hour when Walt called back. What do you know about this Leonard Kingsley, Diamond? Oh, now, there's a brilliant question. Why do you think I called you up? I don't know anything. I want to find out. Well, where did you hear about him? From my client. That bar guy you told me about? That's right. This Leonard Kingsley came into his store, ordered a suit. Never came back. That was because he couldn't. Come back? Yeah. About a month ago, this Leonard Kingsley was killed in a car accident. Stepped off the curb and a car hit him. You sure it was an accident? Yep. Woman hit him. There was an inquest. Witnesses say it was all Kingsley's fault. All right, all right. What's the rest? Rest? Oh, stop with a little red riding hood. Something's up. Well, this is confidential, Rick. Well, it'll stay that way. The FBI have got a share in this thing. What? It seems that when a check was run to find Kingsley's home and relatives, all of the credentials he had on him turned out to be phonies, particularly his passport. What did the feds find out? Kingsley was from one of the Iron Curtain countries. Espionage. <laughs> All right. Well, Paul Revere with a shoulder holster. I want some answers, Mr. Barr. How many customers can you remember who came into your shop and ordered only one suit in the last year? Mm, half a dozen. How many never came back after they got the one suit? Well, what's the matter? That's peculiar. Everyone I can remember, and they're comparatively easy because most of my customers are steady. Go on, go on. What about these single customers? Every one of them ordered a blue surge. And you got all the material from Black and Winterfield? Yes. The whole thing was beginning to make sense. What better way of getting information out of the country than in the material of a suit? 
I dragged Barr down to the store again, got the names of all his single customers who had ordered blue serge suits. Then I went over to the 5th Precinct and had Walt make a check on them. Two hours later, the U.S. Customs Department sent in an interesting teletype. Rick, every one of those guys have left the country and hasn't returned. And eight to five, the FBI can find out plenty. Now, give them the information. Let's go over to Black and Winterfield. I want to take a look at that store. See if I can find out how anyone can hide any kind of information in three and a half yards of blue surge. There it is. Dark. Yep, come on. What do you think you're going to do? Well, we're going in that store and take a look around. You can't do that. Now, without a warrant... All right, Fatty, just so you won't disgrace that lovely badge, I'll go in first, and you can come in and arrest me for breaking and entering. Now, Rick, you wait a minute. Walt, they know I got away. We can't wait. I... Hey. What's the matter? What are you looking at? That car in the alley. What about it? Looks like the one those two killers took me for a ride in. Come on. Well? Uh, looks like it. Wait a minute, I took a shot at it, and maybe I can... Wait, I'll light a match. Uh-huh. Yes, sir, here it is. Nice little bullet hole. Well, I'll be... I think one of my little headhunters is in that building. Still want to get a warrant? Let's go. How are we going to get in? Oh, you'll figure something out. You're really a second-story man at heart. Rick, wait a minute. Oh, what is it? Look at this. Isn't it blood? Huh. Looks like both of them are here. Leads right in the door. Locked. Let's go around back. We ducked around back and spent the next ten minutes jimmying the window. And Walt couldn't have been more professional if he'd done time in Sing Sing. He jimmied it without a sound and knew just how to disconnect the alarm. We squeezed through and dropped to the floor. We were in a basement, and from somewhere in another part of the building, we could hear a radio playing softly. We went up the steps to the first floor and stopped to listen. The radio was to our left, down a long corridor. We stayed against the wall and edged our way toward a door at the end of the hall. A thin strip of light showed at the crack, and we moved up and listened, holding our breath. How you feeling, Hunts? Oh. Well, well oh. try and take it easy. And the oh. boss is coming with the doc. They're both in there. Let's take them. Hold it. Oh. Music making you feel better, huh? No. No, Gabe. Well, you want something better, maybe? Artie Shaw pick you up, oh. maybe? No. Turn it off. Okay. Uh. Now, don't you worry. I'll get that shamus for shooting you. And the boss will be real happy when he sees we got the suit. Okay, let's take them, Walt. Look out behind you, Rick. so fast there wasn't any time to think. Suddenly there were two men standing behind us in the hall. By the time the smoke cleared, both of them were down and Walt and I were shaking like a hula dancer with a hot foot. Then before we could catch our breath, Gabe came running out. I'll get him, Rick. No, no, I'll get him. You go in and take care of the wounded one. Walt went in after Hunts and I took off after the other. I caught him just as he dove through the front door. Hold it. Okay, okay. I'm bleeding! I'm bleeding! All right, all right, let's have it. I'm bleeding! Get a doctor! The ambulance is on the way. Now, tell us about it. What do you want to know? We want to know about the suits and about the material. And who the guys are in the hall. One of them's a doctor for Hunts here. The other one's the boss. He runs the store. You were getting information out of the country and the blue surge material. Yeah. What kind of information? All kinds. Defense plans, radar locations, that kind of stuff. Done all in code numbers. How did they do it? Stuff was invisible like. Just drew it on the blue surge. When the guy got out of the country, he'd take the suit and dip it in something. Then the right and come out. And when Kingsley got hit by the car, you found out he didn't have the suit. The boss did. <laughs> How about it, Hans? How do you feel? Uh, 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 why did you swipe my suit? We was tailing bar. So I'm going to your office. 
Figured maybe he'd give you the suit. Well, there it is, Rick. How about it, Hans? Your partner telling the truth? <laughs> you heard him. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. What cigarette do you smoke, Doctor? Again, a study has been made. Again, this question was asked of doctors all over the country and in every branch of medicine. The brand named most was Camel. Yes, again and again, surveys show that more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Friends, smoke Camels for 30 days and you'll see how mild, how flavorful... How thoroughly enjoyable a cigarette can be. And say, how about giving a carton of camels for Valentine's Day? Makes a swell gift. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild mild can a cigarette be? Make the camels 30 day test and you'll see. Smoke camel and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, each week for many years, the makers of camels have been sending gift cigarettes to hospitalized servicemen and veterans in this country. Now, gift camels are also being sent to hospitals overseas. This week's shipping list includes U.S. Naval Hospital, Yokosuka, Japan. Camels are also on their way to Veterans Hospital, Coatesville, Pennsylvania, and Fort Howard, Maryland. U.S. Air Force Hospital, Lackland Air Force Base, San Antonio, Texas. Now... Until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Dick Powell can soon be seen in his new RKO picture, Cry Danger. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond was written by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Our director is Helen Mack. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Wilms Herbert, and Arthur Q. Bryan. P.A. stands for two things, Pipe Appeal and Prince Albert. They go hand in hand, for Prince Albert's choice tobacco has a rich flavor and a delightful natural aroma. P.A. is crimped cut for smooth, even burning, and it's specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Get Prince Albert, the national joy smoke, America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Again, that question has been asked of doctors in all parts of the country, doctors in every branch of medicine, and again, the brand name most is Camel. Yes, according to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. It was a cold afternoon in New York. There were six inches of snow on the streets and twice that much on the fire escape outside my window. I looked down at Broadway and watched the miserable pedestrians edging their way over the slippery, ice-covered sidewalks and thought about burning some of my furniture. It was just the day for anything unpleasant, and when the door to my office opened, I turned around to look at one of the most unpleasant sights I'd ever been faced with. Standing in the door was something that looked human. 
and I use the term human only because I stuck around long enough to find out for sure. He was about six feet and well-dressed in a dark gray overcoat. But his face raised goosebumps from my argyles to my haircut. It was as dark gray as his overcoat, his whole face, his eyes, his lips, and when he spoke, even his tongue. Mr. Diamond? Yeah? I want you to find a man, and I want you to find him in the next five hours. He didn't sit down. He just stood there facing me like a bad dream. I pushed the chair back and got up, as though I had to be standing to protect myself from what was coming. The man I want you to find is named Carnes. He's a science teacher at State College. Is he missing? Would I want him located if he wasn't? Would I have asked you if I'd known the answer to that? How much is your fee, Mr. Diamond? When I know what I'm getting into, a hundred a day in expenses. Yes, five hundred. Find Lewis Carnes in five hours and you get another five hundred. Does it matter if you know what you're getting into? I never go waiting if there's quicksand around. Not even for a thousand dollars? I never like to count money when I'm suffocating. You only have to find Lewis Carnes. I guarantee you'll live through it. And after I find him? You can spend your thousand and forget about it. Why do you want him found? I owe him a debt. I want to pay him. And why do I have to find him in the next five hours? Because that's how long I've got to live. Interesting situation? You bet. And that thousand made it about as interesting a situation as I'd ever gotten into. I couldn't take my eyes off of him, standing there as gray as an early morning ghost. I wanted to ask him about his color. But in a business like mine, if a client comes in riding a purple llama, you greet him like everybody rides purple llamas and keep your mouth shut. He handed me the $500 and a card with his business address on it. Roger Vegas, 64 West 110th, studio of modern photography. He backed up two steps, smiled a slow, dead smile, turned and walked out of the office like he was going to look at his own grave. I sat back down and thought about it for a while. And the little voice in the back of my head kept whispering... Don't do it, Diamond. Don't do it, Diamond. Don't do it, Diamond. Oh, shut up. You'll be sorry. What about the thousand dollars? It'll buy you a nice funeral. Eh, uh, peasant. If it ain't Richard Diamond, the overstuffed flatfoot. Well, if it ain't Sergeant Otis, the overstuffed flathead. Oh. No. Someday you'll be sorry. Well, everybody is sooner or later. Think of what your poor mother must have gone through. That ain't funny. I bet your father didn't think so either. Oh. Oh, Rick. Still picking on him? Oh, he'll be picked on until somebody plucks off that other head. What's up? Uh, Walter wants some information. If I can... History on a fellow named Roger Vegas. Here's his card. Also, a Mr. Lewis Carnes, science professor at State College. Well, I'll try. What's it all about? Roger Vegas wants me to find this Lewis Carnes. Wants to pay back a debt. What's unusual about that? I don't know. Oh, but you should see Roger Vegas. He'd scare you right into a dozen more ulcers. I doubt it. No room for any more. Well, the ones you've got would hide. You should see this guy, Walt. His face, his, his, his hands are duck gray. What about the rest of them? Now, wouldn't you know it if I got to ask him to take his clothes off? Very funny. What do you mean he's gray? Well, that's just what he is. Even his eyes. Not just the pupil, but the whole eye. The whole eye? Yep. If he raised his collar, he could stick out his tongue, put a tie pin on it, and wear it with a dark blue suit. His tongue, too? Even his fingernails, his gums. I suppose his hair is plaid. Okay, okay. But if you ever run into this guy in a dark alley, get set to faint. Well, I'll see what I can find out about him. I've got to have the information pretty fast. I've only got four and a half hours to find Lewis Carnes. How come? Because Roger Vegas has only got that long to live. 
Rick. That's what he told me. A guy with a gray face comes into your office, wants you to find another guy, and tells you you got to find him in the next four and a half hours because he's going to die. Who's going to die? The guy with the gray face. You didn't say that. You said got to find the guy in the next four and a half hours because he's going to die. Oh, well, you know what I meant. No, no. Vegas gave me five hours. You said four and a half. Well, that was a half an hour ago. Oh, swell. Oh, I'm wasting my time. I've got to find him. The man with the gray face? No, the science professor. Well, you're getting pretty confused. I'll see you later, huh? I left the 5th Precinct, grabbed a cab, and 20 minutes later I was walking across the campus of State College. Being Saturday, the big school was quiet and impressive as it stretched out over the dozen acres of snow-covered grounds. I located the administration building and found one lonely student working in the main office. Uh, ahem. <clears throat> yes? Oh. oh. Good afternoon. Looks like it might be. Can I do something for you? Well, uh, yes. I'm, I'm looking for Professor Carnes. Professor Carnes? Mm-hmm. He's uh, in the science department, isn't he? Well, professor hasn't been on campus since last Thursday. Faculty's been rather worried. You don't know where I could find him? No, but I'm through here in half an hour. I could help you look. <laughs> I bet you could. You know where the professor lives? It's on file. Well, why don't you be a good little freshman? And... Junior. A junior, and get me his address from that file. Because it's more fun not being a good little junior. And the college has certain rules. Well, then be a bad little junior and break the rules. I'm off in half an hour. Might be able to then. I've got to find a science professor, dear. And until I do, I'm afraid I'll have to pass the extension course in biology. And if you find the professor? Uh, we'll talk about it. I'm in here every afternoon. Hmm. College hasn't changed a bit since my days. Just jumped into second gear. The cute little junior walked her sweater and saddle shoes over to a long file and came back with Professor Kahn's home address. I thanked her, promised she could wear my gold badge if she passed lunch hour and took my cab back to town. At the professor's house, I met his sister, an elderly lady named Drusilla, who reminded me of my math teacher at PS14. I haven't seen my brother since Friday morning, Mr. Diamond. And you have no idea where I can find him? No. Why do you want to find him? Well, I, uh, I'm a private detective, Miss Carnes. I, I was hired by a man named Vegas. Oh. oh, you know him? I most certainly do. Did he hire you to find my brother? That's right. He's not a good man, Mr. Diamond. I believe he's the reason my brother disappeared. Maybe you better tell me about him. My brother married a girl many years younger than himself, and unfortunately, it was not a good marriage. Did this Vegas person mention my brother's wife? No, he just told me he wanted to find the professor in order to pay him a debt. A debt? That's what he said. Watch out for that man, Mr. Diamond. He broke up my brother's marriage. Well, uh, maybe I'd better talk to your brother's wife. That would be impossible. My brother's wife killed herself. Oh, well, that's uh, too bad. My brother and I believe she killed herself because of that man, Vegas. My brother found out they were seeing each other. When he begged her to stop, she said that it was impossible and refused to give a reason. A week later, she killed herself. Have you ever seen Mr. Vegas? No, I have not. Why? Well, I was just wondering why any woman would go for a man like him. Unless she liked ghosts. I left Drusilla Carnes and looked at my watch. It was three o'clock, and I had only two hours left to find the professor and earn my thousand dollars. On the way to the nearest phone booth... I thought about the case and wondered if the thousand dollars would be worth it in the long run. I watched part of my last five bucks drop in the phone and decided it was. Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Diamond, Walt. I want to know about a suicide. Otis won't do it. Uh, Professor Carnes' wife. I thought so. I checked for you in Vegas and the professor. The professor's wife jumped off a building five days ago. What did you find out about Vegas and the professor? Not much. At the inquest, the professor accused Vegas of breaking up his home and driving his wife to suicide. Neither man's got a record. Vegas is a professional photographer, and the professor has been teaching at State College for the past 11 years. 
I talked with some of the men at the inquest, and they remembered Vegas. They all say his skin looked pretty healthy at the time. Do me a favor, Walt. Check with the coroner and find out what would turn a man's skin that color. Sure. Got any leads on the professor yet? No, but he got a hunch. I just left his sister's, and uh, she doesn't seem at all worried about her brother's disappearance. So? So if she isn't worried, there's a good chance she knows he's all right. And if she knows he's all right, she might know where he is. Oh, no wonder they made you a Lieutenant Walt. You keep thinking like that, and someday you might even take over for Sergeant Otis. Bye. I left the phone booth and walked back toward Drusilla Kine's house. I staked myself out across the street in a corner gas station and warmed my blue little ears inside while I waited for the good Drusilla to contact her brother. I was just guessing, but it worked. Ten minutes later, Drusilla, dressed in a heavy fur coat that looked like it should be out on the river building a dam, walked out of her house and hailed a cab. I hailed one, too, and followed. Fifteen minutes later, I was back on the campus of State College. I watched her get out, walk around back of one of the buildings, knock on a door. She waited until someone opened it, and then she disappeared inside. I tried the door, but it was locked again. So I toured the building. The front door was locked, too. I set to work trying to pick the lock. I broke a Boy Scout knife half a dozen fingernails, and several bobby pins that for some strange reason had found their way into my coat pocket. So I did the next best thing. I went back to the door that Drusilla had entered earlier and waited. Five frozen minutes later, the door opened and I stood there facing Drusilla while her look melted every icicle within ten feet. Standing directly behind her was a small man his breath showing clearly against the cold air, coming in short gasps. Drusilla. It's all right, Lewis. What do you want, Mr. Diamond? Nothing now, Miss Carnes. I have found it. Is that the man, Drusilla? Yes. He's a detective. Vegas hired him. It's all right, Drusilla. If Vegas wants to find me, I'm tired of hiding. Tell Vegas that I'll be waiting here, young man. Lewis, you know what he'll do. It's all right. Vegas knows he's only got a few hours left. Has that strange color of his skin got something to do with it? Yes. Have you seen him since the inquest, Professor? No. Well, that's funny. How did you know about his skin and that he only has a few hours left to live? Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here is an important question. What do you look for in a cigarette? Well, most people say flavor and mildness. Those are two things you'll find in camels. No other cigarette has camels' rich, full flavor. The flavor of costly tobaccos, properly aged and expertly blended. And no other cigarette gives you this conclusive evidence of mildness. In a coast-to-coast test, hundreds of people smoked only camels for 30 days. Each week, noted throat specialists examined the throats of these smokers and reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Yes, that's proof of mildness based on day-in, day-out smoking, not just a sniff or a puff. Make your own 30-day camel mildness test, the sensible test. The thorough test. You'll enjoy Camel's rich, full flavor from first puff to last. You'll see just how mild Camel's are. And you'll know why more people smoke Camel's than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild mild can a cigarette be? Make the Camel's 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke Camel's and see. And now, back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, I'd found the professor, and the thousand dollars was close to being mine. All I had to do was notify Vegas and collect. Even the professor guaranteed to help by staying and waiting for Vegas. But something was wrong. Standing there in the snow, looking at the timid professor... 
Something began to smell to high heaven. I turned and walked away. Even if the professor was going to run, what was I supposed to do? Carry him piggyback until I located my dying client? The thousand was important, but there was a lot more that had to be solved in a hurry. I went back to town and over to the photography shop run by Roger Vegas. Yeah, just something. What's the matter? Huh? Oh, nothing. Nothing. Uh, can I do something for you? I'm looking for Roger Vegas. Oh, he ain't in. Ain't I seen you someplace? You might have. I move around. Where can I find Vegas? He ain't here. I know he ain't. Where can I find him? Home, I guess. Home. That would be somewhere in New York, huh? I, uh, I ain't supposed to give out the address. Uh, who wants him? I do, and I ain't supposed to give out the name. Uh, you're pretty sharp. Sharp guy, huh? Tell him to call Richard Diamond. Rich? Richard Diamond. My family thought it up. Okay. You know me now? No. No, I was mistaken. Well, I'm surprised. I sent you to Sing Sing ten years ago. <laughs> The professor's hiding in the school? That's right, Walt. In the basement of the science building. I just left Roger Vegas's photography shop, and guess who was working there? Who? George Youngwell. Youngwell? The guy you sent up on that blackmail rap? Ten years ago. Well, I knew he was out, but I haven't heard anything about him in a couple of years. Well, he's working for Vegas. Must be keeping his nose clean. Oh, I've seen cleaner noses on pigs. Somebody want me? No. What is it, your melon head? Well, gee, don't yell at me like that. I got something more than Roger Vegas. Well, do you want to hand it to me, or would you just like to stand there and throw it? Oh. Gee, I wish you'd stay away from Diamond. Every time you see him, you get meaner and meaner. Come on, come on. What do you got? Here. Ain't nothing much. Robbery detail come up with it. Huh. That photography shop was broken into this morning, Rick. Oh, it was? Yeah, burglary got some prints on the windows. Belongs to some guy named Carnes. Carnes? Yeah. Says here, checked prints with State License Bureau. Prints belong to one Lewis Carnes, professor of science at State College. I'll see you later. Rick. Yeah? I nearly forgot. I checked with the coroner. Told him about the color of Vegas' skin. He said that it could only be caused by a strong dose of silver salts. Silver salts? Poisoning known as perinia. P-Y-R-I-N-N-I-A. Silver salts. Uh They used that in a photography shop. Carner said a man would have to drink about 30 grains for a fatal dosage. That's quite a bit. Hmm. Can tell you how long he'd live? Yeah, anywhere from six to eight hours, according to the dosage. First, the victim turns gray, then green. About what time was that photography shop broken into, Walt? Oh, sometime before nine this morning. Before they opened up. Mm, thanks. Where are you going? Going to talk to George Youngwell and then find out if my gray client has turned green yet. Hello, George. I told him, Diamond. I told him you wanted to see him. He said he was going over to your office. Well, thanks. Look, what are you looking at me like that for? I'm going straight now. Swell. I got a good job, see? Legit. I don't want no trouble. I don't blame you. Okay. Mr. Vegas has gone over to your place. Why don't you go meet him, huh? Plenty of time. Look, he's in a hurry. He's got a big trouble, and he's got to take care of it in a hurry. Yeah, I know. He's got about an hour. Well, go on, go on. He, he paid you, didn't he? What do you do around here, George? Now, listen. Listen, you. I know my rights. I'm clean. I don't know what you're trying to prove, but I don't buy none of it. Now, get out of here or I'll call a straight cop. You know why Vegas is going to die in an hour, George? Yeah. No, no, I don't. If I did, I don't have to tell you nothing. Nothing, see? Maybe you know why he wants to find the professor. No. Maybe you knew the professor's wife. No. Maybe you know why she got killed. No, no, no. Get out of here, Diamond. Get out. I'm clean. I'm legit now. Yeah, like a tub of mud. What do you mean? I want you to tell me about Vegas. What about him? What about him? He owns the shop, that's all. He makes pictures. What else does he do? Nothing, nothing that I know of. What else he does, I don't know about. What are you doing? Get away from me. I want to know all about it, George. I think I know most of it. I want to know the rest. No, I don't know. 
No, get away. I'm not a cop anymore, remember? I don't have to play the rules. You can't scare me. You won't get rough. You ain't a cop is right to lock you up if you get rough. Get away. I want to know why the professor's wife got killed. I don't know. I swear. I don't know. She she jumped. She jumped off the building. I thought you said you didn't know. Get away. No, please. Please. I could figure everything but the wife. If she jumped, she had to have a reason. When I saw you, George, I got the idea. Please, please. Blackmail, maybe, George. I'm legit, I told you. I'm working here. Blackmail with pictures, maybe? No, no. The dirtiest racket in the business. I mean, no. You're going to tell me, George, or wish you were dead. I'm not telling you anything. Blackmail's the dirtiest racket I can think of. No, please, please. Please. If Vegas finds the professor, he'll kill him. I've got an hour to stop a murder. Okay. Okay, okay. Okay, we were blackmailing the wife. Phony pictures? Yeah. How many others? How many others? A lot of them. Lots. Okay, George. Let's get down to the station. I hate to get in a rut, but I'm going to see that you get another ten years. I hauled George Youngwell down to the precinct and went back to see the professor. He gave me some very interesting information. Interesting enough to make me call Walt and set up a plan. Then I went back to my office. When I walked in, I found Roger Vegas facing me. He turned an ugly shade of green, all but the gun in his hand. Where is he, Diamond? I've got less than an hour. I just left George Youngwell at the 5th Precinct. He's singing like a quartet. I thought that would happen, but I'm not worried. You've got plenty of poisoning, huh? That's right. You've had it for about seven and a half hours, ever since the professor broke into your store and made you drink the silver sauce. Yes. He was getting even for his wife. I've got about 40 minutes to live. Where is he? Well, if you're short on time, maybe you'd better start looking. No, I don't think so. You're going to show me. No, I don't think so. I can't argue. I guess you won't live through it after all. Oh, no. Wait a minute. Let's not lose our heads. He's uh, at the college. Don't lie to me. He's in the science building, in the basement. You're coming along. It'll take 30 minutes to get there. If you're lying, I've got five minutes left to kill you. I think that's plenty of time. The professor's in this building. Is it open? It should be. Go ahead. Stop. I can't see anything. The lights are out. If you're lying to me, Diamond, if he's not here... He's here. Call him. Okay. Oh, well, Professor. Professor Carnes. Yes? Oh. He's in the back room. Tell him to come in. Will you come in here, Professor? Who is it? It's Diamond. The detective? Get him in here. Yes, Professor. All right. Yes, what is it, Mr. Diamond? I... Hello, Professor. Vegas. Yes. Surprise. No. No, I knew you'd hired this detective. I knew you'd come. Not too late, eh? Huh? All right, Professor. I've got but five minutes, so you're going to die before me. You're a pretty terrible man. Look who's talking. Break into my store, pull a gun on me, make me drink that stuff. You're a killer and you're going to pay for it. I'm not a killer yet. I haven't got the time to talk about it. You won't get away with it. You think you pulled it off just great, don't you? Well, I'm not only going to kill you, but I'm going to tell you something. I want to see how you take it. I got a little additional revenge, Professor. Your wife didn't jump. I pushed her. I don't believe it. She was going to stop paying me. Going to tell you about the pictures I was blackmailing her with. Well, I couldn't have that. So I pushed her off the roof. That's all I wanted to know, Vegas. What do you mean? Walt. Very nice, Lieutenant Levinson. Here's his gun. Thank you, Mr. Diamond. Get up, Vegas. You cheated me. But you've got to take him. He made me drink this stuff. Oh, relax. You're going to be all right. You're crazy. I'm going to die, but he'll be the murderer. It's a little satisfaction anyway. You'll hang, Professor. Tell him, Professor. You lose all the way around, Vegas. What do you mean? It takes 30 grains of silver salt to be fatal. I only gave you 15. No. In another few hours, you return to your natural color. No. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh. Don't be so unhappy, Vegas. You tried so hard to die, I think the state will do everything they can to see that you make it.
Dick Powell will return in just a minute. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. And among the millions of camel smokers are many stars who know the importance of mildness in a cigarette because their voices are their living. Our own Dick Powell has been a camel smoker for a good long time. Is that right, Dick? Yes, it is, Ed, and I'm smoking one right now. Well, you're in good company. Among other stars who smoke camels are John Wayne, Risa Stevens, Ezio Pinza, Martha Tilton, and so on. Friends, find out for yourself how mild and flavorful a cigarette can be. Make the camel 30-day test, and you'll know why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild. How mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel's 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. You know, ladies and gentlemen, no one deserves our appreciation more than the hospitalized men and women of our armed forces. As a tribute to them, the camel people send gift cigarettes each week to servicemen's and veterans' hospitals in this country and also to overseas where our fighting men are hospitalized. This week, camels go to veterans' hospitals, American Lake, Washington, and Fort Bayard, New Mexico, U.S. Army Station Hospital, Camp Stoneman, California, U.S. Naval Hospital Ship, Repose. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Dick Powell will soon be seen in the RKO picture, Cry Danger. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond was written by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Our director is Helen Mack. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Wilms Herbert, and Arthur Q. Bryan. Then, for pipe pleasure, get the National Joy Smoke, Prince Albert. P.A. has a rich flavor and wonderful natural fragrance. It's crimp cut for cool, smooth smoking, and specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. You'll enjoy Prince Albert, America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the fire.